Wait, before we start, do you want a bundle of 30 printable English PDF cheat sheets teaching you words and phrases for conversations for free? Then click the link in the description and sign up for a free lifetime account to get access. In this video, you'll learn 20 of the most common words and phrases in English. Hi everybody, my name is Alicia. Welcome to the 800 Core English Words and Phrases video series. This series will teach you the 800 most common words and phrases in English. But there's a twist. With each new lesson in this series, we'll include the previous lessons at the end. So after you've learned the new words and phrases, stick around and review what you learned in previous lessons. Reviewing is one of the most important parts of learning a language. You can also get the full list right now at EnglishClass101.com. Click the link in the description to access more example sentences, create your own flashcard deck, and finally master English. Okay, let's get started. First is shirt. 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 So a shirt is a piece of clothing that we wear on the top part of our body. There are 10 shirts in the closet. There are 10 shirts in the closet. There are 10 shirts in the closet. Pants. 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 So pants, that's a piece of clothing that we wear on the lower part of our body. It covers our legs. Your pants are bigger than mine. Your pants are bigger than mine. Your pants are bigger than mine. Dress. 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 So a dress is something that's worn over the entire body. It usually covers from the shoulders to around the knee area, but it can go further. I regret not buying that dress. I regret not buying that dress. I regret not buying that dress. Say. 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 We use say for simple reports of speech. I was just going to say that. I was just going to say that. I was just going to say that. Call. 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 We use the verb call when we want to make a phone call to someone. Please give me a call tomorrow morning. Please give me a call tomorrow morning. Please give me a call tomorrow morning. Find. 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 We use the word find when we talk about the moment we discover something. How did you find the cell phone? How did you find the cell phone? How did you find the cell phone? Clean, clean, clean. So the word clean can be used as an adjective or it can be used as a verb. It refers to making something nice. We aim for a clean environment. We aim for a clean environment. We aim for a clean environment. Dirty, dirty. Dirty. So the word dirty is used to refer to something that is not clean. The fork is on the dirty plate. The fork is on the dirty plate. The fork is on the dirty plate. Carrot. 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 So a carrot is a very common vegetable. It's orange, maybe about this size. We can have small ones as well. Kids do not like carrots. Kids do not like carrots. Kids do not like carrots. Onion. 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 So an onion is a very common cooking ingredient. When you cut them, it will make you cry. I don't cry when I cut onions. I don't cry when I cut onions. I don't cry when I cut onions. Lettuce. 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 
So lettuce is very commonly used in salads. It's a leafy green vegetable. My salad only has lettuce and tomato. My salad only has lettuce and tomato. My salad only has lettuce and tomato. Sheep. 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 So a sheep is a kind of farm animal. We get lots of things from them, such as milk and wool as well. The sheep is eating the green grass. The sheep is eating the green grass. The sheep is eating the green grass. Rabbit. 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 So a rabbit is a very small, cute animal、uh, that's known for hopping around. Your rabbit is very cute. Your rabbit is very cute. Your rabbit is very cute. Seal. 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 So a seal is an ocean animal. They can be big or a little small. They kind of look like dogs sometimes in the ocean. Seals live in the coldest areas. Seals live in the coldest areas. Seals live in the coldest areas. Cloud. 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 So clouds are those usually white or gray kind of fluffy things we see in the sky. I can't see any clouds today. I can't see any clouds today. I can't see any clouds today. Sunny. 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 Sunny is the word that we use to talk about a day with lots of sunshine. I often go on a picnic on a sunny day. I often go on a picnic on a sunny day. I often go on a picnic on a sunny day. Rainy. 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 Rainy is used to talk about weather, so we use it for days when water is falling from the sky. It'll be rainy this Saturday. It'll be rainy this Saturday. It will be rainy this Saturday. Baby. 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 Baby is the word we use to describe a very small creature. We can use it for humans, and we can use it for animals. The baby sleeps on the blanket. The baby sleeps on the blanket. The baby sleeps on the blanket. Girl. 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 So a girl is someone who is born as a female. The girl washes her face. The girl washes her face. The girl washes her face. Boy. 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 The word boy refers to someone who is born as a male. The boy fell down from the tree. The boy fell down from the tree. The boy fell down from the tree. Well done! In this lesson, you expanded your vocabulary and learned 20 new useful words. Click the link in the description and sign up for free at EnglishClass101.com to get access to the full list of vocabulary you'll need for daily life conversations. You'll also get example sentences, custom flashcard decks, and more learning resources. See you next time. Bye bye. In this video, you'll learn 20 of the most common words and phrases in English. Hi, everybody. My name is Alicia. Welcome to the 800 Core English Words and Phrases video series. This series will teach you the 800 most common words and phrases in English. But there's a twist. With each new lesson in this series, we'll include the previous lessons at the end. So after you've learned the new words and phrases, stick around and review what you learned in previous lessons. Reviewing is one of the most important parts of learning a language. 
You can also get the full list right now at EnglishClass101.com. Click the link in the description to access more example sentences, create your own flashcard deck, and finally master English. Okay, let's get started. First is headache. 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 A headache is a pain in your head. So when we say, I have a headache, it refers to a pain that's specifically maybe around this area or for many people, perhaps in the back of the head. My headache is getting worse. My headache is getting worse. My headache is getting worse. Diarrhea. 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 Diarrhea is a very, very unpleasant condition where your body has trouble processing food and drinks correctly. Maybe you have a germ or maybe you ate something that was not good for your stomach. And so you have to use the bathroom a lot or the way that your body produces waste changes a bit. This medicine will stop the diarrhea. This medicine will stop the diarrhea. This medicine will stop the diarrhea. Symptom. 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 So a symptom is something that you notice that gives you a clue about your sickness. So common symptoms are like fever or a runny nose or a sore throat. These are like the parts of an illness. What are your symptoms? What are your symptoms? What are your symptoms? Stomach ache. Stomach ache. Stomach ache. So a stomach ache refers to, again, an unpleasant feeling in the body, maybe because you ate something bad or maybe because of an illness. But a stomach ache refers to the pain in your body. The earlier word that we talked about that also refers to a pain or an unpleasant feeling in the stomach refers to the waste the body produces. This one is very, very common, especially among kids, stomach aches. Yesterday, I had a bad stomach ache. Yesterday, I had a bad stomach ache. Yesterday, I had a bad stomach ache. Clean. 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 So clean can be used as both an adjective and as a verb. When we use it as a verb, it means to make something tidy or to organize something or to sanitize something. As in, did you clean your room? Did you clean your room? Did you clean your room? Dry. 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 So dry can be used as a verb and as an adjective. When we use it as a verb, it can mean to remove the moisture from something, like when you dry your hair. It can also mean to leave something alone and allow the moisture to leave that thing. For example, I'm waiting for the paint to dry. I'm waiting for the paint to dry. I'm waiting for the paint to dry. Dust. 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 Dust can be used as both a noun and a verb. When we use dust as a noun, it refers to the very, very small pieces of dirt that we find usually in the corners of our homes, or maybe we find it on tops of shelves and so on. I am allergic to dust. I am allergic to dust. I am allergic to dust. Vacuum. 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 Vacuum is both a noun and a verb. When we use vacuum as a verb, it means to use a vacuum cleaner, so a machinery specifically for picking up dust to clean our house. I have to vacuum the hallway before the guests come. I have to vacuum the hallway before the guests come. I have to vacuum the hallway before the guests come. Intersection. 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 
So an intersection refers to a place where two roads meet. The two roads cross. We talk about the middle point of those roads as the intersection. There is traffic in the intersection. There is traffic in the intersection. There is traffic in the intersection. Highway. 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 A highway is a road that sometimes is actually higher than other roads, though not always. Sometimes it's at a regular level. But a highway is generally a place where cars can travel very quickly. Highways are generally outside of cities or they're above cities. Traffic conditions on the highway are normal this morning. Traffic conditions on the highway are normal this morning. Traffic conditions on the highway are normal this morning. Road. 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 So road is a very general word that we can apply to many different situations. A highway is a type of road. You can imagine a path in the park is kind of like a small road. Your everyday city streets we can call roads as well. So basically anything that you use to travel, usually with a car or maybe with a bicycle, is something we can call a road. There is ice on the road. There is ice on the road. There is ice on the road. Street. 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 So we use streets as a way to organize our cities. So we often use street and road interchangeably. So we tend to use street when we're talking maybe about cities or in neighborhood situations. Let's cross the street. Let's cross the street. Let's cross the street. Interesting. 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 Interesting is an adjective. We use interesting to describe something that we find cool or something that sparks our curiosity, something that is exciting to us. The title of the book seemed interesting. The title of the book seemed interesting. The title of the book seemed interesting. Mean. 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 We use the word mean to describe someone who is unkind. Someone who is mean is not nice to other people. Some people are just mean and don't want others to be happy. Some people are just mean and don't want others to be happy. Some people are just mean and don't want others to be happy. Bored. 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 So bored is used to talk about your own feelings. When there's nothing to do or you don't feel excited or you don't feel interested in something, you can describe that feeling with bored. Remember, when you want to talk about something outside you that doesn't cause you to feel interested, you describe that thing as boring. Your emotions, bored. I'm bored. I'm bored. I'm bored. 700. 700. 700. When you're counting numbers by hundreds, just put the base number before 100. In this case, 7 plus 100 makes 700. This statue is 700 years old. This statue is 700 years old. This statue is 700 years old. 800. 800. 800. So just like the last example, 800 refers to eight hundreds of something. The field is 800 hectares. The field is 800 hectares. The field is 800 hectares. 200. 200. 200. 
So again, when you're counting by hundreds, simply put the number before the word hundred. So two hundred refers to two one hundreds of something. We have over two hundred books here. We have over two hundred books here. We have over two hundred books here. Three hundred. Three hundred. Three hundred. Again, the latest example: three plus hundred refers to three one hundredths of something. You can see that in English we don't make a change to the number that comes before hundred. In some languages, your number that you use to count hundreds may change according to the sound or according to the spelling of the word. In English, we do not need to change this base number. This school has three hundred students. This school has three hundred students. This school has three hundred students. Six hundred. Six hundred. Six hundred. Our final example of hundreds today is six hundred. So again, six comes before the word hundred to refer to six one hundredths of something. Six times one hundred equals six hundred. Six times one hundred equals six hundred. Six times one hundred equals six hundred. Well done! In this lesson, you expanded your vocabulary and learned twenty new useful words. Click the link in the description and sign up for free at EnglishClass101.com to get access to the full list of vocabulary you need for daily life conversations. You'll also get example sentences, custom flashcard decks, and more learning resources. See you next time. Bye. In this video, you'll learn 20 of the most common words and phrases in English. Hi, everybody. My name is Alicia. Welcome to the 800 Core English Words and Phrases video series. This series will teach you the 800 most common words and phrases in English. But there's a twist: with each new lesson in this series, we'll include the previous lessons at the end. So after you've learned the new words and phrases, stick around and review what you learned in previous lessons. Reviewing is one of the most important parts of learning a language. You can also get the full list right now at EnglishClass101.com. Click the link in the description to access more example sentences, create your own flashcard deck, and finally master English. Okay, let's get started. First is can. 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 So can is used to mean something we are able to do. Can jump over. Can jump over. Can jump over. Zero. 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 So zero is used to refer to the number, which means nothing. So we also read this as o sometimes. Number zero. Number zero. Number zero. One. 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 So one means the first number. So we use it any time there's a single number of something. One degree. One degree. One degree. Two. 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 So two is the second number. We use it to talk about pairs or couples of things. The number two is my favorite number. The number two is my favorite number. The number two is my favorite number. Three. 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 So the third number in English is the number three. Three dollars. Three dollars. Three dollars. Four. 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 So the fourth number in English is the number four. Keep in mind that the spelling is different from f o r, which means a purpose. Number four. 
Number four. Number four. Five. 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 So the next number is the number five. The starfish has five legs. The starfish has five legs. The starfish has five legs. Six. 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 So the next number in our sequence is the number six. We have a six day vacation next month. We have a six day vacation next month. We have a six day vacation next month. Seven. 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 So the next number in this sequence is the number seven. There are seven days in every week. There are seven days in every week. There are seven days in every week. Eight. 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 So the next number is the number H. This has an interesting spelling. It's pronounced eight. Eight is a lucky number. Eight is a lucky number. Eight is a lucky number. Nine. 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 So the next number in this series is the number nine. Nine floors. Nine floors. Nine floors. Ten. 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 So ten is the first double digit number. That means there are two digits, one and zero. Ten grams. Ten grams. Ten grams. Salesman. 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 So a salesman is a male, a man who sells things. Car salesman. Car salesman. Car salesman. Manager. 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 So a manager is a person at a workplace that is responsible for other people. Department manager. Department manager. Department manager. Cook. 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 So a cook is a person who makes food. A cook is different from a chef in that a chef went to school. A cook has their experience on the job. The cook fried an egg. The cook fried an egg. The cook fried an egg. Engineer. 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 So an engineer is a technology-related job. An engineer can create things in many different industries. I'm an engineer. I'm an engineer. I am an engineer. Programmer. 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 So a programmer is a person who writes or who creates programs. I am a computer programmer. I'm a computer programmer. I am a computer programmer. Nurse. 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 So a nurse is someone who works at a hospital or a clinic or at like a nursing home. So they help patients. The woman is a nurse. The woman is a nurse. The woman is a nurse. Body. 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 
So a body can be a human body. It's just your actual body, all of your different parts. We can also use this for animals too. Food is fuel for the body. Food is fuel for the body. Food is fuel for the body. Head. 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 So head refers to this part of your body, the very top part of your body. Head injuries are very dangerous. Head injuries are very dangerous. Head injuries are very dangerous. Well done. In this lesson, you expanded your vocabulary and learned 20 new useful words. Click the link in the description and sign up for free at EnglishClass101.com to get access to the full list of vocabulary you'll need for daily life conversations. You'll also get example sentences, custom flashcard decks, and more learning resources. See you next time. Bye-bye. Hey everyone, I'm Alicia. Halloween is a time for celebration in the USA. It's become the second most popular holiday in the nation over the years. Halloween is known for its oftentimes scary costumes, elaborate parties and events, horror film festivals, and its many gothic trappings. This holiday was a latecomer to the US, not really becoming popular until the early 20th century. Today, it's one of the most anticipated holidays in the USA. Halloween is very much associated with scary costumes and things that are wonderfully creepy. Do you know what holiday dressing up in scary costumes was likely borrowed from? We'll show you the answer at the end of this video. People in the USA typically carve pumpkins into scary jack-o'-lanterns, decorate their houses to look as creepy as possible, and wear elaborate costumes to celebrate this holiday. These aspects of Halloween, according to some, have their roots in various Celtic and European myths, legends, and cultural traditions. Today, popular horror films have also influenced the cultural traditions that surround Halloween. The monster movies of the early 20th century are significant contributors to the look and feel of modern Halloween celebrations in the USA. Trick-or-treating started at the beginning of the 20th century to curb the vandalism and destruction that once characterized this holiday in the USA. Today, Halloween is a night when the streets are full of families getting treats from their neighbors, and vandalism and other problems are rare. Some families and social groups set up elaborate haunted houses and invite people to go through for free or for a donation. Hay rides and other nighttime events are also very popular in rural areas. Check the local theaters and TV stations around Halloween and you'll find plenty of scary stuff to watch, too. Over the years, Halloween costumes in the USA have become more varied. Some people, particularly younger participants, forego the dark gothic theme of the holiday and dress up as characters from adventure movies, literary figures, or even historical figures. And now, here's the answer to the quiz. Do you know what holiday dressing up in scary costumes was likely borrowed from? Samhain is considered to be a significant influence on Halloween celebrations, though this is disputed by some scholars. Samhain was, and still is to some extent, celebrated in Scotland and Ireland. It's associated with the final harvest of the year more than it is with scary ghouls and goblins, though spirits do play a part. The dressing up was originally done to scare malicious spirits away or to trick them into thinking that you were one of them to avoid harm. How was this lesson? Did you learn something interesting? Is Halloween celebrated in your country? If so, how? Please leave a comment at EnglishClass101.com. Until next time! How are your English listening skills? First, you'll see an image and hear a question. Next comes a short dialogue. Listen carefully and see if you can answer correctly. We'll show you the answer at the end. A man and a woman are talking about printers in the office. Where is the old printer? Where should we put the new printer? Hmm. I think we should put it where the old printer is now. But the old one still works. We're going to keep using it. Okay, so we can't put the new one there. 
It's too bad. It would be nice to have the new one in the bookshelf next to the door, but there's only room for one printer there. Okay then, I think we should put it on the other side of the room. Right. How about next to the window? That sounds good. Where is the old printer? A man and a woman are talking about printers in the office. Where is the old printer? Where should we put the new printer? Hmm, I think we should put it where the old printer is now. But the old one still works. We're going to keep using it. Okay, so we can't put the new one there. It's too bad. It would be nice to have the new one in the bookshelf next to the door, but there's only room for one printer there. Okay then, I think we should put it on the other side of the room. Right. How about next to the window? That sounds good. Did you get it right? I hope you learned something from this quiz. Let us know if you have any questions. See you next time. Did you download your free PDF cheat sheets yet? These conversation cheat sheets are an easy way to speak more because you get cheat sheets for conversational topics like the weather, family, hobbies, and much more. And inside, you'll learn common questions and answers that you'd use in conversations, as well as tons of vocabulary. Don't miss out on this free gift. Click the link in the description to get access. You should learn how to whistle. Advice. I just gave you some advice. Let's go. Hi, everybody, and welcome back to Top Words. My name is Alicia, and today we're going to be talking about 10 ways to give advice. So let's get started. I think you should. The first expression is, I think you should, blah, blah, blah. I think you should is a very neutral, not so strong, not so weak way to give advice. I think you should get a different haircut. I think you should find a new job. I think you should give me all your money. <laughs> well, can't hurt. I think you should is a very typical uh, way to give advice or just I think is okay or you should is okay too. In this sentence, I think you should find a new apartment. Why don't you? The second expression is why don't you blah blah blah. So uh, it uses the negative, why don't you? So that means it's a bit softer, it's a bit more of a weak way to give advice. So why don't you uh, take a day off? Or why don't you help me with my homework? <laughs> uh, that's sort of a sneaky way to give advice and ask for help at the same time. Why don't you, um, I don't know, find a new hobby, for example. So these are kind of uh, weak ways to give advice. In this sentence, why don't you get a pet? Have you thought about, have you thought about blah, blah, blah. So have you thought about, it sounds, it's, you're giving your advice, but this is a question for the listener. So have you thought about blah, blah, blah. It's, you're, you're sharing your opinion, but you're kind of making it sound like uh, maybe it was the listener's idea, or maybe the listener has thought of this thing before. So this is also a fairly soft way to give advice. So like, have you thought about going to a different city? Have you thought about moving in with your friends? Something like that. So these, these are probably going to be um, questions that are a little bit more serious. Like I don't feel like we would use this for really casual or really light questions, but maybe for something a little more serious and a soft way to give advice. In this sentence, uh, have you thought about looking for a new job? I don't know if is a good idea. So this is um, kind of a negative way to give advice or to share your opinion. It's I don't know if blah 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 is a good idea. So um, you're, you're giving someone advice not to do something. So for example, I don't know if getting a pet is a good idea or I don't know if starting a new project is a good idea. These are different ways that you can say uh, you don't think uh, or you think that the other person should not do something, but this is a soft way to express it. In this sentence, I don't know if taking a year off work is a good idea. Maybe you should try. 
The next one is a suggestion to try something. So this is a soft but kind of encouraging expression. Maybe you should try blah blah blah. Maybe you should try blah blah. So、uh, you are encouraging someone to attempt something, to try something.、Uh, maybe not forever, but just for a short period of time. So maybe you should try volleyball. Maybe you should try playing sports. Maybe you should try、uh, spicy food. Maybe you should try something. So it's encouragement to do something new. This is kind of positive, but it's a fairly soft way to give your advice. Here,、uh, maybe you should try studying a new skill. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. Blah blah blah. So again, we have this negative. I wouldn't. I would not. Meaning, and I think we'll talk about this later.、Uh, in my case, if this were my decision, I would not. Blah blah blah. So, for example, I wouldn't buy a new car if I were unemployed. I wouldn't eat spicy food if、uh, my stomach were very sensitive. For example, in this case, I wouldn't worry too much about it. If I were you, I would. If I were you, I would. So, in the previous expression, we used the negative "I wouldn't," but in this expression, we have the positive "If I were you." I would blah blah blah. So if I were you, which I'm not, but if I were you, this is what I would do. So this is my recommendation. So if I were you, I would study every day. If I were you, I would try to get enough sleep. If I were you, I would cook dinner every day. In this sentence, if I were you, I would look for a new car. Have you tried? The next expression. This is very similar to、uh, "Have you thought about?" Blah blah blah.、Um, so again, it's a question for the listener, and it's a suggestion for the listener. Kind of soft advice. So, have you tried? Blah blah blah. Have you tried something?、Um, so this is something you can use to make a suggestion that people should try. So, have you tried wearing glasses? Have you tried getting contacts? Have you tried? Uh, talking to your boss? Oh, actually, that's a sentence. Yeah, have you tried talking to your boss about the problem? It's a small encouragement in that way.、Mm. My advice is to. My advice is to blah blah blah. So this one is a very clear advice statement. My advice is to something. So is to, and then there's some、uh, some action you recommend for the listener. So my advice is to stop eating sweets.、Uh, my advice is to take a trip or take a vacation. My advice is to get a dog. Here we are with the dogs again. <laughs> I don't know.、Um, in this sentence, my advice is to get some sleep. So this is just a very clear, very simple advice phrase. You ought to.、Uh, the next expression is you ought to. You ought to. So ought to means should. Uh, but ought to. It sounds more formal, more polite. It's not used as commonly as others.、Um, but actually, we use the contracted form oughta. So ought to, just like want to, can be contracted to oughta.、Uh, so you oughta blah blah blah. You should do something. So you oughta give your new coworkers a try. They're nice. Or you oughta get a new car. You oughta get a new haircut. You oughta. Uh, go on a diet, for example. So, this one is not used quite as often as the other expressions, but you may hear it from time to time. It sounds more formal, sounds more polite. In most cases, you should is perfectly fine, but you might hear you ought to or you ought to. In this sentence, you ought to think about your goals for the future. Ah, that's the end. Okay, so those are ten ways that you can give advice to people. If there's a different way that you have tried to give advice, or if you have any questions about how to give advice, please be sure to leave us a comment and let us know about it. Thanks very much for watching this video, and if you liked it, please be sure to hit the thumbs up button. If you haven't subscribed to the channel, please make sure to subscribe to us too, so you don't miss out on anything. Thanks very much for watching this episode of Top Words, and we'll see you again soon. Bye. Me, what do I use the most? I think. I use you should the most, like, or I think you should. I think you should blah blah blah,、um, and I think I use why don't you. I prefer kind of softer 
ways to give advice, like why don't you blah blah blah, or or I use why don't you just as well. Like just, I feel like gives a little simpler. It sounds like your suggestion is very simple. Like oh, why don't you just send it to me in an email, or why don't you just. Drink a beer with me. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it sounds like a really like it simplifies this. It sounds like using just makes it sound like my suggestion is a really small thing to do. It, using just sounds like oh, it's no big deal. You can do it. So like, eh, why don't you just take a day off? You know, so something like that. So I think you should, and why don't you? I think I use those the most. Hi everybody, my name is Alicia. Today I'm going to talk about if clauses. So if clauses are used in a variety of different sentence patterns, we use them to do a variety of different things as well. So today I'm going to give kind of an introduction into a few cases where you can use if clauses. So let's get started. Okay, first um, I want to introduce two basic patterns for using if clauses. Um, if clauses can come at the beginning of a sentence and can be followed by a main clause. I'll explain this a little more later. So we can begin with an if statement and end with a main statement, or the opposite is also possible. First, a main clause followed by the if clause. Both are okay. Um, a few things I want to talk about today are um, how to use some of these sentences, we can use if clause sentences, these kinds of patterns, for making plans uh, and planning questions. So by this I mean uh, questions about plans. Uh, and all of these uh, include a specific condition introduced by the if statement. So I'll explain a little more in just a moment. So we can use these for making plans, talking about plans, asking questions about plans. We can use these for talking about our future activities, uh, so potential activities in the future. Uh, we can use it for talking about past potential, so things uh, different in the past, an action done differently in the past, and the potential different outcome in the future. This is a very complex grammar point, I think, but this is very, very useful. Okay. Finally, we can use them uh, to talk about advice and to give recommendations as well, uh, to ask for and give recommendations, actually. So this is a very, very useful uh, kind of sentence, and I want to share a couple ways that you can use these, as well as a couple uh, grammar points inside the sentences, especially in the main clause um, that I hope you can use to make these kinds of statements and to make these kinds of questions. So let's take a look. Okay, first I want to look at if clauses. Uh, so if clauses, they begin with this if statement. Um, so we use an if clause to express a condition. A condition meaning uh, some possibility or some potential. So for example, if it's sunny tomorrow, if it's sunny tomorrow, if the weather is sunny tomorrow, blah, blah, blah. So we use if at the beginning of the if clause to introduce our condition. That's going to lead us into the main clause. So in our main clause, the main clause can express a result, a potential result. It can express a recommendation. It can express a question. So there are a lot of different things we can do with the main clause and a lot of different types of grammar we can use. So I want to look at a few examples here. Let's look at this first sentence, which I already talked about, this one. If it's sunny tomorrow, for example, I'll go to the beach, I'll go to the beach. Here I have my if expression, my if clause, the condition is the weather. If it's sunny tomorrow, I have here, I'll go to the beach. You'll note that I've used I'll, I will, because in this case, it sounds like the speaker has just made the decision. Maybe you've seen the video we did about the difference between will and going to. So when we use will, it's often used uh, in times when we've just made a decision during the conversation. So here, if it's sunny tomorrow, I'll go to the beach. Please be careful, however, uh, do not use will in this sentence, in this part of the sentence. For example, some people say, 
uh, if it will be sunny tomorrow, it's not correct. We cannot use will here. We need to use will in the main clause. If it's sunny, I'll go to the beach. Please be cautious here. So meaning this sentence means if the weather is nice tomorrow, uh, my plan, I just decided, is to go to the beach. Let's look at one more sentence that is similar. If you pass the test, here is my condition. If you pass the test, here, you'll get a certification. You'll get. So once more, you can see I've used will here in the contracted form. You will get a certification if you pass the test. So keep in mind, as I said before, we can uh, swap. We can um, reverse the sentence patterns and the sentence meaning remains the same. So just please be careful. If you're using will, make sure it's in your main clause, not in your if clause. Let's take a look at something a little bit different. Here I have, if we got approval for the project, if we got, so here you'll see, uh, it's not the present tense, if we got approval for the project, uh, this is the past participle form here. Uh, if I got approval, or sorry, if we got approval for the project, we would begin on Monday. So this is a potential situation. This is a situation, you can see I've used the past participle here and would in the main clause. By changing the tense of my verb, I change the uh, potential of the situation. This is a, a sentence we might use when making a proposal. So if we got approval for the project, in the future, in theory, so meaning in possibility, this is not a certain, it's not in my control now, but if this were the case, if I got the approval for the project, I would, we would begin on Monday. This is a future potential situation, something that is potentially, uh, I'm potentially capable or we are potentially able to do, but it has not been decided yet. In these cases, we need to use would in the main clause. Um, okay, so let's take a look at the next sentence here, similar to the previous sentence I talked about. Um, so the sentence, the if clause here is, if I hired you for the job, you can see the verb here is also different as we talked about in the previous sentence. If I hired you for the job, you would get $50,000 a year. So once more, this is a future potential sentence. And we know that because of the verbs that are chosen. If I hired you, we use the past participle here, we need to apply would uh, in the main clause to show the future potential of this situation. So please be careful. Um, we've talked about two types of if clause statements now. Um, let's go to one more, yet one more example of how to use this grammar. This is a past potential and a, and a resulting possible outcome from a past situation. So let's look at the if clause first. So if they had left the house earlier, they would have been on time. So here once more, you can see I've got if they had left the house earlier. Uh, if they had left, I've got had here. Uh, so I've, we, we need to use have or had uh, in the past tense here plus the verb and then again we use this would have been on time. We have uh, created a more complex grammar sentence. This shows if something had been different in the past, a different outcome would have resulted. We need to use would plus our have been, for example, in this case. Let's take a look at one more sentence. If I had studied a little more, here's our verb phrase, if I had studied, so I did not study very much, if I had studied a little more, I would have passed the test. Here I've mentioned too, might is also possible. Maybe the speaker doesn't know for sure the definite outcome in this case. So we can use would to express certainty, might to express a lower level of certainty. I might have passed the test, I would have passed the test. And again, we have the verb have 
and in this case, pass, passed the test as well. So you can see the grammar becomes progressively more complex in these situations. The last ones I want to talk about, just two more, are uh, recommendations and questions. So you can use an if clause to introduce your condition, like if you go to Paris, for example. Here, in your main clause, you can give a recommendation, like you should, in this case I've used should, you should visit the Louvre, or go to the Louvre, or try some food, something like that. You can use a recommendation expression in your main clause here. The final thing I want to talk about is uh, making a question in your main clause. For example, if it rains this weekend, what do you want to do? So this is a situation where you're looking for the listener's opinion. What do you want to do? You can use an expression like a question. What do you want to do? What do you think we should do in your main clause to do that? Okay, so those are a few different ways that you can use if clauses uh, to create a variety of different expressions and different statements. So we've talked about quickly about a few examples of each of these, so give them a try. Uh, if you liked this video, please make sure to hit the thumbs up button and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. If you want to try out a few of these uh, sentences, please feel free to do so in the comment section. Check us out at EnglishClass101.com for more good stuff as well. Thanks very much for watching this episode, and I will see you again soon. Bye! Hi everybody, and welcome back to Top Words. My name is Alicia, and today we're going to be talking about 10 ways to invite someone to something. So, let's go! Do you want to? The first way to invite someone to something is with the phrase, do you want to? So, do you want to plus some activity. Do you want to go to the beach? Do you want to see a movie? Do you want to go puppy shopping? Do you want to make a sandcastle? These are all invitations to do something. So, in a sentence, a different sentence, do you want to get lunch on Saturday? Ah, that's a good point. Want to. To make want to sound more natural, uh, contract it to wanna. Do you wanna do something? So, do you want to get lunch on Saturday? Nice. Are you free? Are you free? Blah, blah, blah. Where here is a, a time period. So, for example, are you free this weekend? Or are you free tonight? Are you free later? So, asking someone about their free time in the future. This is an introduction to an invitation. So, in a sentence, uh, are you free for dinner tomorrow night? Do you want to come to? Do you want to come to? Do you, again, shortening want to to wanna. Do you want to come to blah, blah, blah. So, it's some activity you go to or you come to. You need to physically move your body to participate in this activity. So, for example, do you want to come to my house later? Do you want to come to my friend's birthday party? Do you want to come to a movie at the neighborhood movie theater, for example? So, something that you need to move to do. Um, but maybe when you make this invitation, you, the speaker, you should be close to that activity or you should know, you should have a connection with that activity. It sounds like you're inviting the listener to something close to you, something you know about. So, in an example sentence, uh, do you want to come to a concert with me? So, the speaker knows about the concert. Do you want to come to a concert with me? You can say, do you want to go to a concert with me also. In that case, it's okay. Are you doing anything? Are you doing anything? So again, are you doing anything plus a time frame or uh, maybe a meal as well is good after this expression. So, are you doing anything after work? Are you doing anything for brunch tomorrow? Are you doing anything this summer? You can ask about someone's future plans with, are you doing anything? And the answer to this question should be yes or no. Are you doing anything later? No. Are you doing anything later? Yeah, I have some plans. So, um, it's a yes or no question, but when you reply to this question, uh, if it's yes, you can give some information about your plans. If it's no, you can say maybe, uh, no, do you have something in mind? But anyway, in a sentence uh, to invite someone with this expression, you could say, are you doing anything for dinner? Uh, or are you doing anything this weekend?
That's another nice expression you can use. What are you up to? The next one is what are you up to plus a day or what are you up to plus a time period? So for example, uh, what are you up to this weekend? So what are you up to is a casual expression for what are you doing or what are your plans? What are you up to? Again, what are becomes what are. Uh, contract that to make it sound more natural. What are you up to uh, this evening, for example? Uh, in another example sentence, what are you up to on Friday night? Come with me. The next expression is come blah 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 with me. So here uh, this uh, space, come do something with me, is a noun phrase. Come to a movie with me. Come fishing with me. Come uh, to a concert with me. So some activity um, the speaker uh, is inviting you to join to. It's uh, a stronger invitation. They use the command form, come blah 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 with me. It's a command form phrase. So for example, uh, come to the beach with me next week. It's a very strong suggestion. Why don't we, why don't we blah blah blah. This is a really soft way to invite someone to something. So why don't we? It uses the negative don't. It's, so that softens the expression even more. So why don't we, uh, why don't we take a vacation next week? Or why don't we uh, study tomorrow night? Uh, why don't we buy a puppy? Another example sentence, why don't we have coffee tomorrow? Wanna grab? wanna grab. So here it says wanna, which is the short form of want to. And then grab. So grab, the image of grab, uh, or like the nuance of grab, is uh, something you can uh, hold in your hand. So grab is like to quickly take something. So um, the image with this expression is maybe uh, an activity that takes a short time and that's not so serious. So we usually use wanna grab blah 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 for food or drink. Kind of has like a light, friendly, casual feeling about it. So for example, wanna grab a coffee? Or wanna grab a drink? Wanna grab lunch later? Um, you wouldn't use it for a more serious expression. Like you would not say, wanna grab a movie. Like you can't like grab, you can't hold a movie so it sounds a little unnatural. But you can hold a coffee or a beer or a glass of wine. Something um, kind of small, something, it's a very light casual expression here. So in an example sentence, uh, wanna grab a beer after work? Yes I do. Some small things that you're preparing like for a party or an event, like let's grab some forks, let's grab some knives, let's grab some wine to prepare for an event. You can use it, that's a great point. How about we, how about we, how about we blah blah blah. So how about we watch a movie later? How about we have a picnic? How about we buy a boat? How about we make a cake? All right, so in a different sentence, how about we see a movie later? We should get together sometime. You can use this expression just by itself. It's we should get together sometime. This is sort of a vague expression. It's kind of uh, an expression you don't have a specific plan, but you're making a suggestion to the other person. We should get together sometime. When you're free, when I'm free, we should get together to do an activity. So you could say, for example, I haven't seen you in ages. We should get together sometime. You can use this expression just to show you want to catch up with someone uh, that maybe you haven't seen for a long time. That's the end. So those are 10 phrases that you can use to invite someone to something. They're very useful. If there's anything that you like to use or if you have any questions about a way to invite someone to something, please leave it in a comment so we can check it out. Thanks very much for watching this episode of Top Words. If you liked this video, please make sure to hit the thumbs up button and also subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed already. Thanks very much for watching this episode and we'll see you again soon. Bye. I'm talking about puppies a lot. Puppies are always good. Why don't we buy a puppy? Because responsibility. <laughs> Hi everybody, my name is Alicia and today we're gonna be talking about the top 25 English verbs by frequency. So let's get into it.
Be is the first English verb. Be refers to existence. I want to be an astronaut. I think you would be a great person for this job. Be yourself. Let's be friends. I could have been a writer if I wanted to be. The next verb is have. I have a dog. I have an idea. What do you have? How many do you have? How much money do you have? Do you have any friends? <laughs> How have you been? Have you seen my mom? I can't find her. Have yourself a merry little Christmas. The next verb is do. Do you want some pizza? Do you have a dog? Do I do want to give any dip to do? Do be do be do if you're Frank Sinatra. I do the things that you do better. <laughs> say, 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 say what you want. Say my name, say my name. Say you love me. Do you know what I'm saying? Know what I'm saying? The next verb is get. Get a life. Get a job. Get a haircut. Get a better suit. Steven, <laughs> what you got? I could have gotten a pony, but I went with a lizard instead. I'm getting tired. That's not true. The next verb is make. Make a cake. Make your mother proud. Someone outside is making a strange face at me through the window at the moment. That is a true story. <laughs> make a living through legitimate means. The next verb is go. Go big or go home. I'm going to the beach. You should go to the beach. You should go to the forest. <laughs> go to a baseball game with me. Past tense of go is went. I went spelunking on my holiday. <laughs> the next word is no. This is an interesting word because no is actually not commonly used in the progressive tense. No is commonly used in present tense uh, to refer to your mental state or your emotional state. So we don't really say I am knowing really, but we can say I, I know. I know the answer. What do you know about this issue? He couldn't have possibly known the location of the treasure. How many people do you know? I knew it. <laughs> the next verb is take. Take a cake. <laughs> take a break. Take yourself to bed. You should take a vacation. Have you ever taken a bath? The next word is see. We'll see. I'll see you later. Uh, the next verb is come. Come is the next verb. Please come to my house. Come to a party. I'm gonna come over to your place later. The next word is think. Think. I think you're great. He thinks pizza is the best food. I'm thinking about lunch. I'm thinking about coffee. What are you thinking about? I've been thinking about something. That's a Hanson song. Uh, have you ever thought about the meaning of life? Look, look is the next verb. Please look at the camera. Look over there, look over here. Look, a dog. Look at your mom. Oh my gosh, would you look at that? Look at the time. <gasps> look, it's a bird, it's a plane, it's actually a bird. <laughs> look at that. <laughs> is it me you're looking for? Hello. Next word is want. Want. What do you want? I want food. How many coffees have you ever wanted? I wanted to go to the dry cleaners this morning, but I ran out of time. That's true. The next verb is give. Give me a break. I'm going to give you a raise, Stevens. I'm giving you the axe. Fired. Give me a break. Give me a break. Break me off these like a cat bar. I have given you everything I have. Go on to Mordor, Frodo. I could have given you the world, and instead I gave you a carpet. Use is the next word. Use. Don't use a pen. I like using chocolate when I make food. <laughs> Are you using me for my brain? Next is find. We could have found buried treasure last weekend. I'm finding Nemo. <laughs> find things on the internet with Google. Find English words and phrases at EnglishClass101.com. Yeah! Tell is the next verb. Tell me a story. Tell me lies. Tell me sweet little lies. Tell me the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I'm told that you are an extremely good opera singer. I'm telling you to leave. Tell lies every day. Don't tell lies. The next word is ask. Ask. Please pronounce this correctly. It is not ax. Many native speakers make this pronunciation mistake and it really bothers me. Ask. Ask me about my collection of rare donut recipes. Ask 
your mom about her life. Why don't you ask your boss to the party? How about you ask your coworker for some advice about this issue? I should have asked for help, but I didn't. The next verb is work. Work is work. I'm working now. Seem, to seem. The weather seems nice today. He seemed a little angry this morning. Feel is the next word, feel. I feel happy. Feelings. How does it feel? Feel, feel. Clap along if you feel like that's what you wanna do. Try, oh my gosh, try is the next word. Oh, I'm trying my best. <laughs> I try every day to work very hard. Have you ever tried ramen? I tried ramen yesterday and it was really good. Do you try to exercise every day? I'm trying to sleep, go away. The next verb is leave, leave, leave me alone. Leave your doors unlocked. Don't leave your doors unlocked. I have never left a hot air balloon without First, taking a picture. <laughs> the next verb is call. Call is the next verb. Give me a call. Please call me later. Call me maybe. Call your mom on her birthday every year. She'll be happy. Call, call. <laughs> if you're a seagull, have you ever called the wrong number? Have you ever called a dog? by another dog's name. <laughs> and that's the end. That was the most fun episode I've ever done, I think. <laughs> so those are 25 English verbs, some very, very common English verbs. Give them a try. We've talked about a lot of different grammar forms and a lot of different ways you can use these verbs. So please practice them. And if you like this video, please be sure to comment. Please, please, please be sure to subscribe to, we'll have a button around here somewhere, maybe many buttons. Uh, so please subscribe to us and check out more content as it becomes available. Thanks very much, and we'll see you again soon. Bye. S surfed. <laughs> Look at that. Do you want to build a snowman? Leave your babies outside of the movie theater. <laughs> Leave your attitude at the door. <laughs> there are a lot of verbs in English. OK, these are just a few. In this video, you'll learn 20 of the most common words and phrases in English. Hi everybody, my name is Alicia. Welcome to the 800 Core English Words and Phrases video series. This series will teach you the 800 most common words and phrases in English. But there's a twist. With each new lesson in this series, we'll include the previous lessons at the end. So after you've learned the new words and phrases, stick around and review what you learned in previous lessons. Reviewing is one of the most important parts of learning a language. You can also get the full list right now at EnglishClass101.com. Click the link in the description to access more example sentences, create your own flashcard deck, and finally master English. Okay, let's get started. First is break. 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 So to break something means to cause it not to function. Or for example, when you break an object, it means you crush it or you destroy it in some way. So you can't use it anymore. I broke one of my plates while washing the dishes. I broke one of my plates while washing the dishes. I broke one of my plates while washing the dishes. Cut. 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 Cut can be used as a noun and as a verb. We can use it to mean to separate two parts of something, with a knife usually, and we can use it to talk about an injury that we receive from something sharp. The boy fell and has a deep cut on his leg. The boy fell and has a deep cut on his leg. The boy fell and has a deep cut on his leg. Sprain. 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 
Sprain is used as a noun and as a verb. As a noun, a sprain refers to a type of muscle injury. If you stretch or tear a small part of the muscle, you get a sprain. As a verb, to sprain refers to causing this type of injury. The athlete sprained his ankle. The athlete sprained his ankle. The athlete sprained his ankle. Microwave oven. Microwave oven. Microwave oven. A microwave oven is also called a microwave. It's a box that we use to heat up food quickly. The most convenient kitchen appliance is the microwave oven. The most convenient kitchen appliance is the microwave oven. The most convenient kitchen appliance is the microwave oven. Refrigerator. 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 A refrigerator is like a very large cold box that we use to store foods and drinks. Refrigerator is a very, very long word, so we usually say fridge. The refrigerator is full of food for the holiday. The refrigerator is full of food for the holiday. The refrigerator is full of food for the holiday. Vacuum cleaner. Vacuum cleaner. Vacuum cleaner. A vacuum cleaner is a machine we use to clean our floors. We usually use vacuum cleaners to clean carpets. So a vacuum cleaner is typically very, very noisy and we push it to clean our house. This vacuum cleaner is very quiet. This vacuum cleaner is very quiet. This vacuum cleaner is very quiet. Sweat. 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 Sweat is both a noun and a verb. Sweat, as a noun, is the liquid that comes out of your body when you feel very hot, like when you exercise or when the temperature is hot. To sweat means for your body to go through the process of creating sweat. The athletes were covered in sweat after the game. The athletes were covered in sweat after the game. The athletes were covered in sweat after the game. Check in. Check in. Check in. Check in is a very common phrasal verb. We use it at hotels and at the airport to mean you announce your arrival to a person who works there. It's like you are showing up for your reservation. I'll check in at 10 p.m. I'll check in at 10 p.m. I'll check in at 10 p.m. Room number. Room number. Room number. A room number is a number assigned to a room where you live or in a hotel room where you're staying. Your room number is 514. Your room number is 514. Your room number is 514. Room key. Room key. Room key. Room key is the word we use specifically for a key you receive for your hotel room. We do not use room key to talk about the key to your house or apartment. This expression is for hotels only. Don't lose your room key. Don't lose your room key. Don't lose your room key. Wake up call. Wake up call. Wake up call. A wake-up call is a phone call that you can arrange for at a hotel. You can ask the front desk to call you at a specific time and wake you up. Hi, I'd like a wake-up call at 15 minutes to 6 in the morning. Hi, I'd like a wake-up call at 15 minutes to 6 in the morning. Hi, I'd like a wake-up call at 15 minutes to 6 in the morning. Check out. 
check out. Check out. When you check out of a location, usually a hotel or perhaps also a supermarket, it means you finish your stay or you finish your transaction. Please check out before 10 a.m. Please check out before 10 a.m. Please check out before 10 a.m. Light. 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 Light can be used as a noun, as an adjective, and as a verb, actually. In this case, we want to focus on light for use in terms of colors and in terms of visuals. So light, in this case, refers to the opposite of dark. Light colors really suit you well. Light colors really suit you well. Light colors really suit you well. Gold. 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 Gold is a material and it's also a color. It is a bright and shiny and very valuable material and when we see it in colors too, it has the same kind of feeling, this kind of luxurious and expensive look. She wears gold eyeshadow. She wears gold eyeshadow. She wears gold eyeshadow. Pink. 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 Pink is a very popular color. Pink in the US is commonly associated with girls. People think of pink as a girl's color. But historically, pink was used for boys and blue was used for girls. It just slowly became the reverse over time. The towel was pink. The towel was pink. The towel was pink. Silver, silver, silver. Like gold, silver is both a color and a material. So silver is quite shiny, but it has a colder color than gold. It can also be very valuable and people like to make jewelry out of silver, just like gold. I think silver looks better on you. I think silver looks better on you. I think silver looks better on you. Beige. 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 Beige is a neutral color. Beige is like tan, but it's a little bit light. Beige is a pale cream color with a yellowish tint. Beige is a pale cream color with a yellowish tint. Beige is a pale cream color with a yellowish tint. Raspberry. 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 A raspberry is a fruit. They are rather small and they can be quite tart. So tart means a little bit sour and a little bit sweet. They have kind of a surprising taste. I'm simply a huge fan of raspberries. I'm simply a huge fan of raspberries. I'm simply a huge fan of raspberries. Cough. 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 Cough is a noun and a verb. As a noun, it refers to a bad health condition. As a verb, to cough means to force the air out of your lungs, usually to try to remove something. She's been coughing all night. She's been coughing all night. She has been coughing all night. Garlic. 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 Garlic is a very popular ingredient in food. It can be used in soups and pizzas and sauces. So many different foods and so many different cuisines around the world love to use garlic. It has a very strong smell and a very strong taste. So you might smell like garlic even after you eat it. Cheese and garlic are always good on pizza. Cheese and garlic are always good on pizza. Cheese and garlic are always good on pizza.
Well done! In this lesson, you expanded your vocabulary and learned 20 new useful words. Click the link in the description to sign up for free at EnglishClass101.com and get access to the full list of vocabulary you'll need for daily life conversations. You'll also get example sentences, custom flashcard decks, and more learning resources. See you next time! Bye! Hi everybody! Welcome back to English Topics! I'm joined again today by... I'm Davey. Hi, Davy, and today we're going to be talking about American accents. These are different American accents that you will hear in TV, in movies, and if you visit the USA, perhaps in different regions as well. So we're going to share and try our best to <laughs> share what these accents might sound like, but forgive us in advance if it's not perfect. Anyway, let's begin. You want to start us off? Uh, all right, sure. Okay. Uh, well, I guess I'll go in alphabetical order. And my first one is Boston. I, a nice Boston accent is a sort of classic, uh, strong American accent. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're really famous. The famous thing that Boston, the Boston accent does is it drops the rhotic R, that R that follows a vowel. So the classic example is if you have a car, you park your car in Harvard Yard, but you don't say it that way. So you park your car in Harvard Yard. That's the that's the classic Boston example, and that's probably all I can do of that accent. Oh, I've got another one um, that my mom used to use for the Boston accent okay. that has the same thing. Let's hear it. Uh, which was, uh, let's go up to Thorny Thod and Thod Street and listen to the Boyd's Choy. Sure. <laughs> it's like that uh, that R sound. Uh -huh. It's it totally it's totally different from the way that we're speaking now. Yes. So, but it's hard. I think if you're not expecting that. No, it's it's a really distinct accent. <laughs> the first accent. time you hear that, it's shocking. And actually, it's interesting because I, I I think a lot of accents in the U.S. and a lot of places are often regional, right? They're for a whole region, and sometimes they're very specific specific to a city. And I think Boston is that case. Mm -hmm. It's very specific to a very kind of small location. Mm -hmm. It's this uh, this city in the Northeast. Yeah. Yeah. You, I think you do see that in uh, movies actually a lot. Definitely. Mm, yes. For sure. It's interesting to me the way that different accents are associated with different like stereotypes of people mm -hmm. in movies and mm -hmm. things like that. So in movies or on, on television, oftentimes that Boston accent is associated with a kind of like tough, no nonsense attitude. Yeah. And I'm sure there are tough, no nonsense people in Boston. But I'm sure there are people that uh, are not so tough and tolerate a lot of nonsense. Uh, that is probably true. Mm -hmm. True anywhere. <laughs> what, do you, what, do you, what do you have for us, Alicia? All right, I, I'm going to choose, uh, I'm going to start where I was born and a uh, place that uh, I love to make fun of all the time, uh, the Californian accent. I say the Californian accent, but there's not just one. Mm. Um, so there may, maybe my favorite accent to make fun of is what's called the Valley Girl accent. The Valley Girl accent is known for making all statements sound like a question and having a very whiny um, manner of speech. Um, there's also this sort of weird thing that seems to be um, not specific, but very common in speech among uh, young women, particularly from California. And that's something called vocal fry, mm -hmm. um, where women uh, will like drop the pitch of their voice in order to, well, just to kind of create a different manner of speech. There are a variety of reasons why people do that. And I didn't actually know, but I do it. Uh, I just grew up talking that way, though. It never occurred to me I should use this kind of speech in a certain, like, situation. It right. just I just grew up speaking that way. But uh, in recent years, vocal fry has been uh, the subject of discussion mm -hmm. in uh, some things I've read. But anyway, uh, so a typical California Valley girl, if I can give an example, is Please. like, um, today I was going to work, oh, yeah. and I saw this guy, and he was like, really, really scary, and I didn't know what to do. Oh, no. so they have what this, did you do? So they have this very like whiny way of sharing stories and explaining things. Um, in not, and actually, in that series of example questions, or sorry, in that series of statements, nothing I said was a question. No. But everything had that upward intonation. So those are a few things that are kind of characteristic, um, sort of characteristics among women. Mm -hmm. Uh, this way. But men, on the other hand, there's this image of the surfer dude mm. from California. And it's typically like young men who speak this way. And they'll be like, yeah, bro, what's up? Like, 
let's head to the beach sort of thing. This very, how would you describe that? It's like, it's, it's like if you could imagine your voice being relaxed and yet rough at the same time. Sure. That's kind of what it sounds like. Do you ever like to make fun of Californians in the way they speak? That's uh, my favorite accent to make fun of. Uh, well, I don't like to make fun of accents as a rule, Alicia. No? No, I do. Well, uh, I should say to mimic. To mimic. It's fun. It's, it's my favorite accent to mimic, It I is think. a fun accent to mimic. And maybe this, I, I think this accent as, uh, as well has certain uh, associations with it. Maybe a lot of people might associate um, stupidity or dumbness with a Californian accent, mm -hmm. which is unfortunate because that's not always the case. Mm -hmm. There are there are dumb people from everywhere, <laughs> not only California. Uh, but this is an accent that uh, mm. we often associate that with, right. which is unfortunate. Right, that's true because of the manner of delivery mm. and also like apparently like right now this is vocal fry. I'm not even thinking about it, but like dropping your voice into there a is. lower register. But apparently people associate that with stupidity, mm. like the people are specifically young women are trying to alter their voice to seem more intelligent or something like that. Right. But I don't even think about it, honestly. So mm. it is quite interesting. But California has a range of accents, mm -hmm. a range of different ways of talking. So that's just one. There you go. Anyway, back to your side of the, the table. Absolutely. We're still in alphabetical order, which okay. uh, I like. And I am going to do a Chicago accent now for you. Uh, Chicago accent, very kind of stereotypical Midwestern accent. I think there is a wider kind of Midwestern accent and the Chicago accent is maybe a, a, a subset of that. It's not just like the wider Midwestern accent, but there's a Chicago accent too. I don't know this accent super well, but I chose this one because uh, it's an accent that I used to see in one of my favorite Saturday, Saturday Night Live sketches when I was a kid, which were the, uh, the, the Bears fans. Mm. The Bears. They're from Chicago, and they love the Chicago Bears. And uh, that's that's the accent. So uh -huh. it kind of just draws out. What does it do? Chicago. Chicago draws out a lot of vowel sounds. A lot of Midwestern accent draws out vowel sounds and makes them a little higher uh, mm. on your palate, I guess. Bears. Da bears. Bears. Yeah. Yeah. Instead of bears. So it's a little bears. more like open and back and, mm. and up with the vowels. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I could not but do a Chicago accent to save my try life. It. Chicago. Chicago. There you go. You're doing it's it. hard. It's really hard. Yeah. It's a nice accent. Mm. I like it. The Chicago accent has associations with like a kind of working class accent. Mm -hmm. um, but maybe that's just right. I don't know. Right. Yeah. That's a good one. But I couldn't. I don't think I could do. It's I a tough one. Do it I, can't, I don't want to try saying much more than Chicago and <laughs> yeah. the Bears. Yeah. Because that's just sort of what, I, what I've heard people Right. It's tough. I uh, do. It's tough. Okay. It's a good one. Okay. I'll go north of that then. All so right. the next one that I prepared um, is I called it Minnesota. So Ooh. Minnesota is a state uh, that is north ish of, of Chicago. Chicago is in uh, Illinois, uh, the state of Illinois. So this is s sort of the same region, but this is further north. So you're heading towards Canada. Uh, so there are a couple of places, uh, like we talked about, Wisconsin is another state that might uh, have a similar accent here. But Minnesota, similar to Chicago, has these very um, drawn out vowel sounds. And um, it's okay. I guess I'll just try and let's let's hear the it. one thing that we all know how to say is like, oh yeah, sure you betcha. Oh sure you betcha. Oh sure. Oh sure. Oh Alicia. Oh. That was a little Irish. That was a little Irish. <laughs> oh. Minnesotan accents. It's it sounds very cheery. Yes, I think I think so too. And that's kind of what throws people off. Um, it's very friendly. I shouldn't say throws people off, but it's like it sounds kind of joyful just on its own mm -hmm. like, so anything you say in like a minnesotan accent it sounds just more happy it, it sounds, sounds very sincere to me ah uh, yeah like if i if i hear a minnesota mom saying oh sure you betcha uh -huh. have some hot dish i like, don't know what hot dish is it's casserole but they say hot dish hot dish uh, okay yeah it's very sincere mm -hmm. and warm and friendly i, I see. think i see yeah very yeah, rounded vowels right accent. but i'm not sure exactly exactly how far this accent goes in the region sure. uh, if it extends into Canada, for example. Like Canada, it, like um, when we talk about a Canadian accent, we use 
words, like ending uh, sentences with e, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Like, oh yeah, Canada, eh? That sort of thing. But the, uh, a lot of Canadian accents differ from American accents too in the vowels, mm -hmm. like rounder, longer vowels. Mm -hmm. Uh, compared to sort of a general American accent. And I think Minnesotan accent, our upper Midwest accents, are towards that end of the spectrum as well. Mm -hmm. So I think Minnesotan accents are, are similar to, to maybe a central Canadian accent. Mm. I think the most famous example <laughs> of a Minnesotan accent is from the movie Fargo, yeah. the Coen Brothers movie, mm -hmm. which is Fargo is not in Minnesota. It's in one of the Dakotas, right? North or South Dakota? North Dakota. Fargo's South in Dakota. South Dakota. One of the Dakotas. Okay. But... That accent is a very classic mm -hmm. kind of Minnesotan accent right. that the characters use. Right, and I was movie. thinking about that too in, in choosing that accent to describe because, and th this is part of the reason why I said it sounds kind of cheerful, mm -hmm. is that that movie, is, it's a suspense movie. It's a, it's a murder mystery. Yes. Uh, but everyone is speaking in this kind of cheerful sounding voice. <laughs> and that really lends, that kind of gives this really kind of strange, mysterious feel to the film. Yes, there's a good contrast there. Uh -huh. I think you're right. I never thought about that, but yeah. I agree with you. Yeah, all right. Anyway, that's a bit about Minnesota. I don't know if it was good or not. But anyway, let's go on to your next sure. one. What do you think? Uh, my last one is Southern accent. And now Southern accents also, there, there is a lot of variety in Southern accents, different uh, states in the South, different parts of those states um, have different Southern accents, but there's also a sort of general Southern accent. Mm -hmm. um, I'm from the South. I grew up in the South, but I do not have a Southern accent. Uh, but I like to try and pick out, when I hear a Southern accent, I like to try and guess mm -hmm. where people are from from hearing their accent. But I'm not always right. Mm -hmm. um, so there's sort of a general Southern accent, and there are pockets of specific kind of accents in the South. And I also think there's a big distinction in Southern accents between like a rural Southern accent mm -hmm. and a more urban or, or, or city Southern accent. Mm -hmm. um, the city accents are a little bit more, so they're softer, a mm -hmm. little more genteel. Mm -hmm. And the uh, rural accents are twangier, I would say. Mm. So for example, a, a gentle Southern accent would be something like, hey y'all, bless your heart, mm -hmm. something like that. Whereas a twangy accent would be, hey y'all, mm. bless your heart. Much sharper. Sharper, a little more uh, throaty, maybe. Okay, okay. But there is a there's a drawl and an elongation and a slowness to a southern accent. Yeah. That I think is very nice. Right, and I think going back to what you mentioned about the Boston accent and the way the R sounds in particular mm -hmm. change, I think that you can hear that with kind of like like you described the more city version mm. of a southern accent. Like I think back to um, like when my grandmother would use the expression she. She would say, oh, lordy. Oh, lordy. As, instead of saying, oh, my God, like yes. that was the southern way of saying lordy. Right. Or that was a way of saying, oh, my God. But she would say, as you just said, oh, lordy. Like the R sound, when we spell that word on paper, it's L-O-R-D-Y. But when she pronounced it, it was like L-A-W-D-Y, mm -hmm. lordy. Mm -hmm. that, was, that was the way she made an O and an R sound, right. too. So it was this very soft uh slow it's a way of slow speaking. accent a lot of the sounds kind of blend together mm -hmm. it's it's a nice i think it's a nice accent most of the time mm -hmm. um, but unfortunately a southern accent also has associations that are generally kind of negative mm -hmm. in other parts of the country a lot of people hear a southern accent and think that a person with a southern accent is maybe uneducated not very smart and again i think that's very unfortunate because that's not always the case i mm -hmm. think that is an unfair stereotype associated sure. with the accent for sure okay then let's i'll go for my last one uh, a bit to the west of mm -hmm. you i suppose though this could probably be blending a little bit with southern accents i feel mm -hmm. uh i chose texas uh for the next accent um so texas borders mexico uh and i would i was thinking about this actually in preparing this card and i was kind of thinking it's interesting that you don't hear more of an influence, uh, at least I should say, at least among like white English speakers in in Texas and in that region, like there's not more of an influence in terms of like the way Spanish speakers mm. talk. But instead, 
The Texas accent, the traditional, I guess, stereotypical Texas accent, sounds much more similar to a Southern accent, mm -hmm. I think. I, I agree. Um, they have what's called the Texas drawl. Mm -hmm. So a drawl is like this continuous style of speaking. It's like this really, well, it's not always slow, but it's like there are no breaks almost between words sometimes, or they're, they're like, kind of rolling the words together. Mm. So we make like clear distinctions, admittedly a little bit exaggerated for this show, but making clear distinctions between words. But in Texan, in Texas accents, you might not hear such a clear distinction. So uh, some kind of maybe famous things that people say in Texan accents, uh, like even the way the state is pronounced, we say Texas, mm -hmm. but uh, Texans might say Texas, Texas. Oh yeah? I don't know. Sure, why not? <laughs> Texas. Texas. Don't mess with Texas. Right? That's better. Sure. I can't do it very well. Texas. Yeah. It's like, it's... it's there's, a, a, there's a cadence to it, mm, uh, which is, is nice. I am struggling to make it, to make that sound. It's Texas. without embarrassing myself. But like, it's like the image that that kind of speech conjures like I think you imagine like a cowboy <laughs> like <laughs> when you hear yeah. somebody who speaks this way it's it's like a big guy too right like a slow kind of maybe actually kind of gentle I have an image of like a slow sort of gentle cowboy it sounds really weird right. but it's just a stereotypical sure. image I think of someone yeah. who speaks I think with the stereo typical Texan accent yes yeah sorry to interrupt mm, no, no. I think that the, the stereotypical southern accent uh, excuse me I think that the stereotypical Texan accent also it inserts a lot of these like glide sounds there's a lot of neat like y and and gliding and blended vowels in there mm. so uh when you say like, don't mess with Texas, don't mess with Texas, mm. you know, you're putting in a little Y to kind of wedge that vowel apart. Right. Get. Instead of get. Instead of get. 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 Yeah. That's a good one then. That sort of Y sound mm -hmm. gets in there. Get up. Y'all. Y'all. Yeah. Y'all there is a in lot there too. There's, there's, the there's some cross, there's some influence with a Southern accent mm -hmm. in Texas as well. It's mm -hmm. a different accent, but the two are often mistaken. They're, mm. they're similar. Yeah, and these are just a few accents, really. There are so many and like some small regional variations as mm, well. Absolutely. So these are just a couple examples of maybe the ones that stood out. But mm -hmm. it's quite, I feel anyway, it's quite difficult to really replicate another accent if you're not used to using it that much. It's true, it's hard. Mm. And I don't know about you, but it, I've been very self-conscious doing all of these. Me too. Um, so hopefully they're accurate. I think we're we're, we're going to just get completely roasted in the comments. Could on be how terrible our accents. Could are. be, but if you want to know more about these accents, I would recommend just do a quick YouTube search mm. to see what people actually sound like using these accents, um, because you know maybe we can do a Boston accent or like a Californian accent, okay, but if you really want to see a good example of someone speaking that way, just do a quick YouTube search and maybe you can find some uh, some better resources, some actual native speaker resources. We often get asked on this channel, what kind of English are we speaking? Uh, people usually ask, is this American English? Is this British English? And the answer is American English. We speak American English on this channel. Uh, both of us are American English speakers, but we have different accents, actually. We sound fairly similar in most so. ways, uh, but... I am from the West Coast. I was born in California, uh, and then I was raised in Oregon, so I have a very mm, West Coast, I suppose, accent, but I think that that has also been influenced here and there right. um, by the people and the accents that I've spent my time around. Um, so it's mostly West Coast, I would say. There's not really one specific region for me. Mm. Right. But how would you define your accent? I would say I have a fairly standard American accent. And so I, I grew up in the South, as I said, but I don't have a Southern accent. When I go home, my family's still all in the South. We're not, I'm not in the South now, but when I go home, some of my Southern accent creeps out. Mm -hmm. And I kind of let it creep out a little bit, honestly, because it helps show people that I'm from there. I mean, accents in a way are like a membership card to, uh, to a community. Uh, and so I let my Southern accent come out a little bit when I'm home. But otherwise, this is my, my normal accent, uh, sort of standard American accent. And a standard American accent is sort of like the newscaster accent. It's the, it's the, the flat, overarching, 
accent that you could find in any part of the country. Mm -hmm. So people from Boston might not have a strong Boston accent. People from California might not have a strong uh, Californian accent. They might have more of a, a standard American accent that you might people might pick up from just watching TV growing mm -hmm. up, which is maybe what happened uh, with me. Mm -hmm. But I also know that I have uh, one interesting thing about accents. We've been talking a lot about pronunciation, but word choice is also a big part of accents. The different words people use for different things. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, in Minnesota, it's hot dish, but mm -hmm. other parts of the country, it's casserole mm -hmm. and things like that. And some of the words that I use that I have in my lexicon, in my vocabulary, my internal vocabulary, mm -hmm. are very New England because my parents are from the East Coast. Uh, and so I say, I, I pronounce uh, your, your mother, or, or excuse me, your, your mother or father's sister mm -hmm. is your aunt. I say aunt. Mm -hmm. How do you say the word F O R? For. Fur. Really? Yeah. Like, I'm going to go to the store for some milk. You say fur. I might say fur if I'm saying it quickly, uh, but I'm more likely to say for, I would say. I think I'm, go I'm going to the store for some milk. I definitely say fur. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So. How do you pronounce K N E W? K N E W? Mm. New. So, yeah, I think I, I say new as well, but I, I've heard some people kind of, they recognize the K sound and make it more of like a new, new sort sure. of sound. Okay. I just say new. New. Like I N U. I knew That's it. That's how I pronounce it. Yeah. Yeah, but like dialects for sure. Yeah, they dialects, are, yeah. They are a huge part of language as well, not just accent. There is one fierce debate that has raged for a long time. Fierce debate means a strong, heated discussion that has raged for a long time, meaning it has continued for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, soda, pop, mm -hmm. Coke, cola. Those four yes. words are used in different regions pop. of the USA. Pop? You left off pop. Or did you say pop? I thought I said pop. Did you say pop? I don't know. <laughs> okay, sorry. I said pop! I ruined it. Yeah. I ruined it. Okay, Take it okay. back. Okay, so soda, pop, Coke, cola. Those four words all mean fizzy carbonated drink. Mm -hmm. When I grew up in California and in Oregon, we used pop. Okay. We used pop. Absolutely not Coke, because in my mind, Coke is a brand, and that is specific to one item only. What did you use? Coke. Coke! Because I'm from the South. No. In the South, people say Coke because no. Coke is a Southern brand. It's from Atlanta. But, but when I moved out of the South and I moved to the West Coast when I was 18, mm -hmm. I relearned, I taught myself to say soda. I started saying soda. Wait, you started saying soda when you moved to the West Coast? Yes. In Growing up in the South, I would go to a restaurant when I was a kid, mm -hmm. you know, with my parents and, what do you want, hon? I'll have a Coke, please. What kind? You know, Sprite. Whatever that, th all of those things are Coke. Any soda was Coke. Mm. Uh, I think that that's changing now. Maybe, mm -hmm. um, maybe more people are saying soda mm -hmm. in the South. Mm -hmm. But I definitely said Coke growing up. Ah. And I changed. I changed to Coke. I think I said pop a lot. Sure. Fun uh, vocab for you for the day. Mm -hmm. If you look at a map, let's say you have a map of the United States, and down here you've got Coke, and over here you've got soda, and over mm -hmm. here you've got pop. Mm -hmm. The border between those zones is an isogloss. What? Isogloss. Isogloss? Yes, an isogloss is the term uh, used to demarcate between regions mm -hmm. based on dialect. Mm, interesting. And that's your that's your word of the day. Though I'm interested that it's it's literally something you could draw a line down. It's not. There's a lot of crossover. Mm. And so you can see isogloss maps. If you just get on Google and you, you Google, you know, United States isogloss maps, mm -hmm. you'll see different maps for different terms and different words. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you'll see quizzes, like these Facebook quizzes kind of things where how do you pronounce this word? What mm. do you call this insect? And so on. And based on how you answer, it's those quizzes are pretty accurate at predicting where you're from. Isogloss is the word I S O. G L O S S. So if you Google isogloss, you know, United States or American isogloss map, something like that, you can find some very interesting images that show you how different words are pronounced or different words that are used for the same thing mm -hmm. in different parts of the country. And the, the lines are not sharp. There's a lot of, of blending and gray area where those lines meet. Interesting. Mm, so maybe if you find an accent that you like, 
and you want to know more about that, you can use one of those. And study an isogloss study map. some isogloss maps. <laughs> you never know. It yeah. sounds interesting. Cool. Thanks for telling. I didn't know about that. That's sure. the first time I'd ever heard of an isogloss map. There I learned you go. Something. Very cool. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I guess we'll wrap it up there. So those are a few accents from the USA. Again, these are not by any means the only accents in the USA. Definitely have a look at, at some other videos online if you want to know more about these accents and definitely check out isogloss maps as Davey recommended to learn a little bit more about each region uh, where different accents are spoken. But I think we'll finish up here for now. Any final thoughts? No! <laughs> I wanted to get a squeeze in an accent, but I couldn't think of a good one for just saying no. We're just no. saying no. No. Y'all right there. Nothing more from me. <laughs> okay, we'll finish up for that one then. All right, thanks as always, everybody, for watching this episode of English Topics. Don't forget to give the video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it. Subscribe to the channel if you have not already. And check us out at EnglishClass101.com for some other study resources. Thanks very much for watching this episode, and we'll see you again next time. Bye-bye. Hi, everybody, and welcome back to Top Words. My name is Alicia, and today we're going to be talking about 10 compliments that you always want to hear. Let's go. I love your cooking. This is my personal favorite compliment. Oh, my God. I love cooking. Like, I'm always posting, like, pictures of things that I cooked on Twitter. I'm just, like, crazy about food. Uh, so this would be a compliment that I would love to get. Like, the ultimate compliment for me, though, would be, will you make my birthday cake? That would be such a compliment. Like, it's it's a question, but it's it, there's so much behind that. Will you make my birthday cake? You'd be like, oh, you would give that to me? So maybe after you can use this after a meal, for example. I love your cooking. And the other person will be like... Next is great job, great job. This is a compliment that you can use anytime. You can use it uh, to your, with your friend, with your, not with your boss. Your boss might use it with you, uh, an employee, a coworker, a colleague, a pet even, whatever. It's, it's just a, a very small scale, a very easy to use compliment. That means you think whatever has just happened is good. I use great job all the time. I use great job and I use good job. Sometimes, uh, when I make a mistake or something funny happens and I'm alone at my house and I want to make fun of myself, I'll be like, yeah, great job, Alicia. <laughs> uh, but if I'm, if I'm trying to be positive about a failure or laugh at myself a bit. But in general, uh, it's just a good, easy compliment to give someone. Great job. You have a way with words. You have a way with words. This can be speaking. This can be writing. It means you think that the other person is a good communicator, or maybe even more so than just a good communicator. You think that the way they speak or the way that they write is particularly good. So that could mean funny, it could mean romantic, it could mean dramatic. Something about the way they speak or the way that they write, you really enjoy that. You can say, you have a way with words. It's quite a nice compliment. I think it's kind of like a, you know, a bit smart. It's a bit of a smart thing. You have a way with words. Hmm. Or you can say you're good with words. You're really good with words. Yeah. All right. Next one. You look gorgeous. You look gorgeous. Very nice compliment to give. Just be very careful with the way that you say this. For an everyday compliment, I tend not to say you look nice or you look gorgeous today or something like that because the underlying comment there is on the other days that person doesn't look nice. <laughs> like, so... If I want to compliment someone's appearance, I try to pick a specific thing. I'm like, oh, I've never seen you wear that sweater before. It looks nice on you. Something like that. Like yesterday, my friend had a new dress on and I was like, is that a new dress? And because I, th I thought she looked nice, I th I was, but I didn't, I didn't want to make it sound like I don't think she looks nice every day. So I said, is that a new dress? And she goes, yeah. And I said, I think that color is really, really nice on you. It looks really good. And she was so happy about that. So. Uh, yes, there there are these compliments like you look nice, you look great, you look gorgeous and so on. But I personally kind of prefer to level them up a little bit and just say, pick a specific thing. Like, did you get a new haircut? Did you dye your hair? Or you, did you get something, did something happen? Like what, whatever it is, try to pick up on a specific thing because then that shows you're paying attention to the other person. 
and you think that whatever they have chosen to do, whatever like clothing or whatever haircut, whatever it is, you think that they have good sense there too, or good style. So it's kind of like a double, that's a very subtle double compliment. Yeah. The next word is you have good taste. You have good taste. This can be for uh, food, uh, fashion, style, for decorating sense, uh, music in movies, whatever. If you think that that person's uh, artistic selection in, in whatever capacity, if you think that that person makes good choices with uh, their, uh, their appearance or their hobbies or whatever, you can say you have good taste. This is a fairly sophisticated compliment, I think. We use you have good taste for something like it's, it sounds a bit more sophisticated. Maybe if you both choose the same bottle of wine, perhaps. Like it, it has kind of a more formal, adultish, sophisticated feeling about it, this compliment. So yeah, maybe, maybe wine is a good example of that. Yeah. Oh, nice bottle choice. Like I really like that. You have good taste. You can follow this, by the way. You have good taste in blah, blah, blah. Uh, you have good taste in movies. You have good taste in music. If you want to be specific about something that you think that person is really good at choosing, you have good taste in now. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, next one is you have a great sense of humor. You have a great sense of humor. This is the, this is the underlying compliment in the phrase, you are so funny. This is the underlying compliment. You have a great sense of humor means the other person thinks you are funny, that you are good at telling jokes or you make them laugh. This is actually one of my favorite compliments to get. You have a great sense of humor. Um, yeah, because I think that like, you know, people like to laugh. So it's an, it's an, if someone makes you laugh, you can say this, you have a great sense of humor or you're very funny. Yeah, it's a good one. It's a really good one. Um, so you can say after a joke, for example, or after maybe you've, you're, you've finished laughing at something the other person has said, you can say, ah, you have a great sense of humor. Good. Next one is your resume is impressive. This is a weird compliment to say to your friends, <laughs> unless you're like reviewing your friend's resume. It's a bit weird. This is something that perhaps, uh, someone interviewing another person for a job would say. The candidate comes in for the interview. The interviewer says, wow, your resume is very impressive. I'd like to ask you a few questions about it. Yay. <laughs> uh, so this is good to hear in a work situation. Yeah, you really probably won't need to use this with your friends. If you do, it's kind of weird. Oh, wow. This next one is quite a compliment. Nobody's ever said this to me. To be fair, if somebody said this next one to me, I would feel a little bit of like pressure. The compliment here is you make me want to be a better person. This is something that I think you see in movies from time to time. Person. Yeah, I've had, I had one person say like, uh, like, uh, oh, that something you did inspired me. Mm -hmm. And that was like really like, oh, that was really exciting. Like somebody was inspired by something like, wow, that's great. Or I want to be like you. That's a yeah. really cool compliment. But if someone says, you want to make me be a better person, it's like, oh, wow, like that means I'm really important to that person, which is really flattering. But at the same time, if someone said that, I would also be like, if it's like my friend, I would be like, mm, but I, I want you to be you. Like, I think you're a cool person already. Yeah, it's like, oh, you make me want to be a better person. Like in that person's viewpoint, you're like somehow above them and that's uncomfortable. Yeah, just, I would rather say, you inspire me. I think that that, or like this thing that you did really inspired me. Like if somebody said like, I saw that picture that you posted on Twitter of that pizza today, Alicia, and it really inspired me and I made my own pizza. I'd be like, yay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, next one is nice. Actually, I say this to my friends quite a bit. You are an awesome friend. This is really, really good to use after your friend has helped you with something. Maybe you're moving to a new apartment or new house, or maybe you've had some trouble and your friend gave you some good advice, or your friend just listened to you when you really needed to talk to someone. After that experience, you can say, thanks so much, you were an awesome friend. Or maybe your friend did something really, really cool and you just want to like tell them, like, I think you're really awesome. Just say, you are an awesome friend. They'll be happy to hear that. Or just, you can abbreviate it to, you are awesome. Not just you're an awesome friend, just you are awesome. You are a cool person. You are awesome. You're fantastic. You are an awesome friend. 
You're an awesome friend. Compliments that I want to hear. Quite honestly, I I feel that the any physical appearance compliment is sort of boring to me, honestly. When people I feel you. I feel you. Really, I'm just like, okay, great. I didn't do anything to be have the, this body or my face or whatever. It's just it's like, okay, that doesn't mean anything. Like, what are we, what are we gonna do with that? It's like. <laughs> If you want, if you want to compliment somebody, I feel like you should compliment them on their skills, uh, something that they have done or something that they have created, or something about their personality that is valuable to you. I think that that's a much better compliment. So for me, I like this is delicious because I love cooking. So when somebody tells me this is so good, like when they say it in just that right way, and you can tell that it's real, you can tell that it's true. I'm just like yes. When people go, oh my god, this is so good, like. I've cooked something really, really well, they say, oh my god, amazing, or I want to eat your food, that sort of thing. When people say that, I'm just like, yes, like that makes me so, so happy because it's some, like, that's one of my favorite things to do. It's a skill and it's something that like I've worked hard to try to do well. So when someone compliments me on that, I get really excited. All right, so um, those are compliments you always want to hear. What compliments do you want to hear? I don't know. We've talked about we've talked about personality compliments and we've talked about skill compliments, but if there if you have a favorite compliment, leave it in the comment box. We can start a compliment mayhem among the commenters. Anyway, positive feelings after this video. Everybody's cheery, I think. Uh, thanks very much for watching this episode of Top Words and we will see you again soon. Bye. How are your English listening skills? First, you'll see an image and hear a question. Next comes a short dialogue. Listen carefully and see if you can answer correctly. We'll show you the answer at the end. A boy is reading from his journal. What was the first thing the boy did today? The weather was great today. I went swimming this afternoon at the pool and I went to a movie in the evening. I also studied all morning. Today wasn't bad. What was the first thing the boy did today? A boy is reading from his journal. What was the first thing the boy did today? The weather was great today. I went swimming this afternoon at the pool. And I went to a movie in the evening. I also studied all morning. Today wasn't bad. Did you get it right? I hope you learned something from this quiz. Let us know if you have any questions. See you next time. Everybody, my name is Alicia. Welcome back to EnglishClass101.com's YouTube channel. Today I'm going to talk about say, tell, and speak. I'm going to talk about the differences uh, between when we use these and also give some examples of how to use them as well. So let's go. Okay, the first one I want to talk about is say. Say. So we use say when we want to have a very neutral feel to what we're talking about. We use say when we report speech. We're reporting information, reporting something we heard, reporting something someone else said to us. So, as I just used, the past tense of say is said. Please be careful. It is not say ed, say ed. It should be said. The spelling changes. Said. He said, she said, we said, they said. Okay. So, when we want to report speech, we can use the past tense like I've just done. For example, he said dinner was delicious. This is a past tense statement, so maybe previously, before the conversation, someone, he, said this statement, dinner was delicious. Think of this like a quote. Dinner was delicious. He said dinner was delicious. Another example, you said you were tired. You said you were tired. So again, before the conversation, the other person said he or she was tired. But here, to report, you said you were tired. And we use the past tense, say, said, to do that. 
Okay, one more with the present tense then. Remember, we use the present tense when we're talking about uh, general facts or things which are always true, regular actions. So in this case, I've used present tense. I said, I never say mean things. So here I have present tense. This is a general fact in this case. I never say mean things. So again, a very neutral way of talking about verbal communication. Okay, so that's how we use say, an introduction to how we use say. Then let's talk about how to use tell. We use tell a little bit differently from the way that we use say. So we use tell when we want to show kind of a one-way nuance. There's sort of one-way communication happening. So by that I mean that someone is passing new information or giving new information to another person. Something I do not already know, I'm having someone tell me. Someone is going to tell me new information. So we use this in past tense a lot. The past tense of tell is told. He told me, she told me, they told me. This gives us the nuance of new information, something I'm learning, something I'm hearing for the first time. I can use tell or told in past tense. Also, one point about tell. The object, uh, in many cases, is a person. So by that I mean uh, after the verb tell, the item coming after it in the sentence is usually a person. So the person receiving the information. So please tell me, please tell her, please tell him. The person indicated here, or the group of people indicated here after the verb tell, that's the person or the group of people receiving the information, learning the information, okay? So let's see. I told you to call me. Here I have the past tense. I told you to call me. So you, this is the receiver of the information. I told you to call me. I asked you to call me here. Okay, so this is the report, some, some command. We can use tell and told to give commands. I told you to call me. I gave you the new uh, request to call me, in other words. Okay, one more. A request this time. Can you tell me where the bathroom is? So here, tell me. So this is a request for information. Can you tell me where the bathroom is? I don't know where the bathroom is. Please give me new information. Please tell me where it is. Okay, here we also use present tense, yeah? So when you're, when you're making requests, please make sure to use the present tense. Can you tell me something? One more. Why didn't you tell me the party was canceled? Another question. Why didn't you tell me? So you didn't give me new information about the party. Why? Why didn't you tell me? Blah, blah, blah. We can use this pattern for if uh, you miss information or if someone forgot to tell you something, if someone forgot to give you information that you needed, you can say, why didn't you tell me? Blah, blah, blah. Uh, to make a different sentence, you could say, why didn't you tell her? Or why didn't you tell them? Why didn't you tell our boss? Some other examples, a positive sentence could be, why did you tell him? Why did you tell her? For example, if someone tells a secret. Hmm. So we can use tell to give new information, to pass new information along. Okay, so that's tell. So the next verb that I want to talk about today is the verb speak. So we use speak to mean a, a conversation, yes. So speak has the nuance of a conversation, but it has the nuance of a more formal tone. We would use speak in more formal situations, like a business meeting or a work setting, for example, or for maybe a more serious conversation. But we can use speak uh, with either with or to. So I mean speak with someone and speak to someone. So the difference between these two is very, very small. If you say speak with my boss, it sounds like you expect a conversation with your boss. Speaking with someone sounds like there's information passing back and forth between the two of you. Speak to your boss sounds more like, for example, you're going to say a lot of things, you're going to give a lot of information, and your boss will participate a little bit, but there's more nuance of giving information than uh, passing information back and forth. So if you want to make a more conversational nuance, use with, speak with someone. If you want it to sound a little more one-sided, a little more one-way, use speak to someone. Okay, 
So we also use speak for languages, like I speak English, I speak French, I speak Japanese, I don't speak German, I don't speak Thai. So please use speak for languages as well. The past tense of speak is spoke. Please be careful. It is not speaked. Please use spoke. The past tense is spoke. I spoke English every day when I lived in America, for example. So uh, please use spoke as the past tense here. Also, the past participle form is spoken. Spoken. So we'll see that in a little bit, maybe. Okay. Uh, so some example sentences. You should speak with or to your boss. So here you can choose with. Sounds more conversational. To sounds a little more direct. You should speak with your boss, you should speak to your boss. Okay, past tense sentence. I spoke with my manager. I spoke with my manager. We shared information. Last, have you spoken to HR? Have you spoken to HR? Here's a present perfect tense sentence. I've used spoken here. Okay, good. So that's a nice maybe a uh, wrap up of a few different verbs that are commonly confused when talking about speech. Let's go to some example sentences. All right. The first example sentence is my friend something something me. My cooking was bad. Okay. My cooking was bad. This is probably new information for a person. Another hint. We have me. There's a person here in the object position of the sentence. So we can guess that this should be the verb tell. However, we have this hint. My cooking was bad, was bad, a past tense. So we should use the past tense form of tell, told here. Okay, next one. They something something, I have to work tomorrow. So here, I have to work tomorrow. This is maybe just uh, information. It sounds like somebody passed some information to me. So, if I want to think of this as like reporting speech, I would use the verb say in the past tense, said. Hmm. So I know this should not be tell because there's no object here. I know it should not be speak because there's no with and there's no to here either. So I know this should be, they said I have to work tomorrow. Of course, this sentence could be, they told me I have to work tomorrow. It sounds more like a command in that case. Here, they said I have to work tomorrow is very neutral and just a simple report of speech. Okay, next one. He really needs to something something with his client. So here is a big hint word. We have the word with here. And we also have client here, which shows maybe a business or a work setting. Therefore, we can guess the verb should be speak. He really needs to speak with his client. Okay, great. Next one, have you something something, your mother, the news, the news. So here, news is a big hint, new information, new information. And we have a person, a person in the object position. A person is going to receive new information. So have you told your mother the news is the correct sentence here. So have you told blah, blah, blah is actually a really good sentence for you to remember. Have you told your mom about that? Have you told your dad about that? Have you told your dog about your new park? <laughs> I don't know. So anytime you want to pass information or ask a question about information being passed, please use tell to do that like we've done here. Have you told someone something? Okay, let's go to the next one. We something something about this at the last meeting. So again, meeting here is a big hint that it is a work or a more formal situation. We see that this uh, is the last meeting. So something that has finished already. So let's use past tense spoke. We spoke about this at the last meeting. We spoke about this at the last meeting. Here, I have introduced something slightly different from this speak with or speak to. If you want to mention a topic rather than a, about a person, uh, we can use speak about a topic, speak about something. Mm. We spoke about this at the last meeting. We can use speak to introduce a topic as well. So please note that this is an option. Okay, let's go to the next one. You always, blah, 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 nice things, nice things. So always here, I have a, a word which indicates a regular action, something that is always true. We talked about an example over here, though I used never here. However, the grammar is still the same. We should still use the same grammar nuance, the same grammar point here. So let's use the present tense, say. 
you always say nice things. So someone always says positive things or someone always makes very positive comments. Like for example, everybody in the comments on these videos, uh, everybody always says very nice things. We can use always say to talk about something that uh, a person always says. Mm. Okay, finally, same thing, he always something something, the truth. Okay, now this is tricky. I've used always here. I used always in the previous one as well. But the thing I want to point out is this the truth at the end of the sentence. There's a set phrase in English. We don't use say. We actually use tell with the expression the truth. He always tells the truth. So the expressions tell the truth and the opposite, tell a lie, we always use the verb tell with this. You might hear, I sometimes hear uh, non-native speakers of English say, say a lie or say the truth, but this is not natural. Please be sure to use tell the truth or tell a lie. We always use tell in these cases, so please be careful of that. Okay, but we've talked about a lot of different ways to use these three verbs, and I hope that it's a little bit more clear now when to use them, uh, especially say and tell. Many people have a little bit of confusion between these two, but speak is also quite useful as well. Okay, so I hope that was useful for you. If you have any questions, please be sure to leave them in the comment section below this video. If you liked the video, please make sure to give it a thumbs up. It's super helpful for us. Also, subscribe to our channel if you have not already. Check us out at EnglishClass101.com for more good stuff too. Thanks very much for watching this lesson and I will see you again soon. Bye! In this video, you'll learn 20 of the most common words and phrases in English. Hi everybody, my name is Alicia. Welcome to the 800 Core English Words and Phrases video series. This series will teach you the 800 most common words and phrases in English. But there's a twist. With each new lesson in this series, we'll include the previous lessons at the end. So after you've learned the new words and phrases, stick around and review what you learned in previous lessons. Reviewing is one of the most important parts of learning a language. You can also get the full list right now at EnglishClass101.com. Click the link in the description to access more example sentences, create your own flashcard deck, and finally master English. Okay, let's get started. First is flood. 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 A flood is a type of natural disaster. A flood happens when there's water on the streets, too much water. So, so much water, for example, it's hard to walk or cars get covered. This can happen because a lot of rain causes river levels to rise or because of some other issue relating to water not draining in a town. The flood destroyed the town. The flood destroyed the town. The flood destroyed the town. Typhoon. 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 A typhoon is a weather pattern that is a natural disaster. So a typhoon is different from a hurricane because a typhoon happens in the Pacific Ocean. A hurricane happens in the Atlantic Ocean. A typhoon is like a giant tower of water and wind. It spins very fast. There are very strong wind speeds and it's very dangerous to go outside. The typhoon is hit. The typhoon is hit. The typhoon has hit. Hurricane. 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 So we just talked about typhoon. Again, a hurricane is just like a typhoon, but it happens in the Atlantic Ocean, so in a different part of the world. Again, just like a typhoon, a hurricane creates a very, very tall tower of water and wind, maybe even lightning and thunder too, and it can be very, very dangerous to go near them. A hurricane has formed over the ocean. A hurricane has formed over the ocean. A hurricane has formed over the ocean. Tornado. 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 
A tornado is similar to typhoons and hurricanes. However, a tornado happens on land. A tornado is a tower of wind and sand and dust and sometimes other objects. They whirl together, they spin together very, very fast and can be very, very dangerous weather patterns. The tornado is twisting across the prairie. The tornado is twisting across the prairie. The tornado is twisting across the prairie. Drought. 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 A drought is a condition that happens because of not enough rain in an area. So droughts, when they extend for a long period of time, can become disaster situations because farmers aren't able to grow food because there's not enough water. Drought is a real trouble for farmers. Drought is a real trouble for farmers. Drought is a real trouble for farmers. Islam, Islam, Islam. Islam is one of the most followed religions of the world. Followers of the religion of Islam are called Muslims. The Islam faith was founded by the Prophet Muhammad. The Islam faith was founded by the Prophet Muhammad. The Islam faith was founded by the Prophet Muhammad. Protestantism. 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 Protestantism is a part of Christianity. It's like a type of Christianity. It came from Europe to the United States. It was considered a very conservative branch or a very conservative type of Christianity. Protestantism came as a break from the Roman Catholic Church. Protestantism came as a break from the Roman Catholic Church. Protestantism came as a break from the Roman Catholic Church. Catholicism. 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 Catholicism is a branch of Christianity or a type of Christianity. The leader of Catholicism is the Pope. Catholicism is the religion of those who accept the leadership of the Pope. Catholicism is the religion of those who accept the leadership of the Pope. Catholicism is the religion of those who accept the leadership of the Pope. Hinduism, Hinduism, Hinduism. Hinduism is a very widely followed religion originally from India. Hinduism from India involves the belief in reincarnation and many gods. Hinduism from India involves the belief of reincarnation and many gods. Hinduism from India involves the belief in reincarnation and many gods. Buddhism. 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 Buddhism is a very well-known and very widely practiced religion and philosophy that is spread throughout Asia and now the rest of the world too. Buddhism is based on the teachings of the Buddha, the enlightened one. Buddhism is based on the teachings of the Buddha, the enlightened one. Buddhism is based on the teachings of the Buddha, the enlightened one. Ankle. 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 An ankle is a part of the body. You have an ankle at the place where your foot meets your leg. That part between the two is called your ankle. The athlete sprained his ankle. The athlete sprained his ankle. The athlete sprained his ankle. Elbow. 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 
An elbow is another body part. Your elbow is the part of your body where your forearm meets your upper arm. This part of the body is the elbow. The arm only bends one way at the elbow. The arm only bends one way at the elbow. The arm only bends one way at the elbow. Wrist. 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 Your wrist is the part of your body where your hand meets your arm. This part of the body here is called your wrist. The most common places to take a pulse are the neck and wrist. The most common places to take a pulse are the neck and wrist. The most common places to take a pulse are the neck and wrist. Knee. 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 Your knee is the part of your body that connects your lower leg to your upper leg. So you can touch it and tap on it. It feels quite hard. Keep in mind, yes, this word begins with a K in spelling, but the pronunciation is knee. The boy fell and scraped his knees. The boy fell and scraped his knees. The boy fell and scraped his knees. Skin. 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 Your skin refers to the outer part of your body. All of this is called your skin. These connected tissues all across your body, we refer to this as your skin. My skin is very delicate. My skin is very delicate. My skin is very delicate. Shave. 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 Shave is a verb. It means to remove hair with a sharp object. So many people, men usually, shave their faces. Or we can shave other parts of the body too. We can shave arms, legs, and so on. He didn't shave for several weeks. He didn't shave for several weeks. He didn't shave for several weeks. Chef. 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 A chef is someone who prepares food professionally. The difference between a chef and a cook is that a chef has had special training. So they work in a restaurant or they work in a hotel creating food, creating menus, and so on. A cook, while they may have excellent food preparation skills, doesn't have the same type of training as a chef. The chef is making a meal. The chef is making a meal. The chef is making a meal. Non-smoking. 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 We use non-smoking as an adjective. We usually use non-smoking before a location, like a non-smoking room or a non-smoking restaurant. It refers to a place where smoking is not allowed. Could you find me a non-smoking room? Could you find me a non-smoking room? Could you find me a non-smoking room? Smoking. 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 So smoking refers to the act of smoking a cigarette or something else, but smoking can also be used as an adjective as with non-smoking. For example, a smoking room or a smoking section in a restaurant. So pay attention to the situations in which you see this word used to understand what part of speech the word is taking. There is a separate patio for smoking attached to the restaurant. There is a separate patio for smoking attached to the restaurant. There is a separate patio for smoking attached to the restaurant. Blood. 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 Blood is the red liquid that comes from our bodies when we get injured. Before it comes out of our bodies, it is blue. We can see it inside 
our bodies, we can see it in our skin, but when it comes out of the body, it becomes red. He cannot bear to see blood. He cannot bear to see blood. He cannot bear to see blood. Well done. In this lesson, you expanded your vocabulary and learned 20 new useful words. Click the link in the description to sign up for free at EnglishClass101.com and get access to the full list of vocabulary you'll need for daily life conversations. You'll also get example sentences, custom flashcard decks, and more learning resources. See you next time. Bye. Want to speak real English from your first lesson? Sign up for your free lifetime account at EnglishClass101.com. Hi everyone, I'm Alicia. Thanksgiving is one of the most celebrated holidays in the United States. It also marks the beginning of the holiday season. The weeks leading up to Christmas, Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, and the winter solstice, which are all widely celebrated holidays in the U.S. For retailers, Thanksgiving begins their busiest season. Thanksgiving is celebrated on the fourth Thursday of November. Thanksgiving was founded as a national holiday by one of the most famous presidents of the United States. Do you know who it might have been? We'll show you the answer at the end of this video. Thanksgiving, to a large extent, is about having a feast with friends and family. Turkey is the traditional main course with yams, squash, pumpkin pie, cranberries, and other rich and filling foods rounding out the meal. Some families spend weeks preparing for their Thanksgiving feast, and to stuff oneself is most certainly encouraged. The Thanksgiving meal of today is rooted in the meal that the pilgrims from Europe shared with the Native Americans on the first Thanksgiving. This was quite a feast. Turkey, duck, goose, squash, corn, and a plethora of other foods were shared between the Europeans and the Native Americans. This original fate was said to go on for three full days. Football is another tradition during Thanksgiving celebrations in the United States. Watching the football game while preparing the Thanksgiving meal is an important part of the celebration for many families. Families that aren't sports fans, however, may opt to spend the time outside, enjoying the crisp autumn air, or may find other diversions to enjoy while the turkey cooks. Thanksgiving is not a uniquely American holiday. There are similar celebrations in Canada, for instance. The concept behind the holiday, showing thankfulness by having a feast, spans many cultures. And now, Here's the answer to the quiz. Do you know who founded Thanksgiving as a national holiday? Abraham Lincoln established Thanksgiving during the dark days of the American Civil War. Even though the holiday was officially born during this conflict, it's more associated with the initially good relations between the first European immigrants and the Native Americans. How was this lesson? Did you learn something interesting? Is there a day in your country where you give thanks? Please leave a comment at EnglishClass101.com. Until next time! I'm going to use the force to make you watch this whole video. Hi everybody, welcome back to Ask Alicia, the weekly series where you ask me questions and I answer them. Maybe you can send your questions to me at EnglishClass101.com slash ask hyphen Alicia. First question from Harley Passos. Har Harley Passo Passo Pass pa I'm very sorry. Harley asks, what is the use of get? plus adverb or preposition. For example, I get down. This is a question about phrasal verbs with get. We can use a lot of different things after the word get. In your example, to get down, we use it when dancing, for example, like I want to get down this weekend. It's sort of an old fashioned expression though, to get down. We can use a lot of different uh, words after the verb get though. For example, get into, to get into something, means to become interested in something. You might hear to get at, like get at me, or get at your professor. To get at means to reach out to, or to communicate with. 
but it's a very casual expression. You can say get after, like I need to get after my homework, for example. It means to like chase after or try to do something. Also to get in, like to get into a club, to get into a restaurant, to get into a party. The nuance is that something is challenging, but you can gain access to that thing. Like, I got into the party last night, but I wasn't on the list. There are a lot of different uses of the word get. I can't talk about all of them in this video because there are so many. So if you're curious about the various uh, phrasal verbs that we can use with the word get, check out a dictionary. That's a really good place to start. Next question. Next question comes from Long Ann. Long Ann asks, what is the difference between simple past tense and past continuous tense or past progressive tense. Simple past tense we use for actions that started and ended in the past. So the beginning of the action and the end of the action happened in the past. So for example, the sentence, I ate breakfast is a simple past tense statement. I ate breakfast. Ate is a simple past tense. The past continuous tense, however, or the past progressive tense is something we use to talk about an action that was continuing at a specific point in time in the past. If I want to use the past progressive tense, I can say I was eating eating breakfast. Using that continuous tense, using that progressive tense implies I want to explain something else that happened at that time, or maybe I want to add some more information. So for example, I was eating breakfast at 8 o'clock this morning, or I was eating breakfast when the phone rang, or I was eating breakfast and watching TV at the same time. I was eating breakfast while studying today. By using the past progressive, I'm explaining that an action was continuing at a specific point in time, as in the example, I was eating breakfast at eight o'clock, or I can use past progressive to show one action was happening at the same time as another action in the past. If I use just the simple past tense, I'm just saying a simple fact, in other words, this action happened. I ate breakfast at eight o'clock. Um, if I want to emphasize the continuous nature of the action for some reason, like I was eating breakfast at eight o'clock, I can use the past progressive tense. In that case, it might be in response to a question like, what were you doing at eight o'clock this morning? So if someone wants to ask maybe uh, what you were doing at a specific point in time, like someone is suspicious of you, like, what were you doing last night? <laughs> you can say like, oh, I was having dinner with my friends last night. But past tense, simple past tense is something we use for actions which start uh, and finish uh, in the past. But progressive, the progressive tense in past can be used to emphasize the continuing nature of that situation or that action. Next question. Next question comes from Yasin. Ya Yasin? Yasin? I'm very sorry. What's the difference between on time and in time? Is it you arrived just on time or you arrived just in time? We use on time to refer to doing something at the correct time, doing something at a scheduled time. So for example, I need to get to work on time, uh, meaning at the correct time, or did you make it to your appointment on time? In time, however, is used when we want to kind of give a nuance of rushing or hurrying for something. I need to leave my house now to get to the airport in time for my flight. I need to study for my test now if I want to be in time for the party later. You should probably leave now if you want to be in time for the movie. In time for something else. So I want to do action A to make my schedule meet this other condition, this other thing I would like to do or this other thing I need to do. In time for has the nuance of a deadline. We can use this expression in like a panic, like, oh my gosh, I'm not going to make it in time, like to submit a paper. I'm not going to make it in time. In time means like before the deadline, whereas on time has the meaning of completing an action or completing something at a scheduled time. Next question. The next question comes from Gerson Silva. Hi, what is the difference between shade and shadow? Oh, great. This is a great question. Both of these words can be used to refer to a place that is darker than its surroundings because there's an object that is blocking the light. We can say there's shade over there or there's a shadow over there. In that sentence, they are used the same. However, shadow refers to the dark shape only. So a person can cast a shadow. We use 
cast, the verb cast with a shadow. I cast a shadow when I stand in the sun, for example. Shade, however, as a noun, refers to or has the nuance of a kind of shelter. So shelter provided by some other object, shelter from the light, shelter from the sun. So we would say stand in the shade because shade has the nuance of shelter. We would not say stand in the shadow. Shadow does not carry the nuance of shelter in the way that shade does. Interestingly enough though, shade and shadow are both used as verbs as well. To shadow something means to follow something closely. To shadow someone at work means to follow someone at work and, and try to understand their job, for example. Shade is used as a verb to mean to create shelter from light. For example, the canopy shaded us from the sun. Uh, shade also has some interesting uses. You might hear the slang phrase to throw shade. Throwing shade is a really interesting slang expression that we use, which means to communicate disrespect or to, to communicate like contempt. Uh, bad feelings for something. When you're speaking generally, in most cases, uh, when you want to talk about a dark, cool area, we should say shade. Stand in the shade. When you want to talk only about the dark area, that dark object, use shadow. Next question! Actually, two questions from Danny. Hi, Danny. Danny's first question is, you talked about lit as slang. Yes, I talked about lit in episode two. Episode one, episode two of Ask Alicia. Can you please talk about the verb light and using it in active and passive? Sure, light means to start a fire. So to light a fire, to light a candle. Some examples of active and passive voice with this verb then. Why don't we light some candles for dinner tonight? All the candles in the restaurant were lit. On our camping trip, my neighbors lit a fire and we brought uh, hamburgers to make. A fire was lit in the campsite while we were gone. I was going to light a fire, but I fell asleep. So to light means to start a fire. He lit the house on fire. We can say to light blah 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 on fire. So there are a few different examples of using the verb uh, light in active and in passive, past tense, future tense as well. So I hope that that's helpful. Danny's second question, can you talk about ride and its uses? Like take someone for a ride. Can I take a ride? Ride is another verb that has a lot of different uses. You use the example to take someone for a ride means to drive together with someone. To go for a ride has the nuance of doing something just for fun. It's just for fun. I want to take a ride to a location. I want to take a ride to the mountains this weekend or take a ride to the beach. But to take someone for a ride means to invite someone to drive somewhere with you in a car. That's one way to use ride. You can also say, give me a ride. Can you give me a ride? So this is a request expression. I don't have a car. My friend has a car. I want my friend to take me in their car to a location. I can say, can you give me a ride to the movie theater? Can you give me a ride to the lake? Give me a ride is a request. So give me a ride in your car. So there are a lot of uses of ride. If you want to see all of them, or if you want to see more of them, I recommend checking a dictionary. There are quite a few, and I can't talk about them all in this video. So please check a dictionary. Next question. Okay, next question is from Femme. Femme, Femme, Femme. What does you're too good to be true mean? Is it good? or not. Maybe you've heard this in a famous song, you're too good to be true, can't take my eyes off of you. In that case, it's a good meaning. A different way to say this expression is you are so good, you are so amazing that I can't believe you're real. So in other words, something must be wrong. There must be some problem with you. It's not possible for you to be real because you are so good, you are so great. So you're too good to be true. It's like, Wow, I'm amazed by you. So it's a good expression. If, however, uh, maybe in a more uncommon situation, someone said like, ah, this guy's too good to be true. Like maybe reviewing a job application, for example. Uh, this girl, she's too good to be true. Like if it's said in that way, maybe there's something suspicious about that person. This doesn't seem right. There's just too much good information here. There must be some problem with this person. Depending on the intonation, it can portray either a very positive meaning or a very suspicious meaning. In most cases, however, it's a positive meaning. So if you heard this in a song, for example, it's probably a very positive, kind of romantically nuanced phrase. Thanks very much for that question, Fem. Next one. Next question. Rabia Arshad. Ra Rabia Arshad. Rabia Ar I'm very sorry, I'm very sorry. What's the difference between can and may? I saw this on the Dining Like a Champ cheat sheet 
and noticed these words were used for requests. Uh, what's the difference? Can and may for requests in modern English, in modern American English are used the same. If I use them in a statement, can refers to ability, may refers to permission. Please just be careful. Can and may are only used in the same way uh, to make requests in modern American English. Next question is from Taylor. Ah, hi again, Taylor. Are where are you from and where were you born the same? Ah, great question. Where are you from? Where were you born? No, not necessarily, not necessarily. Where were you born is only the place where you were physically brought into the world. Maybe your hometown, the place you identify as your hometown is different from the place where you were born. Maybe you were born in Spain, but you grew up in the USA. Your family moved after that. So you could say, I was born in Spain, but I grew up in New York City. If someone asks you, where are you from? It might be a good idea to say, I was born in blah, 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 uh, but I was raised in blah, 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 in a different place, if the two places are different. Next question. Next question is from Hassan. Hassan says, how do we use gotta in the negative form? So we did a live stream about have to and got to and need to on the YouTube channel and on Facebook a while ago. Gotta is a contraction, a very casual contraction of got and to. It's not a real word. Uh, gotta is just the sound that we make when we say got to very quickly. Like, I gotta go to school today, or I gotta finish my homework, or I gotta get to sleep, I'm so tired. In American English, we do not use gotta in the negative. Instead, we use have to or need to. I don't have to go to work tomorrow. I don't need to go to work tomorrow. I don't need to go to sleep right now. But American English does not use gotta in the negative form. Next question. Next question is from Sadaham. I need to improve my spoken English and my my vocabulary. How do I do that? I think there's a tool on the website where you can record your voice speaking English and compare it to a native speaker saying the same thing. Um, so I think that's a that's a feature on the website. So check that out. Uh, if you haven't been, it's at EnglishClass101.com. There should be a recording function there where you can record your voice and compare it to a native speaker and keep practicing that until your voice and your pronunciation matches uh, the native speaker's pronunciation. So you'll see like little waveforms there even on the recording page. So you can try to match your voice to a native speaker. So of course, practicing with native speakers where possible, um, repeating. So creating your own speech uh, is important too. Um, practicing with like recording tools, voice recording tools. When you record yourself, you suddenly hear so many problems in your speech. So recording yourself can be another good tool. But in terms of building your vocabulary, first I need to define a goal. What do I want to talk about? If I want to talk about food, I should look for materials in my target language talking about food, and I should study those. So think about what it is that you want to do and try to be specific, try to narrow your goal down to you know, what are the words that I need to do and try focusing there. And then maybe you can widen the focus to other interests here and there too. But start maybe with uh, the things that are going to help you communicate the things that you really want to say. So always think about your goals. What do I want to learn how to say? Next question from Ricardo Villarreal. Oh, hey, Ricardo, welcome back. Is it correct to learn several languages at the same time? Ooh. Is it correct? I can't answer that, whether it's correct or not. So I've heard that if you want to try, uh, for whatever your reason is, if you want to try to study more than one language at the same time, it's better to try to choose languages that are quite different so that there's less chance uh, of you making mistakes or getting confused in your studies. The other thing that I think I would say is if you're studying more than one language at the same time, your progress might be a bit slower than if you studied just one language. Yeah, is it correct? I don't know. I can't answer that. Uh, that's up to you to decide. So those are all the questions that I want to talk about this week. Thank you so much for submitting so many interesting questions. I really appreciate it. If you haven't submitted a question yet, you can check it out. Uh, the submission page is at englishclass101.com slash ask hyphen Alicia. So check that out. Send me your question. If you like the video, please make sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel too. And check us out at englishclass101.com for some other stuff. Uh, we talked about a few things today that you can find on the website. So definitely check that out. So thanks very much for watching this episode of Ask Alicia. I will see you again next Saturday. Bye bye.
Bonus vocabulary word for today. Spoiler. Spoiler. A spoiler is secret information, key information about your media, your book, your movie, your TV show. If you see the phrase spoiler alert somewhere, it means the next piece of text, the next information, the next thing in the video is going to be secret information about the story. So if you have not seen the movie, if you have not seen the TV show, or you have not seen the book, you might find information you don't want to read yet. So spoiler means something that will spoil or something that will ruin the story for you. So no spoilers about Star Wars until we've seen it, yeah? Use the force to study English. Hi everybody and welcome back to EnglishClass101.com's YouTube channel. My name is Alicia and today I'm going to talk about prepositions of location and movement. If you want to see more about this topic, you can also check a live video that we did uh, on the channel too. Today we're going to talk about prepositions of location and movement, so let's get started. Okay, so the first preposition of location I want to talk about is at. We use at to talk about exact specific locations, so some examples of this are at the supermarket, at the table, at her desk. This means a person or an object is at that specific place. Uh, so for example, I'm at work right now. I'm at the office. These are specific um, points where people or objects can be located. So please use at to talk about a specific location. Okay, so let's go on to the next preposition of location for now. In. We use in when we want to talk about enclosed locations, so locations which are surrounded uh, or when we're surrounded by something else. Something else is all around us or we are enclosed within something. So some examples of this are in the pool, we are enclosed or surrounded by the pool, in the closet, completely enclosed by the closet, in your bag, your items are enclosed by your bag, and in the water. So when swimming in the ocean, for example, we say in the water. I'm in the water. For example, now I'm in the office. I'm in a room. Um, I'm in my home city, for example. So these are different ways we can use the word in when we are enclosed or surrounded by something. Please also remember that in is used for countries and cities. I live in Bangkok. I live in uh, Europe for example. So please remember to use in for countries and cities as well as for locations that are enclosed or uh, when you're surrounded by something else. Okay, so let's talk about the next preposition of location. The next preposition is by. We use by when we want to express something is near something else, near or close to something else. So for example, by the park or by the coffee shop by your computer, by the table. These mean near something else. We don't know exactly. Is it maybe next to, in front of, behind? We don't know, but it means simply near something else. So for example, I'm by the whiteboard right now. I'm by a chair. I'm by a table. These are ways we can use by to express near or close to. Okay, so the next preposition I want to talk about is a preposition of movement. Actually, the next two are prepositions of movement. The first one is into. So into is something we use to express movement from an open location to a more closed location. So for example, into the bank, walk into the bank, or into the refrigerator, put food into the refrigerator or into the suspect's home. The police moved into the suspect's home. In each case, into shows moving from an open location to a more closed location. So because in is here, you can imagine we are moving to an enclosed location. We could say uh, jump into the pool, for example, or go into the closet, put something into your bag, or uh, go into the water. So in this way, we can kind of think of uh, in and to being closely related, but to shows us the movement, the relationship, that there's some movement happening there. Okay, so let's talk about the opposite then of into, which is out of. So because we use into to talk about movement from a more open place to an enclosed space, 
out of is used to talk about movement from an enclosed space to a more open space. So for example, out of the house or out of the washing machine, taking clothes out of the washing machine, uh, out of your purse, take something out of your purse. So moving uh, yourself, moving a person or moving an object from something that is enclosed to a space that is more open. We use out of in this case. Okay, so now we know about five new prepositions of location and movement. Let's try some example sentences. Okay, the first one, she's sitting something something, the table, the table. So here we have the table. I talked earlier about this, at the table, with at, yeah? However, we can use by the table as well. At the table and by the table have slightly different meanings though. Both are correct. At the table means she is sitting in a chair directly in front of the table. She's sitting at the table. By the table, however, could mean she's next to the table or she's just near the table. By is a little bit less clear. At is very clear here. To be very clear, say she's sitting at the table. To be less clear, maybe she's somewhere near the table, use by. Okay, so the next example sentence is, our company's headquarters is something something LA. LA. LA meaning Los Angeles here. So we have a city name, yeah? A city name, Los Angeles, we know that we should use city names with in. So the answer here is in. In LA. Okay, the next one, he lives something something the supermarket. So the supermarket is a place and here we have the verb lives, he lives. We know it's not in, because people do not live in supermarkets, uh, probably not at. He lives at the supermarket. Also, it doesn't make any sense. People do not live at supermarkets. Uh, however, we can use by, by. So, he lives by the supermarket to mean he lives near the supermarket. Okay, so next one. When we walked something, something, the bank, it was raining. Okay, so here we have the verb walked and we have the bank. So there's a motion happening, yeah? Walking, and then the bank. The preposition we should use here is probably into, though out of could also be possible. When we walked into the bank, it was raining. When we walked out of the bank, it was raining. Both sentences are okay in this case. It just depends on the action you want to communicate. Okay. Next one, I need to run something something, the supermarket for milk. Okay, so here uh, there's an objective for milk. This person wants to buy milk, so they need to run something something, the supermarket. So let's use into, moving from outside the supermarket to inside the supermarket, a more enclosed space, into, into the supermarket. Okay, next one is I have to be something something, the office until 6 p.m. So here we have a specific location, the office, the office. So office is an enclosed space, yes, which means we can use in. I have to be in the office until 6 p.m. But with work and with uh, office spaces, we can also use at. It's an exact location. I have to be in the office or I have to be at the office until 6 p.m. Both are correct here. Okay, next, I forgot to take my phone something something, your bag. Okay, so take, this take motion here is a really good hint, there's an action happening. So, there's a very good chance we are moving something from, a, from an enclosed location to a more open location. So, I forgot to take my phone out of your bag, out of your bag is the correct answer here. Finally, I want to get something, something, town. So town um, is, yes, it's a location, like uh, in my town or at my town. However, a big hint here is get, get. We use get uh, to reflect movement sometimes. Um, and this phrase is a good one to remember. Get out of town, get out of town. So get out of town means leave town, go to a different place outside of town. So I want to get out of town is the correct answer here. 
Okay, so those are a few prepositions of location and movement. Uh, I hope that this was useful for you. If you have any questions, please be sure to leave them in a comment below this video. If you liked this video, also please be sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. Also, please make sure to check us out at EnglishClass101.com for more good stuff. Thanks very much for watching this lesson and we will see you again soon. Bye! talk about preposition In this video, you'll learn 20 of the most common words and phrases in English. Hi everybody, my name is Alicia. Welcome to the 800 Core English Words and Phrases video series. This series will teach you the 800 most common words and phrases in English. But there's a twist. With each new lesson in this series, we'll include the previous lessons at the end. So after you've learned the new words and phrases, stick around and review what you learned in previous lessons. Reviewing is one of the most important parts of learning a language. You can also get the full list right now at EnglishClass101.com. Click the link in the description to access more example sentences, create your own flashcard deck, and finally master English. Okay, let's get started. First is wallet. 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 A wallet is something that you use to store money. You can keep bills, you can keep coins, receipts, credit cards, and other things inside a wallet. My wallet is full of receipts. My wallet is full of receipts. My wallet is full of receipts. Purse. 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 So, purse is used to refer to the bag that we use to carry around the things we need for the day. We tend to use purse to refer to women's bags. This is a big purse. This is a big purse. This is a big purse. Order. 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 We use the verb order to talk about asking for food, usually food or drinks, at a restaurant, at a cafe, or a bar. Confirm the order. Confirm the order. Confirm the order. Field. 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 A field is a large, open area of grass. This can be in nature, but we also use this word to talk about sports fields. Those are large, open areas of grass for football or soccer or other sports. The horse is running in the field. The horse is running in the field. The horse is running in the field. Desert. 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 A desert is a very dry place. The image of a desert is a place that has a lot of sand and where it becomes very, very hot. The sun is heating the hot desert. The sun is heating the hot desert. The sun is heating the hot desert. Boss. 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 So the word boss is used to refer to the person in charge at your workplace. Your boss is often your manager or the person above your manager. Our boss allows us to leave earlier on Wednesdays. Our boss allows us to leave earlier on Wednesdays. Our boss allows us to leave earlier on Wednesdays. Office. 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 So office refers to a place of work. You can use it to talk about the place that you go for work. You can also talk about places where other people work with this word. The office opens at 8 o'clock. The office opens at 8 o'clock. The office opens at 8 o'clock. Coworker. Coworker. Co-worker. Your co-worker or your co-workers are the people that you work together with. So these are the people that you share information with, that you meet or communicate with every day. 
I go out to eat with my coworker every Thursday. I go out to eat with my coworker every Thursday. I go out to eat with my coworker every Thursday. Meeting. 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 A meeting is a period of time for which you and perhaps your boss and some of your coworkers gather together to discuss some topic. I forgot that the meeting was today. I forgot that the meeting was today. I forgot that the meeting was today. Police station. Police station. Police station. A police station is a place where lots and lots of police officers stay. It's kind of like an office, but for the police. The police cars are parked outside the police station. The police cars are parked outside the police station. The police cars are parked outside the police station. Pharmacy. 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 A pharmacy is a place you go to receive medication. So if you've gotten medical treatment from a hospital or a clinic, you can go to a pharmacy to receive the medicine you need. Is there a pharmacy nearby? Is there a pharmacy nearby? Is there a pharmacy nearby? Bakery. 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 A bakery is a place that bakes fresh breads, cookies, and perhaps other kinds of sweets. She goes to the bakery every Sunday with her kids. She goes to the bakery every Sunday with her kids. She goes to the bakery every Sunday with her kids. Movie theater. Movie theater. Movie theater. A movie theater is a place you can go to watch movies on a big screen. You might also hear this called a cinema. This movie theater is so crowded. This movie theater is so crowded. This movie theater is so crowded. Negotiation. 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 A negotiation is a discussion, usually between two groups of people, and they want different things. So they discuss a topic and work together to find an agreement. That process is called a negotiation. After two years of negotiation, the two countries were finally able to come to an agreement. After two years of negotiation, the two countries were finally able to come to an agreement. After two years of negotiation, the two countries were finally able to come to an agreement. Contract. 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 A contract is a written agreement. It's very common to sign a contract before getting something like a mobile phone or getting a loan for something from a bank or other things. Could you come to our office to sign the contract? Could you come to our office to sign the contract? Could you come to our office to sign the contract? Business. 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 So a business is a place of work. We also use the word business to talk generally about the professional world sometimes. My dad owns a business. My dad owns a business. My dad owns a business. Deal. 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 So deal is kind of like a more casual word for agreement. After you've negotiated or discussed something with another person or another group for a while, you might reach an agreement and proclaim it or decide that it's a deal. We have a deal. We have a deal. We have a deal. Busy. 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 
Busy is an adjective. It refers to having many things to do or not having very much free time. I'm busy tonight. I'm busy tonight. I'm busy tonight. Serious. 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 Serious can mean something that is not at all like a light topic. So maybe there are some very heavy topics that are considered serious. We can also use the word serious to talk about someone's personality. Someone who is serious doesn't laugh or smile very much. Depression is a very serious mental illness. Depression is a very serious mental illness. Depression is a very serious mental illness. Tired. 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 Tired is an adjective. It means someone doesn't have a lot of energy. Maybe they're ready to go to sleep or ready to just relax. Thanks, but I'm really tired. Thanks, but I'm really tired. Thanks, but I'm really tired. Well done! In this lesson, you expanded your vocabulary and learned 20 new useful words. Click the link in the description and sign up for free at EnglishClass101.com to get access to the full list of vocabulary you'll need for daily life conversations. You'll also get example sentences, custom flashcard decks, and more learning resources. See you next time. Bye-bye. Hi everybody, my name is Alicia. Welcome back to our English class channel. Today we're going to be talking about the difference between by and until. So let's get started. Okay, so first we're going to talk about by. By marks a deadline for an action to finish. By marks the point where an action completes or is replaced by another action. Uh, so really think about using by to express a deadline. Something is going to stop or you must finish an action uh, at this point in time. So um, we can think about by as marking some point in the future uh, so, by marks some point in the future where an action is going to finish, an action is going to be completed. So, in an example sentence, I have, I'll be at the office by 7 p.m. So, in this sentence, the speaker is not at the office, but 7 p.m. is the deadline. This is the point in time at which the speaker will be at the office. The speaker is not at the office now, but by 7 p.m., by the 7 p.m. deadline, the speaker will be at the office. This will shows us, this is a future tense expression, and by shows us the deadline, the point at which that expression or the point at which that action is going to be completed. So this is how we use by, to think about it like a deadline, some point in time at which an action will be completed or finished. Okay, so let's continue on to the other grammar point for today, which is until. Um, until also has a more casual form. We can use till, uh, T-I-L-L, or apostrophe T-I-L. You might see both spellings used uh, for until, till, or till. Uh, in most cases, it's good to use until. In casual speaking and maybe in casual writing, you can use the casual form. But uh, until is always polite and is always correct. Okay, so when we use until, let's talk about when to use until. We use until to talk about a continuing situation or a continuing state now in the present or in the future but it's going to change or stop. Mm. So the key difference, one key difference here perhaps, is a continuing situation, a continuing state. With by, the nuance is a deadline. Something is going to finish at a deadline. Here, however, until gives us the nuance of something that's continuing. Uh, something true now, for example, uh, but that may not be true in the future until marks the point where that action or that state is going to finish or change. Hmm. Okay, so uh, we can think of it rather than as a deadline, as a key point in the future somewhere, 
where action A continues until a point where we use until, and then a second action begins. Hmm. Something is going to change at the until point. With by, however, we don't have the nuance of an action changing. We only have the nuance of a deadline. So here, until is used to show that something different is going to happen, uh, or something, uh, something will finish, um, but there's going to be a change uh, after the, the until point. So for example, um, this sentence, very similar to the by example sentence, is I'll be at the office until 7 p.m. So here we have the future tense, I'll, I will, I'll be at the office until 7 p.m. This sentence shows us the speaker is at the office right now. However, at 7 p.m., until shows us that 7 p.m. is the point at which the situation or the state is going to change. So at 7 p.m., the speaker is probably going to leave the office. Until shows us that right here, the action or the state is going to change. So please keep that in mind. Until shows you a change in something. By shows more of a deadline for an action uh, that is continuing. So I hope that we can practice this in a few example sentences now. OK. So let's try to choose the correct uh, word to use in these example sentences. Should we use by or should we use until in these cases? So the first one I have is, uh, he has to find a new job, blah, 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 March. So in this case, we see a point in time. Uh, we can think about it. Should we use by or until here? If we use by, we see that uh, the deadline the deadline nuance matches here. He has to find a new job by March. If we use until, he has to find a new job until March. There's no information in this sentence that shows us a hint or that gives us a hint about how the action is going to change. Until does not make sense for this question. So we should use by in this case. He has to find a new job by March is the correct answer for this sentence. In the second sentence, uh, I'm not going to go to bed, blah, blah, blah. I finish this movie. So in this sentence, we have at the end, uh, I finish this movie. So there's some action uh, maybe that's continuing here. Uh, and we have another action. I'm not going to go to bed. In this case, it's a negative. So there are two actions here. This is a pretty good hint that there's an action that's going to change at some point instead of the nuance of a deadline. So for this sentence, until is the best answer. I'm not going to go to bed until, <clears throat> until I finish this movie. This shows us that at this point, the point where I finish the movie, I'm going to go to bed. This marks the change in the continuing state or the continuing situation. So the next sentence is, uh, they need to write their reports, blah, 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 tomorrow. So this sentence, uh, there's no change in the sentence. We don't have any hints about some kind of different action that's going to happen. Instead, we have maybe what seems to be a deadline, some requirement here too. Um, so if we try to use until, it doesn't make sense. There's no changing action. We can't guess about what might happen in the future or a change that might happen. So by is the best answer here. They need to write their reports by tomorrow. Tomorrow is the deadline. So we can guess that tomorrow is the deadline here. By shows us that it's the deadline in this case for this task. All right. Uh, let's take a look at something a little bit different. Here we have, we can't leave the house, blah, 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 your mother calls. So again, there are two situations, there are two actions uh, involved in this sentence. We have leave the house and your mother calls, uh, makes a phone call. So because there are two actions here, we can guess that there's some change that's going to happen. So because we learned, that until marks a change in actions, 
we know that until is the better answer here. Okay. We can't leave the house until your mother calls would be the correct sentence here. All right. Uh, so let's look at the next sentence though. This one is a tricky sentence. This one is a little bit difficult. We have, I'm not going to be there something something 8 p.m. Mm. So here we have 8 p.m. at the end of a sentence which looks like a deadline, right? We have uh, going to be there. Mm. So should we use by or until for this sentence? It's difficult because actually both are okay for this sentence. I'm not going to be there by 8 p.m. is correct and I'm not going to be there until 8 p.m. is also correct. However, the meanings are very different. Just as we practiced in these two sentences, I'll be at the office until I'll be at the office by 7 p.m., the same is true here. I'm not going to be there by 8 p.m. means I'm not going to be there at 8 p.m. It's not possible for me. I can't go. However, I'm not going to be there until 8 p.m. This sentence means after 8 p.m. or beginning at 8 p.m. and after I'm going to be there. So please be careful. In some cases, both by and until are correct, but they change the meaning of the sentence. Okay, let's continue to another example. So uh, the next example sentence is also a little bit difficult. Uh, it's, if my date doesn't arrive, something something, 7 p.m., I'm leaving. Okay, so here we have, we do have two actions. Uh, doesn't arrive, my date doesn't arrive, a negative point, and I'm leaving. So it seems like there are two actions here. However, we have this 7 p.m. This marks a deadline, right? So. Uh, if my date doesn't arrive, there's some deadline here. If this is not uh, completed, something is going to happen. The person is going to leave. So in this case, 7 p.m. is showing a deadline. So we have to use by. If my date doesn't arrive until 7 p.m., we could use that, but it doesn't sound so natural. So uh, the nuance again here is of a deadline. There's something that is going to happen uh, at 7 p.m. 7 p.m. marks the end point in this situation. So we use by here. Okay, let's go to the next pair. Again, these are very interesting points. Uh, we have to leave the beach, blah, 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 10 a.m. And we have to stay at the beach, blah, 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 10 a.m. Okay. so. These two sentences I included because I wanted to show the emphasis of changing actions and continuing actions. So we can see the verbs are different here. In the first sentence we have leave, so this is a change, uh, leaving a location. In the second sentence I have stay, which shows a, a continuing action, stay in one place. So here, as you can guess then, we have to leave the beach, blah, 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 10 a.m. Some change, some deadline. So we'll use by to show our deadline. In the second sentence, we have to stay at the beach. Stay shows a continuing action. And then it's going to finish here. So we'll use until. We have to stay at the beach until 10 a.m. This shows us a continuing action and maybe at 10 a.m. we'll leave the beach. All right, uh, let's go on to the next sentence. I'm not going to travel abroad, blah, blah, blah. I learn English. Okay, so here there's no time point. There's no 10 a.m., 8 p.m. Uh, tomorrow and so on. So this is a little more complex maybe. We have travel abroad and learn English. So it seems there's no real uh, deadline here, but we have maybe a change. Maybe this shows us some kind of change. Learning English marks a change. So uh, I'm not going to travel abroad until I learn English. Mm. 
This shows us that something uh, different is going to happen in the future, so we should use until to mark that change. Okay, our last example sentence for today is we told him to wake up, blah, 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 6 a.m. So once more, our last sentence may be a little bit uh, simple, but 6 a.m. shows us an action, sort of this deadline. You can see a lot of these use a time to mark a deadline for an action. So here, we told him to wake up by 6 a.m. This is the point at which something must happen. So we should use by here. Okay, great. So those are a few example sentences that you can have a look at and think about uh, when you're trying to decide whether to use by or until. Keep in mind, however, there are some cases where both by or until are correct but the meaning is going to change significantly depending on the one you use. So uh, I hope this lesson was useful for you. If you have any questions or if you want to try to make an example sentence using by or until, please be sure to leave us a comment. If you liked this video too, please be sure to hit the thumbs up and subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. Thanks very much for watching this episode and we will see you again soon. Bye! Hi everybody, welcome back to Top Words. My name is Alicia and today we're going to talk about 10 phrasal verbs for eating and drinking. So let's get started. Drink up. The first phrasal verb is drink up, drink up. Drink up is a happy, is a cheerful phrase we use that means let's start drinking or let's enjoy drinking or please drink. So you can use it when everybody gets their drinks. Uh, you can say, all right, our beers are here, let's drink up. It means, it has the nuance of drink a lot. Like, you can also use it like as a challenge to someone, like someone who loses a bet or loses like a, an argument, you can say drink up as kind of a challenge. It's sort of like a friendly command for drink. So in a sentence, our beers are here, everybody drink up. Take down. The next phrasal verb is take down, take down, as in take down an order. Take down is a phrasal verb that the staff, like waiter or waitress, will use at the restaurant. They may come to your table and say, can I take down your order? They may also say, can I take your order, of course, but to take down is like to take your order and write it down on a notepad, for example, on a notebook. So take down your order. You might hear this. So in a sentence, when you're ready, I can take down your order. Ring up. The next word is ring up, ring up. We use ring up to mean total, to total something, uh, to total a bill, to total the amount of something at a restaurant or shopping too, for example. Um, so again, this is a word that uh, wait staff, the staff at the restaurant may use. So when you finish your meal, uh, they will ring up your bill, they will ring up your total, and you will pay that amount at the end of your meal. So in a sentence, I'll ring up your bill at the cash register. Set down. The next phrasal verb is set down, set down. So we use set down for items which we are carrying and then we set or we place on a table. So usually there's like a downward motion. If you're carrying something, like you can use it for a backpack if you want to, like to set down, to, to drop something, to leave something, but to put it in, like on a table, to put it in a place specifically there. So. Uh, we can use set down at a restaurant, like please set the plate down on the table, or uh, can you set down my drink over there, or I'll set down your order over here. So set down means to place something, uh, something you were carrying, to place it uh, on a table or to place it on a desk, so set down. In a sentence, please set down the plates carefully. Cut up. The next phrasal verb is cut up, cut up. We use cut up to mean cut, but cut up usually means to cut all of something. So if you receive like, uh, I don't know, chicken or beef or pork or some large item you need to cut, uh, we say cut up to mean cut the entire piece, to cut everything you receive. Uh, so in a sentence, make sure to cut up steak into small pieces, for example. It's easier for children to eat. Or I take a long time to cut up my meat, for example. So cut up means cut everything. Cut into. 
the next phrasal verb is cut into. So to cut into means just to make one slice into something. Usually we use cut into for like the first slice, like we use it maybe to check that a something is properly cooked sometimes. So like to cut into a chicken or to cut into turkey. Uh, we usually use this for the first slice. So the first experience, like uh, when I cut into the chicken, all the juices came out. It looked delicious. I'm excited to cut into my Thanksgiving turkey this year. Or um, I'm, I'm really looking forward to cutting into that steak later. It looked great. So cut into is kind of that uh, first cut, that initial cut where you can see maybe what the what the meat looks like, or you get you get a sense of how the rest of your meal is going to taste. So cut into the first slice. I want to cut into my dinner later. Sop up. The next phrasal verb is sop up. Sop up. So to sop means to soak with liquid. To soak with liquid. To sop up, therefore, is like to to soak to soak liquid from like a bowl or from a cup or something. But we use this with bread usually. So uh, if you're eating soup, for example, and there is leftover soup in your bowl, you can take bread and sop up. Soak up the liquid from your soup with bread. So to sop up liquid. So to soak and pick up something is the image here. So to sop up bread. So for example, I like to sop up my soup with bread or I like to sop up extra sauce with a biscuit, for example. So usually there's some bread and some sauce or liquid we use with this phrase. Cool down. The next phrasal verb is cool down. Cool down means to let something uh, become lower temperature naturally. Uh, so to let something cool down really means to allow something to gradually go to a lower temperature. If you make a pie, for example, it's very hot when it comes out of the oven. So oftentimes the recipe will say, allow to cool down and serve, for example. So meaning after the pie is taken from the oven, you should let the temperature cool. You should let the temperature come down before eating. So to cool down is like reducing the temperature, but just naturally over time. So in a sentence, make sure to let your mashed potatoes cool down before you try to eat them. Heat up. So the next phrasal verb is heat up, heat up. We use heat up usually to talk about microwave use or oven use. So it's taking a cold food or maybe a frozen food, usually just a cold food kept in the refrigerator, put it in the microwave and turn it on to heat the food, to make it warm again. So to heat up is like to move the heat level up, to increase the temperature of the food. We use the phrasal verb heat up to do this. So for example, I like to heat up my pizza uh, before I eat it, my leftover pizza. Or you should heat up uh, yesterday's soup. It would be really good to have that tonight. Or maybe we should heat up uh, something quick for dinner tonight. So heat up means to increase the temperature of a cold thing. Chow down. So the next phrasal verb is sort of a slang expression. It's chow down. Chow down means like to eat really excitedly. It's, uh, it's not a phrasal verb I personally use very much, but um, you can use it to express your enthusiasm for something. So um, it's typically used for like uh, sort of junk food type things or like really, really um, everyday foods. Like in, in the USA, it's like, sandwiches or hot dogs or uh, like something you might get at like a sporting event. We'll say like, I want to chow down on a sandwich later or I want to chow down on some pizza after this. So to chow down is like enthusiastically eat. Like you're not thinking about being polite. You're not worried about looking nice while you eat. You're just enjoying eating very enthusiastically. So like, oh, let's chow down on some pizza later, for example. So, or for example, like we're gonna chow down on some barbecue this weekend, it'll be great. So those are 10 phrasal verbs for eating and drinking. I hope that those are useful for you as you visit restaurants and of course, eat and drink. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, please make sure to let us know in the comment section below this video. If you like this video, make sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. Uh, check us out at EnglishClass101.com for other good stuff too. Thanks very much for watching this episode of Top Words and I'll see you again soon. Bye. 
Or for example, we're gonna chow down on some BBQ this, this weekend. Oh, that, I messed it up. Okay, one more time. Food, usually just a cold food kept in the refrigerator, placing it in the microphone, microphone, <laughs> the microwave. <laughs> My microphone, that's funny. Let's try that again. Want to speak real English from your first lesson? Sign up for your free lifetime account at EnglishClass101.com. Happy New Year! Let's talk about present perfect tense. Hi everybody! Welcome back to Ask Alicia, the weekly series where you ask me questions and I answer them. Maybe. As always, remember you can submit your questions to me at EnglishClass101.com slash ask hyphen Alicia. First question. This question comes from Zara. Hi Alicia, I have a question about present perfect tense. In my native language, there isn't a tense called present perfect tense. I am confused because I don't know the differences between present perfect tense and simple past tense well. Let's begin with an in-depth explanation of these two grammar points and the differences between them. Okay. To begin, let's begin with a simple timeline here. We have the past, now, which is the star on the timeline, and the future. So we're going to focus on the past and the now points. Let's focus on those. So first, let's look at the simple past tense. We use the simple past tense for actions which started and ended in the past. So at a point in time before the present, a point in time before now, in other words. On our timeline then, let's imagine there are two points, a start point and an end point for that action. Okay, so here I've made a start point and an end point on the timeline. So in the past, you can see there are two points, the start and the end of the action, both are in the past. You'll see both of them are in the past. That's the first point about the simple past tense. Also, these are for actions that we did at a specific point in time. We can assign a specific point in time to these actions. For example, this morning, last year, last week, yesterday. There's a specific point in time we can attach to these actions. Okay, so let's talk now about the present perfect tense. Present perfect tense has a couple of different uses. The first use of present perfect tense I want to explain is using the grammar point to explain a life experience. Let's take a look at how visually this is different from the simple past tense. So now on the timeline in blue, you can see this sort of dotted line that I made with a question mark. So the dotted line begins in the past and it ends now, it ends at the current point in time. This is because we use present perfect tense to talk about things that happened at some point in the past, but the specific point is unimportant or unknown. We don't need to explain when the action happened. We only want to state we have had or have not had that experience. So we use this when we want to talk about our life experiences. For example, travel experience or work experience. Like, I have never been to France or I've eaten pho. My parents have never been outside the country, for example. We use this to talk about life experience, but we don't include a specific point in time when we talk about these experiences. It's just some time before the present. The specific point in time is not important in that sentence. You might follow up this sentence with a specific point in time, in which case you use simple past. So let's talk about one more use of the present perfect tense. This is the one we use with the words for and since, and we can also use the continuous tense with this use. The black line on the timeline here shows an action that started in the past and continues to the present, or it's an effect of an action that continues to the present. We use this to talk about our studies, for example, or the places where we live, like I have been studying English for three years, or I have lived in Brazil for 10 years, for example. So remember that we use the words for and since along with this form of the present perfect tense. We use for before a length of time, like I've studied for three years, I've lived in Brazil for five years, and we use uh, since 
before a period of time. So I have uh, lived, I've been studying since 2009, or I've lived here since 2013, for example. So please keep this in mind. The present perfect tense is used for actions that started in the past and continue to the present. Simple past tense is used for actions which started and ended in the past. Next question. This question comes from Maxime. Hi, Maxime. What's the difference between one year and a year? For example, I've lived here for a year, or I've lived here for one year. In this sentence, no difference, honestly. When you're talking about time periods, a year and one year, a minute, one minute, they don't mean anything different. They mean the same thing. Thanks for the question, though. Next question. Next question comes from Huang Zhang Ik. Huang Zhang Ik. I'm very sorry. Which one is correct? I work out for one to two hours a day. I work out for one or two hours a day. I drink coffee two to three times a day. I drink coffee two or three times a day. Ah, both of these are correct, actually. Um, in this case, there are very, very small differences between these. One to two hours a day means between one and two hours. Uh, if you say, I work out for one or two hours a day, it means it's determined, like uh, one hour only for a workout or two hours only for a workout. So the difference here is, are you determining, are you deciding one hour or two cups of coffee or three cups of coffee? Or is it between those two amounts? So using one, two, two or two, two, three means between those two amounts. Using or shows it's either A or B, but not between those two. This is the difference between two and or. Next question. Next question comes from Huang Seina. Huang Wang Seina, Wang Seina. I'm very sorry, I'm very sorry. Uh, I've never been to Japan. I've never been to Japan before. I've never eaten horse. I've never eaten horse before. My question is, if you put before at the end of those sentences, does it mean you are in Japan right now? Or you are eating horse right now? No, not necessarily. Think of before at the end of the sentence as before now. I've never eaten horse before now, in other words. You could use this be just before you eat horse or just before you go to Japan, if you like, as an emphasis phrase, um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you are in Japan now or that you're eating horse now. You could use it in that way, sure, but it doesn't necessarily mean it. If you'd like to emphasize it, like if you're about to eat horse, for example, and you say, I've never eaten horse before, you could show your interest or perhaps to show maybe some anxiety or nervous feelings about uh, what you're about to do. Um, but no, it does not necessarily mean you are in that place. Like for example, you could just be having a conversation. Have you eaten horse before? No, I've never eaten horse before. It could just be a conversation about it. But really, before just means before now. Next question. Next question comes from Rashke. Rash, Rashke. Rashkesh. I'm sorry. Where do we use wanna and gonna and how? Ah, this question is about the casual contracted forms of want to and going to. So want to becomes wanna going to becomes gonna in casual speech. We use them in exactly the same way we would use I want to, I'm going to, he wants to, she wants to, he's going to, she's going to. We use them in exactly the same way, which means we use them in casual situations like I want to take a day off or I'm going to go to the beach this weekend or do you want to see a movie tonight? We use them in exactly the same way we use want to and going to. Uh, but we use them in speech. Typically, we don't write these unless we're writing very casual messages like text messages to our friends or something. Next question. Next question comes from Garrison Silva. Hey again, Garrison. When can I use the expression take for granted? Take for granted. This is an expression which we typically use in the negative, like don't take something something for granted. Don't take blah 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 for granted. It means um, don't forget to appreciate this thing or this person. So for example, uh, don't take your parents for granted or don't take this opportunity for granted. These expressions mean don't forget to appreciate these things or um, don't just disregard your parents or don't disregard this opportunity. You recognize the importance of something. So if you are given a good opportunity, for example, or someone gives you good advice or a very nice gift, perhaps, we would typically use this um, with the negative. Don't take something something for granted, meaning don't forget to show your appreciation for 
that thing or for that person. Next question. Next question. Next question comes from Daniel Silvero. Hi, Daniel. Uh, Daniel asks, what is the difference between wish and desire? Greetings from Paraguay. Hey, uh, what is the difference between wish and desire? Wish is used to express a, a want when you want something that is different from the present situation. So we often use it with I wish I were or I wish I could. Something we, uh, we want or an ability we want but that we do not have now. Something um, for the future. So I wish I could speak seven languages or I wish I had a million dollars or I wish I were taking more time off every week, for example. Something that is different from the present condition, the present situation we use wish or I wish you would call me for example I wish you would or I wish you could to express something that is not happening now desire on the other hand desire tends to be used more formally uh, and it also can carry more romantic nuances it's not used as much conversationally as the word wish is wish is used to express wants things that we want that are not true now Desire is used more um, in romantic situations, um, like to desire another person, or um, he desired more of her time, for example, but it sounds unnecessarily formal, I feel. You might use it in a, in a more formal, like a business context, like our client desires more information about the situation. Um, that could be a different use of the word desire, but in general, it sounds a bit more formal and a bit more romantically charged at times, depending on the situation when it's used. If you're talking about a person as well, like if you say, for example, I desire you, it sounds actually quite odd, at least in American English. Um, if you want to use the word desire, I think in romantic situations, it might be applied in a phrase like, uh, he was filled with desire or she was filled with desire used more as a noun than as a verb. Um, so I would recommend not using desire so much to talk about your wants uh, as it can sound a little bit too formal or can give perhaps the wrong nuance to the situation. But wish is used to express a, a hope for something or wanting something that is different from the present situation. So I hope that helps. Next question, next question from Han Yon Hee. Han, Han Yon Hee? Han Yon Hee? Very sorry. Hey Alicia, what's the difference between maybe, probably, perhaps, and possibly? Great question. Maybe, probably, perhaps, possibly. Okay, maybe, probably, perhaps, and possibly. These are all adverbs. They have the same grammatical function. Maybe, probably, perhaps, and possibly. Maybe and perhaps are very closely related. Maybe and perhaps are, they have the same meaning, but just different levels of formality. Maybe is like the lower level, the more casual version of the word perhaps. So maybe I'll go to the beach this weekend and perhaps I'll go to the beach this weekend. They have really the same meaning, but perhaps sounds more formal. Probably, however, is different. Probably expresses a higher level of possibility than the other words on this list. I'll probably go to the beach this weekend is like a 75 to 80% chance the speaker is going to go to the beach this weekend. Possibly, however, possibly has more of a nuance of just that something can be done. It is possible to do something. We use possibly more in requests. Like, could you possibly blah, blah, blah for me? Could you possibly send me this file? Um, possibly sounds a little too formal for casual conversations and invitations. Uh, but if you're using it at work, for example, could you possibly meet me later this week? Instead of, could you maybe meet me? So the difference between maybe and possibly and perhaps there, um, possible, has that root, yeah? Possible, able to. So maybe and perhaps don't have that nuance. Possibly sounds like, is it possible? Is it, are you able to do this thing? Maybe and perhaps don't contain that nuance. So uh, to recap, maybe and perhaps are used to express the same thing, a chance of something happening, perhaps is more formal. Possibly is used in a similar way, however, it refers more to simple possibility than is it is are you able to do that thing? 
probably expresses a high chance of something. Thanks so much for all your questions. Remember, you can submit to me at EnglishClass101.com slash ask hyphen Alicia. Thanks very much for watching this episode of Ask Alicia. I will see you again next week. Bye-bye. Happy New Year, and I hope that uh, your studies continue well. How are your English listening skills? First, you'll see an image and hear a question. Next comes a short dialogue. Listen carefully and see if you can answer correctly. We'll show you the answer at the end. A man is calling the doctor's office. What time does he need to be at the doctor's office by? Hello, how can I help you? What time do you close today? We close at 6 o'clock, but please come in before 5.30. Okay. Thank you. What time does he need to be at the doctor's office by? A man is calling the doctor's office. What time does he need to be at the doctor's office by? Hello, how can I help you? What time do you close today? We close at 6 o'clock, but please come in before 5.30. Okay. Thank you. Did you get it right? I hope you learned something from this quiz. Let us know if you have any questions. See you next time. In this video, you'll learn 20 of the most common words and phrases in English. Hi everybody, my name is Alicia. Welcome to the 800 Core English Words and Phrases video series. This series will teach you the 800 most common words and phrases in English. But there's a twist. With each new lesson in this series, we'll include the previous lessons at the end. So after you've learned the new words and phrases, stick around and review what you learned in previous lessons. Reviewing is one of the most important parts of learning a language. You can also get the full list right now at EnglishClass101.com. Click the link in the description to access more example sentences, create your own flashcard deck, and finally master English. Okay, let's get started. First is happy. 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 We use happy to describe our mood. We use this word when we are feeling positive. I am a happy person. I am a happy person. I am a happy person. Sad, sad, sad. So the word sad is used to describe our feelings when we are feeling down or low. The sad teenager is sitting alone. The sad teenager is sitting alone. The sad teenager is sitting alone. Angry, angry. Angry. The word angry also refers to our emotions. We use it in times when we feel upset or very unhappy about something. There was something that made me angry this morning. There was something that made me angry this morning. There was something that made me angry this morning. Clothing. 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 Clothing is a word that's used to refer to anything we wear. This can mean coats, pants, jackets, shirts, hats, whatever. I worked at a clothing store. I worked at a clothing store. I worked at a clothing store. Shoe. 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 So a shoe is something you wear on your foot. I need new shoes. I need new shoes. I need new shoes. Sock. 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 
A sock is something that you wear between your shoe and your foot, usually. You wear heavy socks often in winter. Are you wearing socks? Are you wearing socks? Are you wearing socks? Underwear. 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 So underwear refers to the clothing we wear under the clothes we can see. My socks and underwear are in the top drawer of my dresser. My socks and underwear are in the top drawer of my dresser. My socks and underwear are in the top drawer of my dresser. Talk. 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 We use the verb talk when we want to refer to a conversation so two or more people are participating. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. Give. 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 We use the verb give when we want to provide someone with something else. Can I give you a useful tip? Can I give you a useful tip? Can I give you a useful tip? Low. 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 We use the word low to talk about something that is not high. This is the opposite of high. So it's something near the ground. This table is too low for me. This table is too low for me. This table is too low for me. High. 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 So the word high is the opposite of the word low. It refers to something that is far away from the ground. The waves are high today. The waves are high today. The waves are high today. Fruit. 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 So fruit refers to a category of foods. So fruits tend to be rather sweet. Please put the fruits on the plate. Please put the fruits on the plate. Please put the fruits on the plate. Octopus. 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 So an octopus is a very interesting animal with eight legs. Uh, some cultures like to eat octopus. The octopus is swimming in the ocean. The octopus is swimming in the ocean. The octopus is swimming in the ocean. Shark. 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 So a shark is, for many people, a very scary undersea creature. Some of them are huge and can eat people. The surfer was bitten by a shark. The surfer was bitten by a shark. The surfer was bitten by a shark. Whale. 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 So whales are typically very, very large creatures that live under the sea. Some are peaceful, some are aggressive. Whales are mammals. Whales are mammals. Whales are mammals. Cloudy. 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 So cloudy refers to weather. It's used on days when there are many clouds in the sky. I don't like cloudy days. I don't like cloudy days. I don't like cloudy days. Cool. 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 We use cool when the weather is not like cold, but it feels a little bit nice actually still. The weather is cool. The weather is cool. The weather is cool. Cucumber. 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 So a cucumber is a food that we can eat. It's something that's healthy and usually pretty refreshing. These cucumbers are fresh. These cucumbers are fresh. 
These cucumbers are fresh. Bell pepper. Bell pepper. Bell pepper. So a bell pepper is another food that many people like to eat. Sometimes they're a little bit bitter. The most common bell peppers are green, red, or yellow. The most common bell peppers are green, red, or yellow. The most common bell peppers are green, red, or yellow. Broccoli. 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 Broccoli is another very healthy food. Lots of kids really don't like it, though. Order the broccoli soup. Order the broccoli soup. Order the broccoli soup. Well done. In this lesson, you expanded your vocabulary and learned 20 new useful words. Click the link in the description and sign up for free at EnglishClass101.com to get access to the full list of vocabulary you'll need for daily life conversations. You'll also get example sentences, custom flashcard decks, and more learning resources. See you next time. Bye-bye. The coffee is in me. Hi, everybody. My name is Alicia, and today we're going to be talking about the top 25 English adjectives. So these are the top 25 English adjectives in terms of how often they're used. So let's get right into it. Okay, the first adjective is the word good. Good can be used to refer to anything that you think is good or great or positive. In the comparative form, it is better. In the superlative form, it is best. So I think pizza is good. I think that sleep is good. I really think that sleep is good. Baseball is good. Playing sports is good. Video games are good. The next word is new. Comparative form, newer. Com superlative form, newest. I have a new haircut. Do you want a new bike? I need to get a new job. Not true, sorry, no, <laughs> just an example sentence. So the next one is first. First just refers to um, the number one of something. Yeah, the original of something. You could say the first silent film or the first movie I ever watched or the first CD I ever bought. The first CD I ever bought was Michael Jackson's Bad. Next word is last, the final of something. We use last to refer to the most recent of something as well as in the last time I went to the beach or the last time I went to the forest or the last time I saw my friend. Have you ever? eaten the last piece of pizza when you weren't supposed to? <laughs> what was the last word we talked about? It was first. The next word is long. Uh, long. Anything that you feel is... <laughs> Lightsabers are long. Subway sandwiches are long. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I'm not supposed to laugh for long. The next word is great. Great can be used to express any positive emotion. Somebody gives you new information and you think it's good, uh, but you want to express that it's even better than good, you can say it's great. Greater is the comparative form. Greatest is the superlative form. The greatest invention of all time was the light bulb, for example. What do you think is your greatest achievement? One of life's greatest pleasures is finding people to be good friends with. Is great! <laughs> the next word is little. This is a very common uh, word that gets used in an expression like when I was little, referring to when you were a kid. So when I was little, I really liked to play outside. Or when I was little, I was really into Pokemon. I have said very little about the word little. The next word is near. Near, nearer, nearest. You probably know the location of the nearest, maybe a supermarket to your house or the nearest post office. I live near a very fashionable store. The next word is big. Big is used for anything that is large in size or large conceptually. So for example, you can say an elephant is a big animal or in terms of concept, you can say, um, let's see, that fashion is really big right now or that artist is really big right now. And that refers to popularity. Big movies are exciting to watch with friends. Do you have any bigger sandwiches? I'm really hungry. Next word is other. Other just refers to something else, something different from what is currently happening. The other thing, the other person. My other friend is a DJ. My other friend is a cook. My other friend is a dancer. My other friend, I have very interesting friends. 
What other things have you done with your life? <laughs> the next word is old. Old, it can be used to refer to people, it can be used to refer to animals, to art, anything that has a long history. So maybe I like old movies, or I don't like old art, or I think my grandpa is really, really old. This is getting old. The next word is right. This can be used to refer to the direction, right, as in the opposite of left, or it can be used to refer to something that is correct. So in a sentence like, you're right, it means you are correct. That is the correct answer. It can also be used to mean right, as in make a right turn. Uh, but you'll have to listen to the context to decide which meaning is the true meaning. This is not right could mean something that's not fair or that you disagree strongly with. This is not right. The next word is high. High refers to something that is very tall, very way up somewhere. So many people might say like, I have a fear of high buildings or I have a fear of high places. It can also, in the comparative form, just refer to something higher or taller than something else. Highest, meaning the most high. Squeaky level is high. I like high volume uh, music. The next word is different. Not the same as something else is different. I think that having many different friends is a lot of fun. Do you enjoy listening to different kinds of music? The next word is small. Small, smaller, smallest. Small and little are extremely similar. I would pretty much use them in the same way. Uh, however, we don't say when I was a small kid. We say when I was a little kid. Or you can say when I was small. The next word is large. Large and big are very much the same. I will say though that large is used on clothing sizes. Big is not. When we talked about big, we talked about how big can be used to refer to something that's very popular. Large is not used to refer to something that's, that's popular. Large is used um, for, for sizing, I feel, only. So like a house can be large, but it's, it's used to refer to like the physical size of something. Uh, large and in charge. Large, larger, largest. This is the largest uh, the bottom is in the zoo. <laughs> I have to go. The next word is easy. Easy is the next word. Easy, easier, easiest. Now, this is a good one that you can use anytime something seems very simple for you. For example, this test is easy, or that was the easiest thing I've ever done, or I hope this test is easier than the last test. You, oh gosh, don't call a person easy, Alicia. Uh, don't ever call a person easy unless you're trying to be really rude. My driving test was really easy. Or what's the easiest language you've ever studied? The next word is difficult. Uh, difficult is something that seems hard to do. What is the most difficult thing you've ever had to do? The most difficult thing I've ever had to do was move to a different country. The next word is young. Young, younger, youngest. Come on, guys. Uh, younger, younger generations have a lot of uh, new technologies to experiment with. Young! The next word is important. Important, more important, most important. What is important to you? I think that practicing a, another language is more important than playing my banjo. I don't have a banjo. <laughs> you can find something that's important to you and put your time into it. I think drinking a lot of water every day is important. Putting on your shoes before you leave the house is very important. I have to go, it's very important that I go. Next word is interesting, interesting. Anything that you think is cool, anything that you find that makes you go ooh is something that's interesting. I think that this type of music is the most interesting type of music. Your mom is interesting. The next word is short, short, shorter, shortest. I am the shortest person in my class. I'm the shortest person in the room. Short just refers to something that is not long. So it can refer to a size or it can also refer to a concept um, as in a length of time. So like I'm going to travel abroad for a short period of time. Bad. You know I'm bad, I'm bad, you know. Bad, something that is not good. Bad food will give you bad feelings in your stomach. You're a bad dog. Who's a bad dog? You're a bad dog. The next one is boring. Something that is not interesting. Something that does not make you go, ooh, but something that makes you go, huh. The most boring story I've ever heard was a story about a tomato. If I don't do anything, this will be really boring. Oh. Far, referring to distance. Something that is not near to you is far. How can I go farther? Far. The farthest I've ever run is seven kilometers. I am not a runner.
Okay, that's the end of the top 25 English adjectives. You've probably used these if you're studying English,、uh, and if you haven't, try to experiment with them、um, and see what kind of interesting sentences that you can make up. Try to use the、uh, the normal form and the comparative form and the negative form and the superlative form. You can express a lot with just these 25 words, so give them a try. Thanks very much for watching us in this lesson, and we'll see you again soon. Bye. Cows are delicious. <laughs>、Hey、everybody, my name is Alicia. In this lesson, I'm going to talk about the difference between someone, everyone, and anyone, and somebody, anybody, and everybody. Let's get started by looking at the meanings of these words and how we use them. Okay, let's begin with someone and somebody to begin with.、Uh, you can remember someone and somebody and anyone and anybody follow very similar rules as some. And any. If you've seen the video on our channel talking about some and any, maybe you remember、um, the rules that I'm going to explain here. You can check that video for some extra information about those grammar points too. So let's start with someone and somebody. We use someone and somebody in positive statements. So a simple statement, not a question. In other words, when we make a positive statement, we use someone and somebody in that sentence structure. We also use these two words in requests and in offers. So keep in mind these are two categories of question. So a request question or an offer question. Let's take a look at some examples of this now. First of all, there's someone at the office. So here I've chosen someone. There's someone at the office. This is a positive statement. So not a question, just a statement. It's a positive here. The next example: Can you send someone to help me? Can you send someone to help me? This is a request. So a specific type of question, a request question. Can you send someone to help me? The third example sentence is an offer. Would you like to talk to somebody? Would you like to talk to somebody? So here we have request, offer, positive statement. We can use someone or somebody in each of these examples. So I've used someone, someone, and somebody here. But actually, we can change each of these to the other choice. Both are fine in each of these example sentences. I'll talk more about the difference between one and buddy a little bit later. For now, however, let's move on to the difference between anyone and anybody. Okay, so this is a key difference between someone and somebody. Anyone and anybody. This is used in negative statements. These are used in negative statements. Someone and somebody used in positive statements. So this follows the same rule as some and any. So in negative statements, and we use anyone and anybody in information questions. So that means that not、uh, requests, not offers, but you're looking for some kind of information. Um, we use anyone and anybody in these cases. So let's look at a few examples of this. First, I don't think anyone is at the office. Don't think anyone is at the office. So here we've used anyone because it's a negative. Here's my negative. It's in the do not. So not right here. This is my negative. Therefore, I've used anyone here. One more example sentence, a question this time. Has anybody seen my keys? Here I've used anybody. I've used this because this is an information question. I'm looking for some information I don't have now. This is not a request. It's not an offer. So I shouldn't use someone or somebody. I need to use anyone or anybody. I'm looking for information. This third example sentence is the same. Why hasn't anyone returned my calls? Here, anyone, and I'm looking for information. In this case, a why. This is a why question. So again, not a request, not an offer. I'm looking to find something new. I'm looking for information, so I should use anyone. Again, just as I talked about with someone and somebody, I can change this anyone, anybody, and anyone. 
to the other word. It's fine to use the other word here. For example, anybody, anyone, anybody. That's perfectly fine. Again, I'll explain more a little bit later here. But remember, uh, anyone and anybody is used in negative statements. Someone, somebody used in positive statements. This is one key difference. Okay, but let's move along now to everyone and everybody. Everyone and everybody, uh, this will follow kind of a different rule than someone uh, and anyone. We use everyone and everybody to refer to all people related to a situation or related to a group. So this could mean a class, it could mean every person in an office, it could mean in a city, in a country. Uh, so it just depends on the group or the situation. We use this word when we want to talk about all people related to that group or related to the situation. So let's look at some examples. Okay, first one. Everyone in our class graduated. So here everyone in our class graduated refers to all the people in our class. So uh, everyone in that group of people. In this case, the group is the class. So all people in the class. Another example, it was great to see everybody at the reunion. So everybody here shows us again, all people. And this could be a class reunion. It could be a family reunion a company reunion. Um, so this just means it was great to see all the related people, so the people related to the situation at this reunion event. One more example then. Everybody had a great time. So here everybody shows us everybody in the situation. So maybe everybody who attended the event had a great time. Everybody who attended the party had a great time. This is quite a common expression after an event of some kind. So again, as we saw with uh, the first two groups, we can actually change each of these words to the other word. So everyone can be replaced with everybody. Uh, same thing here, everybody and everybody can be replaced with everyone. So I want to end this lesson with a quick introduction uh, or a quick overview to the difference between these two endings, one and buddy. What is the difference here? Really, one, the words that end in one, someone, anyone, and everyone, they sound more formal than the words that end in buddy. So um, we can actually use these interchangeably. Interchangeably means we can mix and match them. We can choose which one we prefer. So that means the meanings are the same, uh, like their purpose is the same. It's just up to us to choose. So why would we do this? Why would we choose one word and not the other word? Um, you can choose according to the syllables. If you remember, syllables is the number of beats. A syllable is a beat of a word. So for example, somebody, somebody has three beats. Someone has only two beats, two syllables. This is important when you are writing, especially like writing poetry, writing lyrics for music, or maybe you're trying to write a nice essay, for example, we are listening for which words sound nice to our ears. So sometimes the word somebody sounds nice, sometimes the word someone sounds better. So it's up to us, meaning we can decide, we can choose which word we prefer to use. So you just have to listen and kind of feel which you prefer. There's no difference in meaning, it's just a sound preference and a little bit of a formality difference. So I hope that this lesson helps you understand the differences between these words a little bit. As I said, if you want some more information about the difference between some and any, you can search the YouTube channel for that video as well. Uh, of course, if you like the video, please don't forget to give it a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and check us out at EnglishClass101.com for some other good English study tools. Thanks very much for watching this lesson, and we will see you again soon. Bye-bye. In this video, you'll learn 20 of the most common words and phrases in English. Hi, everybody. My name is Alicia. Welcome to the 800 Core English Words and Phrases video series. This series will teach you the 800 most common words and phrases in English. But there's a twist. With each new lesson in this series, we'll include the previous lessons at the end. So after you've learned the new words and phrases, stick around and review what you learned in previous lessons. 
Reviewing is one of the most important parts of learning a language. You can also get the full list right now at EnglishClass101.com. Click the link in the description to access more example sentences, create your own flashcard deck, and finally master English. Okay, let's get started. First is dog. 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 A dog is a very popular and very common pet. We see small dogs and big dogs. Is that your dog? Is that your dog? Is that your dog? Cat. 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 Cats are also very, very popular pets. We see cats that have very short fur and cats that have long, fluffy fur. My cat likes to take a nap in the afternoon. My cat likes to take a nap in the afternoon. My cat likes to take a nap in the afternoon. Hamster. 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 So a hamster is a very small pet. It's kind of popular among very young children. Hamsters like to sleep during the day. Hamsters like to sleep during the day. Hamsters like to sleep during the day. Warm. 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 We use warm to describe a temperature that's not quite hot, that's a little bit pleasant, but it's not cool either. The soup must be warm. The soup must be warm. The soup must be warm. Rain. 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 We use the word rain to talk about the water that falls from the sky. The rain is falling on the street. The rain is falling on the street. The rain is falling on the street. Tomato. 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 A tomato is a red fruit. They're very common in salads. There are very large tomatoes or smaller tomatoes as well. My grandfather grows tomatoes in his garden. My grandfather grows tomatoes in his garden. My grandfather grows tomatoes in his garden. Strawberry. 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 A strawberry is a very sweet red berry that's very common in desserts. I like strawberry, not apple. I like strawberry, not apple. I like strawberry, not apple. Cherry. 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 So a cherry is another small, sweet red berry, or not really a berry, more of a small fruit that you can eat. Uh, you can typically have them in one bite. I want to eat cherries. I want to eat cherries. I want to eat cherries. Child. 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 So a child is someone who is not an adult. Uh, usually around the age of 15, 14 or so, they kind of start to become like an adult. When I was a child, I used to ride my bike to school every day. When I was a child, I used to ride my bike to school every day. When I was a child, I used to ride my bike to school every day. Friend. 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 So a friend is someone that we are close to, we can share our experiences with and enjoy spending time together. I met a friend at the park. I met a friend at the park. I met a friend at the park. Adult. 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 So an adult is someone who is a grown person. Uh, in your country, maybe an adult is 18 years old or 20 years old or 21 years old, but an adult is someone who can be responsible for themselves. Sometimes being an adult just isn't very fun. Sometimes being an adult just isn't very fun. Sometimes being an adult just isn't very fun. Bicycle. 
bicycle. Bicycle. A bicycle is a mode of transportation. It's popular with kids, it's popular with adults. You can ride easily around your city or your neighborhood with a bicycle. The bicycle is in the garage. The bicycle is in the garage. The bicycle is in the garage. Car. 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 A car is a very common mode of transportation in North America. Many people have their own car. What kind of car is it? What kind of car is it? What kind of car is it? Motorcycle. 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 So a motorcycle is like a bicycle with an engine. Usually one person or maybe two people can ride a motorcycle. He has two cars and a motorcycle. He has two cars and a motorcycle. He has two cars and a motorcycle. Scooter. 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 So a scooter is a little bit shorter than a motorcycle. It's something you can sit on and there are places to put your feet on either side and you can ride it around your city or your neighborhood. Scooters are convenient in the city. Scooters are convenient in the city. Scooters are convenient in the city. Boat. 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 So a boat refers to a method of transportation for water. You can use a rowboat, a very old fashioned style boat, or very, very large expensive boats called yachts. The boat floats on the water. The boat floats on the water. The boat floats on the water. Jellyfish. 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 So a jellyfish is an undersea creature. Some of them can be dangerous. They may sting people as a way to defend themselves against attacks. The jellyfish are bobbing in the water. The jellyfish are bobbing in the water. The jellyfish are bobbing in the water. Lobster. 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 So a lobster is another sea creature. Lobsters are very popular because they are delicious. Lobsters are very expensive. Lobsters are very expensive. Lobsters are very expensive. Crab. 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 So a crab is another sea creature. Crabs typically have very large pinchers and they walk in this motion. They walk from side to side. Crabs usually walk sideways. Crabs usually walk sideways. Crabs usually walk sideways. Turtle, turtle, turtle. So a turtle is another water-based creature. Turtles are known for being very, very slow and they have a hard shell to protect them. The sea turtle is swimming in the sea. The sea turtle is swimming in the sea. The sea turtle is swimming in the sea. Well done. In this lesson, you expanded your vocabulary and learned 20 new useful words. Click the link in the description and sign up for free at EnglishClass101.com to get access to the full list of vocabulary you need for daily life conversations. You'll also get example sentences, custom flashcard decks, and more learning resources. See you next time. Bye-bye. In this video, you'll learn 20 of the most common words and phrases in English. Hi everybody, my name is Alicia. Welcome to the 800 Core English Words and Phrases video series. This series will teach you the 800 most common words and phrases in English. But there's a twist. With each new lesson in this series, we'll include the previous lessons at the end. So after you've learned the new words and phrases, stick around and review what you learned in previous lessons. Reviewing is one of the most important parts of learning a language. You can also get the full list right now at EnglishClass101.com. 
Click the link in the description to access more example sentences, create your own flashcard deck, and finally master English. Okay, let's get started. First is kettle. 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 A kettle is something that you use to heat up water. You might also hear this called a teapot. The kettle is on the stove. The kettle is on the stove. The kettle is on the stove. Pot. 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 A pot is something we use in the kitchen. It's usually big and round and we use it for soups and stews. That pot is 10 years old. That pot is 10 years old. That pot is 10 years old. Frog. 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 A frog is a small creature. They're typically green and we can see them around lakes and rivers. The green frog is in the water. The green frog is in the water. The green frog is in the water. Pigeon. 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 A pigeon is a very common bird. They're very well known in like big cities and in town centers as kind of a nuisance or a pest. Don't feed the pigeons. Don't feed the pigeons. Don't feed the pigeons. Guidebook. 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 A guidebook is a book that is intended to be used as a guide. We can use guidebooks for restaurants, for travel, for many different topics. A guidebook will give you helpful information for your trip. A guidebook will give you helpful information for your trip. A guidebook will give you helpful information for your trip. Entrance. 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 An entrance is a place, usually in a building, where you can enter the space. Where's the entrance? Where's the entrance? Where's the entrance? Tour guide. Tour guide. Tour guide. A tour guide is someone who leads a tour. They are the person responsible for guiding the people on the tour. Meet your tour guide at the entrance to the hotel. Meet your tour guide at the entrance to the hotel. Meet your tour guide at the entrance to the hotel. Reservation. 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 A reservation is an appointment. We use the word reservation when we're talking about restaurants, hotels, and flight tickets as well. Do you have a reservation? Do you have a reservation? Do you have a reservation? Passport. 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 A passport is a special document given by your country that allows you to travel internationally. It's ID. The passport has expired. The passport has expired. The passport has expired. Computer science. Computer science. Computer science. Computer science is a topic of study. It's the use of computers and science together. Computer science classes are on Mondays. Computer science classes are on Mondays. Computer science classes are on Mondays. Math, math, math. Math is the short form of the word mathematics. It can refer to very simple mathematics or complicated mathematics. My favorite subject in school is math. My favorite subject in school is math. My favorite subject in school is math. Feel. Feel, feel. 
The verb feel can be used to talk about the sensation of touching something, or it can be used to express our emotions. I feel wonderful tonight. I feel wonderful tonight. I feel wonderful tonight. Draw. 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 The verb draw is the verb that we use to refer to making a picture. So we use a pen or a pencil or something else to create a picture. The artist draws a picture. The artist draws a picture. The artist draws a picture. Plan. 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 Plan can be used as a verb or as a noun. As a verb, it means to create a schedule for something. We'll plan the holiday to Europe. We'll plan the holiday to Europe. We'll plan the holiday to Europe. Sail. 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 Sale is a noun. It refers to a discount. It's often used when shopping to refer to a place where you can receive a discount. There's a big sale in the shoe department. There's a big sale in the shoe department. There's a big sale in the shoe department. Shopping. 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 Shopping can be used as a noun. It can also be a verb in the progressive form. It refers to going out to a mall or a department store to look for something to buy. I love shopping for clothes. I love shopping for clothes. I love shopping for clothes. Fourth. 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 Fourth comes after third, which is after second and first, it refers to the number four of something. For my fourth birthday, my mother gave me a book. For my fourth birthday, my mother gave me a book. For my fourth birthday, my mother gave me a book. Fifth. 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 Fifth refers to the number five of something. It comes after fourth. You live on the fifth floor, don't you? You live on the fifth floor, don't you? You live on the fifth floor, don't you? Sixth. 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 So sixth refers to the number six of something. This is a really good word to practice some pronunciation. Slow down that six, that middle part there. The sixth book from the left. The sixth book from the left. The sixth book from the left. Seventh. 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 Seventh refers to the number seven of something. This is just like the word seven, but with th at the end. Please read the seventh paragraph of the contract. Please read the seventh paragraph of the contract. Please read the seventh paragraph of the contract. Well done. In this lesson, you expanded your vocabulary and learned 20 new useful words. Click the link in the description and sign up for free at EnglishClass101.com to get access to the full list of vocabulary you'll need for daily life conversations. You'll also get example sentences, custom flashcard decks, and more learning resources. See you next time. Goodbye. Hi everybody, welcome back to Top Words. My name is Alicia and today we're going to be talking about the top 10 must-know vocabulary for restaurants. So let's eat. Waiter. The first word is waiter. Waiter or waitress or wait staff. These are the people who bring you your food and take your orders. In a sentence, your waiter will be with you in a moment. Menu. The next word is menu. Menu is the piece of paper or the document, the thing that's on your table or near your table that has a description of all the food you can eat at that restaurant. In a sentence, can I have the menu please? Order. The next word is order. Order. You can use this as a noun or as a verb. You can say to order something or where is my order? 
In a sentence, I would like to order two steaks, three hamburgers, four beers, a large pizza, and a piece of chocolate cake to go to my home. Water. The next word is water. In American restaurants, you usually get water for free. I noticed when I traveled in Europe, you had to pay for water at restaurants. That was interesting. In a sentence, American restaurants usually give you a glass of water without having to ask. Dessert. The next word is dessert. Dessert is the sweet stuff, the sweet course, all the sweet foods that come after the main part of the meal. In a sentence, can we see the dessert menu? Chef. Chef. Chef is the leader of the kitchen, the person that is cooking the food. In fancy restaurants, the chef is like the, the one who is running the operation, the manager of everything. There are different levels of chef in the kitchen. In a sentence, you can say, please give my compliments to the chef. Fast food. The next word is fast food. Fast food is anything that's quick. Popular examples in America are McDonald's, Burger King, Subway, Taco Bell, Kentucky Fried Chicken, Jack in the Box. So those are all fast food restaurants. You get in and you get out very, very quickly. They don't have a reputation for being very healthy. Uh, in a sentence, I try to eat fast food as rarely as possible. Bill. The next word is bill. You might also hear check. Bill and check mean the total of your meal. How much uh, your dining experience costs you is the bill or the check. A bill comes before you have paid. A receipt is the piece of paper you get after you have paid. The receipt shows, confirms you have paid money. The bill is the request for money. That's the difference between bill or check and receipt. In a sentence, usually you say, can I have the bill please? Or can I have the check please? Delicious. Delicious. Delicious means something that tastes good. We have many variations on delicious. We say delicious, good, yum, yummy, fantastic, great, and so on. It's kind of strange to me to say this is delicious. I usually just say this is good or this is really good. Something like that is a bit more natural than delicious. In a sentence, my dinner today was delicious. Main course. Main course. It's often like a meat dish, actually, like, like roast something or I don't know. It's also called the entree. Maybe it's a really fancy pasta dish in some cases. I don't know. In a sentence, for the main course, our specials are chicken and zucchini and curry. Uh, that's the end. So those are 10 words that you can use in a restaurant. I think they're very useful when traveling, actually. So try to keep them in mind the next time you go out to eat. If you haven't already, please be sure to like and subscribe to our channel. And if you like, also, please check us out at EnglishClass101.com for more fun stuff. Thanks very much. Bye. In this video, you'll learn 20 of the most common words and phrases in English. Hi everybody, my name is Alicia. Welcome to the 800 Core English Words and Phrases video series. This series will teach you the 800 most common words and phrases in English. But there's a twist. With each new lesson in this series, we'll include the previous lessons at the end. So after you've learned the new words and phrases, stick around and review what you learned in previous lessons. Reviewing is one of the most important parts of learning a language. You can also get the full list right now at EnglishClass101.com. Click the link in the description to access more example sentences, create your own flashcard deck, and finally, master English. Okay, let's get started. First is today. 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 Today means this day. We use this when we want to talk about something that's happening on this day, like part of a schedule. Today's homework. Today's homework. Today's homework. Yesterday. 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 So yesterday means the day before today. So you can use this word when you're talking about like past actions. Yesterday morning. Yesterday morning. Yesterday morning. Tomorrow. 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 So tomorrow is like the opposite of yesterday. It means the day after today. So we use this when we're talking about our future plans. See you tomorrow. 
See you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. Week. 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 So week refers to seven days, that seven day period. So we use week when we want to talk about making plans or our schedules and so on. I'm busy this week. I'm busy this week. I'm busy this week. Year. 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 So a year is 365 days. So we use year when we're talking about points in time, like historical events. One year. One year. One year. Second. 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 So second refers to a very short period of time. So the amount of time that's inside one minute, for example, there are 60 seconds in a minute. There are 60 seconds in a minute. There are 60 seconds in a minute. 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 Min -ut. So minute refers to, again, a period of time. We learned that there are 60 seconds in a minute, and we can use minutes when we're talking about times of day. Three minutes. Three minutes. Three minutes. Hour. 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 So an hour refers to one of those 24 blocks of time throughout the day. I sleep for eight hours every day. I sleep for eight hours every day. I sleep for eight hours every day. Clock. 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 A clock is an object that we use to understand what time of day it is. We can have analog or digital. Alarm clock. Alarm clock. Alarm clock. A clock. A clock. A clock. So a clock is used after a number from 1 to 12 to show that it's a specific hour. Let's meet at the station at 9 o'clock. Let's meet at the station at 9 o'clock. Let's meet at the station at 9 o'clock. Calendar. 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 So a calendar is something we use to understand the dates of the year. There are 12 months on a typical calendar. I marked our anniversary on the calendar. I marked our anniversary on the calendar. I marked our anniversary on the calendar. Monday. 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 So Monday is, for most people, the first day of the work week. I go to work on Monday. I go to work on Monday. I go to work on Monday. Tuesday. 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 Tuesday is, for most people, the second day of the work week. Tuesday, January 1st. Tuesday, January 1st. Tuesday, January 1st. Wednesday. 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 So Wednesday is the middle day of the week, but keep in mind this is pronounced Wednesday. There's a D there, but we don't say Wednesday. We say Wednesday. Wednesday the 18th. Wednesday the 18th. Wednesday the 18th. Thursday. 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 So Thursday is the fourth day of the work week, 
the day that comes before Friday. So most people get a little bit excited for Friday, and thus Thursday is kind of the day when some people start their weekends a little bit early. Thursday, January 3rd. Thursday, January 3rd. Thursday, January 3rd. Friday. 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 So Friday is the last day of the work week, and lots of people get excited about Friday, and they do things on Friday nights with their friends or their coworkers. Are you free this Friday? Are you free this Friday? Are you free this Friday? Saturday. 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 So Saturday is the first day of the weekend. Lots of people choose to do things like their hobbies or maybe take a trip somewhere. It's a day to relax for lots of people. Saturday night. Saturday night. Saturday night. Sunday. 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 So Sunday is the last day of the weekend, usually. Sunday tends to be a more relaxing day, so we're kind of recharging a little bit and taking it easy. Sunday morning breakfast. Sunday morning breakfast. Sunday morning breakfast. Do. 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 So do is used when we're referring to some kind of activity. We're making something happen. We are taking care of something. Do homework. Do homework. Do homework. Go. 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 So the verb go means to move from one place to another place. We use this when we're traveling or maybe even when we're talking about some place we would like to go or like to travel to. Go to the park. Go to the park. Go to the park. Well done. In this lesson, you expanded your vocabulary and learned 20 new useful words. Click the link in the description and sign up for free at EnglishClass101.com to get access to the full list of vocabulary you'll need for daily life conversations. You'll also get example sentences, custom flashcard decks, and more learning resources. See you next time. Bye-bye. Did you download your free PDF cheat sheets yet? These conversation cheat sheets are an easy way to speak more because you get cheat sheets for conversational topics like the weather, family, hobbies, and much more. And inside, you'll learn common questions and answers that you'd use in conversations, as well as tons of vocabulary. Don't miss out on this free gift. Click the link in the description to get access. Hi everybody, my name is Alicia. In this lesson, I'm going to talk about the difference between someone, everyone, and anyone, and somebody, anybody, and everybody. Let's get started by looking at the meanings of these words and how we use them. Okay, let's begin with someone and somebody to begin with. Uh, you can remember someone and somebody and anyone and anybody follow very similar rules as some and any. If you've seen the video on our channel talking about some and any, maybe you remember um, the rules that I'm going to explain here. You can check that video for some extra information about those grammar points too. So let's start with someone and somebody. We use someone and somebody in positive statements. So a simple statement, not a question in other words. When we make a positive statement, we use someone and somebody in that sentence structure. We also use these two words in requests and in offers. So keep in mind, these are two categories of question. So a request question or an offer question. Let's take a look at some examples of this now. First of all, there's someone at the office. So here I've chosen someone. There's someone at the office. This is a positive statement. So not a question, just a statement. It's a positive here. The next example, can you send someone to help me? Can you send someone to help me? 
This is a request, so a specific type of question, a request question. Can you send someone to help me? The third example sentence is an offer. Would you like to talk to somebody? Would you like to talk to somebody? So here we have request, offer, positive statement. We can use someone or somebody in each of these examples. So I've used someone, someone, and somebody here, but actually we can change each of these to the other choice. Both are fine in each of these example sentences. I'll talk more about the difference between one and buddy a little bit later. For now, however, let's move on to the difference between anyone and anybody. Okay, so this is a key difference between someone and somebody. Anyone and anybody this is used in negative statements. These are used in negative statements. Someone and somebody used in positive statements. So this follows the same rule as some and any. So in negative statements, and we use anyone and anybody in information questions. So that means that not uh, requests, not offers, but you're looking for some kind of information. Um, we use anyone and anybody in these cases. So let's look at a few examples of this. First, I don't think anyone is at the office. Don't think anyone is at the office. So here we've used anyone because it's a negative. Here's my negative. It's in the do not. So not right here. This is my negative. Therefore, I've used anyone here. One more example sentence, a question this time. Has anybody seen my keys? Here I've used anybody. I've used this because this is an information question. I'm looking for some information I don't have now. This is not a request, it's not an offer. So I shouldn't use someone or somebody. I need to use anyone or anybody. I'm looking for information. This third example sentence is the same. Why hasn't anyone returned my calls? Here, anyone. And I'm looking for information. In this case, a why. This is a why question. So again, not a request, not an offer. I'm looking to find something new. I'm looking for information, so I should use anyone. Again, just as I talked about with someone and somebody, I can change this anyone, anybody, and anyone to the other word. It's fine to use the other word here. For example, anybody, anyone, anybody. That's perfectly fine. Again, I'll explain more a little bit later here. But remember, uh, anyone and anybody is used in negative statements. Someone, somebody used in positive statements. This is one key difference. Okay. Let's move along now to everyone and everybody. Everyone and everybody, uh, this will follow kind of a different rule than someone uh, and anyone. We use everyone and everybody to refer to all people related to a situation or related to a group. So this could mean a class, it could mean every person in an office, it could mean in a city, in a country. Uh, so it just depends on the group or the situation. We use this word when we want to talk about all people related to that group or related to the situation. So let's look at some examples. Okay, first one. Everyone in our class graduated. So here, everyone in our class graduated refers to all the people in our class. So uh, everyone in that group of people. In this case, the group is the class, so all people in the class. Another example, it was great to see everybody at the reunion. So everybody here shows us, again, all people. And this could be a class reunion, it could be a family reunion, a company reunion. Um, so this just means it was great to see all the related people, so the people related to the situation at this reunion event. One more example then, everybody had a great time. So here, everybody shows us everybody in the situation. So maybe everybody who attended the event had a great time. Everybody who attended the party had a great time. This is quite a common expression after an event of some kind. So again, as we saw with uh, the first two groups, we can actually change each of these words 
to the other word. So everyone can be replaced with everybody. Uh, same thing here, everybody and everybody can be replaced with everyone. So I want to end this lesson with a quick introduction uh, or a quick overview to the difference between these two endings, one and buddy. What is the difference here? Really, one, the words that end in one, someone, anyone, and everyone, they sound more formal than the words that end in buddy. So um, we can actually use these interchangeably. Interchangeably means we can mix and match them. We can choose which one we prefer. So that means the meanings are the same, uh, like their purpose is the same. It's just up to us to choose. So why would we do this? Why would we choose one word and not the other word? Um, you can choose according to the syllables. If you remember, syllables is the number of beats. A syllable is a beat of a word. So for example, somebody, somebody has three beats. Someone has only two beats, two syllables. This is important when you are writing, especially like writing poetry, writing lyrics for music, or maybe you're trying to write a nice essay, for example. We are listening for which words sound nice to our ears. So sometimes the word somebody sounds nice. Sometimes the word someone sounds better. So it's up to us, meaning we can decide, we can choose which word we prefer to use. So you just have to listen and kind of feel which you prefer. There's no difference in meaning, it's just a sound preference and a little bit of a formality difference. So I hope that this lesson helps you understand the differences between these words a little bit. As I said, if you want some more information about the difference between some and any, you can search the YouTube channel for that video as well. Uh, of course, if you like the video, please don't forget to give it a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and check us out at EnglishClass101.com for some other good English study tools. Thanks very much for watching this lesson, and we will see you again soon. Bye-bye. In this video, you'll learn 20 of the most common words and phrases in English. Hi everybody, my name is Alicia. Welcome to the 800 Core English Words and Phrases video series. This series will teach you the 800 most common words and phrases in English. But there's a twist. With each new lesson in this series, we'll include the previous lessons at the end. So after you've learned the new words and phrases, stick around and review what you learned in previous lessons. Reviewing is one of the most important parts of learning a language. You can also get the full list right now at EnglishClass101.com. Click the link in the description to access more example sentences, create your own flashcard deck, and finally master English. Okay, let's get started. First is dog. 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 A dog is a very popular and very common pet. We see small dogs and big dogs. Is that your dog? Is that your dog? Is that your dog? Cat. 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 Cats are also very, very popular pets. We see cats that have very short fur and cats that have long, fluffy fur. My cat likes to take a nap in the afternoon. My cat likes to take a nap in the afternoon. My cat likes to take a nap in the afternoon. Hamster. 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 So a hamster is a very small pet. It's kind of popular among very young children. Hamsters like to sleep during the day. Hamsters like to sleep during the day. Hamsters like to sleep during the day. Warm, warm, warm. We use warm to describe a temperature that's not quite hot, that's a little bit pleasant, but it's not cool either. The soup must be warm. The soup must be warm. The soup must be warm. Rain, rain, rain. We use the word rain to talk about the water that falls from the sky. The rain is falling on the street. The rain is falling on the street. The rain is falling on the street. Tomato. 
tomato. Tomato. A tomato is a red fruit. They're very common in salads. There are very large tomatoes or smaller tomatoes as well. My grandfather grows tomatoes in his garden. My grandfather grows tomatoes in his garden. My grandfather grows tomatoes in his garden. Strawberry. 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 A strawberry is a very sweet red berry that's very common in desserts. I like strawberry, not apple. I like strawberry, not apple. I like strawberry, not apple. Cherry. 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 So a cherry is another small, sweet red berry, or not really a berry, more of a small fruit that you can eat. Uh, you can typically have them in one bite. I want to eat cherries. I want to eat cherries. I want to eat cherries. Child. 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 So a child is someone who is not an adult. Uh, usually around the age of 15, 14 or so, they kind of start to become like an adult. When I was a child, I used to ride my bike to school every day. When I was a child, I used to ride my bike to school every day. When I was a child, I used to ride my bike to school every day. Friend. 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 So a friend is someone that we are close to, we can share our experiences with and enjoy spending time together. I met a friend at the park. I met a friend at the park. I met a friend at the park. Adult. 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 So an adult is someone who is a grown person. Uh, in your country, maybe an adult is 18 years old or 20 years old or 21 years old, but an adult is someone who can be responsible for themselves. Sometimes being an adult just isn't very fun. Sometimes being an adult just isn't very fun. Sometimes being an adult just isn't very fun. Bicycle. 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 A bicycle is a mode of transportation. It's popular with kids, it's popular with adults. You can ride easily around your city or your neighborhood with a bicycle. The bicycle is in the garage. The bicycle is in the garage. The bicycle is in the garage. Car. 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 A car is a very common mode of transportation in North America. Many people have their own car. What kind of car is it? What kind of car is it? What kind of car is it? Motorcycle. 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 So a motorcycle is like a bicycle with an engine. Usually one person or maybe two people can ride a motorcycle. He has two cars and a motorcycle. He has two cars and a motorcycle. He has two cars and a motorcycle. Scooter. 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 So a scooter is a little bit shorter than a motorcycle. It's something you can sit on and there are places to put your feet on either side and you can ride it around your city or your neighborhood. Scooters are convenient in the city. Scooters are convenient in the city. Scooters are convenient in the city. Boat. 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 So a boat refers to a method of transportation for water. You can use a rowboat, a very old fashioned style boat, or very, very large expensive boats called yachts. The boat floats on the water. The boat floats on the water. The boat floats on the water. Jellyfish. Jellyfish. 
jellyfish. So a jellyfish is an undersea creature. Some of them can be dangerous. They may sting people as a way to defend themselves against attacks. The jellyfish are bobbing in the water. The jellyfish are bobbing in the water. The jellyfish are bobbing in the water. Lobster. 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 So a lobster is another sea creature. Lobsters are very popular because they are delicious. Lobsters are very expensive. Lobsters are very expensive. Lobsters are very expensive. Crab. 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 So a crab is another sea creature. Crabs typically have very large pinchers and they walk in this motion. They walk from side to side. Crabs usually walk sideways. Crabs usually walk sideways. Crabs usually walk sideways. Turtle. 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 So a turtle is another water-based creature. Turtles are known for being very, very slow and they have a hard shell to protect them. The sea turtle is swimming in the sea. The sea turtle is swimming in the sea. The sea turtle is swimming in the sea. Well done. In this lesson, you expanded your vocabulary and learned 20 new useful words. Click the link in the description and sign up for free at EnglishClass101.com to get access to the full list of vocabulary you need for daily life conversations. You'll also get example sentences, custom flashcard decks, and more learning resources. See you next time. Bye-bye. In this video, you'll learn 20 of the most common words and phrases in English. Hi everybody, my name is Alicia. Welcome to the 800 Core English Words and Phrases video series. This series will teach you the 800 most common words and phrases in English. But there's a twist. With each new lesson in this series, we'll include the previous lessons at the end. So after you've learned the new words and phrases, stick around and review what you learned in previous lessons. Reviewing is one of the most important parts of learning a language. You can also get the full list right now at EnglishClass101.com. Click the link in the description to access more example sentences, create your own flashcard deck, and finally master English. Okay, let's get started. First is kettle. 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 A kettle is something that you use to heat up water. You might also hear this called a teapot. The kettle is on the stove. The kettle is on the stove. The kettle is on the stove. Pot. 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 A pot is something we use in the kitchen. It's usually big and round and we use it for soups and stews. That pot is 10 years old. That pot is 10 years old. That pot is 10 years old. Frog. 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 A frog is a small creature. They're typically green and we can see them around lakes and rivers. The green frog is in the water. The green frog is in the water. The green frog is in the water. Pigeon. 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 A pigeon is a very common bird. They're very well known in like big cities and in town centers as kind of a nuisance or a pest. Don't feed the pigeons. Don't feed the pigeons. Don't feed the pigeons. Guidebook. 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 A guidebook is a book that is intended to be used as a guide. We can use guidebooks for restaurants, for travel, for many different topics. A guidebook will give you helpful information for your trip. A guidebook will give you helpful information for your trip. A guidebook will give you helpful information for your trip. Entrance. 
entrance. Entrance. An entrance is a place usually in a building where you can enter the space. Where's the entrance? Where's the entrance? Where's the entrance? Tour guide. Tour guide. Tour guide. A tour guide is someone who leads a tour. They are the person responsible for guiding the people on the tour. Meet your tour guide at the entrance to the hotel. Meet your tour guide at the entrance to the hotel. Meet your tour guide at the entrance to the hotel. Reservation. 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 A reservation is an appointment. We use the word reservation when we're talking about restaurants, hotels, and flight tickets as well. Do you have a reservation? Do you have a reservation? Do you have a reservation? Passport. 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 A passport is a special document given by your country that allows you to travel internationally. It's ID. The passport has expired. The passport has expired. The passport has expired. Computer science. Computer science. Computer science. Computer science is a topic of study. It's the use of computers and science together. Computer science classes are on Mondays. Computer science classes are on Mondays. Computer science classes are on Mondays. Math. 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 Math is the short form of the word mathematics. It can refer to very simple mathematics or complicated mathematics. My favorite subject in school is math. My favorite subject in school is math. My favorite subject in school is math. Feel. 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 The verb feel can be used to talk about the sensation of touching something, or it can be used to express our emotions. I feel wonderful tonight. I feel wonderful tonight. I feel wonderful tonight. Draw. 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 The verb draw is the verb that we use to refer to making a picture. So we use a pen or a pencil or something else to create a picture. The artist draws a picture. The artist draws a picture. The artist draws a picture. Plan. 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 Plan can be used as a verb or as a noun. As a verb, it means to create a schedule for something. We'll plan the holiday to Europe. We'll plan the holiday to Europe. We'll plan the holiday to Europe. Sail. 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 Sale is a noun. It refers to a discount. It's often used when shopping to refer to a place where you can receive a discount. There's a big sale in the shoe department. There's a big sale in the shoe department. There's a big sale in the shoe department. Shopping. 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 Shopping can be used as a noun. It can also be a verb in the progressive form. It refers to going out to a mall or a department store to look for something to buy. I love shopping for clothes. I love shopping for clothes. I love shopping for clothes. Fourth. 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 Fourth comes after third, which is after second and first, it refers to the number four of something. For my fourth birthday, my mother gave me a book. 
for my fourth birthday, my mother gave me a book. For my fourth birthday, my mother gave me a book. Fifth. 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 Fifth refers to the number five of something. It comes after fourth. You live on the fifth floor, don't you? You live on the fifth floor, don't you? You live on the fifth floor, don't you? Sixth. 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 So sixth refers to the number six of something. This is a really good word to practice some pronunciation. Slow down that sixth, that middle part there. The sixth book from the left. The sixth book from the left. The sixth book from the left. Seventh. 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 Seventh refers to the number seven of something. This is just like the word seven, but with th at the end. Please read the seventh paragraph of the contract. Please read the seventh paragraph of the contract. Please read the seventh paragraph of the contract. Well done. In this lesson, you expanded your vocabulary and learned 20 new useful words. Click the link in the description and sign up for free at EnglishClass101.com to get access to the full list of vocabulary you'll need for daily life conversations. You'll also get example sentences, custom flashcard decks, and more learning resources. See you next time. Goodbye. Hi everybody, welcome back to Top Words. My name is Alicia and today we're going to be talking about the top 10 must-know vocabulary for restaurants. So let's eat. Waiter. The first word is waiter. Waiter or waitress or wait staff. These are the people who bring you your food and take your orders. In a sentence, your waiter will be with you in a moment. Menu. The next word is menu. Menu is the piece of paper or the document, the thing that's on your table or near your table that has a description of all the food you can eat at that restaurant. In a sentence, can I have the menu please? Order. The next word is order. Order. You can use this as a noun or as a verb. You can say to order something or where is my order? In a sentence, I would like to order two steaks, three hamburgers, four beers, a large pizza, and a piece of chocolate cake to go to my home. Water. The next word is water. In American restaurants, you usually get water for free. I noticed when I traveled in Europe, you had to pay for water at restaurants. That was interesting. In a sentence, American restaurants usually give you a glass of water without having to ask. Dessert. The next word is dessert. Dessert is the sweet stuff, the sweet course, all the sweet foods that come after the main part of the meal. In a sentence, can we see the dessert menu? Chef, chef, chef is the leader of the kitchen, the person that is cooking the food. In fancy restaurants, the chef is like the, the one who is running the operation, the manager of everything. There are different levels of chef in the kitchen. In a sentence, you can say, please give my compliments to the chef. Fast food. The next word is fast food. Fast food is anything that's quick. Popular examples in America are McDonald's, Burger King, Subway, Taco Bell, Kentucky Fried Chicken, Jack in the Box. So those are all fast food restaurants. You get in and you get out very, very quickly. They don't have a reputation for being very healthy. Uh, in a sentence, I try to eat fast food as rarely as possible. Bill. The next word is bill. You might also hear check. Bill and check mean the total of your meal. How much uh, your dining experience costs you is the bill or the check. A bill comes before you have paid. A receipt is the piece of paper you get after you have paid. The receipt shows, confirms you have paid money. The bill is the request for money. That's the difference between bill or check and receipt. In a sentence, usually you say, can I have the bill please? Or can I have the check please? Delicious. Delicious. Delicious means something that tastes good. We have many variations on delicious. We say delicious, good, yum, yummy, fantastic, great, and so on. It's kind of strange to me to say this is delicious. I usually just say this is good or this is really good. Something like that is a bit more natural than delicious. In a sentence, my dinner today was delicious. Main course. 
main course, it's often like a meat dish actually, like, like roast something or I don't know. It's also called the entree. Maybe it's a really fancy pasta dish in some cases. I don't know. In a sentence, for the main course, our specials are chicken and zucchini and curry. Uh, that's the end. So those are 10 words that you can use in a restaurant. I think they're very useful when traveling, actually. So try to keep them in mind the next time you go out to eat. If you haven't already, please be sure to like and subscribe to our channel. And if you like, also, please check us out at EnglishClass101.com for more fun stuff. Thanks very much. Bye. In this video, you'll learn 20 of the most common words and phrases in English. Hi everybody, my name is Alicia. Welcome to the 800 Core English Words and Phrases video series. This series will teach you the 800 most common words and phrases in English. But there's a twist. With each new lesson in this series, we'll include the previous lessons at the end. So after you've learned the new words and phrases, stick around and review what you learned in previous lessons. Reviewing is one of the most important parts of learning a language. You can also get the full list right now at EnglishClass101.com. Click the link in the description to access more example sentences, create your own flashcard deck, and finally, master English. Okay, let's get started. First is today. 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 Today means this day. We use this when we want to talk about something that's happening on this day, like part of a schedule. Today's homework. Today's homework. Today's homework. Yesterday. 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 So yesterday means the day before today. So you can use this word when you're talking about like past actions. Yesterday morning. Yesterday morning. Yesterday morning. Tomorrow. 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 So tomorrow is like the opposite of yesterday. It means the day after today. So we use this when we're talking about our future plans. See you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. Week. 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 So week refers to seven days, that seven day period. So we use week when we want to talk about making plans or schedules and so on. I'm busy this week. I'm busy this week. I'm busy this week. Year. 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 So a year is 365 days. So we use year when we're talking about points in time, like historical events. One year. One year. One year. Second. 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 So second refers to a very short period of time. So the amount of time that's inside one minute, for example, there are 60 seconds in a minute. There are 60 seconds in a minute. There are 60 seconds in a minute. 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 Min-ut. So minute refers to, again, a period of time. We learned that there are 60 seconds in a minute, and we can use minutes when we're talking about times of day. Three minutes. Three minutes. Three minutes. Hour. 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 So an hour refers to one of those 24 blocks of time throughout the day. I sleep for eight hours every day. I sleep for eight hours every day. I sleep for eight hours every day. Clock. 
clock. Clock. A clock is an object that we use to understand what time of day it is. We can have analog or digital. Alarm clock. Alarm clock. Alarm clock. A clock. A clock. A clock. So a clock is used after a number from 1 to 12 to show that it's a specific hour. Let's meet at the station at 9 o'clock. Let's meet at the station at 9 o'clock. Let's meet at the station at 9 o'clock. Calendar. 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 So a calendar is something we use to understand the dates of the year. There are 12 months on a typical calendar. I marked our anniversary on the calendar. I marked our anniversary on the calendar. I marked our anniversary on the calendar. Monday. 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 So Monday is, for most people, the first day of the work week. I go to work on Monday. I go to work on Monday. I go to work on Monday. Tuesday. 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 Tuesday is, for most people, the second day of the work week. Tuesday, January 1st. Tuesday, January 1st. Tuesday, January 1st. Wednesday. 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 So Wednesday is the middle day of the week, but keep in mind this is pronounced Wednesday. There's a D there, but we don't say Wednesday. We say Wednesday. Wednesday the 18th. Wednesday the 18th. Wednesday the 18th. Thursday. 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 So Thursday is the fourth day of the work week, the day that comes before Friday. So most people get a little bit excited for Friday, and thus Thursday is kind of the day when some people start their weekends a little bit early. Thursday, January 3rd. Thursday, January 3rd. Thursday, January 3rd. Friday. 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 So Friday is the last day of the work week, and lots of people get excited about Friday, and they do things on Friday nights with their friends or their coworkers. Are you free this Friday? Are you free this Friday? Are you free this Friday? Saturday. 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 So Saturday is the first day of the weekend. Lots of people choose to do things like their hobbies or maybe take a trip somewhere. It's a day to relax for lots of people. Saturday night. Saturday night. Saturday night. Sunday. 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 So Sunday is the last day of the weekend, usually. Sunday tends to be a more relaxing day, so we're kind of recharging a little bit and taking it easy. Sunday morning breakfast. Sunday morning breakfast. Sunday morning breakfast. Do. 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 So, do is used when we're referring to some kind of activity. We're making something happen. We are taking care of something. Do homework. Do homework. Do homework. Go. 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 So the verb go means to move from one place to another place. 
we use this when we're traveling or maybe even when we're talking about some place we would like to go or like to travel to. Go to the park. Go to the park. Go to the park. Well done. In this lesson, you expanded your vocabulary and learned 20 new useful words. Click the link in the description and sign up for free at EnglishClass101.com to get access to the full list of vocabulary you'll need for daily life conversations. You'll also get example sentences, custom flashcard decks, and more learning resources. See you next time. Bye-bye. Hi, everyone. I'm Gabriella. How are your English listening skills? In this video, you'll have a chance to test them out with a quiz. First, you'll see an image and hear a question. Next comes a short dialogue. Listen carefully and see if you can answer correctly. We'll show you the answer at the end. Are you ready? A husband and a wife are looking at some floor plans. Which room are they going to see? How about this one? It's got a nice large living room. Hmm, I like a big living room, but I want the parking space. Let's see, how about this one? Yeah, that's nice. Should we go see this one? Wait a second, isn't the closet a bit too small? Good point. Hmm, there doesn't seem to be one that's perfect. Wait, how about this one? It's got everything we need, doesn't it? And the closet is pretty large, too. Let's go see this one. Okay. Which room are they going to see? A husband and a wife are looking at some floor plans. Which room are they going to see? How about this one? It's got a nice large living room. Hmm. I like a big living room, but I want the parking space. Let's see. How about this one? Yeah, that's nice. Should we go see this one? Wait a second. Isn't the closet a bit too small? Good point. Hmm. There doesn't seem to be one that's perfect. Wait, how about this one? It's got everything we need, doesn't it? And the closet is pretty large, too. Let's go see this one. Okay. Did you get it right? I hope you learned something from this quiz. Let us know if you have any questions. See you next time. Hi everybody and welcome back to Top Words. My name is Alicia and in this lesson we are going to look at 15 ways to improve your listening skills. Let's get started. Quick reminder before we start this video, there is free stuff for you to download from the link below the video. Check the YouTube description. You can find free PDF cheat sheets to download. You can use these, of course, to practice building your vocabulary and phrase knowledge, but these are also super, super important for you to be able to catch when you're listening. So I thought that some good PDFs to focus on for this lesson would be these conversation-based cheat sheets. You can check out this one, uh, making a phone call. So it is a super important skill of course, to be able to understand the things that the other party is saying to you at the other end of the phone. And of course, this one, the 24-hour survival phrases cheat sheet. So things that you need to be able to understand when someone says to you. So check these out and more from the link below the video. Okay, let's get to the lesson. The first tip is to join a conversation group. Join a conversation group. So when we think of joining a conversation group, we think about speaking, yeah? But also we practice listening when we go to a conversation group. So it's not just about practicing your own speaking skills, but it's also about listening to the other people in the group and understanding what they're saying. So picking up new vocabulary from them, listening to the ways that those people speak and so on. So joining a conversation group can be a great way to practice building your own listening skills. Okay, next tip. The next tip is to make yourself a study plan and establish a routine. Make yourself a study plan and establish a routine. So this is a tip that's pretty basic and you have to do this or you should do this no matter what skill you're working on improving. 
but within your study plan, make sure that you have something that's going to help you with your listening skills and you do it regularly. So that means inside your study plan, you have something to listen to. So you're not just reading textbooks or you're not just uh, like looking at vocabulary words and flashcards. Make sure you also have something in your study plan that will help you to build your listening as well. Okay, the next tip is to watch movies in the language you're studying, especially on devices you can use to repeat selected scenes. So this means if you are watching on like your phone or on a computer, something that lets you rewind, you can use that as a tool for your studies. So when you listen to a scene, you can go back and listen to it again to check for new words or maybe something that you couldn't quite catch the first time around. So when you're listening to movies or maybe YouTube videos or even audio lessons, make sure to take the time to just go back and check something when you're not sure about it. This can be a great habit. Okay, the next tip is to look for root words when listening to something. Look for root words when listening to something. What does that mean? So this means when you are listening to new words, try to think about the base word inside a word that you don't know. So let's think of an example. For example, if you hear the word comparable, comparable, you might think, what does that word mean? What is, what is happening there? So comparable is a word that's made up of the root compare, and it also has able at the end. Able is used to refer to something that we can do. So comparable is like saying compare and something that we can do. So that means something that we can compare. So when you hear a new word, try to think about the roots that you might be able to identify in the word. This does not work for every word by any means, but if you hear a new word that's quite long, you might see if you can identify, if you can find some key root sounds within that word that can give you a hint about the meaning. The next tip is to use the shadowing technique. Use the shadowing technique. So yes, we talk about using shadowing to improve your speaking skills, but you can also use shadowing to improve your listening skill. This can be a great way to find gaps in your listening. So if you can't quite catch a vocabulary word or you're not sure about the grammar that's used in a sentence, you can identify that when you're listening and try to check a script or check a textbook or something to identify those parts that you need to work on a little bit. Bit more. The next tip is to practice listening to dictations. Practice listening to dictations. So dictation is a fancy word that means a person talking into a recorder for a long time about one topic. So for many people, you might think, oh, dictation, like that's a, a specialist topic or people with specialized knowledge do that. But you can also find some recordings online of people talking about specific topics that can be at your level. A great example of this is podcasts. So think about a podcast topic or something that you might like to listen to one person talk about for a long time, and then do a quick search to see if you can find a podcast of that. It's basically one person talking for a long time about one topic, and these can be great for building your skills. Okay, on to the next tip. Use the internet, it is full of listening resources. Use the internet, it is full of listening resources. Yes, of course, the internet is full of things for you to listen to. You can find movies and videos, you can find music and podcasts, so much stuff. You can use all of that to practice your listening skills, so make sure to use all of it. You can find things that are specific to your work, to your studies, to your hobbies, to your life. Go crazy. The next tip is to watch the gestures of the speaker while you're listening. Watch the gestures of the speaker while you're listening. So gestures means the body motion, the body movements, the body language of a person. So depending on the country and culture and speaking style of a person, they might have different body language. They might move their hands more or less. Gestures can give you more information, can give you hints about what you should be taking away or the information you should be gathering from that topic of conversation. You can also look at someone's face to understand this. So when you're watching a video like this, for example, you can look at how I move my hands and how I move my body, the ways that I move my face around when I'm talking. You can use all of these as hints to help your listening skills. Okay, the next tip is to focus on the speaker and avoid any internal or external distractions. 
focus on the speaker, avoid any internal or external distractions. What does this mean? So this means when you are listening to something, be active. So don't let something inside you, meaning don't let like thinking about your work or your studies or some personal drama distract you. And don't be distracted by the TV or by music or by your pets or whatever. Try to focus your attention on the speaker. So that means be an active listener. Don't just let it play in the background while you do something else. Make sure that you focus your energy on listening. The next tip is to attempt to find a listening topic in which you are genuinely interested. Attempt to find a listening topic in which you are genuinely interested. So this means if you aren't interested by the thing that you're using for your listening practice, go find something else. You don't have to stick with the exact same materials forever. If you want to learn more from a different person or from a different kind of listening medium, like that means if you've been using music but you want to use videos or you want to use podcasts, go for it. Expand. It will only help you to build your vocabulary. The next tip is to listen to a native speaker and try to imitate their intonation and pronunciation. Listen to a native speaker and try to imitate their intonation and pronunciation. So again, this is a speaking related tip and a listening related tip. So when you listen to a native speaker and try to imitate them, you also have to listen very closely to the ways that they sound. So do they go up or down when they make a certain sound or when they make a certain word? How do they pronounce the letters? How do they connect various sounds in their speech? You need to listen carefully to all of these things in order to make the same sounds yourself. So this can be a great way to work on improving your listening and your speaking skills at the same time. Pretty cool. The next tip is to listen to music in your target language and pick out familiar words and phrases. Listen to music in your target language and pick out familiar words and phrases. So this is a really fun way to build your listening skills. As you listen to a song, you can note the key words or maybe the key phrases or even new phrases. Another good thing that you can do is look up the lyrics. So that means the words in the song. You can look up the lyrics to your favorite song or to a song you're listening and try to read along as you listen. This can really help you to catch all of the information. If there's words that you're not familiar with, you can look them up from there and then listen again a few days later and see how much you can understand. So music can be a great way for you to build new vocabulary and to improve your listening skills. The next tip is to listen to an audio dialogue without reading the text and write down what you hear. Listen to an audio dialogue without reading the text and write down what you hear. Okay, so this one is a really, really challenging one for sure. So if you've listened to an audio lesson, like one of our audio lessons, you can try listening to it without the text and try to write everything down line by line. This is a super challenging, but a really, really great way to find gaps in your vocabulary. So if you listen to the audio dialogue and you realize, oh, I don't know that word, that's a really good sign that you need to study that word. This is a really, really good tip. It takes some time for sure, but it can really, really help you pinpoint exactly what you need to focus on. The next tip is to listen to a dialogue and try to correctly write down words you don't recognize, then compare your spelling to the correct spelling. So once more, listen to a dialogue and try to correctly write down words you don't recognize, then compare your spelling to the correct spelling. Okay, so this is an extra level of challenge. When you listen to a dialogue for the first time, instead of just identifying words you don't know and thinking, oh, I should check the script or I should check the text. Try anyway to write down that word that you don't know. So listen to the word a few times and make a guess and then go and check the script or go and check the text after that. So even if it's not correct, you're at least trying to understand that sound and trying to write the sound based on your knowledge. So this is another level of challenge that you can use uh, to improve your writing skills and to improve your listening skills. The next tip is to listen to a news report or a podcast in your target language in English and then try to identify the topic of the report before reading about it. So again, listen to a news report or a podcast in English, then try to identify the topic of the report before reading about it. So what does this mean? Okay, so for example, 
If you follow a news source, an English-speaking news source, like a newspaper, an online newspaper, or maybe a magazine, something like that, and they have audio files of their news available, go subscribe to that. So subscribe to like the New York Times or whatever news outlet is interesting to you, and listen to their podcast files or listen to their audio files. But don't look at the information about the topic. Just press play on like the first list that you see. Just press. Press play on an audio file at random and try to guess what the main points are. Try to guess what the topic is. Then you can go and read about that topic on that company's website and see if you got the key points correct. So this can be a really challenging way, again, to build your listening skills. First, by identifying key topics in a report and then going to read about the report to gain more information. All right, so those were 15 tips that you can use to improve your listening skills. I hope that they were helpful for you. Of course, if you have any other tips, you can feel free to let us know about them in the comments. Maybe everyone can find something new there too. If you have any comments or questions, of course, or if you want to practice making some example sentences, please feel free to do that in the comment section as well. Also, don't forget to download your free stuff from the link below the video. Check out the YouTube description to get those free PDF cheat sheets. Also, don't forget to like and share this video and subscribe. To our channel if you have not already. Thanks very much for watching this lesson, and I will see you again soon. Bye. Welcome to EnglishClass101.com's English in Three Minutes, the fastest, easiest, and most fun way to learn English. Hey everyone, I'm Alicia. In this series, we're going to learn some easy ways to ask and answer common questions in English. It's really useful, and it only takes three minutes. In this lesson, you're going to learn how to ask and say where you live. Usually, someone will ask you where you live as a polite question after they've asked you your name, where you're from, and what you do for a living. They'll say, "So, where do you live?" This is inviting you to keep making conversation. There are lots of ways you could answer this question, but here are some of the most common. You could say, "Do you know?" and then the name of the area you live in. "Do you know Twin Pines?" or you could mention a local landmark, like near the library, near the movie theater. You could also answer by telling the person what train line you live on if your city has a train network, or what station is the nearest to your house. On the green line, near Central Station. So as you can see, there are lots of possible ways to answer the question, "Where do you live?" Once you've told them, the other person might respond in one of the following ways: "Oh yeah, I know it. I live near there." Or maybe, "I'm afraid I don't know it." The other person is just being polite by showing interest, so you can reply by saying something like, "Oh, really?" Since the other person is asking you this question to be polite, A good way to continue the conversation is to ask them the same question in return. You can just say, "How about you?" or "Where do you live?" Put some stress on the "you." Where do you live? Now it's time for Alicia's advice. Asking where someone lives is a way to try to find something you have in common with the person you're talking to. So if you're familiar with the area the other person lives in, make some comments about it. That's a really nice area. Or the park there is really pretty. Anything is fine as long as you don't say anything negative that could be taken as offensive, like that area has a high crime rate, or I hear that area is really dangerous. Do you know how to ask which school someone goes to? Find out next time in the eighth English in three minutes lesson. See you next time. It is prepared. I am prepared. Okay. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Top Words. My name is Alicia, and today we're going to be talking about the top ten phrases you'll need for a date. Woohoo! Let's go. Would you like to go out to dinner with me? 
Okay, the first phrase is, would you like to go out to dinner with me? This is a pretty typical invitation, I think. You can use, would you go out for lunch with me is okay too, or would you like to get a coffee with me as well? If you invite someone out for breakfast, it's a little weird, <laughs> I feel like. I don't think I would say to someone, like, I'm like at a bar, I'm like, would you like to go out for breakfast sometime? It's just not really something you would say, you know. Would you like to go out to dinner with me? Sure, sounds great. Are you free this weekend? Are you free this weekend? Are you free? Free means are your, is your schedule free? Do you have an open schedule this weekend? Very nice, very casual as well. So, are you free this weekend? Yeah, I've got some time. What's up? Would you like to hang out with me? The next phrase is, would you like to hang out with me? That sounds a little too formal to me. If it were me, I would just say, do you want to hang out? Do you want to get together? That's a little bit more natural. So, do you want to hang out this weekend? Yeah, sure, let's catch a movie. You're so cute. I'm gonna preface this by saying I don't say this, okay? The next phrase is, you're so cute. I never say this, maybe I'm just cold. <laughs> um, it's typically said with downward intonation. Um, people say, you're so cute, you're so cute, kind of going down like that. You can also use this uh, as a compliment. Um, people like parents will say this or grandparents will say this to uh, children in the family. So, um, you're so cute, thank you, I suppose is what you say. You look great. Ah, next one is a much better compliment, I think, much more sincere. Uh, it is, you look great. You look great. Maybe you're going out for dinner, something nice. Your partner looks really nice. You can say, you look great. Oh, thank you. I had a great time. Uh, the next one is, I had a great time. I had a great time. So this is, a, this is an expression you use after your date. You go out for dinner, you spend some time together, um, and you have fun. You can say, I had a great time. So uh, the interaction might be, uh, thanks so much for tonight. I had a great time. Me too. Let's get together again soon. I'll call you. Next expression is, I'll call you. I'll call you. So again, probably used after the date to show how you want to keep in touch later. So one person might say, I'll call you. Sounds good. I'll drive you home. Uh, the next one, again, used at the end of the date, after the date has finished, I'll drive you home. So maybe you live someplace where cars are the normal uh, or you drive for your dates. Uh, so you can say, I'll drive you home, meaning I'll take you home in my car. Um, so in the situation, maybe I'll drive you home. Okay, thanks very much. I don't know why I keep looking up. My, my, date, is <laughs> my date is very tall, like super tall, like eight feet. Okay, can I see you again? Okay, the next expression, again, after the date, or maybe even like the day or two after the date, you can say, can I see you again? Uh, or I want to see you again, or let's get together again, meaning you had a nice time, you want to see that person again. So you can say, can I see you again? Sure, that would be great. Shall we go somewhere else? The next one, okay, so maybe you've gone for dinner, for example, with, the, with someone, and you want to suggest a different location, like let's go for a drink after dinner. You can say, should we go somewhere else? This says, shall we go somewhere else? I would say, do you want to go somewhere else? In this situation, I say, shall we go somewhere else? Eh, I don't think so, I'm kind of tired. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. All right, so those are 10 expressions that you can use for a date. Give them a try the next time you have a chance, whenever that may be, good luck. Uh, thanks very much for watching this episode of Top Words. If you haven't already, please be sure to like this video and subscribe to our channel. We will see you again soon for more fun stuff. Thanks very much for watching. Bye! Hi everybody and welcome back to EnglishClass101.com's YouTube channel. My name is Alicia and today I'm going to give a short explanation of the difference between look, watch, and see. So let's get started. Okay, the first verb that I want to talk about is look. We use look when we simply want to explain that we are moving our eyes to something. Just moving the eyes is to look at something. 
there's no expectation that the item or the object we are looking at is going to change. There's no expectation that some change is going to happen. We're simply moving our eyes to something. Finally, when you use look and an object follows the verb, you need to follow look with at. So for example, look at that, look at me, look at that, look at her, look at him. All of these use at because an object follows the verb look. So look at that thing. When you use an expression like look over there, there's no object there. So only when there's an object after the word look, you need to use at to connect the two. Okay, so remember look is used when you're simply moving your eyes to something. Okay, let's talk then about the verb watch. So we use watch when we want to focus our attention on something. So focusing your attention can be on something happening in front of you, like a performance, it can be movie, TV. But the nuance with watch is you are uh, watching something that is changing or moving. Something uh, is going to happen. There's an expectation of change or movement, evolution in some way. We use watch in those cases. Focused attention on something that is changing or something that is moving is when we use watch. Then finally, see. The verb see is used when we just notice something. We happen to notice something. Maybe uh, a person has come into the room and we see that person. We notice something. But we're not necessarily focusing. So maybe we see it, our eyes catch it, but we don't focus on that thing. That is when we use see. So to recap, we use look just to move our eyes to something. We use watch for focused attention on something that is moving or something that is changing. And we use see when we just notice something, but we don't necessarily focus on it. Okay, so this is the basic use of these three verbs, but there are a couple of exceptions. So here I have special cases, especially for performances. So for example, movies, TV shows, concerts, sporting events, and so on. These have slightly different rules. We will only use watch or see for these cases. Please do not use look in these cases. Please use watch or see. If you're having trouble deciding when to use watch or see, a good rule or a good guideline is if it's something outside the house, something outside your home, your apartment, use the verb see. If you're at home doing something, at home, uh, like watching a movie, for example, use the verb watch. So for example, over here, you would see a movie in a movie theater, uh, see a baseball game, watch a DVD at home or watch the awards show at home. So these are at home actions and these are outside the home actions. So we use see and watch in these cases. Okay, but let's try to choose the correct verb in these example sentences that I've prepared. So first one, tonight I'm going to something something Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones is a popular TV show, so we should use watch because we learned that watch is used for things outside, or I'm sorry, uh, because we learned that watch is used for actions uh, at home, things we do at home. It's more natural to use watch. I'm going to watch Game of Thrones. Okay, the next sentence. I want to something something that new movie. New movie probably means uh, going to a movie theater, so we should use the verb see. I want to see that new movie is the correct verb here. Something, something, up ahead. Traffic is terrible. So up ahead means in front of you, in front of the car. In this case, it's car, it's traffic related. So up ahead, in this case, the speaker is asking the listener to move his or her eyes in front of them, to, uh, to go up ahead with their eyes. So you can use the verb look, look up ahead. Traffic is terrible. So move your eyes up ahead is the command. Okay, next one. Last night I stayed in and something something a football game. So stayed in means stayed home. I stayed at home. We use the expression stayed in. So I stayed in and watched. This is an at home action, past tense. I watched a football game last night. Okay, 
Next one, I can't wait to something something, my favorite band next week. So again, this is a performance outside the house, my favorite band. So we'll use see, I can't wait to see my favorite band next week. Okay, next sentence. When I something something into the forest, I something something a deer. Okay, there are two verbs in this sentence. We're going to use looked. So when I moved my eyes into the forest, I moved my direction, my, my, uh, my eyes moved in the direction of the forest, and I something something a deer. So we noticed something. I saw a deer. I saw a deer. A deer entered my eyes is a weird way to say it, but that's the nuance here. I happened to notice. I wasn't focusing, but I saw this in my eye. I saw a deer. Okay, let's look at a really difficult one. I something something up from my book and something something you. You were something something a video on your phone. Okay, so similar here. I something something up. I looked up. I moved my eyes up from my book. So I was reading. I moved my eyes up from my book and something something you. So here I noticed. I saw past tense. I saw you. Then here you were something something a video on your phone. A, a video on your phone. So maybe uh, we need to use the verb watch because the person has focused their attention uh, on their phone, on the video. You were watching, past progressive tense, you were watching a video on your phone. So here, in this situation, we have all three verbs. Finally, let's use it in a question. When did you last something, something, your roommate? So when did you last notice your roommate? We would use the verb See, when did you last see your roommate? When was the last time you saw your roommate? You noticed your roommate? So these are some great examples uh, of sentences where it might be difficult to guess. Should I use look? Should I use see? Should I use watch? But keep these rules in mind. So remember, when you move your eyes to something, use look. Don't forget to use at when an object follows the verb too. When you want to focus your attention or talk about something that's changing and moving, use watch, like movies and TV shows. When you want to just talk about noticing something but not focusing your attention, use see. So this is a basic introduction to the differences between look, see, and watch. I hope it was useful for you. If you like, you can try to leave a comment with one of these verbs in your sentence. Uh, or if you have any questions, please let us know as well. Thanks very much for watching this video. If you liked this video, please be sure to hit the like button and subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. Also, check us out for more at EnglishClass101.com. Thanks very much for watching, and I'll see you again soon. Bye! Hi everybody, my name is Alicia and I'm joined again in the studio by... Michael, hello. And today we're going to be talking about English conversation strategies. So let's get right into it. Let's start with Michael. What is your first strategy for keeping an English conversation going? This is very important. Don't say, I'm fine, thank you, and you. You hear this all the time from second language English learners or non-native speakers. You learn this, it's one of the first things you learn in an English class. It's easy, it's good, it's basic, it's foundation. Okay, that's fine. But as soon as you can, switch it up. Because to me, when I meet a foreigner and they come up, and if they say, hey, how are you? I say, oh, I'm fine, you know, I'm good, whatever. How about you? And they say, I'm fine, thank you, and you. And it's just, it's almost robotic because I've said it so many times. And when I hear that, I think, ah, their English isn't that good. Mm. And inside, I'm just going to be really polite and say, hello and talk slowly and try to get out of there as quick as I can. So really impress the foreigner, in my opinion. I think the best way to do it is say something, you know, use a big word or just like a slang word, something like that. When I hear that, I go, wow, man, I want to know what this person thinks. I want to get their point of view and I'm really excited. And then I've had great conversations because of that. Um, yeah, mm. that's a really, really good one. And actually, I think on this YouTube channel, actually, from a couple years ago, there's a video all about better answers to the question, how are you, than I'm fine, thank you, and you. Or if someone says, hey, how are you? I'm, like, I'm good, you? Or fine, you? Never, I'm fine, thank you, and you. Never. But try to actually use, you know, 
a phrase that a native speaker would use. And then that's a clue to the native speaker that, oh, maybe this person is ready for a conversation beyond, you know, basic English. So that's a really good point. I like that. I didn't think of things not to do. I only thought of things to do. So, okay, cool. Um, let's see. Let's go to my first one. Um, oh, oh, oh. So um, the strategy in general is just ask the other person a question. Uh, I think, and I'm guilty of this too when I'm learning another language, I tend to only get input. Like somebody else is always asking me the questions and then I forget myself to ask the other person a question. So one question that I like to ask or, you know, a variation, any kind of WH question is good, like a who question, what, where, um, something like this. If you've been paying attention, you can use anyway to transition in your conversation. This was in a previous video. You can ask something like anyway up to anything fun this weekend. This is a pretty casual conversational question that you can ask just about anybody, um, whether you've just met them or whether you've known them for a while, but just, just Get in the habit of asking other people the question. Don't wait for someone else to ask you the question. Um, so that, that's one strategy that I try to use to keep things going. Yeah, me too. I agree. And I'm going to say samesies because actually two of my questions were exactly what you said. Agree 100%. This is kind of cheating. These should be one. but So always ask questions. Mm -hmm. So, you know, again, you forget. It's really easy. I'm really guilty of this. Mm. English, non-English, whatever. I'm, I'm guilty of this. Um, and the other thing is ask deep, open-ended questions. So if you ask a yes or no question, so again, like Alicia was saying, it, it just dead ends. Mm. You can't just say, you know, do you like cheese? Yes or no, right? So you want to say, what do you think about cheese? What is your favorite kind? And kind of open it up to something else and let it, let it just kind of snowball. Right. Right. Yeah, I think I think that that's that's really a key. Like I have another variation on it, which I guess I'll just continue on to because it kind of relates to what you're talking about. Like he's saying, always ask questions, always ask deep, open-ended questions. So like you may, you just said, don't ask a yes or no question because yes or no ends with the yes or the no. So one of the things that I'll do is um, use a pattern similar to this, like hey, did you see or hey, did you hear about blah blah blah. So you can use this little blah, blah, blah as your, uh, you can ask about the news. Uh, you can ask about something funny you saw on the internet. You can ask about, um, you know, some, something that you heard from another friend of yours, whatever. Uh, it's just a way to check in with the other person and say, oh, did you also experience this thing that I experienced? Let's talk about that. So that might be another question that you can use with people. I like that one. I really like that one because you got to stay within people's comfort zone. So maybe you ask and maybe they don't want to, right? So a good thing is, did you hear about it? That's up to them. Maybe they don't want to talk about it. They can say, oh, yeah, I heard about that. And you can kind of feel uh, the, the atmosphere and, and realize, eh, maybe I shouldn't talk about this, change the subject. Or they get passionate and they start talking about it. And there you go. And just let it go. Um, yeah, absolutely. Mm. One thing, again, I'm guilty of is, is you do got to keep, keep returning it. Right. Don't let it, don't just say, oh, yeah, and what I think about da 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 Bring it back. Ask them, what about you? Mm. That's, that's a common thing I forget about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, good. I have one more. This one, um, use when you see fit. Don't, I guess, just... Okay, I'll just introduce it. Compliment the other person or compliment the other persons. This can be a nice strategy just to show that you're enjoying the other person's company. Um, it can be as simple as, oh, I like your shirt today, or oh, that's a nice dress you're wearing today, or oh, did you get a new haircut that looks good on you, something like that. So this is a nice, a nice way to make the other person maybe want to spend more time with you, I think. Yeah, I agree 100%. Um, two things. One, I think it's a good conversation starter sometimes. Um, if you got to be careful. With a stranger, it can be creepy. It can be a little uncomfortable what you're complimenting, right? But if yeah. it's something like if they have a t-shirt and it's a band that you both like, that's a great conversation starter, and you feel, wow, we're connected, you know. Mm -hmm. um, number two, the, the second thing I was thinking about is that keep it honest. I love, I love a sincere compliment. It really means a lot more, and, and it really does butter them up, kind of get them open to, to having more conversations deeper, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the things people do, which, which I don't like, is let's say they say, hey, nice shirt. And then the person out of habit will say, oh, you too, I like your shirt too. Just my opinion, I don't think this feels really natural, doesn't really feel sincere. So I would, I would save it, make a mental note and go, hmm, I need to return the favor. I need to give them a compliment. But wait until you notice something you really do like and say, hey, actually, I love blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I think, I think that's, that's a great point. Like hmm. when you, you can sense whether someone is being sincere or not. What is your next strategy gonna... for continuing an English conversation? Well, don't be afraid to open up. 
I like this one. I think this is good. Um, a lot of people will be kind of shy. They won't open up too much. Again, within, within your comfort zone. But I like this one um, because people will return the favor. Because if you're just having small talk and you say, you know, the weather's nice today, blah, 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 you can only go so far. So don't be afraid to say something personal. Again, trust your judgment. Don't be a creeper. Don't go, we don't want to hear certain things about your life. So don't, don't be a creep. <laughs> don't be a creep. Don't be weird. Don't be strange. And like what you're saying about opening up. Open up is just a phrase that means share something about yourself. Um, so it can be as simple as what you did last weekend or what you're going to do this weekend or a project that you have coming up. It doesn't mean that you have to spill all of your life secrets to the other person, but just showing that you're willing to share something more personal about yourself can help ingratiate yourself or can help, you know, make the other person, help the other person understand you a little bit better. That's a good tip. I like that tip. That's hard to do though. It's hard. It's a mm. little bit scary, I think, yeah. to share parts of yourself, but it's good. Way to meet people and make friends. All right, I think that's all. Is that all that you have? Yeah, that's okay. all I got. <laughs> okay, all right. Well, those are some interesting uh, strategies to keep an English conversation going. So give them a try. If you're ever at a loss for words and don't know what to say, you can try one of these strategies and hopefully it will help you out. Um, please let us know if you have any other strategies or anything else that you would like to use or you try to use when you are having trouble keeping a conversation going. Uh, leave us a comment and let us know what it is. We will see you again next time. Do you have anything else you'd like to add? That's about it. All right, so thanks very much for joining us and take care. Bye-bye. How are your English listening skills? First, you'll see an image and hear a question. Next comes a short dialogue. Listen carefully and see if you can answer correctly. We'll show you the answer at the end. A man and a woman are looking over a menu at a restaurant. What's the man going to order? What are you going to order? The pizza looks delicious. I think I'll go with that. I had pizza yesterday, so... Okay, then. What about the hamburger? Sounds good. I'll go with that. What's the man going to order? A man and a woman are looking over a menu at a restaurant. What's the man going to order? What are you going to order? The pizza looks delicious. I think I'll go with that. I had pizza yesterday, so... Okay, then. What about the hamburger? Sounds good. I'll go with that. Did you get it right? I hope you learned something from this quiz. Let us know if you have any questions. See you next time. In this video, you'll learn 20 of the most common words and phrases in English. Hi everybody, my name is Alicia. Welcome to the 800 Core English Words and Phrases video series. This series will teach you the 800 most common words and phrases in English. But there's a twist. With each new lesson in this series, we'll include the previous lessons at the end. So after you've learned the new words and phrases, stick around and review what you learned in previous lessons. Reviewing is one of the most important parts of learning a language. You can also get the full list right now at EnglishClass101.com. Click the link in the description to access more example sentences, create your own flashcard deck, and finally master English. Okay, let's get started. First is backpack. 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 A backpack is a pack or a bag that you wear on your back. My backpack is so heavy. My backpack is so heavy. My backpack is so heavy. Pencil lead. Pencil lead. Pencil lead. 
pencil lead is material that you use for writing with a mechanical pencil. When you need to replace that material, you buy this pencil lead. That store stocks a wide assortment of pencil lead refills. That store stocks a wide assortment of pencil lead refills. That store stocks a wide assortment of pencil lead refills. Glue. 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 Glue is a sticky material that you can use to attach objects to each other. Apply glue to the paper. Apply glue to the paper. Apply glue to the paper. Calculator. 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 A calculator is a machine, or maybe an app, that you can use to do math. We can't use a calculator during the test. We can't use a calculator during the test. We can't use a calculator during the test. Pencil sharpener. Pencil sharpener. Pencil sharpener. So a pencil sharpener is something you use to make your pencil sharp. You need to use this if you do not have a mechanical pencil. I have a pencil sharpener. I have a pencil sharpener. I have a pencil sharpener. Wide. 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 Wide is the opposite of narrow. We can use this to describe spaces, rivers, many things that are big across. The river is wide and deep. The river is wide and deep. The river is wide and deep. Narrow. 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 Narrow refers to something that is very small across. Again, we can use this to talk about spaces, to talk about natural landscapes, and so on. The man is hiking on a narrow path. The man is hiking on a narrow path. The man is hiking on a narrow path. Hard. 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 Hard can be used to mean difficult, and it can also refer to a surface or a material that is very tough. A turtle has a hard shell for protection. A turtle has a hard shell for protection. A turtle has a hard shell for protection. Soft. 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 Soft refers to a material that has a light feel or a very nice feel to it, like skin or maybe a pillow made of silk. Velvet material is very soft. Velvet material is very soft. Velvet material is very soft. Apricot. 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 Apricot might also be pronounced as apricot, depending on the person. It refers to a small orange fruit. I love apricot juice. I love apricot juice. I love apricot juice. Pineapple. 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 A pineapple is a fruit that has a very spiky look to it. You have to break it open to reach the yellow fruit inside. This pineapple is still unripe. This pineapple is still unripe. This pineapple is still unripe. Melon. 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 A melon is a type of fruit that you have to break open like a pineapple, but there are many different kinds of melons, like watermelons, cantaloupes, and more. I'd like a melon, please. I'd like a melon, please. I'd like a melon, please. Fig. 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 A fig is a very sweet and kind of dense fruit. It's often used in desserts. 
I ordered fig salad. I ordered fig salad. I ordered fig salad. Plum. 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 A plum is a purple fruit. They tend to be kind of sweet, but if you let them go too long, they might get rather sour. Prunes are dried plums. Prunes are dried plums. Prunes are dried plums. Cauliflower. 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 Cauliflower is a white vegetable. You can use it in salads, on pizzas, and more. We eat cauliflower dipped in ranch dressing. We eat cauliflower dipped in ranch dressing. We eat cauliflower dipped in ranch dressing. Cabbage. 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 Cabbage is a light green colored vegetable that's very commonly used in salads and maybe as toppings on other things. Cabbage has a strong smell. Cabbage has a strong smell. Cabbage has a strong smell. Celery. 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 Celery is a long green stalk. It's a vegetable that you can use to flavor soups and sauces. Celery is a great source of vitamin K. Celery is a great source of vitamin K. Celery is a great source of vitamin K. Eggplant. 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 An eggplant is a purple vegetable. Some people, especially who speak British English, call this an aubergine. I like to make stuffed eggplant with rice from the oven. I like to make stuffed eggplant with rice from the oven. I like to make stuffed eggplant with rice from the oven. Bean sprout. Bean sprout. Bean sprout. A bean sprout is quite literally a sprouted bean, so from the bean comes a string-like object. This is often used as a topping for something. Can I get a bean sprout salad? Can I get a bean sprout salad? Can I get a bean sprout salad? Accident. 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 An accident refers to a negative situation or a negative condition that happened without a plan. It was not on purpose. Her brother was in a car accident. Her brother was in a car accident. Her brother was in a car accident. Well done. In this lesson, you expanded your vocabulary and learned 20 new useful words. Click the link in the description and sign up for free at EnglishClass101.com to get access to the full list of vocabulary you need for daily life conversations. You'll also get example sentences, custom flashcard decks, and more learning resources. See you next time. Bye! In this video, you'll learn 20 of the most common words and phrases in English. Hi everybody, my name is Alicia. Welcome to the 800 Core English Words and Phrases video series. This series will teach you the 800 most common words and phrases in English. But there's a twist. With each new lesson in this series, we'll include the previous lessons at the end. So after you've learned the new words and phrases, stick around and review what you learned in previous lessons. Reviewing is one of the most important parts of learning a language. You can also get the full list right now at EnglishClass101.com. Click the link in the description to access more example sentences, create your own flashcard deck, and finally master English. Okay, let's get started. First is ninth. 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 Ninth refers to the number nine of something. Ramadan is the ninth month of the Muslim year. Ramadan is the ninth month of the Muslim year. Ramadan is the ninth month of the Muslim year. Tenth. 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 
tenth refers to the number ten of something. We can use this in schedules, in tournaments, whatever. I finally made a goal on my tenth attempt. I finally made a goal on my tenth attempt. I finally made a goal on my tenth attempt. Eighth. 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 Eighth refers to the number eight of something. The pronunciation might be a little tricky, so be careful with this one. I live on the eighth floor. I live on the eighth floor. I live on the eighth floor. Shaving razor. Shaving razor. Shaving razor. A shaving razor is a razor used specifically for shaving hair. This could be on the face or on other parts of the body. Disposable shaving razor. Disposable shaving razor. Disposable shaving razor. Washcloth. 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 A washcloth is a noun, and it refers to a cloth we specifically use for washing the body. The boy is washing his face with a washcloth. The boy is washing his face with a washcloth. The boy is washing his face with a washcloth. Towel. 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 A towel is a cloth that we use to dry things usually. These can be very large, like to take to the beach, or very small, like for drying our hands. This towel is too small for me. This towel is too small for me. This towel is too small for me. Spoon. 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 A spoon is something we use to eat. It's a curved eating utensil, and we usually use it to eat soups or stews or ice cream, those kinds of things. Forks, spoons, and knives are eating utensils. Forks, spoons, and knives are eating utensils. Forks, spoons, and knives are eating utensils. Fork. 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 A fork is a utensil we use that has prongs at the end. So this is useful for picking things up, like stabbing things and picking things up. The fork is made of plastic. The fork is made of plastic. The fork is made of plastic. Knife. 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 A knife is a utensil we use to cut food. It's usually very sharp. Could you pass me the knife? Could you pass me the knife? Could you pass me the knife? Plate. 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 A plate is something that we use to hold our food. It's a flat object. After we finish cooking food, we put it on a plate. This plate is different from that one. This plate is different from that one. This plate is different from that one. B. 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 A bee is a very common creature. Lots of people are afraid of them. Some people have allergies to them. Bees make honey. The bee is pollinating the yellow flower. The bee is pollinating the yellow flower. The bee is pollinating the yellow flower. Ant. 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 An ant is a very common creature. They are very, very small, and they live in the ground. Usually, you see ants in big groups. Ants have six legs. Ants have six legs. Ants have six legs. Snake. 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 
Snakes are creatures that we typically don't see in cities. You might see them out in forests, maybe in desert areas. Lots of people are afraid of snakes. The rattlesnake is coiled and ready to strike. The rattlesnake is coiled and ready to strike. The rattlesnake is coiled and ready to strike. Milk. 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 Milk is a very common and very popular drink. There are many different types of milk. Traditionally, milk came from cows or perhaps goats or sheep, but now there are types that come from nuts or soy and so on. Milk is an important source of calcium for kids and adults. Milk is an important source of calcium for kids and adults. Milk is an important source of calcium for kids and adults. Designer. 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 A designer is someone who has a design-related job. This could be a graphic designer, it could be an interior designer, it could be a fashion designer, someone who creates designs. She wants to become a fashion designer. She wants to become a fashion designer. She wants to become a fashion designer. Artist. 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 An artist is a person who creates art. Art can mean many different things. It could be music, it could be movies, it could be paintings, something you experience in a museum, many different things. Many artists struggle for a long time before achieving success. Many artists struggle for a long time before achieving success. Many artists struggle for a long time before achieving success. Soldier. 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 A soldier is someone who is employed by the military. So their job is to participate in the military and work for the military. Sometimes this means fighting. The soldiers are moving into position. The soldiers are moving into position. The soldiers are moving into position. Entrepreneur. 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 An entrepreneur refers to someone who starts a business. They usually have a big idea that's kind of unique. They have maybe very innovative ways to approach their work sometimes. Entrepreneurs change the world with their ideas. Entrepreneurs change the world with their ideas. Entrepreneurs change the world with their ideas. Short story. Short story. Short story. A short story is different from a novel, for example, because it has very few pages. It's easy to read and understand quickly. I read only short stories. I read only short stories. I read only short stories. Folder. 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 A folder is something that we use to keep documents. This can be a physical folder, or it can be a digital folder. I'm sure you have many of these on your computer. I put the documents in a folder. I put the documents in a folder. I put the documents in a folder. Well done. In this lesson, you expanded your vocabulary and learned 20 new useful words. Click the link in the description and sign up for free at EnglishClass101.com to get access to the full list of vocabulary you'll need for daily life conversations. You'll also get example sentences, custom flashcard decks, and more learning resources. See you next time. Goodbye. Hi, everybody. My name is Alicia. Today, I'm going to be talking about the simple future tense. Today I'm going to talk about will and won't and going to and not going to. So these are a few grammar points that learners make mistakes with. When should you use will or won't? When should you use going to or not going to? So I'm going to talk about a few of these points, a few basic points that I hope can help you decide when to use will and when to use going to. So let's begin. Okay. 
The first point I want to talk about is going to or not going to. Uh, the positive form and the negative form. Going to, not going to. Uh, for today, I want to talk about two times when we'll use these uh, grammar points. So the first time, uh, the first situation where you use going to or not going to is for plans decided before the conversation. So if you make a decision about your future plans or someone else makes a decision before the conversation about their plans for the future, you should use going to or not going to. Uh, it's something that is probably going to happen, a high certainty. <clears throat> so this is a plan that has a high level of certainty, meaning there's a good chance this plan is going to happen. You decided it before the conversation, meaning you've probably had some time to plan uh, your future, to plan your schedule a little bit. So please use going to for something you decide before the conversation. So on a timeline, it might look like this. We have past, uh, now, and future here. So your plan is for the future, yes, but you decided on the plan sometime before the conversation. So if this point, this is now, this is your conversation, you made the plan, you made the decision before the conversation. In this case, use going to, I'm going to. At the beginning of this video, I said I'm going to talk about simple future tense, will and going to. I decided before this video started uh, about my plans. I decided what I was going to talk to you about before the video started. So I used going to to introduce that plan. Uh, so please keep this in mind. Okay, but let's talk about will now. So we use will and won't for decisions that are made at the moment of speaking. Uh, so keep in mind, will is the positive form, won't is the negative form here. So a decision made at the moment of speaking. This is one way to use will or won't. Uh, you can use this, for example, at restaurants. Uh, you can use this to talk about plans you make quickly after learning information from a friend. Keep in mind, will and won't, uh, tends to have a lower certainty. There's a lower chance the plan is going to happen uh, because you made the plan at the moment of speaking. Going to is used for plans made before the conversation, but will is used for a plan made uh, spur of the moment or a very quick plan you've just made. So that's kind of the image. Is it a decision you just made? Use will or use won't in those cases. If you made the decision before the conversation, there's a good chance you should use going to. So, to go back to our timeline here, if going to is used for a decision you made in the past about your future plans, will is used for a decision you make in the conversation, during the conversation. The plan can be any time in the future, but the decision the point at which you make the decision is the difference here. Mm. Uh, one point about this, two points about this actually. First, will. If you've made a decision at the moment of speaking and you therefore should use will to communicate that decision, you can improve or you can communicate that there's a high chance it's going to happen with the word probably. Mm. So here, I'll show you this in an example sentence in a moment, but you can use probably with will and won't. I'll probably, I probably won't. Remember that order though. I'll probably, or I probably will, or probably won't. Mm. Uh, point number two I want to mention about both of these grammar points is to make your pronunciation a little more natural. Try shortening both of these expressions. Going to shortens to gonna, G-O-N-N-A, gonna. I'm gonna, I'm not gonna. This sounds much more natural, at least in American English. Uh, for will and for won't, when you use will, use the contracted form with your subject. For example, I will becomes I'll, you will becomes you'll. 
they will becomes they'll. Using the contractive form sounds a lot more natural in everyday conversation. It's correct to say you will, they will, but it sounds really stiff and unnatural. So please use the contracted form to sound a bit more natural. You can use the contracted form with probably for will. I'll probably, they'll probably, we'll probably. These are all pretty good. Okay, so let's practice using them. All right. First example sentence, maybe something something, go hiking tomorrow. So how do we know? Is this a will sentence or a going to sentence? We have a hint here, maybe, maybe. So meaning there's a low level of certainty, perhaps, a low chance that this is going to happen. So let's say maybe I'll go hiking tomorrow. This is probably the best answer. Maybe I'm going to. Uh, while you can communicate the idea, yes, it sounds like you decided your plan before the conversation, but you're using maybe, so it doesn't quite match. Instead, use I'll. Maybe I'll go hiking tomorrow. Okay, let's look at the next sentence. I'm, mm, there's a big hint here, a grammar hint. I'm something something go to France next year. So next year, this go to France next year, this is a pretty big decision. Most people probably would not make this decision at the moment of speaking. So we should use going to. I'm going to go to France next year. This is the correct uh, use of going to in this case. A decision made before the moment of speaking and there's a high level of certainty here. Okay, uh, let's look at the next one. I decided, here's a hint, past tense decided, if you watched a different video, uh, oops, I decided uh, that I'm something something, go out for dinner. I'm too tired. Okay. So past tense, this shows us a big hint. Past tense, decided, this implies the decision was made before the conversation. Hmm. So I'm something something, go out for dinner. I'm too tired, here's another hint. So go out for dinner and too tired. Mm, this should probably be, I'm not going to go out for dinner. I'm too tired. So this person has decided, hmm, I'm not going to go out for dinner. We should use going to, the negative not going to, because the speaker made the decision before the conversation happened, and there's a high level of certainty. There's a high chance that this is going to happen. So we should use going to in this sentence. Okay. Okay, so the next sentence I included, because I think it's a really good one to remember, Anytime you visit a bar, a restaurant, some kind of service situation, you can use this pattern specifically to make a request for something. So let's take a look. Here, my example sentence is, I something something, have a glass of wine, please. In this case, maybe it's at a restaurant or at a bar. Um, but in this case, you've just made the decision, looking at the menu, looking at a catalog, looking at something, uh, you made a decision just then, at that moment, and you're asking for that item, you're asking for that service. So, we'll use will. I'll have a glass of wine, please. So in this example sentence, I used glass of wine to show my request, to ask for a glass of wine. But if you want to use this pattern to make a request in a service situation, just replace glass of wine with the item or service that you would like. So for example, I'll have a beer, I'll have a steak, I'll have a hamburger. These are all things you can order at a restaurant or at a bar. Uh, if you're shopping, you can say, I'll have the blue one, please, for example. So just make your request uh, using the same pattern, but replacing that glass of wine section that I used in my example sentence. Okay, next one. Uh, this one is maybe a little bit challenging. Uh, it's you're running late, so you, something, something, have to take a taxi to your next meeting. So maybe this is an assistant or someone supporting another person with their schedule. 
Okay, so in the next sentence, uh, we're looking at a situation where there's been a sudden or quick change to a schedule. Someone is running late and there's a new decision that's made at the moment of speaking, or a new decision is made to reflect the new situation. So let's take a look. You're running late, so you or you will have to take a taxi. Mm. You could say uh, you're running late, so you have to take a taxi, but maybe this is a future plan, something that's going to happen in an hour from now. Maybe this is something uh, the speaker is planning for later in the day. So you will is a nice way to use that. You're running late, so you'll have to take a taxi hmm, to the next meeting. Okay. The last one I want to talk about, this uses probably, which I mentioned over here. So probably, remember, we can use probably to sort of improve, or we can use probably to communicate a higher level of certainty with the decision we made at the moment of speaking. So here, uh, you're not going to the party, then I probably something something go either. Okay, so either is a big hint here. Remember. We use either to show agreement, but negative. Okay, so in the last example sentence for today, uh, we're going to look at a situation where the listener has heard some new information. They use the expression, you're not going to go to the party. So they're confirming new information they have just heard. After that, they're going to make a decision about what their plans are for the party. So let's take a look. We know that probably it can be used with will and won't. And we know from then the speaker just made this decision. And we know it's a negative with either. So we should use won't. You're not going to go to the party? Then I probably won't go either. So the speaker uses uh, won't here to show a decision made at the moment of speaking, but the speaker also uses probably won't to show there's a high chance that this is going to happen. There's a high chance that this is the future plan. Probably won't. Okay, so there's a lot of information communicated there with small words like then and either and probably as well. So please keep this in mind when you're trying to decide when to use will, won't, going to, and not going to. Okay, so, uh, so that's my recap of a few useful grammar points, how to talk about your future tense plans. Uh, so I'm going to finish the lesson now. Uh, I hope that you enjoyed this lesson. If you have any questions, please feel free to leave it in a comment. Or if you want to try out a few practice sentences, please feel free to leave those in the comment section too. If you haven't already, please uh, be sure to like this video and subscribe to our channel too. If you want to find more stuff like this, more lessons, more information like this, you can check out EnglishClass101.com. Thanks very much for watching this episode, and I will see you again soon. Bye-bye. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. I'm joined today again in the studio by... Michael. Hey, everybody. And today we're going to be talking about our favorite English that we use without even thinking about it. So these are things that we just say. We say so, so often, uh, and they come really, really naturally to us. So that might be kind of helpful for you to hear about some of the things that we like to say. Uh, so I guess I'll start us off for this one. Go ahead. Uh, the first one that I've picked, I, th I think I picked really simple phrases this time around. The first one that I've chosen is the phrase, I know, I know. I like to use this to agree with my friends a lot. So if my friend gives me some, some kind of interesting information, I go, I know, <laughs> or I know, or something, something just to show that I'm listening to them and that I agree. It doesn't necessarily mean that I'm, I'm already, I don't know, like, like I've learned the information or something like that. It's, it's, a, it's an agreement phrase that I like to use with my friends. Um, is this so something that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's funny you said that because before you explained like the tone and gave an example of how you say it, mm -hmm. I thought of it on the opposite side. To me it sounded like, like a kid who's just like, I know, I know mom. Oh, you know, giving yeah. them like, you need to do this and this and this. <laughs> I know, I know, you know. I'm trying to think, do, do men, I mean these, these are gender roles, you can say whatever you want, but I'm trying to think, I, I, I know, yeah, I, mm, 
I don't know if I'm, I've ever said it like oh, that. Oh, really? Sorry. Oh, maybe it is a gender thing. Maybe it's more common among women than it is among men. But I feel like it, maybe it's just in a movie or maybe it's because of where I'm from that people will say, like, if you watch the last video, for example, dude, I know, that kind of uh, thing. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but that your point about kids saying that is <laughs> so funny. Like, when, when you get in trouble, I know. I know, saying it like that, mm, it has a different meaning. It's another exercise in intonation, maybe, this word. I know, or this phrase, rather. Okay, cool. Uh, so there's one. What's your, what's your first one? So my first word is not really a word. It's spelled a couple different ways, is <laughs> So this is something I, I didn't realize that I, I do a lot or say a lot or whatever, but it's, um, it, it, it's, it's a sound that English speakers make that shows disapproval. Mm. So, I don't know. Like, okay, for example, the kid, the kid who's talking to a parent, and then the parent says, you know, you need to do your homework. I know, I know. But no, seriously, you need to get into a good go. Psh, mom, whatever. Yeah. So maybe the same as like, whatever. Uh -huh. psh. Yeah, psh yeah. is good. Psh. There are a lot of variations on psh. <laughs> whenever, whenever you don't want to hear what the other person is saying, sure. you can use psh. Or I see another one that I like to use, um, P F F F F T. <laughs> ah. <laughs> that one's harder to say though. It's not so natural. But I think psh is good. Mm. Any any sort of p p kind of sound or meh, just any sort of just nonsensical phrase said mm. like that means I don't want to listen to what you're saying. Mm. Yeah, that's a great one. That's a great mm. one. <laughs> I use that all the time too. Oh, I, I wish I wish I didn't use it as much as I did, but so. oh, I suppose so. I so. see what you mean. Okay. All right. Uh, well, onward, I guess. My next word is anyway. Anyway, I like to use to transition between two things, to transition between ideas. I also like to use it when I'm, I've been talking for way too long and I need to make an exit from the conversation. Usually I use anyway with kind of a dot, dot, dot at the end, like anyway. And I don't finish, any, I don't finish saying anything after that. Hmm. It's just sort of it's my, just my little sidle out of the, out of the conversation. Yeah. In, anyway, um, anyway. So I use this word a lot, actually. I'm glad you said that. Um, actually, some of my students asked me, they said, you know, what are some good um, words that connect two ideas mm -hmm. or something like that, like a beginning, you know, like first, second, these kinds of words. And I noticed, and I, I never noticed this before, it actually relates to this question, um, that a lot of the things that you look up that are transition words, we don't ever use in speech. Mm -hmm. it doesn't sound natural, but you have to use synonyms. You have to switch it up if you're writing. Yeah. Speaking, I say anyway almost every other sentence. Really? Maybe I do it too much. Well, not that much, but a lot, a lot. I realize that even typing, even business emails, uh -huh. I say it all of the time. Like uh. it's kind of like, well, yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Um, maybe because I go on tangents a lot. So for me, I use it not not as much as the anyway dot dot dot. I yeah. usually do the anyway back to what I was saying. Blah oh. blah 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 blah. Yeah yeah yeah. Yeah, that's a good point about it being used for transition. So a lot of my students are the same way. They'll pick like a really, really formal, almost businessy term to use to transition in their speech, and it doesn't really sound so natural. But something like anyway, or like you said, well, or so, is much better to use in conversation, I think. Cool. Okay. Anyway. Anyway. <laughs> um, dun -dun. Seriously. So seriously, this is another one. Always the, the intonation. This is, this is our, our thing is intonation, I uh -huh. guess. But um, seriously can be said in a lot of different ways. Um, for me, maybe the most common is the same as when you say, really? Mm. Just kind of like, seriously? Mm -hmm. Like, did that actually happen? Mm. No way, really? Yeah. Anytime, you, anytime you go up like that, it's just, it's a rhetorical question. You don't actually want an answer. Just right. like, wow, same thing as wow. Um, and then there's also the, when someone does something stupid and you just look and you, seriously? Yeah. You know, but that's less common. That's, you know, kind of a... Really? <laughs> Seriously? <laughs> no, really. I mean, I, I use it the way that you just described it to, really? to, 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 like if I see, I don't know, somebody is walking on the street in front of me and maybe they stop mm. and they don't have any consideration for the people behind them on the street. I might go, seriously? Oh, maybe you're, right, you're right, you're right, you're right. <laughs> <Whenever, laughs> like, are, is this really happening? Did you just make this decision? Mm. I, so I, maybe I use it when I'm talking to myself more. Not so much, I don't necessarily Yeah, those are fighting words. Word. Yeah. Those are fighting words. Yeah. So, no, you're right. I, I think maybe driving, same thing. Yeah, road like, rage. Seriously? Or, I mean, are you, are you kidding me? Mm. Well, 
I don't want to say the bad version of it, but <laughs> this is what I'm thinking when I'm driving. Like, yeah. are you kidding me? Yeah. Seriously? Yeah. You're right, you're right. But it's usually to yourself, because mm. otherwise it's pretty aggressive. That's that true, yeah. Like, so don't say it to the other person. Mm. But yeah, you're right in terms of when you're talking to your friends and you mm. want to ask, did that really happen to you? Seriously? Mm. Yeah, it's super useful. Mm. Okay. Is it my uh, turn again? Okay, last one for me. Um, my last one is one I use all the time in a number of situations. I've chosen, I don't know. Um, this is great for, of course, when you don't know the answer to something. Um, but I think when you don't know the answer to something, like a, you know, a math question or whatever, it's better to say, I don't know. But when you use the, the contracted don't know form of don't know, <laughs> it just shows kind of that you're, it's not a serious issue. It's not something you need, you're overly concerned with. You're just, I don't know. I don't have an answer. I don't have an idea. It's kind of like saying, you know, what do you think? Or just, this is all I've got, you know? Mm. Um, so, I don't know, do you use this? <laughs> <laughs> that's that's yes. how I use it. No, that's, that's a really good one. Um, the same thing is, anyway, I type this a lot. I say, well, I say IDK, which is the acronym for it. I would never say IDK out loud. Don't say IDK. That sounds kind of stupid. I'm sorry, in my opinion. Mm. But you say, I don't know. Uh -huh. I don't know. I don't know. I say that all the time because I think it's, it's just a nice way to be humble, really. Because mm. maybe you do know or you think you know. But it's a nice way to be like, I'm not sure, mm -hmm. you know, what do you think? It's a nice, um, it's, it, it tones down your, your tone. You don't sound as authoritative, as aggressive. You say, yeah. I don't know, what, do you want to eat Chinese food tonight? Yeah. And, I mean, I don't know, we can, we can eat whatever you want. What do you think? Yeah, it's like a really nice softener like that. Mm -hmm. If you want to introduce, you know, like an, an offer, if you have an idea about something, but you're not sure how the other person feels, you can just say, I don't know, what do you want to do? Mm -hmm. I don't know, what do you want to do? <laughs> But that's usually the thing that they say, I don't know, what do you want to do? Mm. I don't know, what do you want to do? Okay, just make a decision. We're going to go to YouTube and we're going to watch some videos at EnglishClass101.com. Wow, nice. <laughs> okay, and anyway. anyway, anyway. <laughs> okay, so that's some English that we use without thinking about it all the time. I think that they're pretty useful phrases and they're a little bit fun. To. If you have some English that you like to use from time to time or that you just find comes out of your mouth without thinking about it, please leave us a comment and let us know what it is. And Yeah, so also, <laughs> this, is, this is a tough one because if you use it without thinking about it, it's hard for us to realize what those words are. So mm -hmm. if there are any words you hear English people say and you're curious, also leave that in a comment any way you can. And uh, anyway, I think that's, that's about all we have. Anything else? I think that's all. So give them a try, and we will see you again next time when we have more fun stuff to talk about. Thank you. Bye. In this video, you'll learn 20 of the most common words and phrases in English. Hi, everybody. My name is Alicia. Welcome to the 800 Core English Words and Phrases video series. This series will teach you the 800 most common words and phrases in English. But there's a twist. With each new lesson in this series, we'll include the previous lessons at the end. So after you've learned the new words and phrases, stick around and review what you learned in previous lessons. Reviewing is one of the most important parts of learning a language. You can also get the full list right now at EnglishClass101.com. Click the link in the description to access more example sentences, create your own flashcard deck, and finally master English. Okay, let's get started. First is watch. 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 So when we use watch to talk about a noun, it's referring to the clock you can wear on your wrist. Do you have a watch? Do you have a watch? Do you have a watch? Glasses, glasses, glasses. So glasses are eyewear. We wear glasses so that we can see better or so that we can block the sun from our eyes. I don't wear glasses. I don't wear glasses. I don't wear glasses. Jacket, jacket, jacket. So a jacket is usually a light piece of clothing. Uh, it keeps you a little bit warmer in autumn or maybe in spring. That jacket looks nice on you. That jacket looks nice on you. That jacket looks nice on you. 
receive, receive, receive. So to receive something means to get something. Get sounds a little bit more casual than receive. To receive a confession of love. To receive a confession of love. To receive a confession of love. Search. 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 So the word search means to look for, to look for something. Search tends to sound a little bit more formal than look for. It'll show up if you search on the internet. It'll show up if you search on the internet. It will show up if you search on the internet. Take. 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 So take means to remove something from another place or to choose something. Please take me home. Please take me home. Please take me home. Week. 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 So this word is the opposite of the word strong. It means something that doesn't have a lot of power. A weak team. A weak team. A weak team. Strong, strong, strong. So strong is the opposite of weak. Strong refers to something that has lots and lots of power. Be strong and don't give up. Be strong and don't give up. Be strong and don't give up. Cold, cold, cold. So the word cold typically refers to temperature. When the temperature is low, we describe the feeling as cold. The North Pole is cold even in summer. The North Pole is cold even in summer. The North Pole is cold even in summer. Hot, hot, hot. So hot is the opposite of cold. Hot is used when the temperatures are warm. The temperatures are very, very high. We describe the feeling with hot. The tea is still hot. The tea is still hot. The tea is still hot. Funny, funny, funny. So the word funny refers to something that causes us to laugh. Funny sitcoms make me happy. Funny sitcoms make me happy. Funny sitcoms make me happy. Peach. 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 So a peach is a well-known fruit. It's kind of sweet. I'm allergic to peaches. I'm allergic to peaches. I am allergic to peaches. Orange. 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 So orange can refer to the fruit or it can refer to the color orange. I drink orange juice in the morning. I drink orange juice in the morning. I drink orange juice in the morning. Potato. 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 So a potato is a very, very popular food. We make all kinds of things with potatoes, french fries, mashed potatoes, and so on. Fried potato is not good for your health. Fried potato is not good for your health. Fried potato is not good for your health. Soybean, soybean, soybean. So a soybean is an ingredient that people may use to create other things like milk, for example. Soybeans grow inside the pods. Soybeans grow inside the pods. Soybeans grow inside the pods. Vegetable, 
vegetable. Vegetable. So a vegetable is a food that's good for you. So there are many different kinds of vegetables, carrots, zucchinis, so on. I ate fried vegetables. I ate fried vegetables. I ate fried vegetables. Cow. 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 So a cow is a farm animal. We use cows for dairy and for milk and for beef. The cows are grazing in the field. The cows are grazing in the field. The cows are grazing in the field. Pig. 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 A pig is another farm animal, usually very low to the ground and pink or kind of gray in color. We use these for meat. Pigs are intelligent animals. Pigs are intelligent animals. Pigs are intelligent animals. Horse. 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 So a horse, another farm animal, is used a lot more for entertainment, for like racing activities. Have you ever ridden a horse before? Have you ever ridden a horse before? Have you ever ridden a horse before? Snow. 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 So snow is a type of weather. It's precipitation, so that means it's rain, it's water from the sky, but that is frozen. There's a lot of snow on the mountain. There's a lot of snow on the mountain. There is a lot of snow on the mountain. Well done. In this lesson, you expanded your vocabulary and learned 20 new useful words. Click the link in the description and sign up for free at EnglishClass101.com to get access to the full list of vocabulary you'll need for daily life conversations. You'll also get example sentences, custom flashcard decks, and other learning resources. See you next time. Bye-bye. Welcome to EnglishClass101.com's English in 3 Minutes, the fastest, easiest, and most fun way to learn English. Hey everyone, I'm Alicia. In this series, we're going to learn some easy ways to ask and answer common questions in English. It's really useful and it only takes 3 minutes. In this lesson, you're going to learn some ways to get in touch with someone after you have met them once already. In a lot of textbooks, you've probably seen the question, What's your phone number? What's your phone number? It's a very useful question, but there are two problems with it. First, it can sound a little too direct, especially when talking to members of the opposite sex. And second, People use the phone a lot less these days than they used to. Instead, they might prefer to connect by email or on a social network like Facebook. To start, though, a simple variation on what's your phone number that sounds a little less direct is, could I get your number? Could I get your number? We start the sentence with could, which softens the request. Next, say, I, then get, and finally, your number, which is short for your phone number. This question is slightly casual, but it can be used in almost any situation. Recently, many people prefer to use email rather than the phone to communicate. Asking someone for his or her email address is also a little less direct than asking for their phone number. Could I get your email address? Could I get your email address? We just took, could I get your number? And replaced number with email address. It's that simple. Could I get your email address? If someone asks you either of these questions, you can reply by saying, sure, my phone number is, sure, my phone number is, or sure, my email address is, Sure, my email address is, 
or sure, it's, and then say your phone number or email address at the end. By the way, if you're having any trouble with numbers, check out EnglishClass101.com's core word lists for these and other key vocabulary words. Each word comes with a picture, audio samples so you can perfect your pronunciation, and sample sentences and phrases so you can master its use in a sentence. Recently, many people use social networks like Facebook or LinkedIn or an online chatting service like Skype to communicate. People might ask you about these, especially if they are younger. If someone wants to connect with you through one of these services, they may simply ask, Are you on? followed by the name of the service. Are you on Facebook? Are you on Facebook? Are you on LinkedIn? Are you on LinkedIn? Are you on Skype? Are you on Skype? To answer, you can simply say, Yes, I am, or No, I'm not. If you respond with Yes, I am, the other person may ask how they can connect with you on one of these services. Of course, if you're not on one of these services, they won't be able to contact you. If you still would like to stay in touch with the person, though, you can say, no, but my email address is, or no, but my phone number is, and then say your email address or phone number. By telling the other person a different way they can contact you, you'll show them that you want to hear from them. Now it's time for Alicia's advice. If you ask someone for their phone number, their email address, or some other form of contact information, they will usually give it to you if you have gotten to know them a little beforehand. If you ask too early in the conversation, though, they may be hesitant about sharing that information. The key is to make sure you talk for some time before requesting this kind of personal information. In this lesson, we learned how to ask for a person's contact information. But what's the best way to ask someone to meet you later? Find out next time in the seventh English in three minutes lesson. See you next time. Everybody and welcome back to Top Words. My name is Alicia and today we're going to talk about 10 ways to help improve your pronunciation. This is going to be a good one, I think. So let's go! Sing along to a favorite song. All right, so the first tip for improving your pronunciation is to sing along to a favorite song. So if you, uh, I should add though, this favorite song should be in your target language. So if you're studying English, pick a favorite English song and sing along to that song, uh, or try to sing to the song just from memory too. So singing along to your favorite song can help you with pronunciation, can help you with the rhythm sometimes of uh, the language you're trying to learn. So it can be really fun and it can be a good way to practice your pronunciation. In a sentence, I like singing along to my favorite songs. Read out loud. The next tip for your pronunciation is to read out loud. So uh, reading out loud, you can choose something that's interesting for you in, your, in English, if English is the language you're studying. So pick something, maybe it's a news article, or maybe it's a book uh, you're interested in. Maybe there's an author you're interested in. Find something in your target language in English and try reading it out loud. So don't just read in your mind, uh, but read the words out loud. Speak them so that you can get comfortable pronouncing those words. Uh, and you can try reading uh, the same passage or the same sentence multiple times to make it smoother. Uh, so this can be a really good tip um, for, and it, it, I think it also improves uh, your natural uh, ability to pick up grammar too, because if you're reading something like in a book, for example, you can kind of pick up the natural rhythm of grammar and you also slowly get a feeling for the correct ways um, that words should connect together. So this, I think, is a really good tip. In a sentence, I sometimes read out loud to practice pronunciation. That's true. Repeat lines you hear in TV shows. The next tip is to repeat lines you hear or the words you hear in TV shows or movies, things like that. 
So um, this means not only words, don't only repeat single vocabulary words. Yes, maybe you find a vocabulary word that is really interesting um, or it sounds funny or something like that, but by repeating uh, a full sentence or a full line in a TV show or in a movie, you're putting the words together. So not just one word, but making a whole sentence. So feeling kind of the flow of your language that you're studying. Um, so this can be a better way to actually practice making sentences and repeating sentences instead of just words. So you can repeat after characters in TV shows. I sometimes do this when I'm like watching Japanese TV. I'm like, ah, and then I try and spit it back out. It's hard to do sometimes when it's like the first time you've heard a word or the first time you've heard a grammar point, um, but you can still understand that sentence. It's interesting, so try to say it. Uh, it's kind of fun, actually, I think. In a sentence, try repeating lines from TV shows to practice. Practice speaking in phrases, not single vocabulary words. The next tip, this is very similar to my TV show tip, is to practice speaking in phrases, not in vocabulary words, not just single vocabulary words. Even if you're not repeating lines from TV shows, when you practice speaking, don't just speak in nouns. So sometimes, for example, uh, I'll hear people just use noun, like they'll use a noun and maybe a verb, uh, like I, tomorrow, beach, or something like that. And yes, we can probably guess based on that how, like the, the meaning, the speaker's meaning, but uh, you need to practice making a whole sentence. So yes, you know those words, I, tomorrow, and beach, and the listener can probably guess what you mean, but you need to practice all those little words in the middle, like, uh, like I'm going to the beach tomorrow. So make a full sentence. Practice making full sentences. Don't only practice single vocabulary words. Make the whole line. It's really good. Sometimes I think my students get irritated. Like they'll, I, like I force them to practice full sentences. Like so I'll say like, uh, mm, have you ever been to Germany? And they'll say, yes. I'm like, Okay, for the purposes of practice, can you make a full sentence? And they'll say, I have been to Germany. Mm -hmm. Like, that's an extreme example, but like, I try to push that, you know, making the full sentence. It's, it's silly sometimes, but just trying to do that. Okay, uh, so in a sentence, speaking in entire phrases is helpful for practicing the rhythm of a new language. Speak a lot with your teacher and ask them to be strict with you. Onwards, okay. So the next tip is to speak a lot with your teacher and ask them to be strict with you. So this is kind of two tips in one. One, speak with your teacher. Uh, so if you have a teacher, um, make sure you're speaking in their class. If you, if, if wherever possible. Sometimes I'll have students join my class and maybe they feel shy or whatever um, and they don't speak very much, but please speak with your teacher so that your teacher can correct you. Your teacher can give you, at least if they're a native speaker, or maybe even if they aren't a native speaker, your teacher can give you corrections. Uh, and if you don't speak, your teacher cannot help you in most cases. So please speak with your teacher. And if you like, you can tell them, please be strict about my pronunciation. Uh, so sometimes people will say, please help me with my pronunciation specifically. And then I can stop them every time they make a mistake and we practice that sound, uh, especially TH sounds like the th, like using, um, using your mouth a little bit differently can be really uncomfortable for some people. But uh, if your teacher can point out those things like, TH sounds, the, this, that, these, those, those TH sounds, ending ER sounds. Um, practicing those with your teacher can be a really good way to work on your pronunciation. Mm. So in a sentence, speak a lot with your teacher. They can correct you and help you improve. Try recording yourself speaking and play it back. The next tip for practicing your pronunciation is to try recording yourself speaking and listen to it. Play it back and listen to it. So this, it might sound a little bit strange, but um, when we're speaking, maybe we don't hear certain things that certain, maybe uh, our little idiosyncrasies or the little special things that we do when we speak, maybe we don't hear them as we speak. But when we listen to ourselves later, we notice them. So for example, when I watch this video, when I watch any of these videos, I notice little things that I didn't notice um, 
at now <laughs> when I'm filming the video. So the same can apply to your pronunciation. When you listen to yourself speak, you might hear something that you don't notice when you're speaking. So this can be a good way to, um, to kind of remove yourself, to, to go outside your body a little bit and listen to yourself from the listener's perspective. So this might be a tip to try. In a sentence, sometimes you hear yourself more clearly on a recording. Do shadowing exercises. All right, the next tip for pronunciation is to do shadowing exercises. So a shadowing exercise, uh, there are textbooks and, and I think resources on the web, maybe on the website. Um, actually, I think you could use the website. Any uh, English listening or anything in your target language, when you listen to that, as the speaker is speaking, you quickly repeat back what the speaker is saying. So as you're listening to it, you repeat it almost immediately. So you're trying to, uh, to match their pronunciation as closely, as accurately as possible. This is called a shadowing exercise. So um, I've seen some cases where people or textbooks will recommend doing you know, 15 minutes of shadowing each day or something like that. Or maybe you can do a shadowing exercise, uh, listening to a podcast or listening to the news or uh, something you might find on uh, the website here. So that's a really good way to work on your pronunciation and to get familiar with using those sounds um, kind of more naturally, the way a native speaker would. So this can be a good tip to improve your pronunciation. In a sentence, uh, try shadowing a native speaker to improve your pronunciation chat with native speakers. Uh, so yeah, the next tip is to chat with native speakers. So chatting with native speakers, of course, uh, is a great way, A, to make friends, uh, B, to pick up new vocabulary, C, to get familiar with grammar and slang, um, but also it can help your pronunciation. Not all native speakers speak with exactly the same pronunciation. So you might hear slight differences depending on the country, depending on the region in a country a native speaker comes from. So there are many different kinds of pronunciations, uh, or many diff there are many different pronunciations, but uh, when you chat with native speakers, you can kind of understand the different pronunciations that are out there. Uh, and maybe it can help you um, be more consistent in your presentation, in your pronunciation too. So this could be a good way um, to improve your pronunciation, but of course it's important in general for learning a language, I think. In a sentence, chatting with native speakers is an important part of learning a language. Do pronunciation drills. The next tip is to do pronunciation drills. So if you know that there's a sound, if you know that there's something that you always struggle with, try drilling it. So dr a drill, to drill something means to repeat a lot. So you might hear this word used for like, uh, like sports and fitness, like you drill a skill, you, which means to practice something a lot and intensively. So if you know that there's like the TH sound is really difficult for you, maybe take 10 minutes and do a pronunciation drill on those sounds for, you know, every day for a month or something. So if you know that there's a specific sound that's difficult for you, consider trying just some very specific pronunciation drills. Um, so um, that can mean just making that sound repeatedly or maybe reading a text um, out loud that has a lot of that kind of pronunciation. Um, I think you can find a few different ways to drill, to practice intensively those parts uh, of pronunciation that are difficult for you. So in a sentence, try doing pronunciation drills for the sounds you have trouble making. Find words that are particularly interesting to you. So uh, I think maybe this is the last tip, uh, is to find words that are particularly interesting to you. So maybe there's a word that sounds really funny, or maybe you found a really long word in English, or a really interesting word, a word that has an interesting history, whatever. If you can find words that are interesting to you, um, then maybe you can put some extra emphasis on pronouncing them correctly. So if you're actually enjoying the words that you're learning, um, then I think it'll become more important for you to express that accurately in your speech. And so focusing on those words maybe, um, and, and in pronouncing those words correctly, perhaps that can help you apply that same pronunciation in this interesting word 
maybe the pronunciation uh, of that word or some of the parts of that word, you can find that in other words in other places throughout your target language. So uh, if you enjoy a particular word and focus on uh, expressing that word, pronouncing that word accurately, it can help you maybe apply that pronunciation in other parts of the language. So give it a try. In a sentence, take extra care to pronounce words of particular interest correctly. That's the end. So those are 10 tips to help you improve your pronunciation. If there's anything else that you do to work on your pronunciation, or if you have any questions, please leave us a comment and let us know about it. Uh, please make sure to like this video too if you haven't liked it already, and also subscribe to our channel as well. Thanks very much for watching this episode of Top Words, and we will see you again soon. Bye! Hi everyone, I'm Alicia. Thanksgiving is one of the most celebrated holidays in the United States. It also marks the beginning of the holiday season. The weeks leading up to Christmas, Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, and the winter solstice, which are all widely celebrated holidays in the U.S. For retailers, Thanksgiving begins their busiest season. Thanksgiving is celebrated on the fourth Thursday of November. Thanksgiving was founded as a national holiday by one of the most famous presidents of the United States. Do you know who it might have been? We'll show you the answer at the end of this video. Thanksgiving, to a large extent, is about having a feast with friends and family. Turkey is the traditional main course with yams, squash, pumpkin pie, cranberries, and other rich and filling foods rounding out the meal. Some families spend weeks preparing for their Thanksgiving feast, and to stuff oneself is most certainly encouraged. The Thanksgiving meal of today is rooted in the meal that the pilgrims from Europe shared with the Native Americans on the first Thanksgiving. This was quite a feast. Turkey, duck, goose, squash, corn, and a plethora of other foods were shared between the Europeans and the Native Americans. This original fate was said to go on for three full days. Football is another tradition during Thanksgiving celebrations in the United States. Watching the football game while preparing the Thanksgiving meal is an important part of the celebration for many families. Families that aren't sports fans, however, may opt to spend the time outside, enjoying the crisp autumn air, or may find other diversions to enjoy while the turkey cooks. Thanksgiving is not a uniquely American holiday. There are similar celebrations in Canada, for instance. The concept behind the holiday, showing thankfulness by having a feast, spans many cultures. And now, Here's the answer to the quiz. Do you know who founded Thanksgiving as a national holiday? Abraham Lincoln established Thanksgiving during the dark days of the American Civil War. Even though the holiday was officially born during this conflict, it's more associated with the initially good relations between the first European immigrants and the Native Americans. How was this lesson? Did you learn something interesting? Is there a day in your country where you give thanks? Please leave a comment at EnglishClass101.com. Until next time! Hi everybody, welcome back. I'm joined today again in the studio by... Michael. Hey everybody. And today we're going to be talking about our favorite English that we use without even thinking about it. So these are things that we just say. We say just so often uh, and they come really, really naturally to us. So that might be kind of helpful for you to hear about some of the things that we like to say. Uh, so I guess I'll start us off for this one. Go ahead. Uh, the first one that I've picked, I, th I think I picked really simple phrases this time around. The first one that I've chosen is the phrase, I know. I know. I like to use this to agree with my friends a lot. So if my friend gives me some, some kind of interesting information, I go, I know, or I know, or something, something just to show that I'm listening to them and that I agree. It doesn't necessarily mean that 
I'm, I'm already, I don't know, like, like I've learned the information or something like that. It's, it's, a, it's an agreement phrase that I like to use with my friends. Um, is this so, something that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's funny you said that because before you explained like the tone and gave an example of how you say it, mm -hmm. I thought of it on the opposite side. To me it sounded like, like a kid who's like, I know, I know mom. Oh, you know, giving yeah. them like, you need to do this and this and this. <laughs> I know, I know, you know. I'm trying to think, do, do men, I mean these, these are gender roles, you can say whatever you want, but I'm trying to think, I, I, I know, yeah. I, mm, I don't know if I, I've ever said it like oh, that. Oh, really? Sorry. Oh, maybe it is a gender thing. Maybe it's more common among women than it is among men. But I feel like it, maybe it's just in a movie or maybe it's because of where I'm from that people will say, like, if you watch the last video, for example, dude, I know, that kind of uh, thing. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but that, your point about kids saying that is it's so funny. Like, when, when you get in trouble, I know, I know, saying it like that, mm, it has a different meaning. It's another exercise in intonation, maybe, this word, I know, or this phrase, rather. Okay, cool. Uh, so there's one. What's your, what's your first one? So my first word is not really a word. It's spelled a couple different ways, is <laughs> So this is something I, I didn't realize that I, I do a lot or say a lot or whatever, but it's, um, it, it, it's, it's a sound that English speakers make that shows disapproval mm. so i don't know like okay for example the kid the kid who's talking to a parent and then the parent says you know you need to do your homework da, da. i know i know but no seriously you need to get into a good go Psh, mom whatever yeah so maybe the same as like whatever uh -huh. psh. yeah psh is good there are a lot of variations on psh. <laughs> whenever, whenever you don't want to hear what the other person is saying you can use psh. or i see another one that i like to use um p f f f f t Ah. <laughs> that one's harder to say though. It's not so natural. But I think psh is good. Mm. Any any sort of p p kind of sound or meh, just any sort of just nonsensical phrase said mm. like that means I don't want to listen to what you're saying. Mm. Yeah, that's a great one. That's a great mm. one. <laughs> I use that all the time too. Oh, I, I wish I wish I didn't use it as much as I did, but so. oh, I suppose so. so. I see what you mean. Okay. All right. Uh, well, onward, I guess. My next word is anyway. Anyway, I like to use to transition between two things, to transition between ideas. I also like to use it when I'm, I've been talking for way too long and I need to make an exit from the conversation. Usually I use anyway with kind of a dot, dot, dot at the end, like anyway. And I don't finish, any, I don't finish saying anything after that. Hmm. It's just sort of it's my, just my little sidle out, out of the conversation. Yeah. In, anyway, um, anyway. So I use this word a lot, actually. I'm glad you said that. Um, actually, some of my students asked me, they said, you know, what are some good um, words that connect two ideas mm -hmm. or something like that, like a beginning, you know, like first, second, these kinds of words. And I noticed, and I, I never noticed this before, it actually relates to this question, um, that a lot of the things that you look up that are transition words, we don't ever use in speech. Mm -hmm. It doesn't sound natural, but you have to use synonyms, you have to switch it up if you're writing. Yeah. Speaking, I say anyway almost every other sentence. Really? Maybe I do it too much, well, not that much, but a lot, a lot. I realize that even typing, even business emails, uh -huh. I say it all of the time. Uh -huh. Like, it's kind of like, well, yeah. anyway. Yeah. Um, maybe because I go on tangents a lot. So for me, I use it not, not as much as the anyway, dot, dot, dot. I yeah. usually do the Anyway, back to what I was saying, blah, oh. blah, 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 blah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, that's a good point about it being used for transitions. So a lot of my students are the same way. They'll pick mm. like a really, really formal, almost businessy term to use to transition in their mm. speech, and it doesn't really sound so natural. But something mm. like anyway, or like you said, well, mm. or so, is much better to use in conversation, mm. I think. Cool. Okay. Anyway. Anyway. <laughs> um, dun -dun. Seriously. So seriously, this is another one, always the, the intonation, this is, this is our, our thing is intonation, I okay. guess, but um, seriously can be said in a lot of different ways. Um, for me, maybe the most common is the same as when you say really, mm. just kind of like seriously, mm -hmm. like did that actually happen? Mm. No way, really? Yeah. Anytime, you, anytime you go up like that, it's just, it's a rhetorical question, you don't actually want an answer, just right. like wow, same thing as wow. Um, and then there's also the... When someone does something stupid and you just look and you, seriously, yeah. you know, but that's less common. That's, you know, kind of a... Really? <laughs> seriously? No, really. I mean, I, I use it the way that you just described it to, really? to, 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 like if I see, I don't know, somebody is walking on the street in front of me and maybe they stop 
mm. and they don't have any consideration for the people behind them on the street. I might go, seriously? Oh, Maybe you're right, head. you're right, you're right. <laughs> Whenever, <laughs> Like, are, is this really happening? Did you just make this decision? I, mm. So I maybe I use it when I'm talking to myself more. Not so much. I don't necessarily. Yeah, those are fighting words. Word. Yeah, those are fighting words. Yeah. So no, you're right. I, I think maybe driving, same thing. Yeah, road like, rage. Seriously, or, I mean, are you are you kidding me? Mm. Well, <laughs> I don't want to say the bad version of it, but <laughs> this is what I'm thinking when I'm driving. Like, yeah. are you kidding me? Yeah. Seriously? Yeah. You're right, you're right. But it's usually to yourself, because mm. otherwise it's pretty aggressive. That's that true, like, yeah. So don't say it to the other person. Mm. But yeah, you're right in terms of when you're talking to your friends and you mm. want to ask, did that really happen to you? Seriously? Mm. Yeah, it's super useful. Mm. Okay. Is it my uh, turn again? Okay, last one for me. Um, my last one is one I use all the time in a number of situations. I've chosen, I don't know. Um, this is great for, of course, when you don't know the answer to something. Um, but I think when you don't know the answer to something like a you know a math question or whatever it's better to say i don't know but when you use the the contracted don't know form of don't know <laughs> it just shows kind of that you're it's not a serious issue it's not something you need you're overly concerned with you're just i don't know i don't have an answer i don't have an idea it's kind of like saying you know what do you think or just this is all i've got you know mm. um so i don't know do you use this <laughs> <laughs> that's yes. how I use it. No, that's that's a really good one. Um, the same thing is anyway. I type this a lot. I say, well, I say IDK, which is the acronym for it. I would never say IDK out loud. Don't say IDK. That sounds kind of stupid. I'm sorry, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. But you say I don't know. Uh -huh. I don't know. I don't know. I say that all the time because I think it's it's just a nice way to be humble, really. Because mm -hmm. maybe you do know or you think you know, but it's a nice way to be like. I'm not sure, mm -hmm. you know, what do you think? It's a nice, um, it's, it, it tones down your, your tone. You don't sound as authoritative, as aggressive. You say, yeah. I don't know, what, do you want to eat Chinese food tonight? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I don't know, we can, we can eat whatever you want. What do you think? Yeah, it's like a really nice softener like that. Mm -hmm. If you want to introduce, you know, like an, an offer, if you have an idea about something, but you're not sure how the other person feels, you can just say, I don't know, what do you want to do? Mm -hmm. I don't know, what do you want to do? <laughs> But that's usually the thing that they say, I don't know, what do you want to do? Mm. I don't know, what do you want to do? Okay, just make a decision. We're going to go to YouTube and we're going to watch some videos in English Class 101.com. Wow, nice. <laughs> okay, and anyway. Anyway, anyway, anyway. <laughs> okay, so that's some English that we use without thinking about it all the time. I think that they're pretty useful phrases and they're a little bit fun. To. If you have some English that you like to use from time to time or that you just find comes out of your mouth without thinking about it, please leave us a comment and let us know what it is. And Yeah, so also, <laughs> this, is, this is a tough one because if you use it without thinking about it, it's hard for us to realize what those words are. So mm -hmm. if there are any words you hear English people say and you're curious, also leave that in a comment any way you can. And uh, anyway, I think that's, that's about all we have. Anything else? I think that's all. So give them a try, and we will see you again next time when we have more fun stuff to talk about. Thank you. Bye. In this video, you'll learn 20 of the most common words and phrases in English. Hi, everybody. My name is Alicia. Welcome to the 800 Core English Words and Phrases video series. This series will teach you the 800 most common words and phrases in English. But there's a twist. With each new lesson in this series, we'll include the previous lessons at the end. So after you've learned the new words and phrases, stick around and review what you learned in previous lessons. Reviewing is one of the most important parts of learning a language. You can also get the full list right now at EnglishClass101.com. Click the link in the description to access more example sentences, create your own flashcard deck, and finally master English. Okay, let's get started. First is watch. 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 So when we use watch to talk about a noun, it's referring to the clock you can wear on your wrist. Do you have a watch? Do you have a watch? Do you have a watch? Glasses, glasses, glasses. So glasses are eyewear. We wear glasses so that we can see better or so that we can block the sun from our eyes. I don't wear glasses. 
I don't wear glasses. I don't wear glasses. Jacket. 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 So a jacket is usually a light piece of clothing. Uh, it keeps you a little bit warmer in autumn or maybe in spring. That jacket looks nice on you. That jacket looks nice on you. That jacket looks nice on you. Receive. 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 So to receive something means to get something. Get sounds a little bit more casual than receive. To receive a confession of love. To receive a confession of love. To receive a confession of love. Search. 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 So the word search means to look for, to look for something. Search tends to sound a little bit more formal than look for. It'll show up if you search on the internet. It'll show up if you search on the internet. It will show up if you search on the internet. Take. 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 So take means to remove something from another place or to choose something. Please take me home. Please take me home. Please take me home. Week. 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 So this word is the opposite of the word strong. It means something that doesn't have a lot of power. A weak team. A weak team. A weak team. Strong. 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 So strong is the opposite of weak. Strong refers to something that has lots and lots of power. Be strong and don't give up. Be strong and don't give up. Be strong and don't give up. Cold. 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 So the word cold typically refers to temperature. When the temperature is low, we describe the feeling as cold. The North Pole is cold even in summer. The North Pole is cold even in summer. The North Pole is cold even in summer. Hot. 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 So hot is the opposite of cold. Hot is used when the temperatures are warm. The temperatures are very, very high. We describe the feeling with hot. The tea is still hot. The tea is still hot. The tea is still hot. Funny. 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 So the word funny refers to something that causes us to laugh. Funny sitcoms make me happy. Funny sitcoms make me happy. Funny sitcoms make me happy. Peach. 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 So a peach is a well-known fruit. It's kind of sweet. I'm allergic to peaches. I'm allergic to peaches. I am allergic to peaches. Orange. 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 So orange can refer to the fruit or it can refer to the color orange. I drink orange juice in the morning. I drink orange juice in the morning. I drink orange juice in the morning. Potato. 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 So a potato is a very, very popular food. We make all kinds of things with potatoes, french fries, mashed potatoes, and so on. Fried potato is not good for your health. Fried potato is not good for your health. 
fried potato is not good for your health. Soybean. 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 So a soybean is an ingredient that people may use to create other things, like milk, for example. Soybeans grow inside the pods. Soybeans grow inside the pods. Soybeans grow inside the pods. Vegetable. 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 So a vegetable is a food that's good for you. So there are many different kinds of vegetables, carrots, zucchinis, so on. I ate fried vegetables. I ate fried vegetables. I ate fried vegetables. Cow. 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 So a cow is a farm animal. We use cows for dairy and for milk and for beef. The cows are grazing in the field. The cows are grazing in the field. The cows are grazing in the field. Pig. 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 A pig is another farm animal, usually very low to the ground and pink or kind of gray in color. We use these for meat. Pigs are intelligent animals. Pigs are intelligent animals. Pigs are intelligent animals. Horse. 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 So a horse, another farm animal, is used a lot more for entertainment, for like racing activities. Have you ever ridden a horse before? Have you ever ridden a horse before? Have you ever ridden a horse before? Snow. 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 So snow is a type of weather it's precipitation, so that means it's rain, it's water from the sky, but that is frozen. There's a lot of snow on the mountain. There's a lot of snow on the mountain. There is a lot of snow on the mountain. Well done. In this lesson, you expanded your vocabulary and learned 20 new useful words. Click the link in the description and sign up for free at EnglishClass101.com to get access to the full list of vocabulary you'll need for daily life conversations. You'll also get example sentences, custom flashcard decks, and other learning resources. See you next time. Bye-bye. Welcome to EnglishClass101.com's English in 3 Minutes, the fastest, easiest, and most fun way to learn English. Hey everyone, I'm Alicia. In this series, we're going to learn some easy ways to ask and answer common questions in English. It's really useful and it only takes 3 minutes. In this lesson, you're going to learn some ways to get in touch with someone after you have met them once already. In a lot of textbooks, you've probably seen the question, What's your phone number? What's your phone number? It's a very useful question, but there are two problems with it. First, it can sound a little too direct, especially when talking to members of the opposite sex. And second, People use the phone a lot less these days than they used to. Instead, they might prefer to connect by email or on a social network like Facebook. To start, though, a simple variation on what's your phone number that sounds a little less direct is, could I get your number? Could I get your number? We start the sentence with could, which softens the request. Next, say, I, then get, and finally, your number, which is short for your phone number. This question is slightly casual, but it can be used in almost any situation. Recently, many people prefer to use email rather than the phone to communicate. Asking someone for his or her email address is also a little less direct than asking for their phone number. Could I get your email address? Could I get your email address? 
We just took could I get your number and replaced number with email address. It's that simple. Could I get your email address? If someone asks you either of these questions, you can reply by saying, sure, my phone number is, sure, my phone number is, or sure, my email address is, sure, my email address is, or sure, it's, and then say your phone number or email address at the end. By the way, if you're having any trouble with numbers, check out EnglishClass101.com's core word lists for these and other key vocabulary words. Each word comes with a picture, audio samples so you can perfect your pronunciation, and sample sentences and phrases so you can master its use in a sentence. Recently, many people use social networks like Facebook or LinkedIn or an online chatting service like Skype to communicate. People might ask you about these, especially if they are younger. If someone wants to connect with you through one of these services, they may simply ask, Are you on? followed by the name of the service. Are you on Facebook? Are you on Facebook? Are you on LinkedIn? Are you on LinkedIn? Are you on Skype? Are you on Skype? To answer, you can simply say, Yes, I am, or No, I'm not. If you respond with Yes, I am, the other person may ask how they can connect with you on one of these services. Of course, if you're not on one of these services, they won't be able to contact you. If you still would like to stay in touch with the person, though, you can say, no, but my email address is, or no, but my phone number is, and then say your email address or phone number. By telling the other person a different way they can contact you, you'll show them that you want to hear from them. Now it's time for Alicia's advice. If you ask someone for their phone number, their email address, or some other form of contact information, they will usually give it to you if you have gotten to know them a little beforehand. If you ask too early in the conversation, though, they may be hesitant about sharing that information. The key is to make sure you talk for some time before requesting this kind of personal information. In this lesson, we learned how to ask for a person's contact information. But what's the best way to ask someone to meet you later? Find out next time in the seventh English in three minutes lesson. See you next time. Hi everybody and welcome back to Top Words. My name is Alicia and today we're going to talk about 10 ways to help improve your pronunciation. This is going to be a good one, I think. So let's go! Sing along to a favorite song. All right, so the first tip for improving your pronunciation is to sing along to a favorite song. So if you, uh, I should add though, this favorite song should be in your target language. So if you're studying English, pick a favorite English song and sing along to that song, uh, or try to sing to the song just from memory too. So singing along to your favorite song can help you with pronunciation, can help you with the rhythm sometimes of uh, the language you're trying to learn. So it can be really fun and it can be a good way to practice your pronunciation. In a sentence, I like singing along to my favorite songs. Read out loud. The next tip for your pronunciation is to read out loud. So uh, reading out loud, you can choose something that's interesting for you in, your, in English, if English is the language you're studying. So pick something, maybe it's a news article, or maybe it's a book uh, you're interested in. Maybe there's an author you're interested in. Find something in your target language in English and try reading it out loud. So don't just read in your mind, uh, but read the words out loud. Speak them so that you can get comfortable pronouncing those words. Uh, and you can try reading uh, the same passage or the same sentence multiple times to make it smoother. Uh, so this can be a really good tip um, for, and it, it, I think it also improves uh, your natural 
uh, ability to pick up grammar too, because if you're reading something like in a book, for example, you can kind of pick up the natural rhythm of grammar and you also slowly get a feeling for the correct ways um, that words should connect together. So this, I think, is a really good tip. In a sentence, I sometimes read out loud to practice pronunciation. That's true. Repeat lines you hear in TV shows. The next tip is to repeat lines you hear or the words you hear in TV shows or movies, things like that. So um, this means not only words, don't only repeat single vocabulary words. Yes, maybe you find a vocabulary word that is really interesting um, or it sounds funny or something like that, but by repeating uh, a full sentence or a full line in a TV show or in a movie, you're putting the words together. So not just one word, but making a whole sentence. So feeling kind of the flow of your language that you're studying. Um, so this can be a better way to actually practice making sentences and repeating sentences instead of just words. So you can repeat after characters in TV shows. I sometimes do this when I'm like watching Japanese TV. I'm like, ah, and then I try and spit it back out. It's hard to do sometimes when it's like the first time you've heard a word or the first time you've heard a grammar point, um, but you can still understand that sentence. It's interesting, so try to say it. And uh, it's kind of fun, actually, I think. In a sentence, try repeating lines from TV shows to practice. Practice speaking in phrases, not single vocabulary words. The next tip, this is very similar to my TV show tip, is to practice speaking in phrases, not in vocabulary words, not just single vocabulary words. Even if you're not repeating lines from TV shows, when you practice speaking, don't just speak in nouns. So sometimes, for example, uh, I'll hear people just use noun, like they'll use a noun and maybe a verb, uh, like I, tomorrow, beach, something like that. And yes, we can probably guess based on that how, like the, the meaning, the speaker's meaning, but uh, you need to practice making a whole sentence. So yes, you know those words, I, tomorrow, and beach, and the listener can probably guess what you mean, but you need to practice all those little words in the middle, like uh, like, I'm going to the beach tomorrow. So make a full sentence. Practice making full sentences. Don't only practice single vocabulary words. Make the whole line. It's really good. Sometimes I think my students get irritated. Like, they'll, I, like, I force them to practice full sentences. Like, so I'll say, like, uh, mm, have you ever been to Germany? And they'll say, yes. I'm like, Okay, for the purposes of practice, <laughs> can you make a full sentence? And they'll say, I have been to Germany. Mm -hmm. Like, that's an extreme example, but like, I try to push that, you know, making the full sentence. It's, it's silly sometimes, but just trying to do that. <laughs> okay, uh, so in a sentence, speaking in entire phrases is helpful for practicing the rhythm of a new language. Speak a lot with your teacher and ask them to be strict with you. Onwards. Okay, so the next tip is to speak a lot with your teacher and ask them to be strict with you. So this is kind of two tips in one. One, speak with your teacher. Uh, so if you have a teacher, um, make sure you're speaking in their class if you, if, if wherever possible. Sometimes I'll have students join my class and maybe they feel shy or whatever. Um, and they don't speak very much, but please speak with your teacher so that your teacher can correct you. Your teacher can give you, at least if they're a native speaker, or maybe even if they aren't a native speaker, your teacher can give you corrections. Uh, and if you don't speak, your teacher cannot help you in most cases. So please speak with your teacher. And if you like, you can tell them, please be strict about my pronunciation. Uh, so sometimes people will say, please help me with my pronunciation specifically. And then I can stop them every time they make a mistake and we practice that sound, uh, especially TH sounds like the th, like using, um, using your mouth a little bit differently can be really uncomfortable for some people. But uh, if your teacher can point out those things like, TH sounds, the, this, that, these, those, those TH sounds, ending ER sounds. Um, practicing those with your teacher can be a really good way to work on your pronunciation. Mm. So in a sentence, speak a lot with your teacher. They can correct you and help you improve. Try recording yourself speaking and play it back. The next tip for practicing your pronunciation is to try recording yourself speaking and listen to it. Play it back and listen to it. 
So this, it might sound a little bit strange, but um, when we're speaking, maybe we don't hear certain things that certain maybe uh, our little idiosyncrasies or the little special things that we do when we speak, maybe we don't hear them as we speak. But when we listen to ourselves later, we notice them. So for example, when I watch this video, when I watch any of these videos, I notice little things that I didn't notice um, at now <laughs> when I'm filming the video. So the same can apply to your pronunciation. When you listen to yourself speak, you might hear something that you don't notice when you're speaking. So this can be a good way to, um, to kind of remove yourself, to, to go outside your body a little bit and listen to yourself from the listener's perspective. So this might be a tip to try. In a sentence, sometimes you hear yourself more clearly on a recording. Do shadowing exercises. All right, the next tip for pronunciation is to do shadowing exercises. So a shadowing exercise, uh, there are textbooks and, and I think resources on the web, maybe on the website. Um, actually, I think you could use the website. Any uh, English listening or anything in your target language, when you listen to that, as the speaker is speaking, you quickly repeat back what the speaker is saying. So as you're listening to it, you repeat it almost immediately. So you're trying to, uh, to match their pronunciation as closely, as accurately as possible. This is called a shadowing exercise. So um, I've seen some cases where people or textbooks will recommend doing you know, 15 minutes of shadowing each day or something like that, or maybe you can do a shadowing exercise, uh, listening to a podcast or listening to the news or uh, something you might find on uh, the website here. So that's a really good way to work on your pronunciation and to get familiar with using those sounds um, kind of more naturally, the way a native speaker would. So this can be a good tip to improve your pronunciation. In a sentence, uh, try shadowing a native speaker to improve your pronunciation chat with native speakers. Uh, so yeah, the next tip is to chat with native speakers. So chatting with native speakers, of course, uh, is a great way, A, to make friends, uh, B, to pick up new vocabulary, C, to get familiar with grammar and slang, um, but also it can help your pronunciation. Not all native speakers speak with exactly the same pronunciation. So you might hear slight differences depending on the country, depending on the region in a country a native speaker comes from. So there are many different kinds of pronunciations, uh, or many diff there are many different pronunciations, but uh, when you chat with native speakers, you can kind of understand the different pronunciations that are out there. Uh, and maybe it can help you um, be more consistent in your presentation, in your pronunciation too. So this could be a good way um, to improve your pronunciation, but of course it's important in general for learning a language, I think. In a sentence, chatting with native speakers is an important part of learning a language. Do pronunciation drills. The next tip is to do pronunciation drills. So if you know that there's a sound, if you know that there's something that you always struggle with, try drilling it. So dr a drill, to drill something means to repeat a lot. So you might hear this word used for like uh, like sports and fitness, like you drill a skill, you, which means to practice something a lot and intensively. So if you know that there's like the TH sound is really difficult for you, maybe take 10 minutes and do a pronunciation drill on those sounds for you know, every day for a month or something. So if you know that there's a specific sound that's difficult for you, consider trying just some very specific pronunciation drills. Um, so um, that can mean just making that sound repeatedly or maybe reading a text um, out loud that has a lot of that kind of pronunciation. Um, I think you can find a few different ways to drill, to practice intensively those parts uh, of pronunciation that are difficult for you. So in a sentence, try doing pronunciation drills for the sounds you have trouble making. Find words that are particularly interesting to you. So uh, I think maybe this is the last tip, uh, is to find words that are particularly interesting to you. 
So maybe there's a word that sounds really funny, or maybe you found a really long word in English, or a really interesting word, a word that has an interesting history, whatever. If you can find words that are interesting to you, um, then maybe you can put some extra emphasis on pronouncing them correctly. So if you're actually enjoying the words that you're learning, um, then I think it'll become more important for you to express that accurately in your speech. And so focusing on those words maybe um, and, and in pronouncing those words correctly, perhaps that can help you apply that same pronunciation in this interesting word. Maybe the pronunciation uh, of that word or some of the parts of that word, you can find that in other words in other places throughout your target language. So uh, if you enjoy a particular word and focus on uh, expressing that word, pronouncing that word accurately, it can help you maybe apply that pronunciation in other parts of the language. So give it a try. In a sentence, take extra care to pronounce words of particular interest correctly. That's the end. So those are 10 tips to help you improve your pronunciation. If there's anything else that you do to work on your pronunciation, or if you have any questions, please leave us a comment and let us know about it. Uh, please make sure to like this video too if you haven't liked it already, and also subscribe to our channel as well. Thanks very much for watching this episode of Top Words, and we will see you again soon. Bye! Hi everyone, I'm Alicia. Thanksgiving is one of the most celebrated holidays in the United States. It also marks the beginning of the holiday season. The weeks leading up to Christmas, Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, and the winter solstice, which are all widely celebrated holidays in the U.S. For retailers, Thanksgiving begins their busiest season. Thanksgiving is celebrated on the fourth Thursday of November. Thanksgiving was founded as a national holiday by one of the most famous presidents of the United States. Do you know who it might have been? We'll show you the answer at the end of this video. Thanksgiving, to a large extent, is about having a feast with friends and family. Turkey is the traditional main course with yams, squash, pumpkin pie, cranberries, and other rich and filling foods rounding out the meal. Some families spend weeks preparing for their Thanksgiving feast, and to stuff oneself is most certainly encouraged. The Thanksgiving meal of today is rooted in the meal that the pilgrims from Europe shared with the Native Americans on the first Thanksgiving. This was quite a feast. Turkey, duck, goose, squash, corn, and a plethora of other foods were shared between the Europeans and the Native Americans. This original fate was said to go on for three full days. Football is another tradition during Thanksgiving celebrations in the United States. Watching the football game while preparing the Thanksgiving meal is an important part of the celebration for many families. Families that aren't sports fans, however, may opt to spend the time outside, enjoying the crisp autumn air, or may find other diversions to enjoy while the turkey cooks. Thanksgiving is not a uniquely American holiday. There are similar celebrations in Canada, for instance. The concept behind the holiday, showing thankfulness by having a feast, spans many cultures. And now, Here's the answer to the quiz. Do you know who founded Thanksgiving as a national holiday? Abraham Lincoln established Thanksgiving during the dark days of the American Civil War. Even though the holiday was officially born during this conflict, it's more associated with the initially good relations between the first European immigrants and the Native Americans. How was this lesson? Did you learn something interesting? Is there a day in your country where you give thanks? Please leave a comment at EnglishClass101.com. Until next time!
Hi everybody, my name is Alicia. Welcome back to Top Words. In this lesson, we're gonna look at the top 20 useful phrases for small talk. Before we get started, a quick note, you can find for free from the link below this video in the YouTube description, a bunch of PDF conversation and phrase cheat sheets. So if you want to work on building your vocabulary or building your everyday phrase knowledge, you should check these out. I think this survival phrases one is a pretty good one for today's lesson. You can use these expressions around your town throughout the day. And of course, there are many other topics to look at too. So don't forget to check these out. You can find this from the link below the video on YouTube. Okay, let's get on with the video. You look great. You look great. So you look great is a good way to greet another person. You should use this when someone has had a new haircut or maybe they have a new shirt or something cool that they're wearing. You want to express that someone looks really nice, you can say, you look great. Next is, how are things? How are things? So how are things is like a more casual way of saying, how are you? How are things means like, how are things in your life? Things here means everything, your job, your work, whatever, your school, your relationships, your family, how are things in general? Okay, let's go to the next phrase. What a coincidence. What a coincidence. What a coincidence is used to express surprise. So this word is spelled kind of strangely. It's pronounced coincidence, coincidence. It means that two things, two or more things, that you might not expect to happen at the same time or in the same way did happen. So for example, if you meet a coworker unexpectedly when you're shopping or you go to a coffee shop and you see someone you know there, you might say, wow, what a coincidence. So you didn't expect this thing to happen, but here you are. So you can express your surprise with this expression. Like, oh, what a coincidence. I ran into you at the coffee shop. Who'd have thought? Okay, let's get on to the next expression. That's great. That's great. Okay, so that's great is good to know. It's a super basic expression, but you can use it to respond to someone else's good news. Someone shares something positive, happy, good, whatever it is, just say, that's great. You can change great out for awesome or super or whatever it is you feel like, but that's great is a good basic phrase you can use just about any time. Okay, let's get to the next expression. Next is good for you, good for you. Okay, so good for you is used to express like happiness for another person's good news. So this is different from that's great because good for you is like mm, kind of noting that someone made an improvement in their life. Someone did something that was good for them specifically. So maybe someone started a new exercise habit and it's really positive, or maybe they ended a bad relationship, or they started a new job at a good place. In those cases where someone has made some personal improvement, you can say, good for you, good for you. Okay, on to the next expression. How are you? How are you? So how are you is a super basic greeting. You can use it with anybody in your life, really. How are you is generally not replied to seriously. We usually just say, I'm good, I'm fine, I'm okay, how are you? So you don't really need to take this expression too seriously, but just say, how are you, to show you're thinking of the other person. Okay, on to the next expression. Next is, is everything going fine? Is everything going fine? So this expression and one that I personally would use, I would probably say, is everything going okay? Is used if maybe you think the other person might be struggling with something or they might have some kind of challenge or maybe some kind of problem. It's kind of used to say like, do you want to talk about something or do you want to discuss something? Uh, you could use it if you're concerned. You can also just use it as like an everyday greeting. Like, hey, how are you? Is everything going okay? So just to show that you're thinking of the other person's life. But yeah, if you use a more concerned tone with this, like, is everything going okay? You can show that you've maybe noticed something about the other person too. And you might want to show it's okay to talk about it. So depending on your intonation, you can communicate some different ideas with this expression. All right, on to the next one. You won't believe this. You won't believe this. 
Okay, you won't believe this is used before you share ex like some kind of surprising information or exciting information. You might also hear, you're not gonna believe this, which is a reduced form of, you are not going to believe this. You won't believe this, but is very common. So it's like saying, I have something so surprising that you probably will not believe the information, but here it is. So you can share something surprising or exciting with this phrase. Okay, onward. Next is, I haven't seen you for ages. I haven't seen you for ages. Okay, so use this expression instead of long time no see, or you can use them together. Like oh, long time no see, I haven't seen you for ages. So an age is a very long time, the word age. So ages is therefore a very, very long time, multiple ages. So when you say I haven't seen you for ages, it means I haven't seen you in a very long time. You use this as a greeting. As I said, hey, long time no see, I haven't seen you in ages, how have you been? for example. Okay, next expression. The next expression is, that's terrible. That's terrible. Okay, so when someone shares bad news, something bad that happened to them, you should respond with something that shows you understand their point of view. Say, that's terrible, or that's awful, or that's too bad. So terrible means very bad. So if you want to sound like, you know, really caring about something bad that happened to another person, use this expression. You lost your job? Oh, that's terrible, I'm so sorry to hear that. Okay, on to the next expression. I'd better let you go. I'd better let you go. Okay, I'd better let you go. This is the reduced form of I had better let you go. We use this when we're talking to someone on the phone or maybe when we're having an in-person conversation in the office. To let someone go means like to release them from something. In this case, to release them from a conversation. So when you say, I better let you go, it's showing, I think you're busy. It's showing the other person you understand they're busy and they have something to do. So if you're talking to a busy person and you realize, oh my gosh, we talked for so long, we've been talking for a long time, you can say, oh, sorry, I'd better let you go, meaning I recognize you're a busy person and you need to do other things. So use this to end a conversation quickly. Of course, you can also use this to escape a conversation you are ready to be finished with. Okay, let's go to the next expression. Next is, did you catch the news today? Did you catch the news today? So use this as a greeting or as a way to start a conversation if you wanna talk about current events. So did you catch the news today or did you see the news this morning is also okay? It just shows you wanna talk about recent events with someone. So use this maybe uh, with someone that you're okay to talk about these kinds of topics with. Okay, on to the next phrase. Nice day outside, isn't it? Nice day outside, isn't it? Nice day outside just refers to the weather. So you can use any kind of weather and follow it with isn't it. You can use rainy today, isn't it? Or oh, windy today, isn't it? So that isn't it shows you're looking for confirmation from the other person. Nice day outside, isn't it? And of course you can drop outside if you really want to. Of course the weather is outside, but this is just an expression that we use. Or nice day today would also be okay. So you're just starting a conversation by talking about the weather and finding a small point you can both agree upon. Okay, on to the next expression. Next is, have you been waiting long? Have you been waiting long? Use, have you been waiting long when you are supposed to meet another person and maybe they arrive before you and you're worried that they waited a long time for you. So if you, for example, were supposed to meet at one o'clock and you arrive at 1.15, you might say to the other person, have you been waiting long? So you don't know how long that person has been waiting. Maybe they got there 15 minutes early. You're showing that you have concern for their time with this expression. Have you been waiting long? Sorry. Okay, next is, it's good to have you here. It's good to have you here. 
Use this expression when you're hosting a party, hosting an event, or maybe you have a guest in your office. Someone who's not usually around is in your circle for the day. You can say, "It's good to have you here," or "It's nice to have you here." That shows that you recognize that they are a new person, but you want them to feel welcome. It's good to have you here. You could use this at a house party, a dinner event, and so on. Okay. Next expression is, "What brings you here?" What brings you here? Okay, so this question is a much softer way of saying "Why are you here?" <laughs> so if you say "Why are you here?", it might sound a little too direct. Instead, say "What brings you here?" You could say maybe "Why did you decide to come to this event?" if you want, or you could ask "What brings you here today?" specifically. So these are all ways to say "Why did you come here?" but they sound much softer and less aggressive. Okay, on to the next expression. Do you mind me asking? Do you mind me asking? Okay, do you mind me asking is used before a topic or before a question that might be a little bit sensitive. So if you want to ask about a person's age, maybe, or if you want to ask about maybe where a person works or maybe where they're from. It could be any kind of information that you feel is a little bit sensitive. You can use "Do you mind me asking?" before you ask that. For example, you might say, "Do you mind me asking how old are you?" or "Do you mind me asking where are you from?" So it shows that you are concerned. It might be a slightly sensitive question, and it gives the other person the option to refuse. So, do you mind me asking? So you can use this in more sensitive topics. I think. Okay, next expression. Are you from around here? Are you from around here? Are you from around here? Is a first-time greeting question. So you've just met someone, you've exchanged names. You can say, "Are you from around here?" That means, "Is your hometown or the place where you grew up near where we are now?" Are you from around this area specifically? So this is maybe a more casual way of saying, "Where are you from?" It's suggesting that the other person might be from the local region. Are you from around here? I just moved. Okay. Next expression is. I need your help with this matter. I need your help with this matter. Okay, this is a rather formal expression. You would not use this with your friends or your family members. It sounds too formal. Use this at work or maybe in a study, a profession, more professional kind of polite study situation. I need your help with this matter, or just I need your help with this. I probably would not say matter in this sentence, but you might see it or hear it from time to time. So use this when you need someone's assistance with something, and you need to be polite about it. Like I need your help with this paper I'm writing. Could you please take a look at it? So I need your help with this. So use that expression when you want to politely ask someone for help. Okay, let's get to the last expression. Have fun. Have fun. So use have fun when someone else is going to do something that seems fun. So you say goodbye to your family members before they leave for an exciting trip. You could say have fun, or you see your coworkers at the end of the day. They decide to go for drinks, but you're feeling tired. But you want to wish them well. You can say have fun and say goodbye in that way. So have fun is a very positive, happy expression. Some people will use it to sound a little bit sarcastic if they want to attend some. Something, but they're not attending. But generally, we use this in a very positive way to say goodbye. I hope you have a good time. All right, that brings us to the end of the top 20 useful phrases for small talk. What did you think? You can let us know in the comments. And don't forget to click the link in the description to get your free PDF cheat sheets to learn even more useful English words and phrases. You can download them to any device or print them out. They're yours to keep, so click the link and get them for free. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye. In this video, you'll learn 20 of the most common words and phrases in English. Hi, everybody. My name is Alicia. Welcome to the 800 Core English Words and Phrases video series. This series will teach you the 800 most common words and phrases in English. But there's a twist. With each new lesson in this series, we'll include the previous lessons at the end. So after you've learned the new words and phrases, stick around and review what you learned in previous lessons. Reviewing is one of the most important parts of learning a language. 
You can also get the full list right now at EnglishClass101.com. Click the link in the description to access more example sentences, create your own flashcard deck, and finally master English. Okay, let's get started. First is hopeful. 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 Hopeful describes the feeling that you have when you have a very positive expectation of something. I'm hopeful that my next summer vacation will be very good. I'm hopeful that my next summer vacation will be very good. I am hopeful that my next summer vacation will be very good. Deep. 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 Deep refers to something that is far below the surface of something else, like with water or maybe with caves as well. This pool is too deep for me. This pool is too deep for me. This pool is too deep for me. Shallow. 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 Shallow is the opposite of deep. It refers to something that's very close to the surface of something else. Don't worry, the water is very shallow here. Don't worry, the water is very shallow here. Don't worry, the water is very shallow here. Rich. 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 Rich refers to someone that has a lot of money. We can also use this to talk about food, something that has a lot of flavor. His father is a rich man. His father is a rich man. His father is a rich man. Poor. 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 Poor is the opposite of rich when talking about wealth. It refers to someone who does not have a lot of money. We also use the word poor to refer to something that is not of good quality. The man is poor. The man is poor. The man is poor. Monitor. 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 A monitor is a screen that you use to look at information. If you have a computer at home, you probably have a monitor. This monitor is broken. This monitor is broken. This monitor is broken. Keyboard. 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 A keyboard is the device that you use to type letters, to type words in your computer. This computer doesn't have a keyboard. This computer doesn't have a keyboard. This computer doesn't have a keyboard. Headphones. 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 Headphones are the devices that you use to listen to music. You can put them on your ears or in your ears. The girl is listening to music with headphones. The girl is listening to music with headphones. The girl is listening to music with headphones. Hiccup. 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 A hiccup is something that happens in your body. It's like when air gets caught in your chest. It often happens many times in a row and can be very uncomfortable. When you have to hiccup, it's hard to talk. When you have to hiccup, it is hard to talk. When you have to hiccup, it is hard to talk. Blueberry. 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 A blueberry is just as it sounds. It's a berry that is the color blue. They can be a little sweet or a little sour. Blueberries are round. Blueberries are round. Blueberries are round. Prune. 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 A prune is a dried fruit. It's a dried plum. Prunes are dried plums. Prunes are dried plums. Prunes are dried plums. Mango. 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 
A mango is a tropical fruit. It's usually a bright orange or a yellowy orange, and it's very sweet. How much is that mango? How much is that mango? How much is that mango? Lemon. 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 A lemon is a bright yellow citrus fruit. It's used a lot in cooking, and it has a very sharp flavor. I like tea with lemon. I like tea with lemon. I like tea with lemon. Buttocks. 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 So the buttocks refers to the part of the body that we sit on. This is often abbreviated to just butt. She fell backwards, landing hard on her buttocks. She fell backwards, landing hard on her buttocks. She fell backwards, landing hard on her buttocks. Shoulder. 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 The shoulder is this part of the body. It connects our arm to our torso. He broke his shoulder while playing football. He broke his shoulder while playing football. He broke his shoulder while playing football. Muscle. 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 Muscle is the part of the body that allows us to move. Muscles are all throughout the body, and when we exercise, they become stronger. If you lift weights, you can build your muscles. If you lift weights, you can build your muscles. If you lift weights, you can build your muscles. Bone. 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 Bone is the hard part of the body, inside the body, that creates the structure of our body. I have strong bones. I have strong bones. I have strong bones. Beard. 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 A beard refers to hair grown on the face around the chin. Some men really like to grow beards. Santa Claus has a long white beard. Santa Claus has a long white beard. Santa Claus has a long white beard. Sweet potato. Sweet potato. Sweet potato. A sweet potato is as it sounds. It's a type of potato that is very sweet. You might eat these in cold weather in particular. Today I had sweet potatoes for breakfast. Today I had sweet potatoes for breakfast. Today I had sweet potatoes for breakfast. Mushroom. 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 A mushroom is a fungus that you can eat. There are many different kinds of mushrooms, and they lend interesting flavors to many dishes. I love eating mushrooms. I love eating mushrooms. I love eating mushrooms. Well done. In this lesson, you expanded your vocabulary and learned 20 new useful words. And with this lesson, you've learned the 800 most common words in English. You've completed the series. Great job. Stick around to review all the words from the series one more time at the end of this video. Click the link in the description and sign up for free at EnglishClass101.com to get access to the full list of vocabulary you need for daily life conversations. You'll also get example sentences, custom flashcard decks, and more learning resources. Thanks so much for watching this series. We'll see you again in another video. Bye! Welcome to EnglishClass101.com's English in 3 Minutes, the fastest, easiest, and most fun way to learn English. Hey everyone, I'm Alicia. This series explains some easy ways to ask and answer common questions in English. It's really useful and it only takes 3 minutes. In this lesson, you're going to learn some different ways people will ask you, where are you from? First, though, where are you from can mean many things. It can mean, what city are you from? Or, what state are you from? 
In fact, Americans ask this question to each other all the time to learn what part of America the other person comes from. Of course, though, it can also mean, what country are you from? If you want to answer this question, there are two ways to do it. You can say, I'm plus your nationality, as in, I'm Japanese, or I'm Brazilian. Or you can say, I'm from plus the country you are from, as in, I'm from Italy, or I'm from Thailand. If you're from a really famous city or place, you can say that too. For example, I'm from Beijing, or I'm from New Delhi. Many times, though, Americans won't ask, what country are you from, or even, where are you from? In many casual situations, they will say it in a simpler way, where are you from? This is just like, where are you from? but they take out the R. Where are you from? You can use this too in casual situations. Of course, in the United States, as in other parts of the world, people may be a little more indirect because they want to be polite. To do this, they might ask you if you are from the place where they meet you. For example, if you meet someone in New York, they might ask, are you from New York? Or if you are in San Diego, they might ask, are you from San Diego? Many parts of the United States are very multicultural, so asking the question this way avoids what could be an embarrassing mistake. You can answer this the same way you answer, where are you from? Just add a simple no in front. For example, you can say no plus I'm plus nationality. No, I'm French. Or no plus I'm from plus country. No, I'm from Russia. Now it's time for Alicia's advice. Since the United States is very large, people you meet may take great pride in the place or region they come from. If you ask someone about where they're from, they may respond by saying something like West Coast, or the East Coast, or California, or the South, or the Midwest. If they answer in this way, it usually means they are interested in talking more about their region and how it differs from others. In this lesson, we learned some different ways to ask, where are you from? Do you know what to ask when you don't know someone's name? Of course you do. But what do you say when you have forgotten someone's name? Find out next time in the fifth English in Three Minutes lesson. See you next time. Welcome to EnglishClass101.com's English in 3 Minutes, the fastest, easiest, and most fun way to learn English. Hey everyone, I'm Alicia. This series will teach you some easy ways to ask and answer common questions in English. It's really useful and it only takes 3 minutes. In this lesson, you're going to learn some new ways to ask someone, what's your name? including one that you can use when you have forgotten someone's name. Now, what is your name was probably one of the first questions you learned when you started studying English. I have to tell you, though, that most native speakers of English would never say this. In English, just like in other languages, it is often more polite to be a little indirect. Of course, the easiest way to avoid asking the question directly is to not ask at all. Just introduce yourself, and most people will respond by doing the same. When introducing yourself, simple is nearly always best. Just say, hi, I'm Alicia. 
To show that you want to know the other person's name, just add and you at the end. Hi, I'm Alicia. And you? Hi, I'm Alicia. And you? Just like before, take out my name, Alicia, and put your name in its place. After you say this, the other person will tell you his or her name. Okay, now let's talk about an embarrassing situation that happens to everybody. You have already met this person once before, but you have forgotten their name. The most polite thing to do in this situation is to apologize and ask again. There's a simple way to do this that's also polite. I'm sorry, what was your name again? I'm sorry, what was your name again? This sentence is very similar to, what's your name? But it has three important differences. First, we say, I'm sorry. A small apology can go a long way. After that, we say, what was your name? This is just like, what is your name? But instead of is, we use the past tense was. This is really important as it tells the other person that you remember meeting them. You haven't forgotten him or her. You have just forgotten the name. This little word makes all the difference. I'm sorry, what was your name? Finally, we add again to the end. This is another hint that tells the other person that you remember learning his or her name before but you just can't recall it right now. I'm sorry, what was your name again? This phrase is appropriate for both formal and informal situations. Now it's time for Alicia's advice. In the United States, it's normal to address people by name in conversation more than once. In both formal and informal situations, it's a way to show respect or interest in the other person and can help you make friends. It is also a great way to practice someone's name so you don't forget it. If you are talking to someone named Anne, for example, instead of just, what do you do for fun? You could say, Anne, what do you do for fun? You can also put the name at the end of the sentence. What do you do for fun, Anne? You don't want to say the person's name too often or it will sound a little strange. But if you practice someone's name like this, you won't forget it. And people love to hear their own name. In this lesson, we learned what to say when we forget someone's name. In the next lesson, you'll learn what to say when you want to get in touch with someone, whether by telephone, email, or even newer ways to communicate. What's your favorite? Let us know in the comments and join us next time for the sixth English in three minutes lesson. See you next time. Welcome to EnglishClass101.com's English in 3 Minutes, the fastest, easiest, and most fun way to learn English. Hey everyone, I'm Alicia. In this series, we're going to learn some easy ways to ask and answer common questions in English. It's really useful and it only takes 3 minutes. In this lesson, you're going to learn how to ask what someone's job is in natural English. Of course, you can just say, what is your job? This is correct English, but it sounds too direct and awkward. Native English speakers almost never say this in a social situation. Instead, they use a different question. But before we master that, we need to compare it to a very similar question. What are you doing? I'm presenting a video about English. What do you do? I'm an English teacher. Do you see the difference? These two questions, what are you doing and what do you do, sound similar but mean different things. The first one is asking what you are doing right now, this minute. You answer it using an ing verb. 
What are you doing? I'm reading. I'm watching TV. While the second is actually a shortened version of what do you do for a living? This is how we ask what is your job in natural English. Let's practice this question. What do you do? What do you do? When native speakers of English ask this question, it can come out very fast and sound more like, what do you do? In order to tell it apart from, what are you doing? Just listen for the ing sound on the end of the question. If it's not there, then you're being asked what your job is. So how would you answer this question? Just think of it as if the other person is asking you, what is your job? You could answer with, I am, plus your job. I'm a teacher. I'm a teacher. Or, I'm an engineer. If you want to learn more job names, go to EnglishClass101.com and check out the core word lists. These cover job vocabulary and more, and include a picture and audio to help you perfect your pronunciation. You can also mention the place that you work at, starting with, I work at. I work at a hospital. I work at a hospital. I work at a law firm. I work at a law firm. If you work for a big company that is well known, you can say, I work for, and then the name. I work for Microsoft. I work for Microsoft. I work for the New York Times. I work for the New York Times. Now it's time for Alicia's advice. When you ask the question, what do you do? And the other person tells you their job, it's polite to make some kind of positive comment about his or her job. For example, how interesting, or that must be exciting, or even, oh, really? Remember to sound sincere. Do you know how native English speakers ask each other what their hobbies are? Hint, we don't use the word hobbies. Find out next time in the third English in three minutes lesson. See you next time. Imagine you're on a plane. There's someone next to you. What do you say? Hi, Alicia here. Introducing yourself in English is easy. In this lesson, you're going to learn how with Gustavo and Henry, who meet on a plane. Gustavo's moving to New York. His family is going to join him later in the month. Henry is in the seat when Gustavo gets on the plane. Let's watch. Excuse me. Sorry about that. Hi, how do you do? I'm Gustavo. Nice to meet you, Gustavo. I'm Henry Eddins. I'm sorry. Can you say that again, please? A bit slowly? Henry Eddins. Henry Eddins. That's it, but please call me Hank. Hank, nice to meet you. Now with subtitles. Excuse me. Sorry about that. Hi. How do you do? I'm Gustavo. Nice to meet you, Gustavo. I'm Henry Eddins. I'm sorry. Can you say that again, please? A bit slowly? Henry Eddins. Henry Eddins. That's it. But please, call me Hank. Hank. Nice to meet you. Here are the key words from the scene. Hi. 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 But. 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 Excuse me. Excuse me. Excuse me. Excuse me. Two. Two. 
two. Two. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. How do you do? How do you do? How do you do? How do you do? Here are the key phrases from the scene. How did Henry apologize when he realized he was in Gustavo's way? Sorry about that. Sorry about that? In general, this expression, when used to respond to excuse me, shows a friendly willingness to help the other person. In this case, Henry wanted to show he was happy to move out of Gustavo's way. You can also use it to apologize for a small mistake, like bumping into someone on the street or blocking someone's way in the aisle of a supermarket. Now you try. Say Henry's line after Gustavo speaks. Excuse me. Sorry about that. Later, Gustavo also used the word sorry to apologize when he didn't understand Henry's name. Which phrase did he use? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. This is a very common phrase in English for many situations, but here, Gustavo uses it to indicate he didn't understand something. Now you try. Say the line after Henry speaks. I'm Henry Eddins. I'm sorry. Because Gustavo did not understand something, he asked Henry to repeat what he said. To do this, what polite question did he use? Can you say that again, please? Can you say that again, please? In response, English speakers will usually repeat what they have said and will use the same words. Now you try. Ask the question after Gustavo says, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Can you say that again, please? Gustavo also wanted Henry to speak more slowly. To do this, what does he ask? A bit slowly? A bit slowly. This is not a complete sentence, but has a clear meaning when used after, can you say that again, please? In response, English speakers will slow their speech down. Now you try. Say the phrase after Gustavo says, can you say that again, please? Can you say that again, please? A bit slowly? After Gustavo said Henry's name, Henry confirmed he said it correctly. How did he do that? That's it. That's it? This is like saying, that's correct. But since the situation was friendly, that's it sounded more natural. Now you try. Say the phrase after Gustavo says Henry's name correctly. Henry Eddins. That's it. Now the lesson focus. Here's how to introduce yourself. Ready? Do you remember how Gustavo introduced himself? Hi, how do you do? I'm Gustavo. When Gustavo introduced himself, he started with, hi, and then used a set phrase. How do you do? How do you do? This is a polite expression people often use with an introduction. It sounds like a question, but it has no particular meaning, and there's no expectation the other person will try to answer it. Next, he says, I'm Gustavo. The first part of this sentence is a contraction of two words, I and am. The am here functions like an equal sign in math. I'm. I'm. The next word in the sentence is a name. Gustavo. Together it's... I'm Gustavo. The structure of the pattern is... Hi, how do you do? I'm... Plus... Your name. Now you try. 
Imagine your name is John. Say, hi, how do you do? I'm John. Hi, how do you do? I'm John. Now imagine your name is Eichel. Say, hi, how do you do? I'm Eichel. Hi, how do you do? I'm Eichel. Now use your name. Okay. There are two additional things you need to know. First, there's a shortcut for giving your name. Just drop the I'm from the final sentence of the self-introduction. For example, if Gustavo just said, Hi, how do you do, Gustavo? Henry would have understood it was his name. This would be especially clear if Gustavo extended his hand for a handshake while saying this. In very casual situations, you can even drop the Hi and the, how do you do? All that is left would be your name. The second thing you need to know is you can use I'm with just the first name or your first name and the last name together. I'm Henry Eddins. Eddins is Henry's family name. Using both your first name and your last name is a little more formal. It also gives you less privacy. For example, if people know both your first and last name, they can find you on the internet more easily. So it may be more common for strangers to say just their first name than people meeting in a more friendly environment. Next, you'll learn how to tell people to call you by a nickname, just like Henry did in the scene. But please call me Hank. But please call me Hank. The first word in the sentence is, but. This word is not necessary but it makes the transition to the rest of the sentence smoother. Henry uses this to introduce a new piece of information. And this information changes something about what he said before, but makes this clear. The next word introduces a polite request. Please. Please. Next is a request to use a certain name. Call. Call. After this is the word... Me. Me. Last is a common nickname for men named Henry. Hank. Hank. Please call me Hank. The sentence structure is... Please call me. Plus... Your nickname. Now you try. Imagine your nickname is Matt. Say, please call me Matt. Please, call me Matt. Now imagine your nickname is Lulu. Say, please call me Lulu. Please, call me Lulu. Now use your own nickname. Say, please call me, and then use your nickname. Finally, when you meet someone for the first time, it's polite to say a set phrase at the end. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Usually, both people will say this or something similar to it. Now you try. Nice to meet you. Now it's time to practice your new ability. Let's practice. This is your chance to introduce yourself. Try to remember what you learned and practice by speaking aloud. It's your first day in the U.S. and you're meeting your new neighbor. Ready? Here we go. What's the first thing you say to someone you've just met? Hi, how do you do? How do you tell someone your name? I'm name. I'm Henry Eddins. How do you tell someone your nickname? Please call me your nickname. Please call me Hank. What's the last thing you say to someone you've just met?
Nice to meet you. Great job. You've just introduced yourself. You'll follow this same pattern many times, so be sure to practice it. Well done. Now, watch the scene one more time. After that, go and practice with all your American friends, or with us in the comments. Bye. Excuse me. Sorry about that. Hi, how do you do? I'm Gustavo. Nice to meet you, Gustavo. I'm Henry Eddins. I'm sorry. Can you say that again, please? A bit slowly? Henry Eddins. Henry Eddins. That's it. But please, call me Hank. Hank, nice to meet you. everybody, my name is Alicia. Today we're going to be talking about simple past tense. We're going to talk about how to make simple past tense statements in English. So let's get started. Okay, so first let's talk about when we should use the simple past tense. Simple past tense statements for today uh, are for actions that started and ended in the past. So these are things that both started or began and ended in the past. Uh, both of those must be true to use simple past tense. The second point for today is these are actions which happened at a specific point in time. So a specific point in time can be uh, yesterday, it can be uh, an hour ago, it can be last year, it can be when you were a kid. All of these are a specific point in time, but the key is that we know when the action happened. So specific point in time is point two for this grammar point. Third, uh, we can use simple past tense for repeated actions in the past. So things you did every week or every month or every year, every summer, every hour if you like. But one point about this Make sure to include a frequency indicator if you want to talk about an action that repeated in the past. Frequency indicator, uh, for example, I just mentioned a few, every week, every month, every year. So frequency, meaning how often. An indicator shows how often you did that. So you can use repeated actions with past tense to show, uh, let's see, something you did a lot in the past, for example. So to give you a visual, uh, the past is down here, now is this point here, and future is up here. When we use the simple past tense, it's an action that started and ended in the past, somewhere before now, that's one. It's at a specific point in time. So this action and this action, we know when they happened. It could be this morning, it could be uh, yesterday, for example. But we know when these actions happened. Third, we can use for repeated action. So maybe these actions repeat, uh, but we know when the repetition happened. We know when we repeated these actions. So it's okay to use simple past tense to describe those. Okay, so now we know uh, when we should use simple past tense. We know why we should use simple past tense, but how do we make simple past tense statements? So when you want to use the simple past tense to explain a, an action that happened in the past, you need to conjugate your verb. You need to change your verb. So that means when you're using a regular verb, you do verb plus ed. So verb plus ed is the basic form for simple past tense verbs. Uh, but keep in mind this is only for regular verbs. Not all verbs are regular verbs. So for example, some common ones are talk, which becomes talked, start, which becomes started, and enjoy, which becomes enjoyed. Please be careful, however, you'll notice that the past tense form of verbs has a few different pronunciations. So for example, start becomes started. It has an ID sound. It's not an ED sound, but an ID sound. You might hear a word like walked also, which has a uh, sort of T sound about it. Walk becomes walked, 
started becomes started, an ID sound. And then there's also a sound like in breathed, a very soft D sound. So there are three past tense verb sounds to listen for. An id sound, started, a soft D sound, like breathed, and then a more hard T sound, like walked. So pay attention to that when you're trying to make these past tense verb conjugations. Okay, but some verbs are irregular verbs. Irregular verbs do not have a simple rule for understanding past tense conjugation, how to change them in past tense. There's no rule for these. You simply have to practice. You have to remember them, read them, listen to them until you can remember the correct conjugation, the correct way to change these verbs into the past tense. So, for example, some common ones are eat, which becomes ate, uh, speak becomes spoke, and make becomes made. If you see a verb somewhere that, uh, that seems a little odd or you're not sure what the uh, present tense form would be, you can check a dictionary and try to remember it from there. So, uh, now we've talked about simple past tense uh, irregular and regular verbs. Let's try to use them to make some sentences. I prepared a few example sentences, so let's take a look. Okay, first sentence, he something something a towel and sunglasses to the beach. So the verb here is bring. I want to use the verb bring. Bring, however, is an irregular verb, so I can't use the ed rule for regular verbs. The correct conjugation is brought. B-R-O-U-G-H-T. He brought a towel and sunglasses to the beach. This is the correct conjugation here. So bring is an irregular verb. Okay. Let's go to the next sentence. They, something, something, to the gym every day last week. So here I'm showing you a repeated action. Here I'm using every day. This is a frequency indicator. How often did I do that action? And last week shows the specific point in time. So I'm using both of these two points in addition uh, to a simple past, the basic simple past structure here. So the verb that we want to use here is go, but go is an irregular verb, so we can't use goad, for example. Go changes to went in the past tense, so went is the correct answer for this sentence here. Okay, let's try the next one. Uh, I something something to tell my boss about my schedule. Uh, so the verb I want to use here is forget. Forget is a very useful word, I think, to remember. But again, forget is not a regular verb. Forget is an irregular verb, so we cannot use the ed form. Forget in the past tense becomes forgot. Okay. So I forgot to tell my boss about my schedule is the correct sentence here. All right. Let's go to something a little bit different. Uh, here's a negative sentence. I don't think they, something, something, a reservation at the restaurant. Okay, so here I'm using a, a phrase. I want to use the phrase make a reservation, to make a reservation. So the verb here is make. This was one of my example verbs for the irregular form. So make becomes made. I don't think they made a reservation at the restaurant is the correct verb form to use here. All right, uh, the next sentence, we something something junk food almost every day last month. So here, again, I have uh, every day, but I have almost here, so almost every day. Not every day, but close to every day. And then last month, last month is my specific point in time in this case. So. Here we have junk food. That means that the verb we want to use is probably eat. And we learned that eat uh, is an irregular verb. There's no rule for conjugating this. We just know that eat becomes ate. We ate junk food almost every day last month. Great. OK. So next sentence uh, has two spaces for verbs, actually. OK. So the next sentence that I've prepared, I included because a lot of my students ask about how to report information. When you want to report information, uh, share something that you heard from a friend, a past tense action, you need to conjugate the reporting verb. For example, say becomes said, or hear becomes heard. You need to conjugate this verb, 
and you need to conjugate the information that you heard. So there are two past tense conjugations that should happen when you report information. Let's take a look. So here we have she something something, she something something, a great time at the party. So here, she blah blah blah, a great time at the party. Uh, so we use the expression to have a great time, to have a great time. Again, have is an irregular verb, so we conjugate it to had. She had a great time at the party. Okay. But then, to report your speech, so someone uh, gave you information, past tense, give becomes gave you information, uh, so the verb for giving information, a neutral way to pass information is say. So uh, to conjugate say into the past tense, it's an irregular verb, so we use said. Say becomes said. So she said she had a great time at the party. Okay. Please be careful of your pronunciation with the word said. A lot of people I've heard use said. Said is not correct, so please use said. It sounds like S-E-D, the pronunciation, uh, but it's said. S-A-I-D is the spelling. Say becomes said. She said she had a great time at the party. Okay, so last one. Okay, so the last example sentence for today includes spaces for a few different verbs. I included this because I wanted to show you that you can use a lot of different information in one sentence just by connecting your past tense verbs together. So let's take a look. Okay, yesterday I something something late, something something shopping, and something something to my mother. Okay, so the verbs I want to use for this sentence are sleep, go, and speak. Sleep, go, and speak. These are all uh, irregular verbs. There are no regular verbs in this sentence. So, sleep in past tense becomes slept. Go in past tense becomes went. And speak in past tense becomes spoke. So here in one sentence, I have, I have explained three things about my day yesterday. Uh, yesterday, I slept late, I went shopping, and I spoke to my mother. So you can explain a lot of things with past tense and a few connecting words. In this case, I've just used and to connect the last two things in this sentence. So please keep this in mind when you're sharing information about your past events. So today we talked about the simple past tense and we talked about how to conjugate both regular and irregular verbs. It might seem a little bit difficult to understand which verbs are regular and which verbs are irregular, but with some practice it will become easier. So I hope that you enjoyed this video. If you have any questions or comments, please be sure to leave us a comment and let us know. Also, please be sure to like this video and subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. Thanks very much for watching. Check us out for more at EnglishClass101.com and we'll see you again soon. Bye! Welcome to EnglishClass101.com's English in 3 Minutes, the fastest, easiest, and most fun way to learn English. Hey everyone, Alicia here. In this series, we're going to learn some easy ways to ask and answer common questions in English. It's really useful and it only takes 3 minutes. In this lesson, you're going to learn how to ask what someone's hobbies are without using the word hobbies. You've probably seen the question, do you have any hobbies? Or, what are your hobbies? in an English textbook before. However, native English speakers almost never use the word hobbies when asking about them. A much more natural way to ask the same question is, what do you do for fun? Let's practice this question. What do you do for fun? What do you do for fun? You can also ask, what do you do in your free time? What do you do in your free time? So how would you answer this question? Let's look at how native speakers would do it. 
The easiest way is to say, I like to, or just, I like, followed by what you like to do. For example, if you like watching movies, you could say, I like to watch movies, or I like watching movies. I like to watch movies, or I like watching movies. And if you like golf, you could say, I like to play golf, or I like playing golf. I like to play golf, or I like playing golf. You can emphasize how much you like your hobby by adding a word like really in front of like. For example, I really like watching movies. On the other hand, if you want to play down how much you like something, you can say kind of. For example, I kind of like playing tennis. Now it's time for Alicia's advice. If you don't have any special hobbies or don't want to be specific, a good way to reply is, I like hanging out with my friends and stuff like that. I like hanging out with my friends and stuff like that. Just use I like and add hanging out with my friends and then add and stuff like that. How do you answer the question, where are you from? It doesn't even have a verb. We'll cover this and more in the next English in 3 Minutes lesson. See you next time. Hi everybody, my name is Alicia and today I'm going to give a short explanation of some basic uses of the present perfect tense. So let's begin. Okay, the present perfect tense, uh, what I'm going to talk about today, uh, there are two basic points to think about when using the present perfect tense. We use the present perfect tense first, number one, to express a life experience. So this can be a life experience you have had or a life experience you have never had. So we use this grammar point to talk about life experience but with one key nuance. This life experience, it happened at a non-specific or an unimportant point in time. So the point in time when this life experience happened is not important in this sentence. In the sentence where you use the present perfect tense, the point in time where you had the experience is not the focus of your statement. The focus of your statement is just the life experience. So to give a visualization of this, on a timeline with past, present, and future, the present perfect tense is used to express a life experience at a non-specific point in time, meaning we use it for some experience you had at some point before the present, some point before the current conversation. So we use the present perfect tense to talk about a life experience that happened at a non-specific point in the past. So when specifically this experience happened is not important. This grammar point allows us to simply say that we have or have not had an experience. So this is the first grammar point about the present perfect tense, the simple use of the present perfect tense. The next uh, point I want to talk about, though, uh, is this second point, number two here. We use the present perfect tense to talk about an action that started in the past and continues to the present. The effect of an action that started in the past continues to the present. So this is a grammar point that's slightly different from number one that I talked about. So the image here is an action that started at some point in the past. It began at some point in the past and it continues to the present or the effects of that action continue to the present. So this is something we can use to talk about where we live, our studies, 
our work experience, for example. I'll show you in a couple of example sentences a little bit later. Um, but this is the second use, the second grammar point I want to talk a little bit about today. So it's important to note that when we use this second point, when we use the second use of this grammar point, we often use the words for and since to express that action that began in the past and continued to the present. It gives the listener some extra information about the duration, about how long that action has uh, continued. So uh, the difference between for and since, many people make a mistake with this. So use of for and since is important with grammar point number two here especially because it gives the listener some information about how long the action uh, has been happening. So uh, in an example sentence, you could say, I have lived in Paris for three years, or you could say, I have lived in Paris since 2014. So you can hear for is used for a period of time. I have lived in Paris for three years. Three years is a period of time. Your period of time can be years, months, days, minutes, hours, and so on. Uh, any period of time can be used with the word for. I have been teaching this lesson for a few minutes. I have been standing up for about an hour, for example. Uh, you can use a different time duration for different expressions. You can use this actually a lot in your everyday life. But on the other hand, let's talk about since. So since is used for a point in time. When we want to talk about a point in time where an action began, where an action started, we can use since. So for example, in my sentence, I said I have lived in Paris since 2014. So that since shows the exact year when I started living in Paris. I have lived in Paris since 2014 and the action continues to the present. So we can use for and since to show when an action began, and we also know that that action is going to be continuing. That action will continue to the present. Um, so these are kind of the two grammar points I'd like to talk about. Then lastly, I want to talk about how to make this grammar point, how to make the present perfect tense. So I have three categories here. There's positive statements, negative statements, and question statements. These are just the basic forms of these three uh, types of sentences. Um, so let's talk about a few different sentence patterns that we can make. I have positive statements, negative statements, and question statements. These are just a few examples of the type of sentences and questions that you can make with this grammar point. So first, to make a positive statement, we'll use have or has depending on your subject. If your subject is I, for example, we'll say I have, you have, and we have. For uh, he and she, he has, she has, and so on. Uh, so depending on your subject, we will use have or has. Next, we need to include the past participle form of the verb. So for example, I have lived in Paris. Lived is the past participle form of the verb live. I have been to Paris. So uh, we can use these past participle forms of verbs, been in this case, to talk about the present perfect tense, to use the present perfect tense. Please try to remember your past participle forms of verbs, um, but I find that uh, one of the best ways to get used to using the correct form of the verb here is just practicing in sentences. It's a little bit difficult to memorize all the verbs just from a list, so try practicing them in sentences to remember. Let's talk then about how to make a negative statement. So a life experience you have not had. This is the sentence pattern that you can use to describe that. So again, depending on your subject, use have or has, I have, uh, he has, and so on. Next, we'll include never. So I have never, he has never, they have never, you have never, and so on. So this never shows no experience. This is our negative expression. Then finally, uh, we'll include the past participle form of the verb. So I have never eaten horse. He has never visited Italy, and so on. These make negative statements with never. 
Okay, and finally, a couple of different question patterns that we can use. There are a lot of different questions, yes and no questions, information questions. Let's take a look at a simple one, a simple yes-no pattern. So again, we begin with our has and have, depending on the subject here. So have you been, for example, with the past participle verb has she seen and so on. So again, we need to use this past participle form of the verb when making our questions. You might have heard people use ever. I have here at the bottom this ever uh, in this sentence style. Have you ever been to France? Have you ever eaten something? This ever uh, the, the nuance of this ever is in your whole life experience. So ever kind of amplifies, ever emphasizes the importance of your life experience. In your entire life, have you had the experience of something? This ever emphasizes your entire life's experience. If you say, for example, have you seen that movie? It sounds like maybe it's a recent movie. But if you say, have you ever seen such and such movie? It sounds like maybe the movie is a little bit older. So, especially in cases where you'd like to emphasize something that's not so recent, you might consider using ever in your questions. Have you ever been to a different country? Have you ever studied something else? So, using ever shows that maybe you're thinking something about something a little bit further back, a little bit more in the past in someone's life. Okay, so now that we know this, Let's take a look at a few example sentences that I've prepared. Uh, so first, uh, I have they something something in Germany. So here, I want to use the verb live, live. So the past participle form of the verb live is lived. And my subject here is they. So I need to use they have lived in Germany. This is a very, very simple sentence. They have lived in Germany. I'm using this simple uh, structure, this simple grammar point number one, which we talked about. So this is just a life experience. When did they live in Germany? We don't know, but it's just the experience that we want to focus on in this sentence. I could change the sentence to say, they have lived in Germany since uh, 1999. In that case, it means they live in Germany now also. However, if they do not live in Germany, they only want to express their life experience of living in Germany, they could say, they have lived in Germany. They have lived in Germany only, that sentence. Mm. So please be careful. They have lived in Germany since 1999 shows they still live in Germany. Saying they have lived in Germany shows uh, only a life experience. If you'd like to give more information about where they live now, do it in the next sentence. They have lived in Germany, uh, but they travel around a lot, and now they're living in Paris, for example. So using the present progressive tense to give some more information in the next sentence. Okay, so here we see grammar point number one is being used in this first sentence. Let's take a look here at a negative sentence. I something something, never something something to Italy here. We have the subject I here. We know that it's a negative sentence because it's never. So we need to use I have never. And then if I want to use the verb be, be. If I want to use the verb be, the past participle form of the verb be is been. I have never been to Italy is the correct sentence here. So I'm expressing no experience in my life. I have never been to Italy, meaning, as we talked about with grammar point number one, in my whole life, I have not had an experience. So there's no time point being used here. I have never had the experience of going to Italy. Okay. Now, let's talk about the next example sentence. She, something, 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 the test three times. So here I want to use the verb take, so to take a test. Take is going to be the verb for this sentence. So here my subject is she, she, and I know this is a positive sentence, a positive statement. So I'm going to use has, she, has, 
And take, the past participle form of the verb take, is taken. She has taken the test three times. So this sentence shows, in her life experience, at three times, three points in her life, she has taken the test. So we don't know when she took the test, but we know she has taken the test three times at some point in the past. This is what this sentence teaches us. We don't know when, just that she has taken the test three times. Okay. Next, let's look at this sentence. Maybe a very useful sentence for some people who are uh, watching this video on this channel. Uh, so this is I something something English for two years. Okay, so there's a big hint word here. I have the word for included in this sentence. Remember, we use for to talk about a time period, a time period. So that connects to grammar point two, which we talked about over here. So remember, with grammar point number two uh, for present perfect tense, we're showing an action that started in the past and continues to the present. Okay, so the verb I want to use here is study, study. So my subject is I, so I need to use have in this case. And the past participle form of study is studied. So, I have studied English for two years. This shows us a length of time, a period of time, a duration for your studies. It shows your studies are continuing. You are still studying English. Two years ago, you started and you have continued since that time. You have continued studying for two years. So, this sentence shows us that you have studied English and how long you have studied English. Lots of information here. Okay, let's talk about the next sentence, a question sentence now. Okay, so here my subject, I have he, he is here. So I know that because the subject of the sentence is he, I need to begin my question with has. Has he something something? So here I want to use the verb take. Take out the trash is sort of a set phrase. So. The past participle form of take is taken. Has he taken out the trash? Meaning, uh, perhaps today, at some point, has he taken out the trash? So maybe we don't know when, and when he took out the trash is not important. Just has he finished the task at some point today? So uh, we use the present perfect tense for that. So we can use the simple past sentence, did he take out the trash? But the reason that it sounds a little bit more natural to say, has he taken out the trash, is because of this point we talked about here, the effects of that action. So if he did or did not take out the trash, it could affect the people around him or the environment around him. So has he taken out the trash? If the answer is no, it might mean there's some negative effect in the environment. If the answer is yes, perhaps it means the people in the environment will be happy. There will be a happy effect of that. So this is the consideration. It's a very, very small point. If you ask, did he take out the trash, it's okay to use. But keep in mind, though, you may hear people say, has he taken out the trash as well? Uh, and this is the reason why. The effect of taking out the trash is what's kind of the nuance of this expression. Uh, great. So let's talk about the next example sentence. Which country something something you something something to? So in casual, kind of more uh, everyday friendly spoken English, it's okay to end your sentence with a preposition, in this case, to. So here I have an information question. Which countries, uh, I need to use have or has here, plus you. So that tells me I should use have. Which countries have you? And I want to use, again, the verb be here. So I know it should be been. Which countries have you been to? So again, in your life experience, which countries have you been to? When is not important, just in your life, where, where, which countries? Okay, let's look at the next one. You'll see I have a little apostrophe. Maybe you can see it on the screen there. There's a little apostrophe here, which is a pronunciation hint. 
Uh, so this is a yes or no question. You, something, something, never, something, something, a motorcycle? So motorcycle, the verb I want to use with motorcycle is ride, ride. The past uh, participle form is ridden. You've never ridden a motorcycle is the complete sentence here. So I mentioned this pronunciation hint. Uh, you have becomes you've in the contracted form, you've. So try not to use you have, he has, she has. Try to use that apostrophe V-E or apostrophe S sound when you're speaking. You've never, he's never, she's never. Sounds a lot more natural and a lot more fluid, fluent as well than he has or she has or you have. So please try to use the contracted form here. So this sentence, you've never ridden a motorcycle, meaning in your life experience, you have never ridden a motorcycle. So this is a yes or no question. Mm, no, I've never ridden a motorcycle could be the answer. Or yes, I have actually ridden a motorcycle. So this is a simple yes or no question, but we use the negative form here. You've never? It sounds surprised. This sounds kind of shocked. Okay. Uh, let's look at our next example sentence. We something something, never something something. Uh, the verb I want to use for this sentence is work, work. Okay, so the past participle form of work is worked here, okay. And uh, we is the subject of the sentence, so we're going to use we have never worked internationally. In our life experience, we do not have the experience of working internationally. Okay, finally, they something something in Paris since 2015. So just as we practiced with this example sentence with four, here we see since. So this shows us that maybe a specific point in time, in this case 2015, is going to give us some extra information about this situation. So um, let's use the verb live again. We know that the past participle form of live is lived. And we'll use have because our subject is they. So they have lived in Paris since 2015. So this sentence shows us that in 2015, they moved to Paris and they have lived in Paris. They have continued living in Paris since that time. This sentence shows us that with since. Okay. So those are a few example sentences and a short in introduction to how to use the present perfect tense and also a little bit of information on using for and since. So I hope that this lesson was useful for you. If you have any questions or comments or want to try making a few example sentences, feel free to do so in the comment section of this video. Also, please make sure to like this video and subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. Also, check us out at EnglishClass101.com for more good stuff. Thanks very much for watching this lesson and I will see you again soon. Bye. In this video, you'll learn 20 of the most common words and phrases in English. Hi everybody, my name is Alicia. Welcome to the 800 Core English Words and Phrases video series. This series will teach you the 800 most common words and phrases in English. But there's a twist. With each new lesson in this series, we'll include the previous lessons at the end. So after you've learned the new words and phrases, stick around and review what you learned in previous lessons. Reviewing is one of the most important parts of learning a language. You can also get the full list right now at EnglishClass101.com. Click the link in the description to access more example sentences, create your own flashcard deck, and finally master English. Okay, let's get started. First is frying pan. Frying pan. Frying pan. A frying pan is a very common item to have in a kitchen. It's usually quite large and it has a handle on it. We use it to make eggs, pancakes, many different things. This frying pan is very cheap. This frying pan is very cheap. This frying pan is very cheap. Cutting board. Cutting board. Cutting board. A cutting board is, as it sounds, it's a board that can be wood or plastic or maybe another material that we use to cut on. This is to keep our counters clean and safe. The cook is cutting a hard-boiled egg on the cutting board. 
The cook is cutting a hard-boiled egg on the cutting board. The cook is cutting a hard-boiled egg on the cutting board. Sink. 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 A sink is a place where you wash your hands, or in the kitchen, a place where you wash your dishes. The sink is almost full. The sink is almost full. The sink is almost full. Bowl. 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 A bowl is something that we use to eat soup or stew or perhaps ice cream, anything that is kind of liquid-like. The bowl is empty. The bowl is empty. The bowl is empty. Exit. 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 The exit is the opposite of the entrance. An exit is a way out of somewhere. Where is the exit? Where is the exit? Where is the exit? Map. 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 A map can be a physical item or a digital item. It's a guide to the area around us, or it can be a guide to a larger region, like a state, a city, or even the world. Check the map to find your way to your destination. Check the map to find your way to your destination. Check the map to find your way to your destination. Suitcase. Suitcase. Suit case. A suitcase is something that we use to keep our belongings in when we travel. A suitcase can be very small or it can be very large. Do not leave valuables in your suitcase. Do not leave valuables in your suitcase. Do not leave valuables in your suitcase. Tourist. 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 A tourist is someone who visits a city or a country just to see the sights. They don't live there, they're just there temporarily for a short time to enjoy famous places. The tourist is taking pictures of the animals. The tourist is taking pictures of the animals. The tourist is taking pictures of the animals. Politics. 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 Politics refers to the government of a country or to the government of a world. It's a popular discussion topic. People like to talk about policies, about people, and about ideas relating to world governments. The politician is talking politics. The politician is talking politics. The politician is talking politics. Biology. 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 Biology is a subject of study. It's a subject in science. Biology refers to living things, to organisms, plants, animals, and creatures. Biology is the study of living organisms. Biology is the study of living organisms. Biology is the study of living organisms. Chemistry. 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 Chemistry is another subject of study, also a science. Chemistry looks at very, very small scale reactions between chemicals, gases, many different kinds of things. The laboratory is a place to learn about chemistry. The laboratory is a place to learn about chemistry. The laboratory is a place to learn about chemistry. Physics. 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 Physics is another topic in the science category. Physics looks at how we understand the world in terms of things like time and space and gravity. I know the basics of physics. I know the basics of physics. I know the basics of physics. Economics. 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 
Economics is the study of the economy. So this refers to the money that comes and goes and moves around inside a country or around the world as well. Economics is a good background for many fields. Economics is a good background for many fields. Economics is a good background for many fields. Put. 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 Put is a verb. We can understand it as meaning to place. So it sounds a little bit less formal than place. Please try to put this box on the top shelf. Please try to put this box on the top shelf. Please try to put this box on the top shelf. Remember. 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 Remember is a verb. It means to recall information, to be able to think of something that you saw or heard or learned about in the past. I'll try to remember. I will try to remember. I will try to remember. Hold. 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 Hold is a verb which refers to keeping something usually in your hand. Hold on to the handrail. Hold on to the handrail. Hold on to the handrail. Shopping cart. Shopping cart. Shopping cart. A shopping cart is something we use in the supermarket. They're generally kind of large. We can push them around the store and we put our items inside. The shopping cart is empty. The shopping cart is empty. The shopping cart is empty. Plastic bag. Plastic bag. Plastic bag. A plastic bag is the bag that we get from many stores like supermarkets or convenience stores or maybe other retail stores. We get a plastic bag after we purchase items. The man is carrying a plastic bag full of groceries. The man is carrying a plastic bag full of groceries. The man is carrying a plastic bag full of groceries. Comedy. 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 Comedy is an art form. It's the art of making people laugh. Comedy is also a movie genre. They're watching a comedy and laughing. They're watching a comedy and laughing. They're watching a comedy and laughing. Novel. 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 A novel is a type of book. It's a long story. So there are many different kinds of books. Books that are novels refer to these long stories, often with complex plots and interesting characters. I like suspense novels. I like suspense novels. I like suspense novels. Well done. In this lesson, you expanded your vocabulary and learned 20 new useful words. Click the link in the description and sign up for free at EnglishClass101.com to get access to the full list of vocabulary you'll need for daily life conversations. You'll also get example sentences, custom flashcard decks, and more learning resources. See you next time. Bye. Hi, everybody. My name is Alicia. In this lesson, I'm going to talk about could have, should have, and would have what they mean, how to use them in the negative, and the differences between them. So let's get started. First, I want to begin with could have. Let's look at the positive and the negative meanings of could have. First, positive. We use could have, positive, for something that was possible in the past. So to give kind of an image of this, if our conversation is happening now, when we use could have, we're talking about something that had possibility in the past, something we were able to do, for example. An example sentence, ah, if I had known you were throwing a surprise party, I could have helped. I could have helped. So here, could have shows us that this action, helping, was possible in the past. 
In this case, the speaker did not know some information, uh, and as a result, this action did not happen, but it was possible at a point in the past. The speaker could have helped. Helping was a possibility in the past. So we use could have to express that possibility. The negative form, however, expresses the opposite. So in the negative, could not have expresses something that was impossible, impossible, so not possible in the past. So here, if we want to give an image, it's something that was not possible, something we were not able to do. Let's look at an example of this. No, that couldn't have been Sarah in the cafe just now. She's at the office. So here, I'm using couldn't have, could not have, contracted, reduced, becomes couldn't. So that couldn't have been Sarah in the cafe just now. In other words, it's impossible that just now we saw Sarah in the cafe. Why? She's at the office. So in this case, maybe Sarah is the speaker's colleague, coworker. So we know Sarah is at the office. So we saw someone maybe who looks like Sarah at the cafe just now, but it's not possible it was Sarah because Sarah's at the office. So we can say that couldn't have been. So it's impossible that that was Sarah. So couldn't have been sounds much more natural than it's impossible that that was Sarah. So we use couldn't have been or could not have been. So positive form, something that was possible in the past. So be careful in maybe contrast, a key difference here is this is only about possibility. We're not talking about like a plan to do something or regret necessarily. We're only talking about possibility when we use could or could not here. So with this, let's move along to the next part. The next part, I want to focus on should have. So let's look at the positive form. Should have in the positive expresses regret for something we did not do in the past. So an image of this here, if our conversation is happening now, we want to talk about something we did not do in the past and that now maybe we think, oh, it's a good idea. Like, I should have done this thing. I did not do this thing in the past. That's why I marked it with an X here. So I did not do this thing, but I feel bad now. I feel regret. Like I should have done that thing in the past. So an example sentence of this, I should have studied more when I was in school. Here is the should have. I should have, and this action, studied more. So, in other words, the speaker did not study enough in the past. The speaker feels he or she did not study enough in the past, regrets that, and wants to express the change. Like, I wish I had done this thing. I should have studied more when I was in school. So here we have more. This is a common pattern with should have or should not have. When we use more, it means I should have studied more than I did when I was in school. So here, the speaker is regret expressing regret, sadness about something they did not do. Therefore, when we use the negative form, the speaker, again, expresses regret, yes, but they're expressing regret for something that happened in the past, something they did in the past. So I've marked it here with a check. This action did happen, and we feel regret about that action. We feel bad about something we did in the past. An example, I shouldn't have spent so much time playing video games when I was a kid. So here I've used shouldn't have. So should not have is how we make the negative form. I've reduced it shouldn't have, shouldn't have in rapid speech, shouldn't have. I shouldn't have spent so much time playing video games. So, what's the action here? The speaker played video games when he or she was a child. 
The speaker now regrets that. The speaker says, I shouldn't have spent so much time. I should have spent less time playing video games. So I could use positive, should have. I should have spent less time playing video games when I was a kid. Here, I shouldn't have spent so much time. So here, a key point with should have is that we're expressing regret. Remember, with could have, we're talking just about possibility. With should have, we're expressing a regret for something that did or did not happen in the past. So, with this in mind, let's go on to the last point for this lesson. The last point, uh, the last point rather, is would have, would have. So, uh, when we say would have, we often say would have, would have. Uh, I mentioned it here with should have, we say should have or shouldn't have. Same thing with could have, like could have or couldn't have is the correct pronunciation in fast speech. So when we talk about would have or when we look at would have and we look at the positive form, um, we use it to express a plan for something that did not happen. So we're talking about something in the past. So from a point in the past, something in the future at that time, we had a plan for that thing, or we thought something was going to happen. But in the positive form, it did not happen. This is kind of tricky. Let's look at an example situation. Here, I would have arrived on time today, but there was terrible traffic, so I did not arrive on time. So first, here's my action. I would have arrived on time. So I had a plan, or I had a desire, um, I was thinking I was going to arrive on time. So th at this point in time, I would have arrived on time today. Maybe we're thinking when I left the house, maybe this is where the action starts. My plan was to arrive on time. So again, this is all happening in the past. My conversation is here. I was planning to arrive on time, but there was terrible traffic. Terrible traffic means lots and lots of cars. It was difficult to drive or difficult to get to work. So I did not arrive on time. I would have arrived on time, but I didn't because of terrible traffic. So this shows us, this would have shows us all of this information, everything here happened in the past on like a timeline. So I thought I was going to arrive on time, something happened and I didn't. So we can use would have to show like our thinking in this point, would have in the past, about a future action that is also in the past. So a couple of past points there at the same time. Okay, so let's compare this then to the negative form. The negative form then expresses the opposite. So we have a lack of plan or a lack of a desire. So lack of something means no plan or no desire. So lack of plan for something that happened in the past. It did happen, yes. So we commonly use both of these to talk about other people's choices, like when we're giving advice. This example sentence is a very common way that we use would not have or wouldn't have. Let's look. If I were you, I wouldn't have quit my job before I found a new position. So here is my would not have. I've reduced it to wouldn't have. I would not have quit my job before I found a new position. So that means if I were you, this is how we're beginning this. This is a very common way that this would have or would not have is used. So if I were you, I'm not you, but if I were, at this point in time in the past, my decision would not have been to quit my job. However, your decision was to quit your job. This did happen. You quit your job. In my case, I would not have done that. So here, in opposite to the positive form, I'm talking about a point in the past, like if I were you, just in general, and I'm talking about a future decision I might make. In this case, the person listening did choose to quit his or her job. I'm saying I would not have quit my job. That would not have been my decision for the future. So again, there's kind of this idea of two points in the past, like a kind of a general, I guess, 
a starting point in the past, if I were you in this case, and some decision, some plan, some like desire or lack of desire in this case in the negative form. So we use these, like I said, to talk about like other people's choices when we're giving advice. Like, oh, if I were you, I would have done this in the past. So we use would have to talk about uh, past decisions and maybe to talk about things um, like if you, if you were the speaker, like things you might change, what would you do differently? So we use this to talk about these sorts of past, um, past decisions and give advice and talk about um, how we might make different decisions in the future. So this kind of expresses a desire or lack of desire. This one should have expresses regret in the past, could have expresses possibility. So this is just a quick introduction to the differences between these three expressions and their negative forms. I didn't write the not here, so would not have. Uh, but if you have any other questions about this, please let us know in the comments. Um, they are very similar, I know. Uh, they sound very similar and it can be hard to understand how to use them, but try to keep these three kind of themes in mind possibility and regret and then kind of desire or advice here. So I hope that this helps you understand the differences between these three. If you have questions or comments or if you want to practice making an example sentence, please feel free to do so in the comment section of this video. Of course, if you like the video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up, subscribe to our channel and check us out at EnglishClass101.com for some other things that can help you with your English studies. Thanks very much for watching this lesson and I will see you again soon. Bye bye. Welcome to EnglishClass101.com's English in 3 Minutes, the fastest, easiest, and most fun way to learn English. Hi, how's it going? I'm Alicia. Nice to meet you. In this series, we're going to learn some easy ways to ask and answer common questions in English. It's really useful, and it only takes 3 minutes. In this lesson, you're going to learn new, more common ways to ask and answer the question, how are you, in English. You've probably learned, how are you, and I'm fine, in textbooks before. But in the United States, people will usually ask this question and answer it in a different way. First, let's review. If someone says, how are you, you can say, I'm fine, I'm fine. Here are some other ways to answer. Pretty good. This means about the same thing as, I'm fine. Pretty good. We also have, not bad. You can use this if you are feeling just okay or so-so. Not bad. Let's look at our question again. How are you? This is the most well-known way of asking how someone is. You could use it when you want to be polite. But now, let's look at some different ways to ask how someone is. These ways are more casual and much more common. First, hey, how's it going? Hey, how's it going? You can answer this in many ways. If you're feeling good, you can say good. Good. Pretty good. Pretty good. Not bad, not bad. Once more, good, pretty good, not bad. Here's a tip. Even though these answers mean the same thing as I'm fine, you can't answer how's it going with I'm fine. It will sound a bit strange. If you're not feeling good, you can say not so good, not so good. Not great, not great, or not so well, not so well. Be careful. If you say one of these, the other person will usually ask, why, what's wrong, to be polite. Then you will have to explain. 
Another casual but very common version of how are you is what's up? What's up? To reply, use a cheerful voice as you say, not much, not much, or nothing much, nothing much. This means you're free and able to chat. Since what's up is just another way of saying hello, you can also reply with hey or hi. Now it's time for Alicia's advice. A lot of the time, when we ask questions that mean, how are you, in English, we're not actually asking about the other person's health, we're only asking to be polite. You should think of these questions as another way of saying, hello, a way for the conversation to get started, instead of actual, literal questions. In fact, when someone asks you, what's up, you don't even have to answer. Just say, what's up? in reply. Do you know the difference between what do you do and what are you doing? It's a little tricky, but we'll explain it simply in the next English in three minutes lesson. See you next time. Hi everyone, I'm Gabriella. How are your English listening skills? In this video, you'll have a chance to test them out with a quiz. First, you'll see an image and hear a question. Next comes a short dialogue. Listen carefully and see if you can answer correctly. We'll show you the answer at the end. Are you ready? A woman is asking a store clerk something at a bookstore. Which book does the woman want to see? Excuse me, I'd like to take a look at a book on that shelf. Which book would you like? The one about cars. One moment, please. This one? Yep, yeah, that's right. Here you go. Which book does the woman want to see? A woman is asking a store clerk something at a bookstore. Which book does the woman want to see? Excuse me, I'd like to take a look at a book on that shelf. Which book would you like? The one about cars. One moment, please. This one? Yep, yeah, that's right. Here you go. Did you get it right? I hope you learned something from this quiz. Let us know if you have any questions. See you next time. Everybody, welcome back to Ask Alicia, the weekly series where you ask me questions and I answer them. Maybe. Okay, let's get to your first question this week. First question this week comes from Sadaf. Hi, Sadaf. Sadaf says, Hi, Alicia. My question is, when do we use actually and when do we use really? I'm always confused about whether to use really or actually in a sentence. Love from Pakistan. Cool. Thanks for the question. Sure. Yeah, let's talk about really and actually. Let's start with the word really. We use really to emphasize something. We tend to use it a lot, for example, in front of adjectives. When we want to show that something is especially or extra, that adjective. For example, this is really beautiful or that dinner was really delicious. You can think of this use as similar to very, right? So when we want to emphasize something, we say that it is really something. In contrast, actually is used to talk about things that are truly something else. So I can understand why really and actually might seem like they have similar uses, but we use actually when we want to clarify something, when we want to express that something is true or something was real. So we use this when maybe someone has made a comment that is not true or is not correct, and we want to correct their comment. So for example, if someone says to you, hey, didn't you pass your English exam last week? That was last week, right? You might say, actually, my exam is next week. So that actually means truly or really, or it's like a kind of correction to the thing the other person said. So we use actually when we need to correct or clarify something. We use really when we need to emphasize something. Here's another example with actually. Let's look at another example situation. Hey, I haven't received that file yet. Did you send it to me? 
oh, actually, I forgot. I'm so sorry about that. So in that example situation, it might be someone clarifying the situation for another person. So they use actually to express some kind of true or real information. So I hope that this helps you understand the differences between really and actually. Emphasis and kind of clarification or correction of information. Thanks very much for the question. Okay, let's get to your next question. Next question comes from Nabil. Hi, Nabil. Nabil says, what is the difference between or and nor. Thank you. Yeah, good question. They seem really similar, right? Or and nor. There's just one letter different. So we use or and nor in positive and negative expressions. For example, when you're choosing between two things, someone might offer you a choice. They might say, would you like the red shirt or the blue shirt, for example. So we're using or to show an offer in this case, or we're using it in a question pattern. We use nor in negative sentence patterns. For example, you might respond to that as, mm, I would like neither the red shirt nor the blue shirt. So you're showing that both of the options are not what you want. They're not what you're looking for. We use nor to express that. This tends to sound a little bit more formal. We don't use these kinds of patterns so much in everyday speech now, but you might hear them from time to time. So the key here, though, is that you're using it in a negative sentence. In this example, I said I would like neither the red shirt nor the blue shirt. So using or in this example sentence would be incorrect. I would like neither the red shirt or the blue shirt would be totally incorrect. We have to match the negative, neither, with nor in this sentence pattern. So if you want to express that two choices or multiple choices are all not acceptable for you and you want to use this kind of pattern, you can totally do that. But just remember you can't interchange or and nor. So in sum, or is used to present different options like colors or maybe sizes, whatever it is, and nor is used to respond to those in a negative sentence pattern. So I hope that this helps you understand the differences between or and nor. Thanks very much for the question. Hi everybody, my name is Alicia. Welcome back to Top Words. Today we're going to talk about 10 job interview questions and a few responses to those job interview questions. So let's go. Tell me a little about yourself. Statement number one is tell me a little about yourself or tell me a little bit about yourself. This is a very common interview introduction question or the first question in an interview. Tell me about yourself is just an open question. Please share or basically introduce yourself. This usually um, means you should share what you studied in college, your work experience, any like personal projects you've tried to do or have successfully done, other experience you think is relevant. So this is an invitation for you to give like a general introduction about yourself in an example sentence. Well, I got my bachelor's degree in biochemistry. How did you hear about the position? How did you hear about the position? How did you hear about the position? This question means, how did you learn about this job that you are interviewing for? How did you find this job opening? So how did you hear about the position? Uh, this is where you can explain maybe uh, where you found the information about the job. So you found it on the internet, in the newspaper, you heard from a friend, you were contacted by a recruiter. So there are a few different ways that you can share with your interviewer how you found the position, how you heard about the job. In a sentence, I found an advertisement about the job on the internet. Why are you interested in this position? Next is, why are you interested in the position? Why are you interested in the position? This is your chance to explain why you want this job. Why are you interested in this position? So usually you should not say, for the money or because this is a really, I don't know, there are a lot of attractive people at this company, I don't know. You should say something in response to this question about your career goals or maybe something specific about the company that you like or something very specific about the job that uh, is available there and how you feel your skills are a match for that job. So um, explain why you're interested in that position, the reason you decided to apply for that job. In a sentence, I think I'm a good fit for the company and its goals. Why should we hire you? 
The next interview question is why should we hire you? Why should we hire you? So this is your opportunity to explain why you feel you are the best candidate for the job. So if you have any special qualifications, you have certifications, you have specific experience, you have a specific goal in mind, this is the kind of question you can share that information in response to. Why should we hire you? Because I can speak six different languages and I know how to create a website in 10 minutes. I don't know. <laughs> so uh, if you have some kind of special qualifications, you can share those qualifications in response to this question. In another example sentence, I'm a goal-oriented person who likes to work at a fast pace. What do you consider your strengths and weaknesses? The next question is a common question. What do you consider your strengths and weaknesses? What do you consider your strengths and weaknesses? Or what are your strengths and weaknesses? So strengths means strong points, things you are good at. Weaknesses is your weak points, things you are not very good at. So you, can, you should be honest to a degree, but be careful. So this should be in a professional setting. Keep that in mind. It's a professional setting. If you want to talk about your weaknesses, don't say like, uh, I eat too much chocolate, or don't say like, I love sleeping, or whatever. Talk about your professional strengths and your professional weaknesses. And also with your weaknesses, it would be a good idea to talk about how you improve those weaknesses, or how you uh, work with your team members or work in a company um, to try to reduce the effect of those weaknesses. So for example, I'm very detail oriented, but I often take on too much at one time. Um, so like in my case, that's the case. Like I'm very detail oriented, but I often take on too much. So do too many things at one time. So I could explain, okay, so I'm very detail oriented, but uh, if I'm trying to take on too much, I tr maybe I say I communicate with my coworkers about what should be prioritized and that helps me organize my time better. So when you introduce your weakness, talk about the ways you kind of you try to reduce the effect of that weakness. That can be one technique. So your good points and your bad points in this question. Tell me about a time when you overcame a challenge at work. Some interviewers may ask this question. Tell me about a time when you overcame a challenge at work. So it's not really a question. They're asking you to tell a story. So tell me about a time when you overcame a challenge at work. So they want to hear an example from your professional experience about how you solved a problem. What did you do to solve a problem at work? Uh, they want to know uh, what kind of problem it was and how you approached the problem and the result of that problem. So um, you could say, for example, our company party was scheduled for the day before Christmas, but the restaurant exploded and I had to find a new place to have the party. <laughs> I don't know. That's not, of course, a crazy example. but giving your employer an idea of how you solve problems and maybe the kind of mental state you have when you solve the problems can be helpful in making a hiring decision. So in an example, when I was having trouble communicating with a client, I reached out to a coworker for support. What are your career goals? The next question is, what are your career goals? Your career goals. So not necessarily in this company, but in your career overall. In the interview, it's probably a good idea to include the company uh, where you are currently interviewing in your career goals. Um, but keep in mind, like, you should be uh, explaining a goal or you should be sharing a goal that is in line with the company's work. So if your goal is to open a cupcake shop, but you're interviewing for, like, an IT job where you're going to be, like, I don't know, installing Windows 10 on people's computers, maybe this doesn't really match. So make sure that your career goal and the job you're interviewing for align. Those two should be kind of aligned. Uh, it'll help your interviewer and it will help you, I think. So in an example sentence, I want to create a global advertising campaign strategy. So maybe you're interviewing for a marketing job, for example. You could say that's your career goal. I would love to design a global marketing campaign strategy, for example. Where do you see yourself in five years? The next question, a very common one, where do you see yourself in five years? Where do you see yourself in five years? This question means after five years, 
five years from this point in time, what is your vision for you? What is your vision of yourself professionally? So what do you want to have achieved after five years? So a good tip for this question is to explain where you will be having made contributions to the company where you are interviewing. So if I'm interviewing at Apple, and Apple says, where do you see yourself in five years, Alicia? And I say, I see myself at Microsoft. Like, that sounds really bad. So try to um, share your, your goals for yourself in a five-year period. But again, try to align them with the company where you're interviewing and explain like how you plan to contribute to the company and develop yourself professionally. That can be a really good way to answer this question. For example, I see myself in a managerial position in this company working on multiple projects for multiple markets. Ooh. Why do you want to work here? The next question is, why do you want to work here? Why do you want to work here? So similar to why are you interested in this position, that one's like, uh, that question is very much about this job in particular. But the question, why do you want to work here, means why do you want to work in this company, like in this place specifically? So share something about the company that you like or share something, some reason the company uh, is attractive to you as a candidate. So maybe it's the location or maybe it's the ability to uh, work overseas or maybe it's an international environment or maybe you can use your English skills. Some reason why you're interested in working at this company specifically. Share that after this question. Uh, so example, um, I think there's a lot to learn and I think there are opportunities for promotion. Do you have any questions for me? Last one, the last question is very common. Do you have any questions for me? Do you have any questions for me? Interviewers will often ask this question at the end of an interview, inviting the candidate to ask questions about the company. It is usually a very good idea to prepare some questions for the interviewer. So it's, it's also a good idea to research your company or research the university you're interviewing for before the interview. So if you have questions about the company, company policy, that sort of thing, it's a great chance to ask your interviewer. Generally, however, it's not a good idea to ask specific questions about pay or vacation in the interview as you can be seen as mm, maybe too, being too money or too vacation focused. That might come a little later if you say, What's the salary for this job? <laughs> like, unless it's a situation, unless it's a kind of a close situation that might be too direct a question. Um, but instead, ask some things about the company. Ask your interviewer what it's like to work there, what your interviewer thinks is good about working for the company, or maybe what your uh, interviewer thinks the company's planning to do over the next few years. Uh, ask something of your interviewer. So it shows that you are interested in that company and that you want to learn more and participate more with that company. So make sure to have some questions prepared when your interviewer asks, do you have any questions for me? So example question, what do you think is the most rewarding part about working here? So those are 10 job interview questions and a few different ways you can respond to them. So I think those are useful for job interviews, yes, but maybe if you interview for like a university or interview for uh, a scholarship or something, you can use similar responses to similar questions. So if you have any questions or comments, please let us know in the comment section below this video. If you liked the video, please make sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel as well. Check us out at EnglishClass101.com for more good stuff. And thanks very much for watching this episode of Top Words. I'll see you again soon. Bye. Hi everybody, my name is Alicia, and today we're going to be talking about the top 25 English phrases. So let's get started. The first phrase is hello. Hello, of course, is used as a greeting. You can greet your friends, you can greet your coworkers, your family with this phrase just by saying hello. Hey, hi, what's up? Hello. Sup. Yo. 
pretty much any time of day you can use hello. Hello? The next phrase is good morning. Good morning is used as a greeting in the morning. You can kind of feel when morning ends for you. Good morning is nice and polite. Or even just morning with your close friends or close co-workers. The next phrase is good night. Good night is fine. We don't use this to greet other people. We use it when we're saying goodbye to other people at night. Uh, family members, particularly mothers and fathers, to say good night to their children before they put them to bed. You can say it to your friend in a text message or in an email if you've been talking for a while. Good night. So the next word to talk about is goodbye. Uh, use it when you say goodbye to your friends, when you leave your friends. Goodbye. Bye, of course. Take care. Have a nice day. Peace out. That's another way to say goodbye. Okay, the next phrase is I'm plus your name. Of course, this is a way to introduce yourself. You can use I'm, in my case, Alicia. I'm Alicia to introduce yourself in any situation. New friend, I'm Alicia. Okay, the next phrase is what's your name? What's your name is used to ask someone else what their name is. So, what is your name sounds a bit... Try to use what's your name. If you forget someone's name, you can say sorry, what's your name? Or sorry, what's your name again? Next phrase is nice to meet you. Nice to meet you anytime you meet someone new. Nice to meet you is fine. Good to meet you is a little more casual. Great to meet you sounds very excited. Pleasure to meet you sounds like uh, maybe a formal situation or a business context. Okay, the next phrase is how are you? How are you? Is an, it's just a friendly way to check in with the other person. You can use it with friends, your family, your coworkers, maybe even your boss to a certain degree. Uh, how are ya? How you doing? The next phrase is I'm fine, thanks. And you? Uh, if you saw English in three minutes, we talked a lot about this phrase. Uh, instead of I'm fine, thank you, and you, say I'm good, thanks. How are you? Just shorten it, make it a little bit more natural. How are you? Good. How are you? Great. How are you? Not so good. How are you? Okay. And so on. So when someone says, how are you? Offer, I usually say, I'm good. This week, I blah, blah, blah. Give some information about what you've been up to. Maybe a hobby, something that you did recently, an event, something interesting you saw, whatever. People want to make that connection with you and it's a good chance for you to continue speaking. The next word is please. Please is a polite phrase used when you want something from someone else. You can use this as a response when someone offers you something, like in a restaurant, for example. Would you like more water? Would you like something to drink? Oh, please. The next phrase is thank you. Thank you is used to express your appreciation. You can use thank you with everybody. The next phrase is you're welcome, you're welcome. When someone says thank you, you can say you're welcome. Ah, no biggie, I use no biggie as in no biggie is short for no big problem. The next word is yes. Yes, of course, yes means is any positive expression. Someone asks you a question and the answer is a positive answer. You say yes, yep, uh-huh, yeah. We. Oui. <laughs> no. Next, I'm guessing I know it. Yep. The next word is no. No is a negative response to something when you have to give a negative answer. So as you can probably guess, um, the long form of no is negative. I like to use nope. It's very, very casual. Not gonna happen. My parents would use that with me. To soften that a little bit, if you want to show a negative response to something, like let's go out for dinner tonight. What do you want to do? Like, do you want to go out? Mm, not really. Mm, no, I don't think so, mm, to soften it. The next word is okay, okay. This word comes from copy editors. Okay, when they had to check a manuscript, um, they had to label the manuscript all clear, A-C, but because they were copy editors and they have a very, very sick sense of humor, they thought they would mark it okay for all clear to make a joke because O and K do not start all and clear, but it caught on among everybody in the world. <laughs> Anyway, okay uh, is used to agree with somebody else. Well, it can be used actually to express a positive or kind of a slight negative, I feel. Transitioning in your conversation, you can say, okay, now we're going to talk about blah, blah, blah. Okay, the next phrase is excuse me. Excuse me, it's used to get someone's attention in English when you don't know the other person. For example, in a store, a supermarket, maybe a stranger on the street, you need to ask directions. You can use excuse me. You can use excuse me in the supermarket. Excuse me, can you tell me where the hot sauce is? If you've done something rude in public, you can use excuse me. I personally do not do rude things in public ever. <laughs> I'm sorry is the next word we're gonna talk about. I'm sorry is used to apologize when you have made a mistake or someone you know has made a mistake and you're connected to it or you just feel bad, you can use I'm sorry. You made a mistake at work, I'm sorry. You forgot to feed your cat, I'm sorry. 
Sorry about that. You bump someone next to you. Oh, sorry. What time is it is the next phrase when you need to check what time it is. What time is it? When you ask someone else what time it is, maybe you say this to yourself too. Check your watch, check your phone, check a clock. Pretty straightforward phrase. There aren't really any short versions, so. That's an easy one. <laughs> Where is the plus a location? So you can use this for um, a building or a store. We don't, we're not gonna use this where is the for a place, a city name or a state name or a country name. To do that, you would need to remove the. But where is the bank? Where is the post office? You can use this to ask directions, to ask for help in your house or at work. Where is the copy machine? Where is the file I need? Where is the blah, blah, blah? Where is the bathroom is perhaps a very important question to know. The next one is, may I use the restroom? May I use the restroom is a polite uh, and soft expression that you can use if you need to use the toilet, you need to use the washroom. And when you're at someone's house for the very first time, when you're in a place that you're that is new to you, you can ask, may I use the restroom? More casually, can I go to the bathroom? To be very polite, you can say, may I go to the bathroom? The next phrase is, I would like to order something. You can use this at a restaurant probably or in any situation where you need to place an order. I'd like a pizza. I'd like a beer. Can I get the check please? This will be used at a restaurant. When you've finished your meal and it's time to go, can I get the check please? In a very, very casual situation, you can just say, check please, that's fine. The next phrase is, see you soon. See you soon is used with friends and family members, perhaps, uh, when you expect to see them again soon after saying goodbye to them. This is used at the end of the conversation. You're going separate directions. You say, see you soon. See ya is also good, or just see you. To make it a little more formal, you can say, I'll see you again soon. Make a full sentence out of it. The next phrase is see you later. See you later is very similar to see you soon, but the point is with see you later is that you're probably going to meet that person again later on in the same day. The last phrase is really. Really is a very useful word because you can use it to show you are interested in a conversation with upward intonation. Really, really, tell me more. Or to show that you're not so interested in the conversation with downward intonation, really. So there are many other words that you can use similar to really in this way, like seriously or oh, oh, and so on. So it's a really good practice for your intonation. Uh, so those are 25 very common words uh, and phrases in English. If you liked this video, if you like this topic, um, please subscribe. Um, I'm sure there'll be a button here somewhere or a button here, wherever. Um, but please be sure to subscribe to our channel because we're gonna be doing more videos like this and we already have more videos like this. So please be sure to check them out. Thanks very much for watching and we'll see you again soon. Bye. Really? Oh, interesting. Uh-huh. Okay, I see. Great. Fantastic. Unbelievable. Mm, gratitude subjects. What are we having for dinner tonight? Pizza? Affirmative. I'll riff on that. I am Chris Hardwick. In this video, you'll learn 20 of the most common words and phrases in English. Hi, everybody. My name is Alicia. Welcome to the 800 Core English Words and Phrases video series. This series will teach you the 800 most common words and phrases in English, but there's a twist. With each new lesson in this series, we'll include the previous lessons at the end. So after you've learned the new words and phrases, stick around and review what you learned in previous lessons. Reviewing is one of the most important parts of learning a language. You can also get the full list right now at EnglishClass101.com. Click the link in the description to access more example sentences, create your own flashcard deck, and finally, master English. Okay, let's get started. First is, hello. 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 Hello is the most basic greeting that you can use. You can use it with your friends, with your family members, with your coworkers, any time of day is fine. Hello, how have you been? Hello, how have you been? Hello, how have you been? Excuse me. Excuse me. Excuse me. So excuse me is the expression you can use when you bump into somebody or when you need to interrupt somebody who's working on something. It's a nice like apology expression to use. Excuse me, how much is this? Excuse me, how much is this? Excuse me, how much is this? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So we use I'm sorry 
in cases where we make a mistake, so I did something wrong or I did something bad, I use I'm sorry to apologize. I'm sorry, it was a typo. I'm sorry, it was a typo. I'm sorry, it was a typo. Good night. Good night. Good night. So good night is the expression we use at the end of the day when we want to say goodbye to someone or when we want to wish our family members a good night of sleep. Good night, Grandma. Good night, Grandma. Good night, Grandma. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. So nice to meet you is the expression we use the first time we meet someone. We don't use this like the second or the third time we see someone, only for the first time. Please come in. Nice to meet you. Please come in. Nice to meet you. Please come in. Nice to meet you. How are you? How are you? How are you? So, how are you is used as a very general greeting. When we see our coworker for the first time or we see a classmate for the first time, we ask, how are you? Meaning, what's your condition right now? It's been a long time. How are you? It's been a long time. How are you? It's been a long time. How are you? Yes. 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 So yes is the word we use to agree with something or to show we think something is good or correct. You can use yes uh, in any of those cases. Yes, this one please. Yes, this one please. Yes, this one please. No. 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 So no is the opposite of yes. We use it when we want to disagree or show that we think something is not good or is maybe not the best option. No, I haven't eaten yet. No, I haven't eaten yet. No, I haven't eaten yet. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you is used to express your appreciation for something. You can use this after you receive a gift or someone does something for you. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm. 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 So I'm is the reduced form of I and am. It becomes I'm. Make sure to clearly pronounce that m sound, like when you're introducing yourself. I'm John. I'm John. I'm John. Goodbye. 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 So goodbye is one way to say like something at the end of the day, usually, to say bye to someone. Goodbye sounds a little bit more formal than just bye, but you can use it to sound polite. Goodbye, see you again. Goodbye, see you again. Goodbye, see you again. Bad, bad, bad. Okay, so bad is a word that means not good. You can use it to describe something you don't like or that you think is inappropriate. Be careful of bad people. Be careful of bad people. Be careful of bad people. Good. 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 So good is the opposite of bad. You can use it when you want to express that you like something or that you think something is positive. My teacher is a good person. My teacher's a good person. My teacher is a good person. Pretty. 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 
So pretty is used to describe someone or something's physical appearance, something that we think is beautiful. I have a pretty girlfriend. I have a pretty girlfriend. I have a pretty girlfriend. Ugly. 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 So ugly is the opposite of pretty. We use this word to describe something that we think is not pleasing or is unpleasant. Ugly face. Ugly face. Ugly face. Easy. 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 So easy is used to talk about something that is not difficult. It's maybe something that's simple to do. Easy exam. Easy exam. Easy exam. Difficult. 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 So difficult describes something that is hard or something that is challenging to do. Difficult problem. Difficult problem. Difficult problem. Near. 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 Near is used to talk about something that is close to us. It's something that we can go to quickly and easily. I live near the university. I live near the university. I live near the university. Far. 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 So far is the opposite of near. Far means something that is a great distance from something else. There's like a long way to get to something. The station is far from here. The station is far from here. The station is far from here. Small. 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 So small is the opposite of big. We use it to describe things that are little. You can use it for concepts, for objects, or for people. Small mistake. Small mistake. Small mistake. Well done! In this lesson, you expanded your vocabulary and learned 20 new useful words. Click the link in the description and sign up for free at EnglishClass101.com to get access to the full list of vocabulary you'll need for daily life conversations. You'll also get example sentences, custom flashcard decks, and more learning resources. See you next time. Bye-bye! Hi everybody, my name is Alicia. In this lesson, I'm going to talk about 25 must-know intermediate phrases. Let's get started. These are some intermediate level phrases that you can use in everyday life. You can use them when you travel, at work, uh, in your studies. So I hope that they're helpful for you. Uh, they're for asking and answering questions. So after you learn these phrases, check out the link in the description where you can make an account at EnglishClass101.com and practice your English even more. All right, let's get started. How is it going? How is it going? You'll notice with how is it going, that there's an apostrophe at the end of this. It's not how's it going or how is it going. If you say how is it going, it sounds too stiff. It doesn't sound so friendly. So we say how's it going? How's it going? How's it going means how are you? Like how are you doing? Or how is your life going? So it's like a friendly, kind of rougher, more casual way to say how are you? How's it going? How's it going? How's it going with you? Fine. <laughs> See, that's the correct response. How's it going? Fine. How's it going? Good. How's it going? Not bad. How's it going? How's it going? Okay, let's go on to the next expression. What have you been up to? 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 What have you been up to is a more advanced version of like, what are you doing? So what have you been up to means what did you do since the last time I saw you? What have you been up to? So what have you been up to? It's like, ah, I've been blah, blah, blah. We're going to talk about this in the next expression. So what have you been up to? Or what have you been doing is another popular variation. What have you been up to? How have you been? How have you been? How have you been? More naturally, how have you been? Sounds like how have you been in everyday speech. So how have 
gets reduced to how of, how of, how have you been, how have you been, how have you been since the last time I saw you is what this means. How have you been? So that you sound also gets shorter. How have you been is kind of what it sounds like if I slow it down a lot. How have you been? How have you been? You might also hear too. So this means since the last time I saw you, what has your condition been like? Good? Bad? Busy? In most cases, the answer is just good. You? Fine. Fine. <laughs> anyway, moving along. I've been blah, blah, blah. I've been. This is the reduced form of I have been something something. This is a good response to questions like how have you been? Or what have you been up to? Numbers two and three in this episode. So if someone says, what have you been up to? You can say, I've been busy or I've been working. I've been studying. I've been planting a garden in front of my house. I've been looking for a new car. I've been making videos on the internet. So I've been blah, blah, blah. So I've is short for I have been. So this is a present perfect tense expression. I've been something, something. You can use the progressive form. You can use an adjective here. You can use whatever suits your situation. So yeah, mm, what have you been up to? I've been sleeping a lot. How about something, something? How about dinner? How about drinks? How about we do this later? How about something? This is a very simple and easy way to make a suggestion to someone. How about blah, blah, blah. So in fast speech, how about sounds like how about, how about, how about we, how about you, how about I, how about. So the A sound kind of disappears. How about we see a movie later? How about we go to the beach this weekend? How about we take a trip to Guam? How about we bake cookies? How about we go on to the next expression. <laughs> okay, sorry, I can't, sorry, I can't. So sorry, I cannot. This is a way to refuse an invitation. So to say, no, I cannot do that thing and I feel bad about it. Sorry, I can't, sorry, I can't. Uh, so like, sorry, I can't, you can add uh, like the thing you are refusing, if you like, you could say, sorry, I can't go to the beach with you this weekend, or sorry, I can't meet you for dinner tonight, I have to work late. Sorry, I can't help you make your tree house, I broke my leg. That was very specific. Sorry, I can't cook dinner tonight because I don't know how to cook. When you want to refuse, and you maybe don't want to give specific reasons, you can say, sorry, I can't. I used this recently. Sorry, I can't go. Sure, sounds good. Sure, sounds good. So, sure, sounds good. You can put those two together. Uh, sure means yes, sounds good. Means like your idea seems to be a good thing. Like I'm hearing your idea. It sounds like a nice idea. So this is a good way to accept an invitation. Sure, sounds good, or it sounds nice, sounds great, sounds awesome, sounds cool, sounds fantastic. You can change your adjective there if you like. Sure, sounds rad. Do you want to something something? Do you want to something something? Do you want to plus an activity? Like, do you wanna get dinner? Do you wanna go for drinks? Do you wanna ride bikes? Do you wanna? make videos for the internet. Do you wanna study English with me? Do you wanna, I don't know. Do you wanna get a Charizard tattoo? Already has one. <laughs> Do you want to is a friendly and easy way to make an invitation um, for some kind of activity. When we say this expression, we kind of put the sounds together. So not do you want to, but do you wanna, do you wanna. Do you wanna? Do you wanna? So it's, you can imagine, it's like D apostrophe Y A W A N N A. Do you wanna? Do you wanna? Not do you want to, but do you wanna? Do you wanna go to the next one? I do. What do you call this? What do you call this? So when you don't know the vocabulary word for something, or you just forget it, you can use this expression. What do you call this? So again, that do you becomes reduced. Do you becomes dia. What do you call this? So to call something is like to name something. What is the name you use for this thing? So what do you call this? Like, what do you call this? 
What do you call that? What do you call these? What do you call this? So you can use that when you don't know the word for something, when you find something new as well. How do I get to location? How do I get to? So how do I get to, for example, the station? How do I get to this hotel? Means what is the path I should take to arrive at that destination? How do I get to the beach from here? How do I get to my house from here? Or how do I get to the bar from here? How do I get to work from here? So how do I get to is a much more natural way to ask for directions to some place. So don't use how do I go or how do I travel, I guess, but how do I get to a location? And don't forget your to. Also, remember, we use that preposition to before the specific place name. So a problem that I hear a lot is how do I go to there? So we don't use to before there because there is not a specific place. How do I get to the station? A station is a specific place or a hotel is a specific place. There is not a specific place. So we cannot use to with there. So how do I get there? It's fine, no to. How do you get to the next one? By scrolling down on the iPad. All right, so let's go to the next one. Have a nice evening. Have a nice evening. Have a nice evening is a way to say goodbye at the end of the day. Many learners use good night um, at the end of the day, like with coworkers or maybe leaving a restaurant, like good night. We use good night when we're like saying goodbye to our kids or like when we're actually in bed like with a spouse or like your partner or maybe you say it to your children or something like that, good night, just before you go to sleep. When you want to say goodbye at the end of the day, use have a nice evening, have a good evening. That's a much more like natural and polite way to say goodbye at the end of the day. Have a nice evening. Have a good one, have a good one, have a good one. Have a good one means have a good day. So one here means day. Have a good day or have a good time or like have a good experience until I see you again. Have a good one or have a nice one. I think have a good one is probably the most common. Have a good one. So friendly, um, kind of polite-ish I suppose. Uh, you can use this with your coworkers, with your friends, with your family members, um, but it does have, there's a little bit of distance there, I think. Have a good one. Okay, onward. Can I have item, please? Can I have item, please? Can I have something, please? So when you're shopping, you can use this to request something from the person working at the store. So can I have that shirt, please? Or can I have... For example, 200 grams of beef, please. Or can I have that pack of cigarettes, please? So you can use any item in this pattern. Can I have that thing, please? You can use singular, you can use plural, you can use a number here if you want, but can I have? And to make this more natural, not can I have that thing, please, but can I have? Can I have, can I have is kind of more natural. Can I have sounds like, can I have? Can I have this iPad? Can I have? <laughs> yes, oh, I got an iPad today. Number of the noun, please. This is used again when shopping and maybe specifically when you're buying things in quantity. So that means, for example, like when you're shopping for food, uh, you maybe need to buy like fresh meat or a fresh fish, for example and you want a certain quantity, a certain amount of something. You can use number of the noun, please. So I used the example before, like 200 grams of the beef, please. So you're buying things in bulk. When you're buying in bulk, it means you're buying a lot of stuff at one time. You can use an expression like this. Um, of course, even if you're not buying in bulk, you can use this, like two of the blue ones, please. You can use that as well. So this is just a simple pattern to use when shopping. Number of the noun, please. How do I plus your verb phrase? So we talked about the expression, how do I get to a place? This is how do I something. So not get, but how do I, and then use a verb here. So 
One thing I hear learners do when they don't know how to do something is they use an expression like, please teach me this thing, or um, I don't know this. Um, so to make a request for someone to show you something, you can use this pattern. How do I use this computer? Or how do I turn on this car? How do I sell my kidney on the internet? How do I learn English? That's what a lot of people say. Just do it is the answer. <laughs> so how do I plus your verb? So that's a much better way than please teach me. Use how do I learn English? How do I study grammar? How do I read books? So use just the simple present tense form of the verb in this one. <laughs> ah, again, another point here, pronunciation point. How do I becomes how do I? How do I? How do I do this? How do I do that? How late are you open? How late are you open? This is very useful when you're visiting restaurants or bars or like retail shops as well. The most natural way to ask what time a store or other establishment finishes is how late are you open? How late are you open? So if you ask this question, you will get the closing time as the answer. Like how late are you open? Eight. How late are you open? 10. How late are you open? Midnight. Or how late are you open? We're open 24 hours. The internet is open forever. We have no closing time here in English Class 101. We're accessible always. How late are you open? So how late are you? So that are you is reduced. How late are you open? Are you sounds like how late are you open? We do not say how late are you closed. We don't say that. You could say when do you close? That's also okay. When do you close? But how late are you open? Do you have any plans for point in time? Do you have any plans for point in time? Do you have any plans for this weekend? Do you have any plans for tomorrow? Do you have any plans for tomorrow night? Do you have any plans for dinner? So choose a point in time or kind of like I did with dinner. You can use meals here too. Choose a point in time to ask about another person's schedule. Don't forget for in this example. Do you have any plans for point in time? Do you have any plans for Sunday afternoon? Do you have any plans for Monday? So this is a quick way to ask about a schedule. Very nice and it's kind of polite as well. Okay, on to the next one. My body part hurts. My body part hurts. This is an important and natural expression to use when you are not feeling well. So instead of like, I have a pain in my arm or something, or I have a pain somewhere, I hear many learners use that pattern. Instead, use my plus your body part hurts. For example, my arm hurts, my head hurts, my finger hurts, my stomach hurts, my back hurts, my face hurts. Because <laughs> I got punched in it this morning. It's not true. Have you ever punched yourself in the face? Myself? Yeah, <laughs> I did it once and I'm never going to forget it. Bloody yes. Yeah, I was trying to pull like the blankets up. It was like oh. six in the morning. I, I was cold. It was winter. I tried to pull the blankets up and my blanket was kind of like shiny and slick and I was like half awake and I was like, ah, bam. So my body part hurts. My body part hurts. Uh, that's the quickest way to explain that you do not feel well in some way. My body part hurts. Don't forget that S. My body part hurts. My eyeball hurts. That's not super hurts. <laughs> my ear hurts. My throat hurts. How much is this? How much is this? This is a cost related expression. When you are shopping, how much is this? How much is that? You probably don't need to use this so much because in most cases the price is clearly written in stores. But every once in a while you do need to ask or you need to like talk to someone about a price in a conversation. So how much is this or how much is that? You can change that. Of course, you can use the plural here. How much are these? How much are those in present tense? And you can also ask about past tense information. How much was that? For example, how much was your car or how much was this apartment or how much were those donuts? a very important question. How much did your sandwich cost? You could ask that as well. How much does something cost is another expression you can use. But yeah, how much did your sandwich cost? It looks good. Or how much for a dozen burgers to be sent to my office tomorrow at one o'clock? What did you say? What did you say? 
Native speakers use this all the time. You can use this too. Please, it's important, probably more important, for you to use this expression and don't feel bad about it. What did you say? Naturally, what did you say? What did you say? What did you say is a question about the thing the other person in the conversation just said. Like you couldn't catch it or you think you misheard something or maybe you didn't understand something they said. What did you say? It's a little more polite than just, what? <laughs> so, what did you say? Yeah, anytime you need to confirm something that someone else said, you can use, what did you say? Try to use a nice intonation with this also. What did you say? What does that mean? What does that mean? And native speakers use this too. Like, we don't understand everything. Like, sometimes everybody needs an explanation. So, what does that mean is a great way uh, to ask for it. What does that mean in fast speech is, what does that mean? What does that mean? So the TH in that becomes like a S or a Z sound. What does that mean? So it connects to that Z sound in does. What does that mean? What does that mean? So what does that mean? It's like you don't understand something that's written, or maybe you don't understand the implications. Implications means like the, um, like the background information of a situation. So what does that mean? Or you don't understand something someone else said, but they're gone. So you can't say, what did you say? You ask someone else, what does that mean? What that person just said, what does that mean? So what does that mean is another really important expression for learners, especially. I don't feel so good. I don't feel so good. So if you don't want to specifically say like my stomach hurts or my arm hurts or my head hurts, you can say, I don't feel so good. So this tends to be used more for like stomach problems. So I don't feel so good. I ate a huge lunch. I don't feel so good. Or maybe you ate something bad. Ooh, I don't feel so good. We often use I don't feel so good when we actually feel very bad very suddenly. Like in the examples I mentioned, when we eat something and our body is not happy with it and we suddenly feel sick, we might use the expression, I don't feel so good, I need to go home. So you can use this to talk about like a sudden and unpleasant feeling in your body. I don't feel so good. I need to go to location. I need to go to location. I need to go to location is useful for talking about errands. So errands is like small tasks you need to do throughout the day. We also use this expression when we need to visit the restroom urgently. So you can say, I need to go to the restroom. That's great. That's a very natural and polite way to talk about visiting the restroom. Otherwise, when you're talking about your daily tasks, you can say, I need to go to the bank. I need to go to the store. I need to go to the car wash. I need to go to the pet sitter and pick up my neighbor's poodle. What? That was very specific. <laughs> so you can talk about your responsibilities with need to. Yes, you can substitute have to here. I have to go to the bank. I have to go to the store. Keep in mind also, when you want to use the negative form, I don't have to or I don't need to, you can, but make sure you use it with something you don't have a responsibility to do. I hear lots of learners use expressions like, I don't have to go to the bar today, for example. Like, if going to a bar is part of your regular responsibilities, like you work at a bar or like part of your business is at a bar, fine. But if it's just something you occasionally do, it sounds really unnatural to use. I don't have to go to the bar today. So we use this in the negative form for things we can naturally and reasonably be expected to have responsibility to do. So keep that in mind when you use the negative form. Okay, onward, I have to, I have to. So my previous one was I need to go to a place. If you want to just talk in general about responsibilities, you can use I have to. I have to get up early in the morning. I have to study for my tests. I have to. Think of a new hairstyle for my cat. Yesterday I had to, past tense, I had to buy new clothes because my director was making fun of me for wearing shirts that they were falling apart on camera because that's how much I love shopping. Yeah, 
So past tense, I had to buy new clothes yesterday, or I had to go out in the rain yesterday. So again, I had some responsibility to do that. So past tense, had to. When are we leaving? When are we leaving? I included this here because it's a common question, surprisingly, like when are we leaving? Not uh, when do we go? That's one that I hear sometimes, like when do we go? Or when we go or something like that. Don't use those. Oh, sorry, Mr. iPad. Um, the question is, when are we leaving? So we use this when we're at an event. We're at a party, we're maybe at work, whatever. You're going somewhere else with another person or with a group. When are we leaving? When are we leaving this place, in other words? So natural pronunciation, when are we leaving? When are we leaving becomes when are we leaving? Okay, so those are 25 must-know intermediate phrases. I hope that those are helpful for you. Many of the phrases that I introduced here are in present tense, but remember, you can use them in past tense and in future tense too. So don't stick only to present tense. Make sure to go outside of present tense and think about the different ways that you can use these expressions to talk about the past and the future. Okay, so that's everything for this lesson. Thanks very much for watching. Please make sure to click on the link in the description to learn more English at EnglishClass101.com. Also, if you like the video, please don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel if you have not already. Thanks very much for watching this lesson, and I will see you again soon. Bye-bye. Stevens. <laughs>
more time now Make it as slow as you dare Word by word Interpreting this emotion Share as much dear as you can But you know We can talk from the dusk till dawn And everything Wind the night, let's get lost from dusk till dawn. Pause it in, in the perfect end. Sing me your favorite song, translate for me as you. you want to be loved how 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 you want to be Hi everybody, my name is Alicia. In this lesson, I'm going to give an introduction to English tenses. For this lesson, I'm going to give a short introduction to when to use each of the English tenses. I'm also going to share an example of what that tense looks like in a sentence or in a question. So this is just a quick guide. If you want more information about any of these tenses, you can try searching the YouTube channel or our website for a video specifically about one of these tenses. So I hope this is helpful for you. Okay, so let's get started. The first group of tenses I want to look at is the present tense. So for today's lesson, I've organized it into three categories, present, uh, past, and future tenses. So let's begin with the present tense. So in each category, I have four uh, different tenses. I have simple, continuous, perfect, and perfect continuous. You might know continuous as progressive. They mean the same thing. Continuous and progressive mean the same thing for this lesson. So let's begin with the present simple tense. Present simple tense is a tense we use for general facts, for regular actions, and for schedules. So this is stuff that doesn't change. Uh, like he speaks English, for example. She doesn't speak Spanish. That's a simple fact. For regular action, so things you do every day or every week, for example. And schedule, so that means like a bus or an airplane or uh, maybe a car schedule, something that maintains a regular schedule. An example, two examples of using the present simple tense. First, uh, I work on Mondays. So here, work is my verb, I work on Mondays. Simple present tense. A negative, I don't eat lunch at two o'clock. So these are simple present tense statements. In this case, they're just simple statements of fact, really. Okay, so let's continue to the next one. The second tense is the present continuous tense. Oof. The present continuous tense. Uh, so present continuous tense we use for continuing action, and that means actions that are happening now. So for example, I'm teaching, I'm standing, I'm speaking. Those are actions happening now. So we use it for continuing actions now, like physical actions. We also use it for trends. So things happening in your society right now, for example. So examples would be like, that TV show is becoming popular, or the world is getting warmer, for example. So these are things happening now also. 
We can use it for one-time actions as well. Um, and this relates a little bit to future tense, which I'm going to talk about later too. But something happening just one time in the future, we can use the uh, continuous form to describe that. So for example, I'm working this Saturday. So sometimes students ask, what's the difference? Why is it I'm working this Saturday and not I work this Saturday? Remember, we talked about the present simple tense. We use that for regular actions, for general facts. So if you usually work on Saturdays, you should use the present simple tense. I work on Saturdays. If, however, this Saturday is special and you don't usually work on Saturdays, you should use the continuous tense. I'm working this Saturday. So it sounds like that's not a typical thing for you. I'm working this Saturday. Okay. Let's go on to the third tense. The third tense is the present perfect tense. The present perfect tense. So we use the present perfect tense for general life experience or lack thereof. So lack thereof means no, no life experience, not having a life experience. So something that you did in the past, uh, but not at a specific point in time. The specific point in time is not so important here, or maybe we don't know. So example. A negative example, he has never been to Spain. He has never been to Spain. In this case, no life experience of going to Spain is what this means. So this is an example of present perfect tense. Here we have uh, he has. Remember, we need to attach has or have before our past participle verb form here. So for more information about this tense, you can check the channel. There's more information there. So let's continue on to the next tense now. The next tense is the present perfect continuous tense. Present perfect continuous. We use this tense for actions that started in the past and continue to the present. So something you started doing uh, in the past, some point in the past, it's not always important when, but that action continues. So you use this a lot to talk about your studies, for example. We use words like for and since and maybe ago with this as well. So an example of this, uh, I've been studying English for two years. So here we see I've been, this I've is the contracted, the reduced form of I have. I have been studying. So this is the continuous or the progressive form. In this case, I've used the word for. I've used for because I'm using two years, which is a length of time. We can use since. Uh, for example, I've been studying English since 2016. So we use since before a specific point in time. Um, we can use ago as well. Uh, usually we pair it with since. I've been studying English uh, since two years ago. You'll notice when we use ago, however, we change from using, uh, in my first example, 2016 to a length of time, since two years ago. So there are a few different changes you need to make there. But you can check the uh, other video on the channel for more information about that grammar point. Okay, let's move on to the second group for today, which is the past tense. Let's look at the four points in the past tense here. First one is the past simple, or just simple past tense. Simple past tense is used for actions that started and finished in the past. So for example, I taught simple present tense earlier. So I use the past tense, I taught simple present tense because the action started and finished in the past. Another example, I worked all night. I worked all night, so work is my verb. I use simple past tense worked because the action started and finished in the past. Another example, a negative, they didn't come. They didn't come to the party. They didn't come to the office. The action was in the past. It refers to something that did not happen in the past. So there was no action in the past, but it's over. It's finished. So we use simple past tense to talk about these simple actions that started and finished in the past. Okay. Let's go on to the past continuous tense then. Past continuous is for actions that were continuing in the past. So this one is one we often use with a specific point in time along with it. So let's look at an example first. We were listening to music. We were listening to music yesterday or we were listening to music at 8 p.m. 
When were you listening to music? When was that action continuing? At 8 p.m. or yesterday. So it's common to include a point in time with this grammar point. Another example, like I was doing something something, ing form there. So um, this is one that uh, some people have questions about, like wh why should I use that? When should I use that? It's typically used in response to someone's question, like what were you doing uh, last night, for example? Or what were you doing this morning? So you want to know someone's activities at a specific point in time. You can use this grammar point to respond to that question. Okay, let's move along to the past perfect tense, our next one. Past perfect tense is for actions that were completed or not completed at a non-specific point in the past, at a non-specific point in the past. So this one is kind of difficult and it's perhaps not used quite so much in everyday conversation. This is used a bit more in writing. This is a grammar point that's especially helpful when we want to show kind of a timeline in our writing. To show that an action happened before another action in the past, we can use the past perfect tense. So here's a couple of examples. Uh, first one, they hadn't departed yet. So here, hadn't is the reduced form of had not. They hadn't departed yet. And I had taken my lunch break. So we would use sentences like these if we're telling a story. So we're telling a story about the past and we want to show that one action happened before another action. When we want to talk about the earlier action, so the thing that happened earlier, like more in the past, we use the past perfect tense. Then we can use the simple past tense to explain the action that happened uh, closer to the present. So for example, I had taken my lunch break when I saw the delivery man came or something like that. So you can see my second point there. That's kind of a strange example, but uh, you see that my second point there uses the simple past tense. I saw the delivery man came. So I had taken my lunch break further in the past uh, when I saw the delivery man came. So that's simple past tense. So this is probably more common in writing, but it is used in speaking as well too. So this is what we use uh, past perfect tense to do. Okay, let's move on then to another challenging point, uh, past perfect continuous tense, past perfect continuous. These, uh, these are sentences or questions uh, for actions that started in the past and continued to like an unspecified point in the past. So the action has finished as well. That's a key difference with the present perfect continuous. With present perfect continuous, the action is happening now still. That behavior still continues. Key point though with past perfect continuous is that the action started at some point in the past and then continued and finished as well, but at some unspecified point. So maybe we don't know exactly when the action finished, but it's done, it's complete. So let's look at an example. Uh, they had been waiting since 3 p.m. So here, they had been waiting. This shows us that there was some waiting period. So the, the waiting started at 3 p.m. and the waiting continued and continued and continued. We don't know when the waiting finished, but this grammar point shows us that the waiting has finished. We're finished waiting. That's done. We wanted to talk only about this period of time the people were waiting in the past. So this is the grammar point that we use to talk about things that were happening uh, over a period of time in the past and then finished. Um, so this is something, again, we use when telling stories. We're showing a sequence of events, actually. Okay. Let's move along then to the last group for today's lesson, the future tense, future tense. Let's start with the future simple tense, future simple tense. This is for actions that are planned or unplanned for the future. There are actually a lot of different things we can do to make the future simple tense. Some very common ways of making future simple are through using will and won't and going to and not going to. And earlier in this lesson, I mentioned using the continuous tense, the present continuous tense, the ing form of a verb to make statements about the future also. So there are many ways to make a simple future statements. Let's look at a couple of examples. First, I'll have a glass of wine. This uses will, I'll. I'll is the reduced form of I will have a glass of wine. That's a future statement. 
Also, he's going to cook dinner. In this one, I've used going to to express that. So these are just simple things about planned or perhaps unplanned. Like he's not going to cook dinner would be an unplanned action in the future or something that's not going to happen in the future rather. Okay, so let's go on to the future continuous tense now. Future continuous tense, um, this is for actions you think uh, will or will not be continuing in the future, in the future, something you think will be continuously happening in the future. Let's look at an example. I'm not going to be working at company A. I'm not going to be working at company A. So here you can see we have going to. I'm not going to. Plus, we have a verb in the continuous tense. I'm not going to be working at company A. Meaning, in other words, I'm not going to have a job at company A or I'm not going to uh, continue my position at company A in the future. That's my thought now in the present about the future. So at that time in the future, like in one year, for example, I will not be working at that company or I'm not going to be working at company A. So that's the idea behind uh, the future continuous tense. Okay, let's move along to the future perfect tense then. So, uh, so future perfect tense refers to actions that you think will have started some point in the future. So remember, you're thinking in the present right now. But this grammar point is used to talk about something, something you imagine in the future that starts at some point and you think might uh, be continuing into the future, maybe. Something uh, started and maybe continues. This is the idea here. So let's look at an example. Uh, I will have lived in China for two years. I will have lived in China. So here I'm using will to show it's a future tense statement. I will plus have lived. This is the same thing that we use for the uh, present perfect tense that we talked about earlier, that past participle plus have or has. But we're attaching it to a future tense will. I will have lived in China for two years. So when would we use this? So if, for example, someone asks you a question about your future you, and they say like, hmm, so where do you see yourself in like 2020, for example? Or where do you imagine you're going to live in 2020, for example? You can say, oh, I will have lived in China for two years. So meaning at that time in 2020, I will have lived in China for two years. So that means not now, but in the future. At that point in time in the future, I will have started living in China and that will have continued for two years. So that's what that means. That's a guess about the future, a future time period, that something will have continued uh, in the future. So again, quite a, a challenging grammar point, but um, something definitely to look into. So again, not used perhaps as much as the present perfect tense, but great for storytelling and for imagining your future too. Okay, so let's move on to the last point for today's lesson, the future perfect continuous tense. Future perfect continuous. Uh, this is a tense that you use uh, similar to the last one, but for actions you think will or won't have started and will be continuing. So something that's going to have uh, started again in the future, something started, and the action will have continued into the future. Example. I won't have been eating meat for three months. I won't have been eating meat for three months. So for this one, let's imagine um, that you decided last month to stop eating meat. So that's fine, actually. For this, for this sentence, that's okay. You made a decision last month to stop eating meat. Then someone asks you um, about your progress. Like, how's it going? Um, like, what are you going to do next month? And you can say to yourself, hmm, well, at that point, next month, by next month in the future, uh, you can use this sentence. I won't, so won't, negative, will not. I won't have been eating meat for three months, for three months. So that means from the point in time I started it in the past until this point in the future. So not present, but into the future. 
this entire time, my behavior not eating meat, that's going to have continued. So you're making a guess about the future. So at this future point in time, that behavior I started in the past will have continued and continued and continued. And at this point, it will be three months, three months total for that behavior. So we use this to talk about something, um, some future thing that will have continued or will be continuing into the future. So will have continued, meaning something that started in the past and continues into the future, or will be continuing, meaning it's still going into the future as well. So there are a couple of like very, very subtle grammar points to consider there too. So that, those are a couple of maybe tough grammar points, um, but they're really good for storytelling and for talking about your future as well. Okay, so I know that this was a lot of information in this lesson. If you have some questions about where to find more details about any of these grammar points, you can check the YouTube channel. Our YouTube channel has some resources for um, these grammar points. There's also some information on the website. If you don't see it on the website or on the YouTube channel yet, please have a little bit of patience. We are making new stuff all the time and we'll hopefully have this available for you soon. So please keep checking back in with us. Great, so that's everything for this lesson. I hope that it was useful for you. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to leave a comment below the video. If you like the video, please don't forget to give it a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, and check us out at EnglishClass101.com for lots of other things that you can use to study English. Thanks very much for watching this lesson, and I will see you again soon. Bye-bye. Imagine you're on a plane. There's someone next to you. What do you say? Hi, Alicia here. Introducing yourself in English is easy. In this lesson, you're going to learn how with Gustavo and Henry, who meet on a plane. Gustavo's moving to New York. His family is going to join him later in the month. Henry is in the seat when Gustavo gets on the plane. Let's watch. Excuse me. Sorry about that. Hi, how do you do? I'm Gustavo. Nice to meet you, Gustavo. I'm Henry Eddins. I'm sorry. Can you say that again, please? A bit slowly? Henry Eddins. Henry Eddins. That's it, but please call me Hank. Hank, nice to meet you. Now with subtitles. Excuse me. Sorry about that. Hi, how do you do? I'm Gustavo. Nice to meet you, Gustavo. I'm Henry Eddins. I'm sorry. Can you say that again, please? A bit slowly? Henry Eddins. Henry Eddins. That's it, but please call me Hank. Hank, nice to meet you. Here are the key words from the scene. Hi. 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 But. 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 Excuse me. Excuse me. Excuse me. Excuse me. Two. 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 Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. How do you do? How do you do? How do you do? How do you do? Here are the key phrases from the scene. How did Henry apologize when he realized he was in Gustavo's way? Sorry about that. Sorry about that? In general, this expression, when used to respond to excuse me, shows a friendly willingness to help the other person. 
In this case, Henry wanted to show he was happy to move out of Gustavo's way. You can also use it to apologize for a small mistake, like bumping into someone on the street or blocking someone's way in the aisle of a supermarket. Now you try. Say Henry's line after Gustavo speaks. Excuse me. Sorry about that. Later, Gustavo also used the word sorry to apologize when he didn't understand Henry's name. Which phrase did he use? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. This is a very common phrase in English for many situations, but here, Gustavo uses it to indicate he didn't understand something. Now you try. Say the line after Henry speaks. I'm Henry Eddins. I'm sorry. Because Gustavo did not understand something, he asked Henry to repeat what he said. To do this, what polite question did he use? Can you say that again, please? Can you say that again, please? In response, English speakers will usually repeat what they have said and will use the same words. Now you try. Ask the question after Gustavo says, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Can you say that again, please? Gustavo also wanted Henry to speak more slowly. To do this, what does he ask? A bit slowly? A bit slowly. This is not a complete sentence, but has a clear meaning when used after, can you say that again, please? In response, English speakers will slow their speech down. Now you try. Say the phrase after Gustavo says, can you say that again, please? Can you say that again, please? A bit slowly? After Gustavo said Henry's name, Henry confirmed he said it correctly. How did he do that? That's it. That's it? This is like saying, that's correct. But since the situation was friendly, that's it sounded more natural. Now you try. Say the phrase after Gustavo says Henry's name correctly. Henry Eddins. That's it. Now the lesson focus. Here's how to introduce yourself. Ready? Do you remember how Gustavo introduced himself? Hi. How do you do? I'm Gustavo. When Gustavo introduced himself, he started with, hi, and then used a set phrase. How do you do? How do you do? This is a polite expression people often use with an introduction. It sounds like a question, but it has no particular meaning, and there's no expectation the other person will try to answer it. Next, he says, I'm Gustavo. The first part of this sentence is a contraction of two words, I and am. The am here functions like an equal sign in math. I'm. I'm. The next word in the sentence is a name. Gustavo. Together it's... I'm Gustavo. The structure of the pattern is... Hi, how do you do? I'm... Plus... Your name. Now you try. Imagine your name is John. Say, hi. How do you do? I'm John. Hi. How do you do? I'm John. Now imagine your name is Eichel. Say, hi. How do you do? I'm Eichel. Hi. How do you do? I'm Eichel. Now use your name. Okay. There are two additional things you need to know. First, there's a shortcut for giving your name. Just drop the I'm from the final sentence of the self-introduction. For example, 
If Gustavo just said, Hi, how do you do, Gustavo? Henry would have understood it was his name. This would be especially clear if Gustavo extended his hand for a handshake while saying this. In very casual situations, you can even drop the Hi and the How do you do? All that is left would be your name. The second thing you need to know is you can use I'm with just the first name or your first name and the last name together. I'm Henry Eddins. Eddins is Henry's family name. Using both your first name and your last name is a little more formal. It also gives you less privacy. For example, if people know both your first and last name, they can find you on the internet more easily. So it may be more common for strangers to say just their first name than people meeting in a more friendly environment. Next, you'll learn how to tell people to call you by a nickname, just like Henry did in the scene. But please call me Hank. But please. Call me Hank. The first word in the sentence is... But. This word is not necessary, but it makes the transition to the rest of the sentence smoother. Henry uses this to introduce a new piece of information. And this information changes something about what he said before. But makes this clear. The next word introduces a polite request. Please. Please. Next is a request to use a certain name. Call. Call. After this is the word... Me. Me. Last is a common nickname for men named Henry. Hank. Hank. Please call me Hank. The sentence structure is... Please call me. Plus... Your nickname. Now you try. Imagine your nickname is Matt. Say, please call me Matt. Please call me Matt. Now imagine your nickname is Lulu. Say, please call me Lulu. Please call me Lulu. Now use your own nickname. Say, Please call me, and then use your nickname. Finally, when you meet someone for the first time, it's polite to say a set phrase at the end. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Usually, both people will say this or something similar to it. Now you try. Nice to meet you. Now it's time to practice your new ability. Let's practice. This is your chance to introduce yourself. Try to remember what you learned and practice by speaking aloud. It's your first day in the U.S. and you're meeting your new neighbor. Ready? Here we go. What's the first thing you say to someone you've just met? Hi, how do you do? How do you tell someone your name? I'm name. I'm Henry Eddins. How do you tell someone your nickname? Please call me your nickname. Please call me Hank. What's the last thing you say to someone you've just met? Nice to meet you. Great job. You've just introduced yourself. You'll follow this same pattern many times, so be sure to practice it. Well done. Now, watch the scene one more time. After that, go and practice with all your American friends, or with us in the comments. Bye. Excuse me. Sorry about that. Hi. How do you do? I'm Gustavo. Nice to meet you, Gustavo. I'm Henry Eddins. I'm sorry. Can you say that again, please? A bit slowly? Henry Eddins. Henry Eddins. That's it.
but please call me Hank. Hank, nice to meet you. everybody, welcome back to Top Words. My name is Alicia and today we're going to be talking about tongue twisters. Tongue twisters are phrases that are difficult to say, so they're really good chances to practice your pronunciation. Let's go. Sally sold seashells by the seashore. Sally sold seashells by the seashore. This one's difficult because of the s and sh sounds. Sally sold seashells by the seashore. Sally sold seashells by the seashore. Sally sold seashells by the seashore. That one's not so bad. Okay, yeah. okay, we'll move on. Next. Betty Botter bought some butter, but she said the butter's bitter. I've never seen this before. Okay. Betty Botter bought some butter, but she said the butter's bitter. <laughs> That's a good one. That's a good one. I feel like you could have thrown the word like butt in there somewhere too. Betty Botter bought some butter, but she said the butter's bitter. Ah, oh, that's a good one. It's very bubbly. Betty Botter bought some butter, but she said the butter's bitter. It's like if I if I knew the words, I could probably say it faster. Betty Botter bought some butter, but she said the butter's bitter. Butter, butter's bitter. Bitter, butter, butter, bitter. But she bought some butter, but she said the butter's bitter. Is this enough? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know when to stop. How much wood would a woodchuck chuck if a woodchuck could chuck wood? The next tongue twister is also a classic one about woodchucks. Woodchucks are real creatures that exist on the west coast of the United States, primarily in Washington and Oregon. Uh, they're like beavers, but they don't live in rivers. They live in like forests and rocks. The tongue twister is, how much wood would a woodchuck chuck if a woodchuck could chuck wood? How much wood would a woodchuck chuck if a woodchuck could chuck wood? And then there's a common response to that, which is, it would chuck all the wood that a woodchuck could if a woodchuck could chuck wood. We definitely talked about this one in that English Topics um, episode we did about tongue twisters. Lesser leather never weathered, wetter weather better. Oh, I've never seen this. Lesser leather never weathered, wetter weather better? Hang on, I'm just, I'm just like astounded by the grammar of this sentence. Lesser leather never weathered, wetter weather better. Oh, that's hard. It's the wetter weather better, well, wetter weather better part. Those last three words. Lesser leather never weathered, wetter better. Ah! <laughs> Lesser leather never weathered, wetter weather better. Wetter weather better. Weather. <laughs> it's, it's the weather better that's hard. Weather better. Weather better. Weather better. Wetter weather better. Yeah, that's it. Lesser leather never weathered, wetter weather better. Ah! On to the next one. If two witches would watch two watches, which witch would watch which watch? If two witches would watch two watches, which witch would watch which watch? <laughs> Did you write these? Did you write these? Did you find these on the internet? Someone's brilliant. If two witches would watch two watches, which witch would watch which watch? Oh, that one's a good one. If two witches would watch two watches, which witch would watch which <laughs> which witch would watch which watch? Ah, all right, that's the end. Wow, those are really good tongue twisters. The one that always gets me from that episode of English Topics that we did was uh, Irish wristwatch. Irish wristwatch. Mm. Hard one. And one we came up with the other day was sushi session. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good one, right? Yeah. They were like, let's go for a sushi session. I was like, that's hard. <laughs> sushi session, sushi session, sushi. Ah, that's a really good one, too. Irish wristwatch and sushi session. All right, so those are uh, what? Those are tongue twisters. Give them a try. They are really, really great ways to practice your pronunciation. If you know any other tongue twisters, please share them with us in a comment so that we can all give them a try. Thank you very much for watching this episode of Top Words. If you liked this video, please be sure to hit the like button and subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. Thanks very much for watching this episode and we'll see you again soon. Bye. Oh my god, I, I wanna like I wanna have this job where I just sit at like my desk and I just think of that's probably what somebody does. Like they're bored at their job and they just think of these sorts of things. Now that you're finished with this lesson, don't forget, as a free bonus, you get over 30 conversation cheat sheets. But only if you sign up via the link in the description. You'll learn how to have flowing conversations and how to answer the most common questions. 
You can also print out these colorful cheat sheets to keep as physical study material. So don't miss out on this free gift. Click the link in the description and sign up for a free lifetime account to get your PDF cheat sheets.